I pose this question to the audience. How aware are you of the Joan Allen problem? All right, cool. I'm going to unmute you now. How are we doing, everybody? We've got a guest on today. Private Sessions is back. We're going to be watching... We're going to be watching Kratos' Skyrim video. <clears throat> Since we watched Acer Thorn yesterday, I thought it was only fitting. So, uh, would, uh, how are you feeling for this video? I'm actually, I've watched parts of it, and from what I've seen, it seems like it should be a pretty decent video. I have no so. expectations going in. <laughs> I'm going to remain I'm going to be the optimist here and say this might be one of the better videos. I hope so. <laughs> I need I a palate cleanser after last night. Yeah, I I need um I just need more good Skyrim videos. I want to feel like I'm not like having to break new ground. I like when I talk about a game and it's comfortable like Battlefront 2, right? Uh, oh, there's the list. I'm, I'm still eating my my uh, my dinner. So, <clears throat> but um, what was I gonna say? Well, if if you want to finish what you're doing, I was gonna talk a bit about my. Uh, so I saw the the JXC video where he was talking about his feelings on like reacting streamers. Basically, it was like a continuation of the of the drama that he's been having with Hassan Piker. Which I think drama has connotations for a lot of people, so I'd want to clarify it's not as drama as much as like extremely legitimate grievances. Um, and I was thinking like there should be a service or a website like Watch Together, except it saves a log of when the streamer uh, pauses, plays, and like changes the timeline, what speed they play at, etc. And then you can watch along. Like a watch together, but at retro, at like after the fact, you can also uh, just put that on, and then it would be an embed, so you you would still get the full watch time. Um, so you would get the watch time benefits. So it's like you would get a sudden boost in watch time, even though it was on somebody else's stream. I don't know how advertising works with embeds. I don't know how well that would work, but it's still better than the literal nothing that like YouTubers get right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's got to be there's yeah. got to be some sort of solution here because it's, you know, reactions and stuff. They're pretty much a genre at this point. It seems mm -hmm. silly that we're that, you know, YouTube and other platforms and stuff are not trying to facilitate some way of doing it more civilly. And, you know, it's to the platforms as benefits as well. Yeah, I, I think that um, I mean, it, it is the truth, like that many people did have their eyeballs on the video so it's not like it's some abusable thing especially when it's people on twitch watching content on youtube why wouldn't youtube want to yeah like cre create a system where they can harvest that watch time and i mean the same is true for i mean a lot of streamers who do this are also on youtube but i think youtube's stream community is more like in the fair use category, like JXE was showing a bunch of examples of people who do do like reaction stream content who are doing it correctly. You know, like uh, somebody who is an expert in a field watching a video and then like giving their commentary uh, and their perspectives. I thought Kreto was Kratosis birds, lizards, or dogs. <laughs> what? Uh, it's the old furries. Uh, <clears throat> oh. Old furries meme. Someone was saying he like feet, but I don't think that's true. Or maybe it's like talons. I went and checked back through the last stream to see what I missed. Was DWT's video even shown at all? Um. Like, for a second. <laughs> and it wasn't the second I wanted. 
Yeah, it was a it was a fast one I pulled, and Acer Thorn commented on the stream. I guess he wasn't particularly bothered. He probably understood why why I did that, because like I said in the last stream, uh, the first time we watched Acer Thorn, he was there and he was kind of dictating the pace of things, and I kind of wanted to get like a a fairer perspective without him. Question for the chat, is there a way for me to watch the past 18 streams? So, work streams 1 through 17 are on the first channel. I might move them over at some point. I don't know, it sounds like a pain in the ass, but they're in a playlist. Um, and then all the streams over here will stay public. They definitely had a good turnout last night for, um, for a, you know, mm -hmm. first stream on a new channel. Yeah. In the middle of the night. Yeah, we had like... <laughs> 200 viewers the entire stream uh it had like an average watch duration of like 50 minutes uh which is pretty impressive for a live stream yeah i'm still trying to figure out how how to do streams on my channel i was actually going to do a stream tonight and then i woke up too late in the day i had a bunch of homework and stuff i had to do so it wasn't really going to pan out so I was in the middle of working out, and you, you know, hit me up on Discord, and I was just like, ooh, yes, perfect. So, yeah, yeah, so I can stream without streaming. You're streaming anyways. Which reminds me, I gotta log this time. Because I log everything that I do work-related, so that I know. Oh, you're counting, you're counting how, how many hours I was a YouTuber this week. Yeah, pretty much. It makes me feel better. I've only gotten 16 hours of work done this week, starting from Sunday. Have you guys Not watched a... the Super Bunny Hop video? Uh, I did. Um, I don't remember it being a bad thing, so I guess it's in the top half. There was some stuff I disagreed with, but like the I think the weird thing was like he's one of those people that um, brags about like it took me three years to beat Skyrim. Just couldn't bring myself to do it you know oh was that the guy who we like we did the numbers and he would have had to play for like an hour a month or something like yeah, that. yeah yeah we were we were making jokes because like he was implying that he had been like playing skyrim continuously since the game had come out until the point that he had made the video which is yeah like i don't understand how people can like i'm only going to play two hours of this game that like you know has a lot of story going on I went and watched a couple of the videos you guys were talking about from the Ether Dynamics. It is, in fact, a mod. He even links the mod in his descriptions for other to others to download. Yeah, it's a mod, but it's not a mod in the sense that, like, it adds new assets or changes anything. The interesting part of Ether Dynamics is that it's, like, demonstrating, um, like, if there was just slightly more effort in the, like, level design of areas that you could have interesting AI encounters. It took me three years to rank up from Mythic to Noble in Halo Reach. Well, listen, uh, it took me uh, two years to get Warrant Officer. Did you play Halo Reach? I assume you did. Um, on and off. I really didn't play the multiplayer all that much. I actually got, I was late to the party for Halo Reach. Oh yeah, that's interesting. So I, yeah, yeah I was. I was one of those. You're a pleb who likes uh, Halo too, so. Halo 2 and Halo 3 and stuff, so... You know, Halo 3's... I understand if, why people like <clears throat> Halo 3. But I don't really get Halo 2. Halo 2 has phenomenal map design. It's, in my opinion, just... Head and shoulders above all the other games in terms of map design. And... I used to do a lot of things like glitching and... Like, I, I, there's a lot of other games that I played within Halo 2, so... If you played Halo 2 strictly for the shooting part... It, it got a little bit stale, but Halo. that game was such that game was such a fucking mess in terms of its engine. But people just ran with it. Mm -hmm. Halo Infinite has been a like it's been an interesting story because when when it was new, 
Uh, we were hearing all about how it was changing multiplayer gaming. It was just so popular. <laughs> Halo was back. I, and then, like, it's had, like, a YouTuber-style fall from grace period. Like, yeah. You, like... would, you would think that it had undergone a grooming allegation f from the way that it's really slid off. Yeah, at least, like, Skyrim had, you know, a few years in the sun before that started to happen. Fucking Halo, Halo Infinite, it took about a month and a half. Yeah, I think like the first, the first mainstream kind of criticism of Skyrim was like 2013. And I mean, it, it was obviously like heavily contested. That was the dumbing down yeah. drama. I think it wasn't, it wasn't until like, I don't know, Mr. Caption that um, it really started to be like, become acceptable to like criticize Skyrim. When did Legendary Edition come out? For Skyrim? Yeah. Um, 2013, 2014? Somewhere around there. I don't know. I, I kind of missed Legendary Edition because I had been buying the DLC as it had come out. And then Special... Oh, well, Special... Yeah, no. Yeah. Special Edition... Uh, Was the remaster. I, that was like 2016. Dude, I, I get so fucking confused by these. It really, it, you, you would think, you know, somebody who's spent a lot of time playing these games and, uh, you know, working on videos and stuff that I would at least get this shit straight at this point. Yeah. But even I'm still confused by it. Well, okay. So there's an interesting thing about confusion where like, um, I don't know the pronunciation of Majin Orion because I've like had to correct myself and remind myself so often that now in my head I just think both pronunciations are correct. And so it's like it's pretty easy to like mess up the basic timeline of uh Skyrim coming out. New One Punch Man chapter just dropped 5 minutes ago. Well, that's some timing. Is it the raw or has it been translated? Um, uh, so somebody was mentioning like Halo on PC and how different that makes it. It makes it very different because um, on console, the classic wisdom was like, you should play on heroic. That's the intended difficulty on PC. It's like you should play on legendary. Legendary on PC is heroic on console. Unless unless you're still using a, uh, a controller. That's oh. one of the one of the only games where I'll use a controller because it's just even later, in multiplayer the later ones still... were, were built for it yeah ODST is a ridiculously easy game uh, with a mouse yeah. it's a ridiculously easy game with a fucking controller yeah That's... I would agree ODST is on the easier side a lot of its appeal is like it's it really is the kind of game that you can like put on and vibe to it's a good game, don't get me wrong, but it's that's a game where I was actually able to solo a lot of legendary levels, which I can't mm -hmm. do in almost any other Halo game. I think the hardest parts of ODST are all the levels involving vehicles. Yeah. But with like the brutes, it's just all right, just pla overcharge the plasma shot and then uh, use the BR to take them out. Done. Yeah, I I think ODST not having the elite, not bringing the elites back as enemies was a mistake. I think that was a great opportunity to have the Halo 3 elites be enemies. Removing the elites in general was a mistake. <laughs> like, even in Halo 3, the campaign of Halo 3 mm -hmm. is substantially weaker, I feel, because, because like, of fighting brutes, fighting brutes is just not, fair. it's not as much fun. I, yeah, none of the incarnations of brutes really worked. Uh, it's, there was, like, it's multiple the attempts with... to make it work, and it just doesn't. You know what? People like to people like to shit on the flood, but I feel like the flood in Halo One was at was probably the best version of flood that existed, and it just got progressively worse with each game yeah, until I eventually would, they just stopped including them. I would agree with like the exception of the reanimation mechanic that they had in yeah. Halo Three, or I don't remember if it was in Halo Two, but in Halo Three the flood could like reanimate bodies, and that was really cool. Except there was just there was one variant which they would turn into like these 
spider oh, yeah, things. Oh yeah, the variants. That that was a terrible idea. That yeah, because you would get those giant hulking brute guys who were just giant bullet sponges. The problem was like the variants would just they would just turn into bullet sponges. Yeah, they would turn into whatever was the least convenient for you. Yeah, and then you had the the freaking the spider dudes who would shoot needles. They would climb the walls and then just mm -hmm. shoot needles at you, and they would hunker up if you shot at them. Oh my god. That's why, like, the library is a way better level than, uh... Cortana. Cortana, because yep. even ignoring the meme of everybody hating the, uh, w the forced walking sections, the library's actually a really good level, and I think it just filters like, people. Yeah, I, I actually like the library. <laughs> um, oh my god. I think I like the library more than I like Two Betrayals. I think it's, like, it's the final boss of the game. Because it's it's as far as much of a, at least when it comes to fighting the flood, uh, of a, how good are you? How good are you at fighting the, this enemy type? Yeah. Because it's just combat encounter after combat encounter, and I think that's why I like it. There's no set pieces. Um, There's no vehicles. I, I'm in the minority where I do not like vehicles in the Halo games. I don't think they, Halo Two might have gotten them sort of okay. And Halo Three, but mm -hmm. especially Halo One, I hate the vehicles in Halo One. Well, yeah, the, yeah, because the, they're so rusty um, mechanically. Yeah, the vehicle levels are like a big toss-up, and that's where like yeah. the difficulty can spike because you lose a lot of like the finer control that you have. Yeah, like um, like Halo Two and Delta Halo, you play that on Legendary, and you get in the tank, you're fucked. Well, yeah, you get up that's by the, the, by the time you reach. By the time you reach, like, near the end of the level, your thing is just fucking on fire, and you take one mm -hmm. plasma pistol shot, and the thing blows up. Yeah, like, it's a it's a sign of bad design when literally every Halo vehicle level is better played on foot. <laughs> like, the Menagerie from Halo, from ODST. You're just better off running through that level than you are using Oh, the yeah. Oh, shit. I forgot about that level. <laughs> or, like... Yeah, I mean, the, the tank level from that one is kind of bad, too, because of just how viciously you can get sniped in the back. Actually, I'll give Halo Reach credit. Um, that might actually be the best vehicle levels. Uh, probably. I'm, I'm thinking of, like, the, the Pillar of Autumn level, the first part, where, like, you're driving th through all the scarabs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it... So that was, like... No, that was ODST, the meme of, like, the flying level. I guess, no, Halo 3 had one, too. But Halo Reach had the, uh, the Falcons. Just the Saber, the one in space. Oh, meme. yeah, there was, there was multiple flying levels, because there was the Sabers, <laughs> and then there was the Falcons. Oh, yeah, 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 in the, um... I like that level, I like the aesthetics blast. of that level, but God, are the, the I don't like oh. the Falcons. Oh yeah, they're a nice looking vehicle, and they're probably pre they're pretty cool in multiplayer, but they don't make for a good like single not, player experience. Yeah, not in single player, like, especially maybe, when you're fighting co banshees. When you're fighting banshees and like turrets that can snipe you from like half a mile away, those mm -hmm. things are a pain in the ass. Yeah, like it was way better to use a banshee on that level. Yeah, those are those were fun in multiplayer though. Well, yeah, like invasion on the spire. I don't know if I've ever played, like my my you experience never with Invasion. Halo, not on. I don't think in um, Halo Reach. Invasion was like one of the cool things about Halo Reach, like the it, it was the first stab at like asymmetrical multiplayer in Halo. Oh, well, I guess like, uh, well, no, because Halo was Four it? was like the first official like one to have the flood game mode. Like there was zombie modes before, but that was just like energy swords versus shotguns kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe I did play. In, um, Maybe but, I did play it then in but Halo Reach. Invasion was elites versus Spartans. And it would be like respawn waves and uh, there would be like objectives that like one level. The, so the Spire was the Spartans were attacking the elites and you would go through like three phases. And then I think it's timed against each side's timed against the other. Was it was it like infection style? No, no, no. It was uh, it was like, you know, Spartans versus elites. OK, OK, no, then I probably didn't play that. Because I'm thinking of Infection. But yeah, like, was I, Infection a standalone? 
um, um, playlist in Halo Three? I, probably, yeah. I think it was. it was. It was part of like the uh, like the fun like the fun game modes in Halo Three. Yeah. I think in terms of like the multiplayer, like the shooty shooty bang bang multiplayer, you should play three. If you want to play firefight, you should play ODST, and then if you want to yep. if you want to play like invasion, you should play Reach. Reach also had um, Headhunter. That I remember having some fun yeah. with. Now, I'm, I'm surprised it never came back. That was the first game, too, I think, that had uh, duos. I think. Uh, duos existed in Halo 3. In, no, in Halo 2 as well. Yeah, duos is a fun mode. Yeah, if you get a good teammate anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's what you play when you have a teammate in already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you never did it? You never did it with pubs? Oh, well, man. I... I've done it with pubs, but we, I primarily played it with a friend. Uh, and so, that, yeah. That's where it really shines. It's like, it's a bunch of, it's basically like multiplayer co-op. Yeah, one of my friends, um, he's very good at Halo. So it would be, if I was, see, like, I'm a, I'm a situationally decent Halo player. If I'm on a team that's not too bad, not too good, I'll do fine. But whenever I'm playing with him, he does so fucking well that I do terribly. Mm. Though he'll be like, dude, what? He's like, what's what's wrong with you? How are you so bad? I'm like, dude, you just got 30 kills that match. This is a 50 kill match. Yeah. There's <laughs> always one of those. He plays uh, Apex Legends now, though. Because MCC is... Well, it's MCC. If you want to yeah. play Halo 2 on MCC, you're basically shit out of luck. It's, it's just it, it's Halo Three and Halo Four. That's all that exists on MCC now. Right, and this is a shame because uh, when I was in high school and they first gave us laptops, uh, Halo Combat Evolved actually got passed around because it has a Mac port. Yeah. So it got passed around like through airdrops and stuff, and like everybody was playing in pubs uh, Halo Combat Evolved, and uh, that was a fun time. I, and the thing was like I was already like very familiar with Halo at that point. Like, I was so familiar because Halo 4 had already, like, come out and died that, like, <laughs> I was, like, the old veteran coming back to fight in the war. For us, it was, um, what was this? Counter-Strike before CSGO. Uh, Whatever. 1.6? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's what got passed around in our, in our classes. We had a um, HTML class. I took two classes with this uh, professor or teacher, I should say. Mm. And uh, he just, he would give us like 10 minutes worth of work. And then the rest, the rest, like 30 minutes of the class, everybody would just pull out the thumb drives and just play Counter-Strike. Fucking great. Yeah, Halo 4 was pretty terrible. Like multiplayer campaign, um, pretty much in every aspect, Halo 4 does not shine. Yeah. And then Halo 5 has its fans, but I was very unimpressed. Laptops in high school, how young are you? Uh, that was, so it was my senior year. So, like, we really terrorized them because, um, there were some extremely, like, technologically literate seniors who got those laptops, and the, like, the CTO of the school, uh, could not adapt to, uh, like some of the crazy shit that we were doing like uh, halo being passed around was just like one element of the story <laughs> so my um my cousin he you know he lived he lives in new york city so his high schools were you know pretty well funded it was a private school so they got the laptops thing years years ago and he was put in charge of all that as like a student he worked with the with the um, principal, and he was put in charge of like the deployment of all the laptops and stuff. So he got access to so much shit; it was insane. Mm -hmm. He would he would just get like new laptops all the time and stuff like that. And uh, and he was the one who was in charge of you know setting up all the firewalls and everything. So he had all the codes to get through all of them. <laughs> it's just like that's a that's a pretty nice setup to have for like three years. Yeah, it's fun if you can get in early when the when the teachers are all because the teachers are boomers. They don't really know yeah. like they don't know their way around it. Like 
so the school is going to be trying to like stop the kids from browsing Facebook. And so it's like there's so much you can do. Like uh, for one month, I had a Minecraft server that I would host on my home PC. And so like I would play Minecraft at school and then go home and play Minecraft. <laughs> play, play on the same world. And that's crazy because Minecraft was literally just coming out as I was graduating high school. Getting olds now. Yeah, old old men. Weird <laughs> how time passes. Yeah, right. That's not weird. Uh did you see the JXC video that I had linked in the Discord? Do you, do you keep up with the reaction drama? Nah. Oh, I was hoping you did. Try and keep my life as drama free as possible. Actually, it's really because I'm just. Well, I, I think a lot that's sad. I'm looking. I'm <laughs> looking for a partner, a rival in drama, uh, but no, nobody that I want to have drama with reciprocates my feelings. <laughs> Well, you gotta well first first off you gotta be on Twitter a lot more <coughs> you gotta you gotta turn Twitter into your full-time job mm -hmm. I guarantee you in a week you'll find that drama well I mean I don't know drama against Nick is like a pretty low bar you know I, I might as well <laughs> settle for like having an Acer Thorn rivalry at that point didn't Nick uh, go offline for a while he's offline now his account's gone Oh shit, really? Yeah, and I hadn't I hadn't kept up with him in a while, so I don't know what happened. I don't know if there was like if he had a big meltdown, if he like got into another drama or like he found out that like I had screenshot like 500 of his tweets <laughs> and like been <laughs> been posting them. Um because th this guy fascinated me. <coughs> he was like an inner he was like the stereotype he... of people who would come north on the weekends from California. <laughs> he was the embodiment of a uh, full-time Twitter user. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just kind of sad. It was sad the same way that like Acer Thorn was sad. Um, all I, The credit I can give Acer Thorn is that he got into this before uh, March of 2020. I think that's a big like a big litmus test for content creators. It's like, were they content creators before... Uh, March of 2020. <laughs> I think you weren't, were you? Nope. I started in like June of 2020. You see? You said, I got all this spare time. Not really. It was um because I got tired of my job and I just stepped down to part time. So I guess in a way, COVID did. Oh, you, were you tired of your job because of it? Oh, pretty much, yeah. Okay, yeah. See? Um, so I, I stepped down to part-time after I got off of vacation. So why'd you start with Oblivion? Uh, because I loved Oblivion, and I was like, I know I, I can talk about that game a lot, and also Will loves video uh, video games' video. Mm -hmm. I watched that, and then I sent it to my friend, and I was like, I really like this video, but he missed some parts like he didn't even get into shivering isles it's like i i wonder if i could do a better video than him my well, friend's like yeah just do it that's such a weird thing like so with oblivion it's shivering isles with um with morrowind it's blood moon and with skyrim it's dragonborn of like things that Fall people off. don't people things Fall that for is also far harbor yeah it's, it's like it... <laughs> expansions that people don't talk about because it would defeat their points in the video although like so Joseph Anderson's the Fallout 4 guy, right? But he did actually yeah. talk about Far Harbor in a big way and how, like, it was a demonstration that, like, Bethesda wasn't totally incompetent. And I, I feel like that's something that's missing from a lot of the discourse. Like, if you don't talk about Dragonborn, then, it, I don't know, it seems kind of disingenuous. Like, there's no excuse for it. it. It comes with every version of the game now. Well, I th what I think it does, what those expansions do, is it proves that... Um, it proves that Bethesda <laughs> are aware of the design choices that they're making, that mm -hmm. their games are intentionally designed the way they are. Right. And then they make the, they make the, I, so I don't know if 
they make the expansions like Dragonborn as a result of people's criticism or I, to cater to the older audience. Like, I think that's hey, the... Marwin fans, here's mm -hmm. Shivering Isles or something like that. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a bit of both because um, you can, like, probably watch a bunch of videos of the era and see like the responses to the criticism in dragonborn like oh you want to see puzzle designs that are more complicated than just spin the pillar okay here's this sword that uh shoots lasers yeah but then it's like but then the next game comes out and then we're back to square one like yeah if, if we had the quality of dragonborn in fallout 4 it would fallout be a whole different 4 thing been, yeah so it's like i don't know it's hard it's really hard to say what's going on when it comes to what's intentional what's not intentional i almost that's feel why like, i always i almost feel like todd it this might be a case of like so todd and like emil when they're working on shivering isles they're working on fallout 3 right so it's yeah. like daddy's out of the room let's let's do the shit that we actually want to do so maybe it's a case of like the people who work on expansions aren't having to deal with the same level of oversight it's possible it might also it could also have to do with um maybe more flexible release schedules because you can see it i i noticed this with um with mass effect 3 with the citadel dlc in terms of quality and production value, that thing's off the charts compared to the base game. And it's and the same case of like responding to criticism too, isn't it? Because it, it uh, resolves the, a bunch, it resolves stuff, and for the most part, I think it, it's it's hard to say. Mass Mass Effect's a it's an interesting game. I really feel like we need more people making videos on that franchise. So I, I'm going to ask you. Um, do you regret not like establishing at the start of your Mass Effect series that like you're synopsizing the playthrough because you're doing like the weird choices? Um, kind of. It didn't really occur to me that that's what I was doing. To be perfectly frank, so I'm working on and no guarantees that this is actually going to come to fruition. I'm just testing it right now. Mm -hmm. But I want to do a super cut of one, two, and three all in one video. But I have, like, the final runtime for that's like 13 hours, so obviously I have to cut it down. So I'm going through my Mass Effect 1 video right now, and it's fucking rough, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, there's a lot, a lot of synopsis. Literally, one of my notes for, like, when I did, when I covered Pharos, one of my notes is, talk about something. <laughs> I want to go through and add maybe a little bit extra content mm -hmm. while cutting down oh, a lot on the fluff it definitely felt like it was getting better as time went on and i don't th i don't think it's particularly unreasonable i mean the same thing happened with the morrowind video i reworked part two when it came yeah. time to do the full uh project i also i also seem to have a problem when it comes to talking about games that i really like where i have trouble coming up with like worthwhile analysis mm -hmm. so there's things that like i can i want to go back and talk about with mass effect one like i want to talk about combat and stuff like that and um so going back to your original question the mass effect one video was almost like it, it was a different philosophy of for video making that i had at the time where it was more like this is just i'm, I'm trying to think of the continuity was that after i we met so we met about like April right or after May. I finished. Well, I didn't really start getting deep into your community and stuff like that and your content until I was right about finishing up writing that script for Mass Effect One. So if you see Mass Effect Two, I there's a lot more analysis, and that's because mm -hmm. I realized, uh, yeah, I probably should be doing more analysis in a video that's you know analysis. Uh, okay, that was just the other thing I was gonna ask. You didn't really talk about a lot of stuff like the uh, the Javik DLC, it being like day one DLC, and that being an in effect. I think you mentioned it with Kasumi, but not with Javik of like people missing that content because it had been like cut off of the game and and sold. Yeah. So the reason I didn't get into it is because I. I was really trying to avoid getting into a lot of the controversies because if I bring up Javik, then I have to bring up 
the three other major controversi controversies surrounding the game especially and that would mean the ending i would have to talk for like three hours straight about just the star child and that whole thing i don't, I don't think that's necessarily true it, it that's that's how i felt that's how i approached it mm. um going back once so there's another video that i'm also kind of working on with as like a follow-up and so what i do regret with the javik thing is that i didn't do my research deep enough because i found that jeff Keeley did a whole like post-mortem on mass effect 3 and it's like a, about two hours of just extra content that explains what actually happened with javik that he was originally intended to be part of the base game but they ran out of time, so they cut it down. They removed a bunch of like his parts in the main story. They moved the uh, so like Cerberus attacking the Citadel was supposed to happen like near the very end of the game, because uh, the loser sense. man finds out. Yeah, he finds out that it's the catalyst, so he's like, "Oh shit, I gotta go take it." Mm -hmm. So I didn't notice. I didn't know any of that until I was almost done editing the video. So there's a lot of shit that I want to just go back to and cover a little bit extra i don't think it's going to change my mm -hmm. my end uh like theories basically or any of my you're saying you're feelings. gonna you're gonna patch the video kind of yeah that, that's become more common over the years and i'm not sure how i feel about it and i say that as somebody who's like guilty of doing it um i was gonna address this in the chance in the chat was it a conscious choice to do your long videos in one part instead of multiple eg eight hour eight one hour Morrowind videos released as they were finished versus how you actually did it so um if you don't know because the videos aren't public anymore they're unlisted you can still find them but they're not public uh the Morrowind video had come out in uh seven parts and then the eight part eight was going to be the conclusion and I decided to like basically combine them all into one now um I had learned from the Fury series to not pull the trigger on doing a project until most, like, most if not all of the script is done. So it's just sort of been, like, an evolution in sort of my philosophy when it comes to video creating. Um, but yeah, I still think it's a good thing to, like, have the script done before you commit to having a long project, even if you're going to release it in parts. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't announce a video until the script is almost completely done. Yeah. Because I was working, actually, so I was working on a Valheim video, um, and I finalized the script, recorded the audio, started cutting the audio, and then I realized I don't like this, so I'm going to rewrite it. It's only like a 20-minute video, but still. So. Well, I saw you changed your profile picture to a Valheim character. Yeah, because that's because I was like, oh, shit, I'm on track to basically finish this by the weekend. So let me mm -hmm. start, you know, hinting at it. And then I realized it's like, eh, it's a bit too not really the direction I wanted to go with it. So I'm going to rewrite it. I had actively not watched any of the parts because I wanted to watch it in one sitting. I if you're referring to me, that would put you in a camp of like 30 people. So I'm kind of I'm kind of skeptical. It's not impossible, but, like, since I've blown up as a creator, most of the old people I saw on the channel I haven't really, like, encountered or interacted with. So let's kind of let's kind of get the show rolling on this. Um, you can feel free to pause it if you have anything to, like, comment on. All right. So uh, this is Kretosis' video. Now, why I decided to stream this now of all times was that uh, yesterday we finished Acer Thorns bit and uh to help acer thorn out with <coughs> with dealing that there's a 12 hour stream in about two hours of his video uh, i was gonna i'm gonna do the same thing for the guy that he is in the most beef with so A Skyrim video that starts with uh, a Morrowind <laughs> Mar track. <laughs> that's already a shot across the bow. Well, yeah, that's good. That's going to be... I'm guaranteed there's at least one person in the comments that's like, you're just a Morrowind fan because, like, they're going to extrapolate it entirely. Like, even without saying anything, 
uh, they've already said something just with the See, choice in music. So my read on Kratosis is that he actively encourages those sorts of comments. He seems the kind of guy who relishes in like pissing off the the annoying people who just have like pedantic arguments to make. I think that's a side effect of being in the Fallout community. Yeah. <laughs> like that's just a coping mechanism. It is so true. is this this is the Rayloff smile, smile moment. So this is part one of five. We, this they've only reached the first part, right? Yeah, I think they were. I don't know if they're if they're waiting on me, or um. But they did say that like, my criticisms were going to like influence it, which is. Um, uh, they're gonna be waiting a while then. Well, I mean, like it's happening now. They were. I hope they weren't like actually waiting on it though, because I would have delayed the project a couple months. <laughs> My last thing I needed is to insult fans who, who aren't even mine. <coughs> Honestly, better than starting with Skyrim music to tug at the viewer's heartstrings. No, I'm not. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying that there is like a statement that's being made that some people are going to pick up on. Um. So I know that Setch is in the chat. Like, what's the extent of the kind of collaboration that goes on here? Because uh, I, I would be interested in like, um, like, what's the writing process? Do you guys alternate parts? Do you guys like edit each other's work? Um, do you like collaborate on every sentence? That sort of thing. Because I feel like it isn't really like collaborative work on YouTube isn't really something that's like talked about from a behind the scenes perspective. So, would you consider it a bad idea to do that on purpose? I no, I would just say that like there is um, it's not a bad idea, but it is something that like if you're conscious of, you can either use to your advantage or avoid doing because you don't want the downside. Ten years. It's been ten years since Skyrim first released. Don't remind me. Uh, so it's standard edition. Is it standard edition? No, wait. Special edition starts desaturated too, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. You have to wait. We'll find out in about 15, 20 seconds right. when it's they like get right, down the road. It's right right before you get to Helgen that like you can tell that it's special edition. Yeah, because the clouds begin to part. Do you think that was intentional? On Bethesda's uh, a, part, like something they thought about. I imagine so because it's def they had to have scripted <coughs> that um, that weather because it's consistent. So there had to have been some sort of decision there to be like, oh yeah, start it when it's cloudy, and then they get close to mm -hmm. get your execution to get sunny, which is I don't even know how to read into that. Yeah, what what's the intended kind of meaning like what, i assume the yeah. idea is like oh you're waking up and the world's gradually becoming more saturated but it doesn't take that long and i thought i'd cover it for its 10th anniversary because well there's been criticism of skyrim none of the ones i've seen. oh yeah there's been there's been a lot of it i got a whole spreadsheet of it i was thinking about like uh like oversaturation of like the skyrim topic and I mean, obviously, there's a perspective of, like, there's so few people that do it right that, like, it's not really oversaturated. It just seems that way. But, yeah, there is a lot. I've seen really go as deep as I'd like. This is the first part in a five-part series. In part one, I'll mostly be covering the mechanical aspects of the game, such as the character build, combat, and so forth. Part two we will cover the main story in the Civil War. Okay, so, um, it is a bit, like, I've kind of figured you don't want to, like, say up front, like, what the parts are, because the, the intro is where you want to be, like, the most economical with what you're saying. Um, so that's the guy who starts his videos with a five-minute well, explanation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, like, so, in my Morrowind video, in the first like draft I did this where I explained what each part was going to be and then I was like 
This isn't particularly interesting, and I don't, I don't think that people would particularly care that, like, oh, yeah, part four is going to be about the story or whatever, right? Like, it's, it's, yeah, they can always, it's fine if you want to structure that, it that way. That's what that's what chapters are really for, anyhow. Yeah, I have and to wonder if this, was, if this was written... No, chapters had to have been a thing when this was written. But it might have been, like, new or something. Is Oxhorn still on his thing? Part 3 will cover the four factions. Part 4 will cover the side quests and daedric quests. And part 5 will cover the DLCs. So is that by implication like an 80 minute section on the side quests and Daedra? Yeah, I, I don't know. This is, see this is, um, this is why I get really, uh, why I turn away from breaking my own videos up into parts because there's just cert like certain parts in like the Mass Effect 3 video where it's just, it's a five minute discussion on something. There's mm -hmm. no reason to really get deeper into it. So if I was to commit each part to, you know, different video and stuff, it would, some parts would be an hour long, other parts mm -hmm. would be 20 minutes long. Yeah, the great inequality in topics. That's like one of the big challenges of it, structuring is finding yeah. places for everything. And if I'm breaking it up, I'm going to feel obligated to pad things out. Which well, padding is, is a good thing. <laughs> Except when it isn't. Kratosis wanted to ensure people knew what the parts were since he normally wouldn't talk about mechanics at all. Originally, part one was going to start the story. I mean, as, as true as that is, I'm thinking about this from a this is the first video that somebody's going to see of yours kind of perspective. So my philosophy is whenever you're whenever you're doing a video, write mm -hmm. the first three minutes as if the, the audience has never seen one of your videos before. Yeah, that's always a... try and put your best foot forward every single shot you got. Yeah, um, that's why with the Oblivion video, I like I fake out the that I'm going to do the introduction and start with like a minute or two of like pretending that it's the real video, which I consider the introductions to be the real video. Like I'm going to have a bit like you think you're not watching the video, but you already are or something like that. With yeah, the, like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. You already are meme. Because I do think it's a weird thing that, like, people think that the introductions aren't the video. Even though I, I consider them to absolutely be. Well, I put, that's where I put my thesis, usually, so... Yeah, like, my thesis statement's, like, the last sentence of the first subsection. Yeah. And that's... Oh, what was it? See, I don't know off so, the top of my head, so I gotta look. I'm gonna... I, I came to this conclusion... Uh, actually, earlier today when I was in the shower, I'm going to stop calling them introductions. I'm going to start calling them openers because mm -hmm. introduction has a connotation that's just, oh, yeah, I don't, this is just, you know, fluffy information that I don't need. Right. Like the old conventional wisdom that, like, you should skip to, like, the 30% into the video. And it's like, well, that would be, like, three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I am I am a an archer of video essays. I see a lot. Um, I have a community around me that does it, you know, it is something that I think about and it's something that like I've adapted, I've been adapting my strategy to just make it work better. The goal of this video is simple, to demonstrate the impact the 2006 launch date and goal will be an, an early 7th generation console release had on the overall Elder Scrolls formula, which I think I, I was not as loyal to my thesis statement as Acer Thorn, but my thesis was better than his. It was learned when working for the Angry Joe show and MMO Grinder as scriptwriter and editor, but I also didn't want to step on Kree's toes at all. It is his channel. You worked for Angry Joe? Did you work on the Skyrim video? <laughs> <laughs> that would make you a local celebrity. As much as I'd like to tear into the main story and world building right away, it's necessary to discuss the mechanical aspects of the game first, as they end up impacting the overall experience. Now to get this out of the way immediately, we are not telling you that you aren't allowed to like or even love. I like the timing of that. Like, how do you think they did that? Do you think they recorded the section to be the right length, or that they like edited to edited it to be the right length? Uh, it looked like it was just recorded that way. Um. 
Do you think it's necessary to talk about mechanics first with Skyrim? Me personally, uh, I would start with mechanics. I like to start with mechanics with just about any game. That's what Salt Factory started with. And it's kind of what Mr. Caption did. And it's kind like, is it, why is that the intuitive thing to do? I, j I think it's probably because if you're looking at like a bunch of gameplay and stuff on screen, mm -hmm. there's going to be it, it, like questions that you think the audience has. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of like part of it. It's just like if you're sitting there staring at the most common thing, which is going to be fighting or, you know, whatever else. Angry Joe's shite was uh, blistered thumbs, right? That's like a, that's a blast from the past. I never read that site. I had only heard about it in Infamy, of like the channel Awesome, uh, Circle of Dr of Hell, basically. Love Skyrim. We aren't some weirdos that want to destroy you for liking something we think is objectively bad. You see, it's a weird thing to say, right? Because oh, hang on. Okay, so the notepad's a bit weird because, like, um, because of the, like, differences in the way this, these, this site's laid out. I don't think there's, the audience should be, like, broken of the assumption that there are people out there that are, like, out to get them for their opinions. Yeah. I, I don't like calling attention to it. It should be assumed at this point that either, you know... If I am one of those people that's going to be spewing hate just to make you feel bad, you should be able to pick up on it pretty quickly. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be... I shouldn't have to sit there and flag it. Well, like, not even Acer Thorn's that bad. At least when it came to Skyrim. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I don't think Acer Thorn... In fairness, I haven't seen, like, the Fallout or Dark Souls videos, but I don't know if he's... If he attacks people for their opinions. And whether or not they like the game. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't recall anybody that I've seen recently anyway. Maybe back in 2011, 2012, I would see oh, people yes, who... Oh, yes, like, would... Sammy Online would def is definitely, like, an example of somebody who... I think is insulting people for their opinions on the game. Yeah. But that would be, like, the exception, like, of the Skyrim videos I've seen. Uh... Well, Dime Tree's a bit like that, but I think that was just his personality. He was, like, just trying to be, like, a smooth-talking kind of guy. Like, I'm quippy. I am, uh... <coughs> you know, I'm witty. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut Angry Joe, because he gave the game a 10 out of 10. That last part is important. Object oh, right. Objectively bad. It doesn't mean you can't have subjective feelings or baggage that you bring along to the table that makes it special to you. Was Skyrim the first game you played with your father or mother, or brother or sister? Did Skyrim help you escape from a more cruel situation in the world? Well, those are things that make it subjectively special to you. We don't want to take those memories and experiences from you. I do. I'm going to take away your <laughs> special <laughs> connections to Skyrim. What I also don't like about this approach is that it almost sounds like you're playing gatekeeper. It's like, uh, I'm giving you permission to like the game. It's like, thank you. If, even when you're saying, you know, I, I just, I'm just putting my opinions out there. I just like the game. Everybody can like the game and stuff. It's just like. I, this... Okay, so it looks like Acer Thorn got like worse with time. I didn't really notice it in the Skyrim video, and I think it is it really is a case of like some people probably made fun of him after the Skyrim video and like he started like he started bringing that negativity to his projects. I was thinking about that after the stream like he's stuck in a feedback loop. It's not well, we a, are not a good to place to be. Yeah, you should not be on YouTube the if old, the old that's... name Nick the old nickname Nick level of hell. Yeah. ...is to objectively look at Skyrim, what it actually has in its gameplay, in its story, in its world, 
or in many cases, what it is missing from all of those and critique that. Is the video quality a bit scuffed for you? Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm wondering if that's watch, uh, uh, yeah, watch together. I, I, I'm uncertain if it's watch together or uh, the actual video proper. I'm gonna look at it's. I'm gonna look at it on my other browser. It's watchable for me. Like it's fine, but. Oh yeah, that might be a thing that people keep bringing it's up to me. Is like, uh, Acer Thorn, I guess, becomes less cordial if he doesn't like the game. Option. In truth, you really want to try and avoid getting into. I think it's watched together. Possible. I love how him rushing through the intro faster than intended. It completely messes up the scripted events. Yeah, if um, I had an interesting thing on one playthrough where. Um, I managed to, like, get attached to Alduin on the tower sequence. So, like, when he flew away, I went with him for a little bit. It didn't... It wasn't very far. It wasn't, like, a speedrun strat, but... Um, you can absolutely, like... This is, intro sequence is too reliant on, like, timings. I mean, I guess the alternative yeah. is, like... They, it, it could be worse. They could throw in invisible walls and, like, force you to watch the sequence where the dragon breathes fire at the kid. Yeah, they could have put it all on rails. I, I actually appreciate that I can run through most of this in, mm -hmm. you know, 15 minutes. What if there was, like, a secret back door where, like, you could just jump out of the, uh, out of the wall and escape? And that was, like, an intentional thing. That would be great. Did you watch the Nocturnal Rambler video on Skyrim yet? I did not. Is that, is that the one that had jumped up, like, 100,000 views? I think it is. Ooh, what? We got a viral no. Skyrim video? No, sorry, it, it wasn't. Uh, now I'm curious which one it was. It's one of these guys that was at, uh, like, around 30k. I wish... I don't know if, um... Because I use a spreadsheet. And you can, like, you can do cool stuff with spreadsheets, like auto-pull. It was, uh, Genji. Uh, like auto pull like stock data and what have you. I don't know if you can like use the a YouTube API to like pull view counts so it would update. Ooh, it might. Um, what are you using? Excel or uh, like Google spreadsheets? Google, yeah, Google Docs. Mm -hmm. There, this pro if it exists, it would probably be a third party thing. Yeah, because like I would be interested in tracking like the view counts over time of of these Skyrim videos. I wonder, like, hang on, I'm gonna check G-Man's Skyrim video just because I'm curious if, like, I send stuff his way. Not really. That feels like, that feels like something Social Blade should invest in. Make some sort of, like, uh, dashboard for tracking, stuff like that. I think there is. I don't, I don't think it goes that deep, though. Yeah, I mean, You can track channels, but you can't track, like, individual videos or anything, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I have Fudge's video on the list. If they have, like, more than... If they have more than, like, 20,000 views, there's a really good chance that I already have it. It's like the, the guys that are around, like, one to 5,000 views. Those are the ones that are, like, kind of obscure. Like, there was one last stream that I found while doing the stream. It is just unfortunate we have seen Bethesda's trend of dumbing their games down further and further. Oh no, he said the words. <laughs> Almost like... I like the idea of doing compilations of stuff that people say and... Um, dumbing down is one of those things because it, it's like... It's a shame that conversation has like so, permeated the, um, the dialogue. It is... It's it's interesting to see what uh, topics get picked up on. Uh, like my favorite, seeing everybody who brings up all the stuff like Mr. B Tongue did, like his um, shandification. Yeah, shandification and everything. I just see that the most just... influential video essayist, Mr. <laughs> B Tongue. And then he left. Mhm. Mm I've noticed, what? like, I've started to, like I was doing the War World of Warcraft thing, and I've noticed that like. They were suddenly doing shantification around that time period. So I have to wonder, like... Because uh, that would be, like, Mist of Pandaria. 
and they absolutely do that in that in that ex expansion oh, yeah which pan by the way mist of pandaria is making the video very difficult because it fucking sucks <laughs> like it has earned its reputation as a bad expansion warlords of draenor is like a way more tolerable experience like it actually has some really cool zones and then like uh pandaria is just like it's offensive it's offensively bad do you know about like warcraft stuff um i played world of warcraft classic and mm -hmm. like burning crusade a like, little bit of wrath in the era where I okay so in the era so you have in a the era in the era but it was it was private servers so oh okay yeah okay so mist of pandaria was like it wasn't a it was not the change in design philosophy but it was definitely like the first symptom that things were changing for the worst um everybody points out like the oh it's pandering to asian audiences i think it goes farther than that it's not it's like it would be like me saying i'm go i really want to attract an american audience so i dress up a bunch of characters in like pilgrims outfits and like <laughs> talk about how their culture is like eating hamburgers and you know what i mean like i'm not big on getting offended on behalf of other people but it's like offensive to it's offensive it to me I think Warlords of Draenor literally only has a bad reputation because of its end game. Like, its leveling zones are actually kind of cool. Like, Outland's a really cool area. Or not Outland, but Draenor. And we have found Skyrim to be especially lacking in quality. Skyrim. What's with the pause? You ever added an awkward pause to the middle of your video? I used to. Oh God! Speaking of the Mass Effect One video, there were. That was back when I wouldn't cut many of the breaths out of my uh, takes. Mm -hmm. Oh no. Oh. Oh, because I was like, I was like, well, you know, it does help pace out the audio. So my it makes my makes my voice sound a little less monotonous, which it does. It helps make it sound less monotonous, but it just makes right. it harder to follow here's how patrician tv does the, the timing on his sentences you listen to the sentence and after it ends when you think the next sentence should start you hit spacebar so you pause and you cut there and then you bring the next sentence to that point and it works with like 99 percent effectiveness yeah it sounds better than what i do which is just going by ear i also try and cut audio as fast as possible I heard people pa hated monks. Um, yeah, I was trying to play a monk, and it's not a very fun class. It looks fun, but it's not. Uh, Demon Hunter's a lot more. Spacebar, so you pause. Yes, yeah, spacebar's pause in, in Premiere and Audition and what have you. But yeah, so it would be like, um, did that go back for you? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, it would Bethesda's be like, trend of dumbing their you wait for the end of the sentence games down further and further and we have found Skyrim to be especially lacking in quality all right so this is where I think the next sentence should start yeah so you just hit spacebar as soon as you think it, th it should start cut it bring it forward Skyrim is and like oh that. yeah that is now, there might be that, like that. <laughs> there might be like an intentional thing that they're trying to do there but generally speaking that's like my philosophy for uh, timing sentences like you don't go with the timing that you have in the recording because you should leave spaces between every sentence in your recording oh yeah absolutely if i my recording so like if i do a 40 minute long recording session that usually results in maybe 20 minutes of actual audio mm -hmm. usually less it's like 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent actually makes it through well the good thing about pausing mm -hmm. like so can you edit video by sight or edit audio by sight yet yeah yeah I, I so that's like a really cool thing that you kind of pick up with experience is being able to edit your audio without actually listening to it yeah <laughs> doing that and also editing at like 4x speed i do that a lot too well that's the thing about pauses is that you might not even realize when you're working on the videos that like it happened but yeah that, that's a really big pause 
So, you know, it happens. Is he timing it to the video footage? So he did it earlier, and it was like when he was doing the console commands to change the guy's scale. And I think that pause was intentional because he started talking as soon as he closed the console. But I'm not sure what this one is timed to. It's without a doubt, the most successful Elder Scrolls game to date. Having been ported to just about every console and re-released so many times it's become a joke that even Bethesda has taken part in. Introducing Skyrim, very special edition. Also coming soon to Etch-A-Sketch, Motorola Pagers, oh, shit. and your- You can't include this much amount of, like, cringe. You gotta cut this down. <laughs> <laughs> Had I miss that the first time you edited it? There's sometimes when you like edit the same part over and over, it you like miss things that like as soon as it's published you notice. Oh god. For me it's titles. I misspelled Leviathan in one of my titles in Mass Effect 3 and it fucking killed me. You don't know how to spell Leviathan? No, I only spelt it 50 times while writing the mm -hmm. script. Yeah, it's like Yeah, and it's like the script editor will tell you like yeah. Hey, dumbass, he spelled it wrong. But, you know, video editing software does not spell check. I think it was just an oversight. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens a lot. But this is, like, this is too much cringe. Your Samsung Smart Refrigerator. He's slim noose. However. Oh, at least he did cut. He did cut it. All right. <laughs> it, the best part about that section is that it ended. <laughs> I have to wonder if, like, the decision to do that was, uh, like, some fucking jaded marketing rep. Like, that's a that sounds like a Pete Hines thing. Dude, imagine, imagine being Bethesda, where it's like, they can literally get away with doing that shit. People continue to buy it. Mm -hmm. People will make fun of it. They themselves can make fun of it and be like, hey, guys, isn't it ironic? But, um, no, seriously, just buy our game again. Mm -hmm. And it's what a what a racket, what a great position to be in. If I was Bethesda, I'd be doing the same thing. Yeah, sad but true. This Take one the money where you can. This one on the bingo card. What you mean, cringe? No, I don't think. Very few people have mentioned the very special edition, so it, it's not a common enough kind of cut to put on the bingo card. Will dumbing down be on the bingo card? The point is that it's cringe, but you don't need, like, you don't need the full cringe, right? You only need, you know, Dumbing Down will be on the bingo card, probably. But yeah, you don't need full cringe. Like, even a second of that is potent enough <laughs> to, to elicit a response. <laughs> so you guys must just be, like, uh, inoculated to cringe. It's worth mentioning up front that just because something is successful does not mean it's good. Yeah, it's interesting, um... How many people don't understand appeal to popularity fallacy? How, like, just, yeah, but also, appeal to popularity fallacy, uh... It cuts both ways. Yeah, it cuts both ways. Like, just because something's popular doesn't mean it's bad, it also doesn't mean it's good. Skyrim is a game with many issues that will be discussed at length through the course of this analysis series. Now, how could such a beloved game really be so bad? Uh, it's pretty easy. Have you ever heard of Call of Duty? I know this is setting up a hyper. Hey, man. COD 4. Hey, I was... man. <laughs> I loved getting spawn camped on block. No, it's about it's about time to cover a Call of Duty game. I think... <laughs> black Ops would probably be next. There's no way that, like... I'm sorry, black I can't Ops stand one. Modern Warfare 3. It's gotta be Black Ops 1. I actually, I actually kind of like Modern Warfare 3. How? I liked, I liked its multiplayer. It was all right. Well, its multiplayer is a whole other thing. Uh, the only part of Modern Warfare 3 I liked was the the poster that they put out. Uh, like the promotional poster of the Time... Or was it Time... Is it... Yeah, it's Time Magazine. And it's like... It has the Invasion of New York art. And it looks really cool. Like, I had that framed on the wall for a while. That's how cool it looked. God. I don't even remember Modern Warfare Three's story. I think I might have played it once. The when I talk about Call, when like I talk a, about Call of Duty, it's I'm like the aftermath of the Russian invasion of America. Was that the? 
Was it Modern Warfare 2 or 3 that had, like, the Eminem song when everybody's fighting on, like, the fucking lawn of the, what's it called? White House. That... It's like a trailer. Oh, if it's a trailer, then I wouldn't know. I was gonna say, I don't remember that from the game, but... No, Modern, no, Warfare like did, Modern Warfare 2 did have the White House, so... Yeah, I think it was... Yeah, so I don't even remember what the fuck Modern Warfare 3... Oh, was Modern Warfare 3 the mission? It's, like, it, they had a mission where you're, like, stuck in a fucking gas station? I think so. No, that's... Or is that uh, Modern Warfare 2 again? God, it, all blends, it all blends together. <laughs> Modern Warfare 2 is the one where you, like... You uh, watch Price and the, and the general guy, like, have a fist fight while you're yeah, playing yeah, out. Yeah. In, the, in a sandstorm. Did I even play the story for, Mass for Modern Warfare 3? Like, like 90% of these Skyrim videos would be so much better without the intro. It, well, introductions are always the hardest part. Like, yeah. I'm not even good at introductions. Um, it's just, like, it's really awkward to kind of interface with people. It takes time to build a vibe. Unless you're known for your vibe. Like, really yeah. well-established YouTubers well, can yeah, get like, away with a lot in their introductions. Well, yeah, literally, hey, hey, people. That That's all yeah, Seth has exactly. to say. <laughs> and you're and you're back into it. How does Mandalore start? Uh, does Mandalore oh, yeah, have a such start? Well, he usually starts with like I like Mandalore's introduction because he starts with a clip from the game that's mm -hmm. just entertaining, but also like indicative of some point that he's gonna make with the video. Yeah, I don't like I did, I, I however do not like Mandalore's like his logo as it pops up. I'm not the biggest <laughs> fan of like his branding. Well, there could be any number of reasons for that, but I think the easiest explanation is that most audiences simply aren't too critical of the media they consume. Oh, well, we don't have to speculate about that. I think most <laughs> analysts aren't, aren't critical <laughs> of the media they consume. At least when it comes to Skyrim. Yeah, especially when it comes to Skyrim. Because again, I think Skyrim is really good at seeming like an innocent easy game it's a baby's game yeah babies can play it and it's like that's true but it doesn't mean that like it's a game with zero depth which i think is like an annoying common trend of uh skyrim videos is to like to say it has no depth and it's like no 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 this pool's no. fucking deep this iceberg goes down far as long as something smells nice on the surface most people will miss the stench of rot deep beneath I also think people have become so used to modding their games to hell and back that they forgot what the base game is actually like. I absolutely agree with this sentiment. Um, <laughs> I find it a really accurate assessment. There, there were some things, some mods that I installed for Skyrim that I would not uninstall for years. And then when I finally started playing Vanilla again, I was like, oh, fuck, that was a mod. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like... I don't think, like, I think just, this is something just, that not even a lot of people are thinking about when it comes to their own I, analysis of Skyrim. I challenge everybody in this audience who actually wants to play Skyrim uh, to play it, but don't install um, SkyUI. Yes. Um, that That's a... Yeah. <laughs> it's a trip. <laughs> you it, will it, it's be like amazed. It, it's like its own challenge figuring out efficient ways to use the UI without SkyUI. Oh, dude. Just, just the storage containers. Just mm -hmm. storage containers. Just yeah, it's like there's no way they they didn't have that issue in QA testing. Um, I have to wonder how many people don't mention like the Delphine Parthenex thing because they played with the Parthenex dilemma mod. Like they might not even realize that like that's something they should talk about. I wouldn't even play Skyrim without mods. If I didn't do this as a job, I wouldn't play Skyrim without mods. I gotta hard disagree with that. On, I don't think this game has that much depth. It has the illusion of depth, but it doesn't go anywhere. I'm talking like in terms of analysis and stuff. I agree that it's like extremely mechanically simple. Um, but I think that like it's very easy to be to be wrong in your analysis because you just don't realize like how deep it goes like you pull an acer thorn and like don't even read the cutting room floor and realize that like the civil war is mostly cut content like i think there's more cut missions for the civil war than there are actual missions in the game 
and I'd argue this is true for most Bethesda games at this point. Seriously, the amount of work that goes into the unofficial Skyrim patch cannot be understated. It's true. They gotta, yeah, they, they gotta change all those things. About still them. patching it to this day. They, they gotta change things that weren't broken. It fixes so many issues with the base game that it's safe to say that Also, I really hate Whiterun with trees. I don't yeah. know why people do this. Whiterun well, does, doesn't have... This, like, this, it's notable there's attribute. There's no trees. It's notable no attribute trees is that the <laughs> one tree in the city is the Gilder Green. <laughs> like, that, that's the thing. How do you fuck that up? But, but there's also no trees around the city. It's in the yeah. middle of plains. Why would there be trees? It's it just bothers me when people add trees to their white run. When you say vanilla does not include the anniversary DLC or no, so for me it will. However, I have playthroughs of the I have playthroughs of everything that didn't include anniversary edition. So, well, I guess not the College of Winterhold, but that's not a big deal. That by using this mod alone you are no longer having the vanilla Skyrim experience. The UESP has documented nearly 800 pages of things within the game that have fixes thanks to the unofficial Skyrim patch, and keep in mind that many of these pages include more than a single fix. While some fixes can seem minor, like assigning the wrong sleeping arrangements to the wrong person, which can cause the AI to hang, others are absolutely catastrophic, like having perks not actually work if you play the wrong fucking race. Yeah. But there's also like I think there were perk changes with the unofficial patch that I like heavily disagreed with. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think that the Necromage perk is a bug where it makes vampire magic more powerful? Um if it was a bug <sighs> No, I don't think it was a bug. I don't think it was a bug either. I think that um, there's some level of like intentional, maybe not intentional, like, you know, there was somebody who hard fought for that because it's magic and there's nobody at Bethesda who cares about magic, but. Well, aside from being stupid, Oblivion Gates and Cities broke all city mods. Yeah, that's, yeah. City, like, you have to disclose that you've changed something in the city because there are so many things that do. But also, like, why would there be Oblivion Gates in all the cities? Wouldn't the cities have been destroyed then? Like, that doesn't make sense from a lore perspective. The mentality of, mods will fix it, has become so ingrained into the minds of Bethesda fans that it's been a fairly common defense for these games from criticism. Oh, but I, I have it on good authority that this isn't true. From good old Acer Thorn. What did, I'm trying to recall what exactly he said. I don't know, it was kind of unmemorable, but it was not based. Was that during the, the stream last night? Yeah, or, that, uh... that was towards the tail end of the stream. He had a section on... On mods. Oh, on the mods. Yeah. Oh, right. And he talked about, like, uh, there are some people who think that, like, mods will fix it isn't a valid argument, and I disagree. He also thought that Dawnguard has no voice lines for if you do the first quest as a vampire, so. People actually argue that the He also thought a lot of other things, like... He thinks that Rayloff is smiling in the introduction. He thinks that, like, if Radiant AI was more powerful, it would make people's computers explode. Uh, he thinks that Joan Allen was, was, do, make, was running improv because she was, like, a Skyrim QA tester. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like well, Acer Thorn. I like, almost liked Acer Thorn more than Salt Factory because Salt Factory won't say crazy shit like that. He definitely gave some good quotes. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, there's an appeal to watching Acer Thorn if only for the, uh, occasionally he'll say something insane. These games are more modding platforms than actual games, which is absurd and ridiculous. Quite often you'll- Yeah, it's not my job to fix Skyrim. I, I have a, 
here's my like kind of perspective on mods i think they're all right if like one or two mods is all you need to fix a game like it like massively overhauls the game so it's like oh yeah i'm playing with this mod like there's terraria mods like that that like extend the end game or like factorial mods you know very simple stuff that makes lots of sweeping changes but it's like if i'm expected to install 100 mods to have a functional playthrough uh no thank you i think minecraft's the exception to that but that's because there's modding mod packs that like yeah are intentionally designed to make all the things work together in a cohesive so, fashion so I've, I've been working on like something for oblivion to fix some of the issues that i've had with it and uh there is a, this, a few different overhauls for Oblivion that I tried playing with, but my problem with those overhauls is that they usually go way too far, and they'll make like some changes that I just feel are not in the interest, best interest of the mm -hmm. game. So yeah, that I almost a... pref I almost prefer the smaller, or they make a giant overhaul mod that you can install in just like you know parts, or there's a bunch of INI files that I can edit. Mm -hmm. And then but, at that point, uh, you're just modding the game. Yeah, all yeah. over again. See discussions, particularly about Skyrim and Fallout 4, about what kind of mods you'll need to make the game good. I think many of these people mistake their highly modified experiences for the content the game actually contains and judge it based on that instead. Yeah, I've run into that issue. Uh, that's the old Eusenia... What's her name? Eusenia Erdius, she's the the travel person at, at Telfir in Morrowind. Oh, right. I was, I, was yeah. wrong, I was wrong about the Nernrit thing. I don't know why, because <laughs> again, I want to state this for the record. I had IRL conversations with multiple people about the fact that you couldn't drop Nernrit, who had borrowed my copy of Oblivion and played it. So either I had a defective copy of Oblivion where you couldn't <laughs> drop Nernrit, or it was a thing and has been changed since then. What, or what plan, I'm from a what different platform. Where you? I, so this was this would be like the no, that was the PC because I I had loaned my friends PC copies of Oblivion. The back I'm when you could do if, that. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering if there was like a was it's, it was it the T rated version or was it the M rated version? I don't recall, and I've long since lost like the case because uh, one, one of my friends broke the case. <laughs> Because they're, uh, who knows, they might have, like, put in some sort of stealth patch in the M-rated re-release or something like that. Yeah, that's the thing, like, trust me when I say I'm not pulling that out of my ass. Um, I've had conversations with people who, like, corroborated that that was a thing. What's even funnier is when people argue that Bethesda doesn't rely on modders, and in the same breath say, they don't fix bugs because modders did it first. You should show that. No, I mean, I've heard that before. But... There's gotta be at least one Reddit post that you can show on the screen. That's been kind of my philosophy, is like... Even if you can't find somebody on YouTube saying that, you can find somebody on Reddit who unironically would, would like, say, in oh. the, say that in the same sentence. Reddit Reddit is a perfect place to get like all those crazy quotes from if you really mm -hmm. want to substantiate just just fucking google it. I mean Acer Thorn has a Reddit account. What more do I need to say? <laughs> I What's going on here? I don't think Bethesda relies upon modders to fix the bugs in their own game, even though the way it works out that tends to be the case. It tends to be the case that modders will fix these bugs. Do you, do you agree that Bethesda relies on modders to fix their games? Mm -hmm. Well, you have that quote from was it Emil who said yeah, it? Yeah, it was Emil. That's was, basic. Yeah, that's basically damning evidence. Yeah, that, like that's like, pretty watertight at that point. Emil's a lead designer and fucking said that like. Yeah, exactly. I could add this stuff, but I know that modders are gonna do it. So. And wouldn't you know they did it? That's, so if they're willing to do that for content, they're probably willing to do it for uh, bugs and stuff too. Yeah. Especially if 
in QA, it's like, oh, this is a very mild, like, mod, like, you know, not, it didn't pop up very often. It's not often. essential, so it's like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you were talking about bugs, I was talking about features. Oh, I mean, I think both. And then, oh, I keep start trying to start it by clicking on the video, and that doesn't Bethesda work. Bethesda just doesn't see the need to fix them there's themselves, because the bugs are already fixed. This is something I wanted to get out of the way immediately. Wait, what was the change in voice? Was that a different person? Yeah, I think that was... That was a quote from somebody else. I was trying to recognize... who it was. Did it first. I don't think Bethesda relies- Oh yeah, this is definitely a quote. Is this miniature nerd or like Oxhorn? upon modders to fix the bugs in their own game. Okay, see, I hadn't picked up on that. I just, I, I had just immediately like, yeah, the voice is different. This must have just been recorded on a different day. Game, even though the way it works out, that tends to be the case. Yeah, I can definitely tell this is Oxhorn now. It tends to be the case that modders will fix these bugs, and then Bethesda just doesn't see the need to fix them their, themselves because the bugs are already fixed. This is... Okay, so was, was that actually... A Fuck. So, what did he say? <laughs> Basically, like, that Bethesda doesn't fix the game because modders fix it? Yeah, I think that was his point, that Bethesda doesn't feel like they have to fix it if okay, the so they did community is already fixed So it. they did include an example, then. That's good. That's good stuff. Okay, so I'm mildly familiar with the Oxhorn thing. Uh, does he, like, how related to Bethesda is he? It, does he just talk about their content, or does he actually, like, uh, know people or anything like that? That's, that's a question to the guys, of course. Something I wanted to get out of the way immediately, because it's unfortunately an important part of the discussion, which I'll sum up simply with, if a game needs... I'll sum up simply, shut the fuck up. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that people who make the well, you can just mod it argument like they're subhuman. You can't you can't convince these people. Right there, implying that Kretosis sounds like Oxhorn. From here on, you can say whatever you want in this video, yet you can't insult Kretosis any more than you just did. I'm not saying that they sound alike. I'm just saying that um there's so little like lead up to it being an example, and there's not like a so what I do is I always, with the Oblivion video was, anytime I was playing other people's videos, I had on screen what the video was. So like there was no ramp up or anything on screen to indicate that it was a different video. So I just was like, oh yeah, this is the same person and they just might have had a cold. To mods for it to be... To mods for it to be good? Then it's probably not a good game. Besides casual fans and modders, there's also the typical fanboy excitement. Ten out of ten. Oh, you is. can't do this. This is our boy. <laughs> Angry Joe, like, I'm not being ironic here. Angry Joe is one of the best Skyrim videos, but it's a release date kind of thing. If Joe had released yeah. this video yesterday, I would have massive issues with it. It's the fact that, like, the video had come out so close to the game's release date. <laughs> I just... I give it... I rank it pretty highly because I don't think he's being disingenuous. Yeah, I I, I believe he was being honest. But, um... I don't know, like, of the channel Awesome Crowd, I, I don't think, like, Joe got off pretty light because he wasn't really related to them. People take Oxhorn as an authoritative source. Yeah, I mean... He's just popular, like, you can't trust people who have gold play buttons. You can trust silver play buttons, but you can't trust golds. And it easily earned the badass seal of approval. The badass well, seal of approval. Well, maybe that's a bit unfair to Joe. Even if the game isn't absolutely perfect, surely it's still an 8 or 9 out of 10, right? I mean... You best be thankful. I fucking saved you! Are these reasons for it to, to not be an 8 or 9? I disagree, it's on him, and as I told him at the time, he needs to check his honeymoon period hard, and he knows it's a problem he has, yet he kept doing it. 
I mean, sure, but, um... I mean, sure, yeah, like, that is a problem that Angry Joe has, from my experience. What? What? What do you mean? I love that cutscene. <laughs> if I die today, it will not be in This is, like, one of the big, like, this is Battle of Red Mountain. Skyrim has the same Battle of Red Mountain problem, where, like, the final third of the game is just feels unfinished or it feels like very rushed it's more complete than Morrowind but yeah there is very much an element of like you can tell that they didn't get to achieve their full ambitions with this scene but I mean like I don't know if these are reasons to say the game's like not an eight or a nine it was it like depend it, it was depends like a, on a bug something that wasn't fixed because it was just funny which is the giant thing and then like a really awkward cutscene. yeah like, I, I would elder scrolls well, is no, elder scrolls is no stranger to awkward cutscenes. i would say it's probably just because it's very difficult to convey uh something esoteric like exploring really boring dungeons in a nice quick 10 second clip is Joseph Ant yeah, like a really fast sped up clip of just running a dungeon. That would be a good clip. The whole game feels unfinished and rushed. I would agree. Is Joseph Anderson and I would agree that it's not an eight or nine. I'm just wondering if this is the best examples to use. Is Joseph Anderson the only person on the internet who is willing to point out that Bethesda is improving their level of presentation? He said it in his Fallout 4 video. I would agree that they're improving their level of presentation. I wouldn't necessarily say that they are improving. I don't know. It's like as Emil gains power at Bethesda, his philosophy of front load the good stuff is becoming more and more uh, pertinent. These are just small examples. Yeah, I get it. It's a, it's in a uh, ensemble that they come together. Um, I don't think... I don't, I don't think Joseph is the only person to say that. I mean, obviously, you have the, uh, the the Bethesda defenders who are going to also agree with that. And I think that... I mean, I've said before that it, that's kind of the case. You really need that... Uh, the kill animation... Yeah, I've seen the Medicur clip. I've, I played it yesterday. Um, you should... Would a good example be that kill animation that you do on the dragons that's, like, really out of sync? Like, I think G-Man uses it as an example. Skyrim will be free! Oh. So the problem with this cutscene is that it's just too verbose. Like, someone, it really needed Jesus in terms of, um, like, going in there and cutting the dialogue <laughs> down. Cutting the things, and then you came. My mother, she, she... Okay, so Saran is just a huge problem in general. She literally does this, like, throughout the entire game. I don't really recall other companions being as bad as she was when it came to, like, uh, bumping into you while having conversations. Yeah, what's up with that? She's got is, she's got different AI packages run? than normal followers to make her work, but I don't know like what specifically they change that like causes oh. her to in in have incursions with cutscenes so often. I just remembered actually. Um, I have a goat follower from CC from like uh, you know CC yeah, stuff. Yeah, one of the pets. That one really screws up a lot of cutscenes. Oh yeah. All, well, all the pets in general, because it's such a, it's such an after the fact kind of addition. Yeah, but their AI, they will just come just running out of nowhere at the person talking and push them off screen and everything like that. But yeah, I didn't start having problems with the companions pushing me around. Like Jazargo never touched me until I got Serana, and then Serana was like all over me. <laughs> he died. I. 
I'm all alone now. So they sent me this terrible Stop. orphanage. Yeah, like she'll she'll uh teleport around. <laughs> she had the worst AI, but the others are pretty bad too. I don't know. I never noticed it being an issue with Jazargo, and I had him almost the entirety of the magic playthrough that I did. It was only Serana that I noticed doing this shit. Unlike any other NPC in the game, Serana actually has a character arc. Sure, that arc is daddy issues, but it's development. Yeah, well, yeah, like, it's like I've said on multiple streams, Saran is a Fallout follower in an Elder Scrolls game. Are you okay? Ah, oh, dude, I just remembered what, what this, uh, what this clip is, and I just started choking. <laughs> it gets better. Oh. Oh, God. <laughs> God, why? Okay, I understand. I understand why this is happening because, like, there's a point in the in the level for that animation. I don't. This must, <laughs> why? Why is Serana able to do it? It's got to be like an oversight of like. Um. So Serana will like interact with objects. Like she'll sit in odd <clears throat> places and what have you. She'll do like actions and stuff. And so I guess it's just like her overactive AI is like, oh yeah, this is an action yeah. that you can do in this area, is the Black Sacrament. To all of us. Serana's performing the sacrament. I yeah, I've always noticed that he does the dual wielding power attack animation. Even though he's he's just that, that based. A is that a one-handed weapon, or is that a two-handed weapon? That's like that a, just that's a clipping one-handed. That's the big two-handed axe. The Nordic uh, battle yeah. axe. To make this to make this oh, okay, he is two-handing it. But yeah, this, okay. Here's how I would doctor this cutscene. You gotta cut, like, 50% of the dialogue that's in it. And then you need to have it be more of like a dragon <clears throat> shout animation, like battle, where they're using shouts on each other. Like it being a physical melee is stupid because like at that point, all you need to do is just be like a really powerful warrior. Like what makes these guys special is that they have dragon shouts. Oh, wait, I guess they're on cooldown because they <laughs> used dragon render. <laughs> yeah. I think this is this is caused by like difficulty. Like if you're on the wrong difficulty, then like there isn't a a correct amount of health. <clears throat> this age? Holy shit. Why is there a black sacrament action in the first place? Because um Arantino has to do it. So like that's how they that's how they do anything where the characters are doing like a custom animation. Holy fucking shit. Please, someone do something. Do what? What are you doing? How are you doing that? Are you... I fucking give up. Right? Oh, no. Why'd the bitrate go, like... It went to total shit. This is not Watch Together. This is the... Yeah. This is like a bitrate of 5k <clears throat> or something. Yeah, what probably is happening is that it's just at the right bitrate that watch together because i'm assuming watch together watch is together still doing makes, some sort of encryption watch together makes it worse but yeah it's probably <laughs> doing some sort of uh rendering or something like that some sort of compression i should say but yeah, and it's like, just like amplifying it because that's what happens if you compress something that's already compressed it like it has a multiplicative effect sometimes mm -hmm. yeah and like as bad as watch together is like it doesn't add this level of like artifacting yeah. This dude is using a ton of clips from Vine Sauce. We should know he played it on the <clears> Switch. <throat> well, shouldn't the Switch version be functional? Like, it's one of the most recent versions of the game. Like, actual release versions. Well, it's easy to point out some lazy animations or weird glitches that say the game is bad, but we're not here simply because of some jank animations. The mechanics, story, world, and characters are busted on pretty much every level, to the point it seems like Bethesda took the laziest possible approach to making this entire game. 
How do you feel about shouts being tied to the speech skill? I have mixed feelings on it. I... It needs something. It probably needs its own yeah. skill tree, like the werewolf stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> where it's like you can get... Uh, like power increases and cooldown reductions and it needed it needed something to level it up or something it needed some way to invest further into it because just going out and picking up shouts is not enough yeah well that's the big issue with it is cooldowns yeah pretty sure cooldowns are part of the lore i imagine it takes a lot of energy for a person to do a dragon shout i'm but dragons do them constantly. I guess they're just that powerful, even though all they do is like, I breathe fire. I'm a dumb lizard. Switch version is seven out of seven. I remember? Oh yeah. Um, uh, why does Arlo do it out of seven rating? Another note I have to make up front is that I can't. Uh, to quote, "Examine Life of Gaming." Bungie wants their gimmick back. I don't really talk about the background lore in much detail. Nor can I really talk about potential retcons. This is because Elder Scrolls lore is essentially a set of tangled Christmas lights, and I have neither the time nor patience to untangle it. What do you mean? No, you're right. No, you're absolutely you're you're absolutely right about this, and I don't like I same exemption to Will. It's completely all right if you don't want to like if you don't want to talk about the lore. From a lore perspective, killing a dragon and taking its soul should be teaching you the shouts the dragons know. Yeah, I've thought about that before. It's like... I think you're told that, like, you absorb their knowledge. This is largely because Bethesda seems to operate on an anything-goes policy when it comes to lore. It's not that. So Ken Rolston had, like, a big thing of the unreliable narrator, and then, like... After Ken left, they were trying to emulate that with Skyrim as well, but they didn't really seem to understand. Like, like, I don't think Ken Rolston did a very good job of codifying his philosophy at Bethesda for how their stories were being told. And I think that's what has created a lot of the problems in the setting. Where they seem to have little to no restrictions on what can be done with it. I don't think dragon breaks are a particular issue. I know people have issues with dragon breaks, but I don't see that as like. I there's nothing that really happens in the dragon breaks that affects the later games, other than Mana Marco, basically. Even if it conflicts with what has already been established in other games, at least as far as the background lore is. A new hand, such as the beacon. Concern that is. Did you see the picture I have of? getting the beacon of the totem of here seen from like a spider sack yeah yeah i saw that they've tried to cover for this with the excuse of the unreliable narrator which can be a good thing if used correctly but the result here is background lore being ignored because the developers want to do something else entirely well it's not even that they're ignoring the background lore of the old games they literally invented a bunch of background lore to ignore that happens between skyrim and oblivion like it's the most confusing thing that like why would you bother with the great war and then like handle it the way you did like is it oh, what, like introduce it and then just not do anything with it. And oh yeah, it was like 25 years ago and like... I don't know, it just seems like a, a massive misstep that like... They skipped 200 years and then like did nothing with the opportunity presented of being able to change the political landscape. Entirely. As such... Like the only thing they did was that they introduced the Old Mary Dominion. A and like... Oh, it's gotta be 200 years because that's how long it would take for an empire over there to form. The only things that can really be taken as true, as far as- Okay, so I think what's going on here is the Draugr Lord- The Draugr Lords can't attack if they don't have a weapon, but they do have a shield. They do have animations for, like, hand-to-hand. -hand, but, like, he's somehow disarmed him of his weapon without disarming his shield as well. As far as the lore goes, is anything that actually appears in the games. Zarek Zacharon did a great video talking about the state of Elder Scrolls lore, 
and I highly recommend it. But the point I'm getting at- Yeah, it's called Michael Kirkbride. <laughs> ...here is that the Elder Scrolls lore is so fucked beyond belief that there's going to be very little in the way of consistency pretty much across the board. See, I don't think that's... I don't think it's an issue of, like, it's just such a mess that it's impossible to talk about. Script writing right now, got, anybody got advice? You have to be a lot more specific. There's a lot of components to it. And because this is the case, most major aspects we'll be discussing will likely- Okay, well, hold on. What's going on here? That had to be... Like some sort of spawn or something like that. Some sort of like a cheat. Well, like, okay. I think it's like one of every enchant type. Is there a command that does this? Or like, I think if you do, I think if you go into um, like the, dev the room? develop, yeah, the dev room, they have like a, a chest with a bunch so of Daedric just, swords. Like, auto looted everything. the dev room chest of Daedric swords. He's got the yeah, bases probably. too. I just like that the carry weight UI is yeah, broken. I can't even see it with um it's like uh with watch anywhere. Ten thousand out of three hundred. Oh, and your uh your uh avatar is blocking it too, your VTuber avatar. Oh. You're <laughs> watching it on the stream. Oh, I'm no, watching okay, I have the, I have both things up. You're talking about the, the stream audience, yeah. both have supporting and contradicting pieces of lore is there a mod that adds the be the the beacon as a pet so just like it's a rolling ball that follows you around because <laughs> that seems to be just what it does based on where you're sourcing your lore from to learn the lore of the fallout games all i had to do was play them to learn the lore of elders because there's like there isn't really lore for fall the fallout games Scrolls? I need to take a fucking college course on it. And even then, I'd be no better off for the fact that the lore exists in a perpetual state of being an ambiguous, nebulous cloud of incomprehensible sludge, with no one true answer or canon for anything, because it all changes upon the whims of the writers, rather than maintaining any kind of logical consistency. I mean, to be fair, that does provide them a degree of flexibility when it comes to story writing, to uh, not be constrained by... Because you can go the opposite route, and it's like, okay, so they're absolute, uh... I think this is, like, Warcraft's problem, is that, like, oh, we're absolutely beholden to old lore, so our stories suck. Yeah. That's that's where something like Dragon Breaks and stuff are really helpful. There's not lore in the Fallout games the same way that there's lore in the Elder Scrolls games. And I know that that's kind of what you're saying, but... It's... Like... The follow games, like, they don't really expand what was going on, like, in pre-1900s or what have you. They don't really expand, like, what's going on in the broader world. Like, there's stuff to learn about, but... With all that out of the way, let's get to it. See, he did it in 940, whereas I did it in 952. I think he's trying to undercut me. Like every Bethesda game since Oblivion, Skyrim starts off with an overly long and unnecessary tutorial sequence that does very little to help you learn to play the game. Uh, Daggerfall? <laughs> That's one of my favorite bits, is just the, uh, Daggerfall? Firstly, most weapon types are unavailable from the very start, with only a sword in the first room of Helgen Keep. Additionally, each race starts off with a basic flame spell and healing spell. Each of the other weapon types available in the starting dungeon have to be looted off the corpses of your enemies, so if you prefer a bow, you have to get through several combat encounters before you can even get one. Though ultimately it doesn't matter if you want to use a sword, mace, or axe, because the weapon classes have been collapsed into three simple categories. More on that later. 
The issue of not. No, I mean, if you have a crippling fear of melee, you could just let. You could let your companion deal with it. Yeah, I, I never really had a problem with that because it only takes about two minutes total to get whatever weapon of choice you really want. Getting your preferred weapon of choice to start with could have easily been solved by having starting sets of gear based on the class you picked. But such a thing. I mean, isn't the only issue with the Fallout lore that, like, the Brotherhood of Steel is on the East Coast, and, like, in Fallout 76, the Brotherhood of Steel is, like, over there way too soon? I mean, it. it I don't know. It's like you're making the case that Elder Scrolls lore is just so, like,. Such a tangled mess that it's impossible to talk about. But, you know, I don't really see the case of, like, how background details that were established in the Pocket Guide to the Empire just make it, like, impossible to talk about. Like, I'm not seeing, I'm not really seeing the difficulty that would make it easy for Fallout and difficult for Elder Scrolls. would require there to actually be classes in the game in the first place. This brings me around to character creation. Quite Okay, see, this footage looks good, right? But yeah, this footage is I like, picked. this is in bitrate hell. But such a thing would require there to actually be classes in the game in the first place. I wonder if it's how he recorded it. This brings me around to Well, yeah, bitrate is, is usually a recording thing. Yeah, because, but I'm just wondering, like, well, the whole if video is he... going to be encoded at the same rate. So yeah, but if he used two different, like, like I've been switching to using Shadowplay, and that has a different. I think I'm using a different encoder with that. Mm -hmm. So he could Probably just be right. having. He could be using the same bit rate, but different well, encoders. Of course, yeah, of course. But like, say you switch, um, you switch the encoding type in OBS. That, like, just changes all the settings. Yeah. To character creation. Quite literally, the only aspect of character creation this game has oh, wait, is on which went. race it, you it decide to play It was because it was moving it. slow. Yes. Well, so, so it's a motion issue? Yeah, that's, okay, that's so, what it looks yeah. like. The bonuses still exist. They generally seem less impactful and significant than they have previously. Each of the races get a bonus 5 points to 5 skills that particular race happens to be naturally gifted in, and 10 points to 1 skill the race specializes in. For example, High Elves, most commonly associated with being skilled magic users, have- Oh, sorry. All their he, he was saying High Elves, but he was showing Wood Elves, so I was like, thought he was talking about Wood Elves. This is an interesting point because I had no idea this was the case until about a year ago. Oh, okay. I was like, you didn't know this in general? Yeah, um... Skyrim does a very job of, like, explaining this information, which I assume is what they're gonna get into. Yeah. But, like, yeah, it, you can go years without realizing that, like, there are skill differences on a race-by-race -race basis. I've made so many characters in this game, and it wasn't until very recently that somebody pointed out, I was like, what the fuck? I went to USP and I was like, oh shit, really is. Yeah, I had like just been cynical and assumed that like, oh yeah, every race starts at plus 15 on everything. Yeah, that's what I assumed too. Skill bonuses in magic skills. Each race also has a unique racial effect, and some of these don't look like they were thought out too well. For example, Bosmer have a 50% resistance to both disease and poison, and red guards only have a 50% resistance to poison. So if that's something you're concerned about, Bosmer- Well, and then survival adds like a bunch of other elements, like um, fro like cold resistance. So. Not a, not a thing like I would expect you to bring up, but I thought it was interesting that like they added more dynamics to racial choices. Bosmer will always be a better choice by default. Argonians naturally get water breathing, which is fine, except for the fact. Ex ex yeah, except for the fact that you never need it. There's barely any use for it in this game. Imperials find a little bit extra gold each time. In a game where the economy is so broken, <coughs> mm -hmm. you'll be swimming in thousands of gold coins if you even remotely sell any loot you find. 
Khajiit get a 15 point bonus to unarmed damage. Uh, uh have you ever done a hand-to-hand -hand build with like Khajiit and you get the gear and what have you? Uh, no. Not in Skyrim anyway. It's not the worst thing. It's not ideal, but it's not the worst thing. Like it's you, just it doesn't how compete. Do you how do you scale your damage though? You the enchantment. Uh like at some point you would have to start like exploiting the restoration loop to keep making better en enchanted gear, but that would that's basically your progression. But it's not a terrible thing because like in one of the updates they added all those kill moves for hand to hand. Yeah, and so they added those Oh, and I was thinking of the CC, um, where they added a bunch of those yeah. um, unarmed weapons and stuff, too. Yeah, all the gauntlets that just have, like, spikes on them. Yeah. Ah, uh, unarmed? Wait, that's not actually a fucking skill anymore. What the fuck? Bethesda, what are you doing? Oh, see? It had to be 18, so... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... They could have just thrown unarmed into the um, two-handed tree, like the du like how dual wielding's in one-handed. Yeah, I mean it makes sense. You use two hands and unarmed. Do they they have um, a route for daggers, right? And um, is it the sneak skill? There's ways to increase your dagger damage and stealth. That's basically what daggers are for, I guess. Also, like uh, making a fast mace build. You can use daggers for that. And orcs. Oh dear, they're unique. I wonder if he mentions that, like, part of the race, like, so the height of the race influences how fast they move. Oh yeah. Racial effect is to skip a quest to gain access to orc strongholds. Not gonna lie, I completely forgot those even existed. Once you pick a race or character, cre unbased. Creation ends immediately. No class choice, no birth sign choice. This is where we come to one of the biggest issues with the RPG mechanics of the supposed RPG. With classes gone, there was no real specialization in character build. Raising any skill levels you up now, which does nothing to encourage any sort of character build. It's an incredible dumbing down of the RPG mechanics. Said it again. 30 times damage that can one-shot anything. Okay, so the issue with you guys being in the voice chat is that it would just slow the stream down and then we'd, we'd have to be here, like, a really, really long time. Oversimplifying the overall experience. You no longer had to think about what skills would be useful to you, nor did it encourage picking skills and sticking to them. It's a total free-for-all, which on paper sounds fine for casual players, but we are talking about an RPG here. Are we? I, do you think Bethesda considers themselves a still-developing RPGs? Uh, gotta look at their marketing material. I, Whatever they're saying in their marketing material is what I would go by. Well, see, I don't know off the top of my head if they have themselves set to a genre. Because if that's what people are, like, you know, attributing that to them, but mm -hmm. they themselves aren't actively saying it, then we can't exactly... Well, yeah, it's like saying that, uh... Let's Emperor, see what it's like saying Imp Lemon is a, is a YouTube poop YouTuber, when, like, mm -hmm. that's just what he started as. Well, Wikipedia says it's an open-world action role-playing game. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's always the, the, the cut, is, uh... Yeah. Let's call it the an action. action. Call it an action yeah. adventure game. Which I think I do, but I don't think Todd has ever like sat down in an interview and like said, Oh yeah, we're making RPGs here. Which I mean it's still fair to criticize them because it's you know, it, they're abandoning the uh the audience that got them there. Character building should be an extremely important aspect, but Skyrim does next to nothing to push the player in pursuing a specific playstyle. Is your class good at stealth? Now, something Todd does say is that 
Uh, he doesn't want players restarting. You you can find that. Yeah. Well, maybe you want to try and sneak around problems instead of facing them. Is your class a great speaker? Well, you will likely be trying to solve problems with words instead of weapons. Can your class actually perform magic? Well, you will likely want to pursue learning more magical abilities, thus pushing you towards a mage's guild. The limitations of your character will also dramatically change how you play the game overall. Like if you're shit at lockpicking, for example, you're going to need to work around locked doors and chests. <coughs> Another point from Morrowind, you weren't required to be good at lockpicking in order to open locks. You could learn an alteration spell to open them for you. Uh, Oblivion. <laughs> I, I do agree, and I I find it not... Okay, one, it's weird that they got rid of unlock spells. I have have conjecture about why that is, but have did you notice that there's a Creation Club spell that is an unlock spell? Um... Yes. Yeah, one of the Creation Club spells is just an expert... Un, uh, unlocks everything up to expert. But you also have that, um... There's a, there's a birthstone, isn't there? Yeah, there's the, the tower, that, tower lets you yeah. do that, that lets you do that once a day. <laughs> but yeah, it's like... My theory is that they didn't want to have five unlock spells. So, but the problem with that theory is that there's tiers of, like, stone flesh and oak flesh and whatever. Yeah, so. yeah, so why? And, like, alteration would become, like... Alteration wouldn't be at risk of extinction if it had an unlock spell. Like, they should have been going the other way. Like, they should have added melee, a uh, melee way to unlock stuff. Yeah. Like in Daggerfall. Acerthorn did say that Skyrim was a dungeon crawler. Listen, Acerthorn said a lot of things. He said that padding was good, and then, like, later said that, like, later criticized the game for padding. Or you could pay an enchanter to create an item <coughs> that could do it for you. But with the removal of cast on use items in Oblivion, the enchant was no longer an option. Mm -hmm. With the unlocking spells- But at least he still had the spells. Being one of the many victims of the- And like, I always thought like, I think Oblivion's issue is that you can't get scrolls. I mean, obviously it's an issue because like cast on use items are cool and all, but. The Mead Dynasty banned lockpicking spells. Exactly. And criminals everywhere were like, damn, well, if it's against the law, then I just can't do it. The Sigic Order, like, every time you try to cast an open spell, the Sigic Order teleports in and, like, kills you. The spell calling in Skyrim, your only option became lockpicking. Uh, the tower sign? <laughs> I have to wonder how many people, like, use the tower stone i'm just trying to think like what's the average number of lock chests in a dungeon it's got to be like around what like four three or four well this is a counted thing because um so you can only max out lock picking like four times because you only get experience for each unique lock so like people went to the effort of like figuring out how many locks you can unlock before you stop getting experience but yeah, so when a dungeon regenerates, it doesn't regenerate the locks? Yeah, well, you can't... It's the same chest, so, and you can't get experience from unlocking the same thing. That... That sounds like an oversight to me. Well, I mean, to be fair, who's the psycho that resets their <laughs> lockpicking skill? Like, I didn't max I out think, lockpicking skill on any of my characters. I think we need to... We need to get in contact with the unofficial Skyrim patch. I think this is an oversight that needs to be patched. Well, I'm, I'm sure they did. I've used the Tower Stone exactly once in my life. I just don't know what, like, I don't know who's the psycho that uses it. I guess Acer Thorn. What, what, um, stones were you using during your playthroughs? Well, on the Magic Character playthrough, I was exploiting the, um, Ethereal Crown to use the uh, ritual stone over and over. Oh, right. So, like, and then you would use the Atronac with that because it's the best, like, casting stone. Uh, I think the melee character was the one that 
adds health regen. And then the thief character... I don't even remember. See, I'm, I'm a pleb, so... Like, most of my character, most of my magic it's character, I've just been using the, uh, I've just been using the, um, the mage one, which is just, you know, increased 20% skill. Like the uh, apprentice? Yeah. No, 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 not even the print, the apprentice. The, the, one, um, the one below that? Yeah, just the mage, where it's just 20% bo uh, buff to skill, skill yeah. gains. You get XP for breaking the lock. Oh, of course. I gotta buy 2,000 lockpicks and... <laughs> Repeatedly oh, so you just never lock pick. You're, li you just you're sit literally, there. if you do that, you are Mr. Caption's worst enemy. That That's who <laughs> Mr. Caption worries about is the guy who levels lock picking entirely by breaking the picks and never actually unlocking anything. With Skyrim not having classes, you never have a weakness at all. It falls entirely on your shoulders to arbitrarily invent weaknesses for yourself. I mean, that's the Daggerfall approach. I don't know, isn't this kind of a weird thing to say that, like, your characters don't have weaknesses? Like, vampires have weaknesses. Mages have weaknesses. Yeah, like, run out of- run out of magic, guy. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> you're no, screwed. Oh no, there's nothing I can do. Unless you're sitting there chugging potions, or you have the Atronach thing, and you can- I wonder if that works. What? The, um, unofficial patch had to fix that, where, um, if you sit there spamming the, uh, like summons with an act with the action oh. sometimes they just absorb the, the See, magic up. i've never been clear on whether or not that's intentional because there's no other spell effect you can cast that you just absorb but you yeah but it's like you try to summon a flame atronach and you absorb it so i have to wonder if that's intentional because i think it was that way in oblivion too yeah it was that way in oblivion you would absorb your own summons so i think that's intentional I gotta test that because I have the unofficial patch installed on my on my uh, mage character. I gotta see if that still works. Yeah, the it, it's fixed by the unofficial patch. It has a fifty percent chance of causing all summoning spells to fail. It, but it doesn't fail. You absorb the magicka. Like that was something I would do when I was low on magicka. Is I would full reset by repeatedly trying to fail summons and then like it would be annoying because sometimes you would actually yeah, fail sometimes you would the summon that you wanted to do yeah i remember that's how i discovered it when i was first playing a mage and i picked up the atronach stone and i would be summon i'd be trying to summon things in the middle of combat and i'd be like where the fuck is my summon and it took me a while to realize that i was absorbing it and I, you know i got killed more than a few times because of that mm-hmm I'm trying to see if it's the, if the UESP says it's the case for Oblivion. The UESP doesn't say it's the case, but I do remember. I I think it I think it did happen in Oblivion as well. So I I I think it's intentional. Like how in Cyberpunk 2077, certain doors need strength to break, intelligence to hack open stuff. I like that aspect of the game. Yeah, it really felt like. Um, the only problem with Cyberpunk is that it does a really bad job of introducing those concepts, but once you know that's going on, you can build a character around those ideas. And you have, like, you can do a pure wimpy, like, physically wimpy, but, like, mentally powerful, like, hacker character, and it's actually a lot of fun. But you have to know what's going on with the game, and the game doesn't really... Despite the fact that its introduction is, like, four hours long, it still has a really hard time of introducing how its RPG mechanics work. Yeah, I remember I was just throwing points into things because I'm like, well, this, this sounds, sounds yeah, useful. This, so this sounds useful, and then it's like, by the time you realize what's going on, you're like fucked in terms yeah. of like how much you've invested into yourself and what you can reset. And yeah, see, I think see, that's the that's the Todd Howard nightmare right there. Yeah, I don't think you can refund. Um, I don't think so attribute either. Points, and there's just a point where like the leveling is so slow, so it's like, fuck, I just fucked myself because I invested my points wrong. You can also just get Gorilla Arms in Cyberpunk, right? Yes, and I think that's probably the best arms in Cyberpunk. Um, I love the double jump legs, and there's actually, like... There's a quest where, like... It's the friendship quest with the, the cop, who's, who's the heterosexual option if you're a girl. That guy. Um, where you, like, have to open a gate, 
and you can open it from the inside but it's like there's a barbed wire fence and if you have those legs you can jump over it and he'll like he'll acknowledge that that you that you did that it's pretty it's pretty like it stood out to me as being pretty cool that that they had that attention to detail but i didn't understand the romance in cyberpunk 2077 i never even got up to the romance because like i shit you not that guy was giving me bedroom eyes but like he's straight <laughs> and then like <laughs> Like, it's such a clusterfuck. And it's one of those games where the romance is just, you have to pick the positive options. If you're yourself, you can, like, fuck yourself out of it. But worse than that, it removed options that were available in previous games for dealing with situations. It does add a perk system to substitute for the removal of classes or specialization, but most perks seem to do little... Ogre Show Balam. Um. Show? I think it's Grow and Gra. A anyways. A little more than damage bonuses, and for the most part, other simple effects, which is what raising a skill alone should have done. But it gets worse yet. Along with the removal of classes, was the removal of attributes. Similar to special in the Fallout series. And then they re-added attributes in the tabletop game. <laughs> attributes were aspects like strength, agility, willpower, and they were major parts of your character build in previous games. They impact things such as how much health or stamina you have, magic resistance, and spell cast chance. And each time you leveled up, you had to pick three of them to raise. So... So I'm thinking about it, right? Okay. You have to cut personality because, like, disposition's not a thing anymore, right? Right. You have to cut... You have to cut endurance because they... They don't want to have to deal with, like, efficient leveling. So that's gotta go, right? Speed has to go because they don't want players, like, going super fast because of the rendering. Like, that part where, like... Oh, we were worried because the werewolves were too fast. They'd outrun the render. Yeah. That kind of meme. Um... Those are the ones that I think you'd have to cut. And then... Yeah, and then at that point, it's like, well, there might as well not have an attribute system. Well, okay, so you say they had to remove endurance because of, like... Efficient, um, leveling. efficient leveling. Yeah, which was one of like, the main can, complaints of Oblivion. But couldn't you just level up your health now? Yeah. Like, you can just level it up directly well, now. That... Well, yeah, a lot of people make the argument that the attributes in Skyrim are just health, stamina, magicka. Oh, I don't... Uh... I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know how... I don't really give a lot of credence to that. Yeah, I don't know, because I've always seen a lot of people who are like, Oh, you gotta stack endurance once, once you start playing the game, even as a mage. And I was like, I've never done that. I was pretty fine. Yeah, you don't have to do that. That's kind of the... Uh, the schools of thought I, t I talk about when it comes to leveling. There's a lot of people who live by the ethos of like, oh yeah, you gotta stack endurance. Why did you change your mind? Okay, basically, I changed my mind about streaming on the second channel because I want to be able to do impromptu streams. And those just don't work on the main channel. What would be the issue with um, retroactively increasing your health if you if you leveled up your endurance? What do you mean? So it's like if you level endurance last, you get all the once you start leveling it, you get all the health buffs that you would have missed out on. Okay, so it like kind of it plays. Like it catches up is what you're saying. Yeah. So it would it would basically it would scale with your level, with your actual character oh, level. Oh, that's true. Like your health would basically scale at that point. Yeah. Um, I don't. Because the issue is health is tied to a single attribute. 
Yeah. And so there's every incentive to level that attribute first because otherwise, like, in you don't miss out on intelligence or on, like, Magicka if you don't level intelligence first. It has that retroactive idea to it. I don't know, like, I guess that would be the issue is, um, health would be extremely homogenous. With each one getting a bonus based on how many skills governed by that attribute were raised during that level. I just want to say his character was really ugly, but that's Oblivion. <laughs> and he's also using the, no, that's just the normal armor from the arena. Gyrim instead dumbs this down to a simple choice there of which color. There it is again, the dummy down. See, that could be part of the, part of the. I mean, you might be intentionally angling for it, but if people have an issue with this video, it's the um, like, cause you're inheriting the old drama, of the dumbing down it, controversy, if you keep using the term. And that might be what you're shooting for. Also, he's, so every level up, he invested in health colored bar you want to increase red for health oh no wait for... he's got five levels in fatigue. yeah in, okay. st in stamina oh in stamina <laughs> i think stamina and fatigue are interchangeable it seems that there's no super chat options on the second channel that's because it's not monetized yet um youtube oh. is like continue like it it'll take a couple days for youtube to acknowledge the watch time on the previous stream yeah yeah so it's like yeah, because I was because I, I was watching yesterday. I was like, oh man, he hasn't gotten any super chats. What the fuck's that about? Yeah, no, it's not that my audience hates me. It's that. Yeah. <laughs> um, most RPGs do retroactive health. Yeah, I, I just feel like there's something you lose by saying like, if you, like. It makes characters unique by being able to invest in um, health first, but it is dumbing down. Yes, I agree, but, and yeah, it's not your fault that uh, the term was tainted, but um, that is still like an effect that it has on people. Is that like, even if that you don't intentionally mean it, uh, the term calls back to an embarrassing moment in the Elder Scrolls community. <laughs> Well, the way I look at it is just how how it sounds, even without that sort of context. It's like, rather than saying dumbing down, I would probably say something like simplifying or something like that, just because I don't generally like using loaded terms that are going to immediately bias people's view, like uh, opinion about what I'm about to say. Uh, what should we call it that we get the point across? Uh, I mean, like, you know, open the thesaurus, get some synonyms going, like, uh, reduction in complexity or what have you. Yeah. You can say dumbing down. I'm only pointing out that, like, if that's what you want to aim for, you just have to bear in mind that, um, now the connotation is that, like, you're in Sammy Online's camp. I don't know about the dumbing down meme. The dumbing down meme refers to... Um, the Sammy Online Sorcerer Dave drama, uh, where Sammy Online made a really bad video complaining about how Elder Scrolls was dumbing down, and then Sorcerer Dave made a really bad response video about how it isn't. Simplifying doesn't really work, though. I mean, okay, yeah, there's a... There's a... Is it caustic, kind of aggressive element to dumbing down that, like, really... That really sells the idea yeah, if that's your intention to, like, emotionally charge what you're saying, then absolutely use something like dumbing down. You could take it. I, I it's know. it's you a stylistic choice, and yeah. it's a choice about how you want to frame your argument. Like I said, I just like to try and come in as neutral as possible because mm -hmm. I'm. Yeah. Or you can take I, ownership I of the term. Yeah. So it's like you just have a bit where it's like. Um... I don't know. It, would, it wouldn't take very long to be like, uh, I'm going to say dumbing down, but I'm not necessarily like associated with... I don't necessarily agree with other incarnations. Or maybe you do agree with other incarnations. 
I'm just trying to point out, like, um, if you have any issues with, like, dealing with really stupid people in the comments, like, these are what is going to be causing... This is what makes their, uh, the cogs in their head turn. Magica and green for stamina. This also says... Green juice. What, what was your, um... What did red you juice. I okay. think it was red juice, blue juice, green juice. Okay, so it was the colored juice. Yeah. <laughs> Simplified skills further. Which is actually something I like. I think that's like one of the few uh, original kind of observations that I had seen in the Oblivion era. As well, in prior games, a somewhat complex... If you're trying to say simplifying with a negative connotation, say oversimplifying, yeah, I guess oversimplifying would be a good a good way to do it. Yeah. I like the take ownership of the term thing because it's like, don't tell me what to say, you know, fuck those guys. I like I like yeah, that mentality. Yeah, that's that's your brand right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just because other people were morons doesn't mean that we have to change our uh terminology. Like I said, that's why it's a I, I consider it a stylistic choice. Well, and, it would be like, like me saying gaslighting, like the term gaslighting, or no, dog whistling would be a better one, because just because other people were morons and uh, made it so that the term dog whistling is like something that you can't take seriously doesn't mean that there's not like elements of truth to the term. But the fact is, if I use dog whistling and like didn't try to take ownership of it. Then I get associated with people who like are over aggressive and think that like um, I don't know like Trump is dog whistling the alt right you know that kind of era. There's lots no, of it's a I've propaganda never thing. Heard, I've never heard of this dog whistling thing. Dog whistling is um, you are like signaling your support surreptitiously. Uh, so it, it would be like oh yeah you're pandering to the alt-right but you're doing it in a way that like most people wouldn't catch on to i think it's kind okay. of i think it's kind of a bullshit term but so it's like there was a... it's like you're stealth you're stealthily mm -hmm. um uh what is that virtue signaling yeah but okay so there was an era of like journalists who would use it for everything um and so that's like kind of tainted the term and that's that's kind yeah. of my point is like um, we're propagandists, and by nature, uh, word choice is, like, a very subtle way that people, uh, can be influenced. Plex equation was behind how skills operated, which was based on your skill level, the level of the governing attribute, and the level of your luck, which is part of why attributes were so important. I feel like... I mean, you you might bring it up, of course. I feel like people don't mention, like, the alchemy, uh, the fact that there is a progression in the game for the alchemy creation stuff, like the calcinator and the alembic. Yeah. That was cut from Skyrim. Yeah, that's uh, always, that always, um, struck me as odd. And also that you have to invest points in, perks into, uh, getting more, um, you know, figuring out the uh, elements and stuff, the effects of different ingredients. That oh, kind of yeah, me that too. bothers me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you're a mage character and well, every one of those fucking skill well, points is... And those are wasted skill points, If you can't, especially in the launch yeah. version of the game where you can't refund them. Yeah. Because you don't need to really go past, like, I think, five or six skill points in alchemy. I appreciate what they were trying to go for, where it was meant to encourage experimentation and stuff, but listen, I'm not experimenting with fucking uh, giant toes. It's just not happening. Right. Or I'll experiment hu with human flesh. I'll experiment. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I'm not going to experiment with those things. I'll experiment with like red flowers. Sure. Well, and but... you didn't have to in like Morrowind. If you had a sufficient alchemy skill, you already knew what the effects were. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, Oblivion. Oblivion no, Oblivion didn't have that. Oblivion added the testing, but I think as like the number of effects you would get would increase as you leveled. Yeah, so how Oblivion worked was it was kind of the worst of both worlds, actually, because in Skyrim, the effect still <coughs> exists, but in Oblivion, the, ex this, the effect doesn't even exist if it's not unlocked. So if you knew you could combine Nurn Root with like 
something other something blah blah blah, blah and create like a spell like potion mm -hmm. you could do it in skyrim but there's not enough instances where like you read a a, a recipe or a alchemy skill book and like the book says what yeah. something means and you learn that yeah yeah there was not enough like they hinted at that you could buy like Mm -hmm. You can potion. buy recipes, but it's like, yeah, oh, you got to read the recipe to know what it is. Yeah. And it's like, well, isn't that the point? It's like, I don't have to have an actual, like, alchemist journal because, like, the game just tells me what the effects are. And also, you'd have to go and buy those things. They were never loot items, and well, the, they were yeah, they very were, rare. In, like, warlock dungeons, you would find them. Which? Oh, wait. Yeah, you could find... Yeah alchemy recipes out in the world play college ball but yeah like i i think that like eating rest eating shit to learn the effects is dumb the game of like because there's like some potion effects that you just can't learn about without the wiki like or like like if you're trying to like make fortify destruction like i think all of the fortify destruction ingredients are like a tier three effect like, I don't yeah. know how you're actually supposed to figure out that how to make Fortify Destruction potions. Because you you're supposed to... to, like, experiment with stuff. Like, I guess just randomly slam shit together. Yeah, you would have to either do that or just put the points into the skill perk and then just eat the ingredients. Rather than making unique character builds specialized for certain styles of play, it instead becomes a jack-of-all-trades situation in which you can do anything without penalty, and as such, it becomes pretty bland. Even Morrowind allowed you the use of skills outside of your class. However, they didn't get the boost bonus that skills within your class received, and they did not contribute to your overall level. Furthermore, birth signs have been relegated to being semi-permanent buffs you gain from runestones, rather than no- I like the term semi-permanent locked in part of your character build. You no longer have to live with your choice, and you no longer have to think about what would be most beneficial to you, because you can just change them on a whim. Further, to be, to be fair, you also have to go through a loading screen. <laughs> like, I don't know, like I that's kind a big of, obstacle. Uh, honestly, I kind of like the birth sign, uh, birthstones over picking the birth signs, because it encourages you know, experiment, uh, well, yeah, experimentation, but also, um, you know, like picking up something that's more effective for certain use case scenario and stuff. I do have a mild issue with like the magic birth signs in, um, like Morrowind and Oblivion because you pick it at character creation, but they have a big influence. So it's like, you can't over the course of your character want to switch into magic because you like it's basically assumed that you're going to pick those signs if you're going to play magic so if you don't get a chance to get them after the fact then like, yeah you have to start over and uh, i'm a big advocate of starting over but not like that doesn't seem like a very valid reason to basically and th that's really my only issue with burst signs also i mean daggerfall system of like comprehensive character weaknesses and strengths i think is still more interesting than either idea you had an overall specialization which allowed you to raise your skills faster as they'd get a bonus when using them this is also provided by your runestone now and similarly can be changed at any time after all i actually think the guardian signs are a bad idea um just because they make you level too quickly so you can miss out on like training points yeah it is a godsend though when you're playing characters strictly for making videos <laughs> yeah i guess <laughs> i will I, say that i mean yeah we can't let players get into a situation where they might have to live with the build they made or potentially start a new game and consider it more carefully wait with how awful the opening tutorial sequence is Maybe this is exactly why Bethesda made it so no choice, challenge, or consequence ever affects you. You don't have to speculate. They, well, un unless he might be... Okay. Kratosis seems at the level where he's willing to do um, stuff like fake-out sentences. So it's like, 
not a lot of creators actually like prove me wrong in the next sentence so like there is a possibility but like yeah you can find you can find proof of this it all makes sense now the reason these aspects are so important is because it's supposed to be an RPG. How you build your character should be important. But is that true, right? Is Bethesda making RPGs, or are they just, like, I'm pretty sure they're making action-adventure games. Not not from, like, a pejorative, um, this is an insult to them. I really think that, like, over time, their philosophy of making games has changed, and I don't think they really want to be, like, the RPG guys anymore yeah like i said i'd have to go through all their marketing material to see exactly what terms they're using when did this video come out uh wasn't it like didn't this video come out on the 10 10th, 10th anniversary yeah somewhere around there it's it, like two months ago yeah it's in the wave of um yeah 11 11 21 um yeah it was in the wave of like videos that we didn't watch until like we had cut a decent dent in the Skyrim videos that came out before the 10th year anniversary but that was the gamble with doing the 10th year anniversary because you didn't know is Bethesda going to do something for it that's going to like influence the video so it's like it's basically impossible for anniversary edition stuff to be featured in this other than like they can say that it's happening. Important. Because every aspect of this has been dumbed down to the lowest common denominator, it is- That implies that it's already as low as it can get. <laughs> and, uh, I, I don't know. I'm looking over the edge and I think that this, this pit goes a lot deeper. Oh, yeah. I'm talking like, uh just recharging potions that have a cooldown you know no arrows you like uh you get you unlock arrow types and then you just have infinite to that type you know the only things you upgrade are like health stamina magicka and then like your skills are just based on like the levels you would still get to pick perks but they would be like very superfluous no encumbrance take everything that you want yeah but but then they also simplify loot to the point where it's just there's nothing to loot except for uh boss chests at the end of a dungeon right like all of the loot is there no urns the, yeah. did you play the creation that was the alien ruin no i haven't gotten to it yet so th they just add urns everywhere which was not something that was in old alien ruins like it, alien ruins had the still had like just consolidated chests but they added like it very much feels like the Skyrim dungeon philosophy, but with an alien coat of paint. It's actually disgusting. Ooh. That sounds that sounds like something worth talking about. Oh yeah, I was gonna I'm gonna mention it. Because it really stands out, like it's a direct point of comparison to show the difference between Skyrim and Oblivion dungeons. Yeah, exactly. Because you can literally say, look at all these fucking urns, and show, <laughs> show, show me on the doll where Todd Howard forced you to loot all the urns. <laughs> it's like, why, like, you know full well that there's only gold in them. Unless you no. get, unless you get the thing that get, puts gems in them, too. But it's like... No, no, you can, um, loot them without any sort of, like, uh, perks and stuff, and they'll have, um, unenchanted jewelry in it as well. That's oh, why I yeah, would... Yeah, yeah. I would habitually um, loot those because I was aggressively that, training my enchanting. That's still just like a money thing. I mean, why bother with enchanting jewelry? Just enchant like whatever the fuck you have laying around. Do you get more experience yeah. based on the value of the item? Yes, you do. See, I would, I would just, I just spam enchanting golden rings. Well, I guess I yeah. would enchant like all the jewelry that I had. Be so that I could sell it. I would I, I wanted enchant. To, I wanted to have enchant, like t um, seven figure gold. Yes. So I tried to. I would start by trying to enchant things that would bankrupt the vendors, mm -hmm. and then I would switch over to enchanting just silver rings because you know, if you're transmuting, uh, transmuting ore. But yeah, it's like a lot of people bring up the urns, 
And, like, I don't know why, because it's just gold. And once you realize gold is meaningless, you can just stop looting the urns. What? Are you addicted to looting urns? <laughs> Can't stop. But yeah, I can very easily... And not only would there just be a, a chest at the end, for, um, but it would be an auto-looted chest, right? Yeah. So it's like... And then there would be a oh, button, and, exit dungeon. And there would also be... Gear would also be color-coded, you know, like the World of Warcraft sort of thing. Well, so and there you would can be a add big, a glance. There would be a big explosion of effects and like golden yes. light. Yes. Yes, exactly. The the chest would like bounce up and down like it's dancing and Mhm. Mm yeah, I can, I can see it in my mind's eye. It does not take a lot of effort on my part to imagine in an Elder Scrolls 6 that makes a, ma makes Elder Scrolls 5 <laughs> look like a complex role-playing game ex experience. Is Blades still active? Can I actually download Blades and play it? I think so. This sounds like something that should be in Blades. It it sounds it sounds like what I've been told Blades is. I might have to play that in turn reduces that RPG aspect to a pretty extreme degree. Oh, did we ever answer the question if they're playing Special or Legendary Edition? No, we didn't. I think they're playing Legendary Edition. Because in my version of Special Edition, every all the 3D models on the loading screen are pink. And I don't know why. To the point you don't really have to think about anything as far as character build goes. It's far more casualized and that's not even intended as a slight towards casual players, but towards Bethesda's priorities. See, good clarification. You don't want you don't want the Sorcerer Days of the World coming along and going, Well, don't, you just hate the casuals. I understand their reasoning, but the result is still a longtime RPG series being simplified to the point of being an overly simplistic experience. It's Babby's first RPG, and I mean that in more ways than one. We'll get to that as we go along, though. I hope you made. I hope you made a baby play the play the game. Also, this is definitely Legendary Edition. I'm feeling depressed looking at the screen. This brings me along nicely to skills as a whole. They've been okay. Hold on. What's this music? I'm a big uh, background music aficionado because it always bothers me if like there's really distracting background music. Reduced even further from Oblivion, which to remind people, strip back some skills from Morrowind. All weapon skills have been folded down into just. Oh, it's uh. You don't want to continue the chain of saying that Morrowind stripped down skills from Daggerfall? <laughs> I was just gonna say it's an 8 bit remix of Elder Scrolls uh, music. That's disgusting. I hate that. <laughs> uh, so, um, going back to what we were talking about earlier about how to. Uh, get like a point across with like terms and stuff. A nice subtle way to do it is by using uh, background music. You use like yeah. you know combative music when you're being when you're being aggressive and yeah, or like you use just some like stupid music or something like that. Like um, in my Mass Effect Two video, I used the Sims music for like Layer of the Shadow Broker because I was being kind of disingenuous. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like having goofy music for that kind of stuff. Um my big issue is like 12 hours of Oblivion video, but uh, 11 hours and 15 minutes of it is Oblivion music. <laughs> <laughs> like I think the best part is the Daedra stuff just for all the the audio memes that are in there. Yeah. Did Daggerfall strip down skills from Arena? I don't think so. And that's mostly because Daggerfall, like, just is Arena. Just three skills. One-handed, two-handed, and archery, which makes the weapon pool feel even more bland and unimportant as a result. As if cutting in time... I mean, it's not like... The weapon pool isn't really different from Oblivion. It's just, like, it has different packaging. Our weapon types from previous games wasn't bad enough in Oblivion. Speech and Mercantile have been folded into one skill as well, largely because any kind of persuasion or intimidation is extremely rare, to the point of it feeling like it was an afterthought. Yeah, I kind of, I have a bit about like trying to analyze this stuff 
um, like how many speech options there are where they are in the game. And it's really funny that you get the amulet of articulation after like the main quest line that has speech checks. Granted, Sneak did get split into Sneak and Pickpocketing, but that seems more like it was done out of necessity due to not having enough stealth skills after cutting acrobatics. Oh, that absolutely hits the nail on the head, and that's that's my observation as well as to why Pickpocket exists as a skill separate from Sneak. There is no meme. Take off your clothes. Armorer was replaced with blacksmithing because crafting shit is all the craze. Bethesda took action. Is that the reason? Or is it because durability got removed? I like durability. It's like a mechanical flashbang. <laughs> I think durability is absolutely I necessary for some games. I was unconvinced until your argument in the Oblivion video. Now I now I kinda I'm a bit of a believer. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like flying. I'm I'm so durability is actually still in World of Warcraft, and I'm massively surprised. Um, yeah, but right. It's a bit like flying, right? Flying in World of Warcraft is a bad thing, but players don't want to hear that because it's a convenience feature. Yeah. So it's like people hate durability because it's an inconvenience feature, but they don't realize that it makes the games better to have it. It, okay, it makes the games better to have it if it's implemented well. Just having durability doesn't make the game better. As a, like, I didn't remember how bad Oblivion durability was until I played the game. Fallout 3's durability is worse. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. Like, it is, abs it is a tricky thing, and I don't think the excuse, well, we did it bad, so we gotta cut it, is good. Yeah, there's, you just gotta rebalance it is all. Mm -hmm. Flying didn't ruin world PvP. Flying ended world PvP. Does <laughs> split mysticism in twain and hid the body amongst the other skills. Uh, come on, it's just a label. So Todd Howard actually said that in audio. So that- that's... Oh, what, that myst mysticism is just a label? Mm-hmm. So, Ooh. That, that's a great quote. Just putting that out there if you guys if you guys want it. Hang on. I can give you a timestamp. Uh okay, never mind. It's in the Game Informer podcast. You can just look up the transcript and you can look for a label and you'll probably find it. While well, hiding a murder weapon in one and two handed skills. Athletics was thrown from a helicopter. In Okay, so athletics is like one of those OG skills that I don't like because I don't like leveling from running. Like I like the effects of athletics, but I don't know a good way to actually make it a good skill. Do you not like it because it's too easy to level or too monotonous to level? Because it can ruin your level. So, oh, okay. Yeah, to like level athletics on an off level or Oh, yeah, 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 if you're trying to min-max. Yeah, so it creates problems for min-maxers. Um, and, like, you have to run way too much to level athletics. Like, you won't max it out just by running around. So it's like, you have to also train it, which I, I guess that makes a degree of sense in character, but it, it's not very good mechanically. Just but go I for like, a swim. I still like the idea of athletics, though. Yeah. I just think that like there's issues with it and I don't know how to fix it. It's one of the few things that like I have a problem with and I don't have a solution in mind. Huh. So Valheim has running and jumping as mm -hmm. skills. Did you find them egregious in there too? Because it's basically the same thing. No, but there's also no over level in, in yeah. Valheim. Yeah. Um, it just, all it does is it just decreases the like stamina. stamina usage. Yeah. Which isn't a terrible thing because, I mean, one of the big ways you offset stamina costs is, like, certain foods in Valheim. Yeah. And hand-to-hand -hand was summarily executed 
despite the fact the game has numerous items and, as mentioned, a fucking racial ability that boosts hand-to-hand -hand damage. Yeah, it's such a... There's also a perk in Heavy Armor for it. So, like, it seems like one of those things that got cut very late in development. Yeah, because they have all those, um, like, brawls and stuff that you can do. Yeah, like, that's one of the main Radiant quests you can get from the Companions. There's lots of uh, brawls out in the open world. Um, Which always just, always made me laugh because you'll get into a brawl and be like, no magic. And it's just like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and spam healing spells. I think it's like, they couldn't think, okay, so like, hand-to-hand -hand has to be a combat skill, right? I don't think they could figure out another stealth and magic skill. To balance it out. To two. Well, so that each well one has hold seven. on. Hold on. So we can bring back mysticism. <laughs> but what spells would it have? It would be the mysticism school in Skyrim would just be soul trap. <laughs> and then, like, what would you give stealth? Acrobatics. Acrobatics. But what would you use acrobatics for? Well, you gotta. What do we use acrobatics for? <laughs> for in oblivion. Uh, oh right, jump, to get get around long um, distances and dodging. I guess get around yeah, dodging. There you go. I, I used it to speed out of, uh, what's it called? Oblivion Gates. Yeah. Because there were certain jumps that you could do to. Yeah, like, like ju jumping from uh, bridge to bridge all around the yeah. towers. I think I would wager to say acrobatics is indirectly my favorite skill in Oblivion. I would have to agree because, like, it's really stupid. <laughs> I wish they would design stuff around it, like, um... Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's the key. It's I, like, I can... if you want to make acrobatics a skill in Skyrim or Tez 6, you have to design dungeons around it. You have to yeah, design like, cities around it. Like, I'm thinking, like, a, a, a jumping puzzle. Yeah. Because, like, high-level acrobatics in Oblivion gives you very fine control over, like, where you move in a jump, and I think that's oh, yeah. the idea. But there's nothing you can do with it because... Um, yeah, because all the dungeons are designed around... If you can find a way to use it in a dungeon, it was an exploit, not actually intentional. Well, listen, in Ustin Grav, there's a place where you whirl and sprint across yeah. gaps, <laughs> and you find a chest at the end that has 10 gold in it, and we really don't <laughs> want players skipping this, this uh, important puzzle in the main quest. Todd, please... At the very least, they renamed Marksman to Archery to drop any pretense or implication of ranged weapons besides bows existing. It's true. Bring back throwing weapons. Oh, I gotta, I gotta ask. So, you were talking about uh, last night. You said something like Emma walked into somebody's office with a shotgun and shot their mom. Is that what the fuck was that? Um. So, like, there are stories in the Mark Lamper episode of the Bethesda podcast. Uh, like, literally. Emil showed up at Mark Lampert's office and worked with him on sound effects. That's not his job. I guess Emil was just done with work and had time to show up at Mark Lampert's office and work on sound effects with him. So, like, I just kind of, like, have a meme of Emil going around to everybody's department and, like, fucking with their workflow. Because it's like, <laughs> how much does Emil Pagliarulo contribute to the sound effects of Skyrim? Like, there's some occasions where, like, if you're in another department that you know nothing about, you are actually slowing down their workflow. Yeah. Because they have to, like, explain shit to you. That sounds like a guy who's trying to get himself promoted. Well, obviously. <laughs> but, I mean, he was friends with Todd Howard and Pete Hines. Like, yeah. there's no way they were going to fire Emil. Unless he was their star child from Fallout 3. Like, I think that's when he started getting awards. So... So forget being a ninja like in Morrowind. Like, I stand by um, Mark and Recall as combat spells with throwing weapons. So Ooh. you put a mark down, you run across the room, and like, when the enemy gets near the mark, you throw a weapon at them and then teleport behind them. <laughs> <laughs> I miss throwing weapons. Like, 
and the thing is, like, Nords, throwing axes. Yeah. It's obvious. You, do you throw your... Do you use spears, and do you throw them in Valheim? Um, I use spears. I wouldn't throw them, though. Yeah, you're scared of losing them, aren't you? Yeah. Even though... Dar throwing spears at, like, deer and shit is fun, though. On guard ads and hunting four deers, hunting deers, hunting in general in that game is awesome. Yeah, it's like a surprisingly robust. Like, um, I would. We got to do. For, you got to do a Valheim video. I no I am worth. That's that's the one that I. Yeah, I, I said that right earlier yeah. in the stream. That yeah, you said you yeah, were I'm reworking work it. You can't. You yeah. can't lose faith here. No, I'm, I'm reworking it. See, the problem with Valheim is that a lot of it's. Uh, the content's like only fifty percent complete. Yeah, apparently. early access and all that. Yeah, so but I'm... and a lot of the joy of the game that I was experiencing was through just progression and figuring things out on my own. So mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil anything. Like I don't want to show any of the bosses except maybe I, I might hear. show. Yeah, I might show him, but the others are I... definitely staying off screen. I could hear is the one to show. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about spoiling people. I don't, I don't know. I felt I felt like I was ruining the experience just looking things up in the in the wiki. I'll talk about it in the video, but it was I really enjoyed the the progression of that game because it felt very intuitive and natural. It has a very good progression system. Yeah. The only arbitrary thing about it is, is that like wolves are like gimme gods. See, I haven't gotten to the um to that part of the game yet. Oh, the mountains. Yeah. I'm getting I'm getting filtered by bone mass right now. Really? Yeah, I need to. I just need to level up a little bit more. Well, I mean, here's um, the, here's the basics I need of to... how you fight bone mass. Okay. Uh, fire arrows, and then you like just clear out a big a big clearing, and then just drag them around the bone mass statue. Yeah. Of course, I did heard. this with three people, but three people adds like a shit ton of health to him. So just takes he's also longer, but yeah, I like, he's also supposed I, to be very weak to like blunt weapons and stuff. And I was using a sword on him, so yeah, I was doing no damage. I tanked bone mass for my group while they pelted him with fire arrows, and it yeah. took forever. <laughs> you can throw spears. Yes, yeah, spear throwing the spear is the alternate attack for it. It's very powerful, but obviously you throw an item that you use resources to craft. Yeah, you would have to craft a bunch of them, probably. I never had any... Well, you get it back. But yeah, but I, I'm just saying, like, if you're in the heat of a battle and mm -hmm. you're getting surrounded, you want to... You probably want, like, two or three of them. Crossbows to pick from. Careful there. You're breaking the creativity bank with the new weapons, Bethesda. Oh, yeah, you, and you got to clarify. The crossbows were uh, post-launch content, so... Not, not even, like, uh... Like a response to criticism, I guess. I don't know. Crossbows are weird. Like, what was the impetus? Like, what did Emil watch that weekend that made him go? <laughs> <laughs> we got to do crossbows again. Was it was it Emil or was it one of the other? Who, who one knows? Of the other but developers? it's like, what was what was popular at the time? I'm trying to think about like popular crossbow scenes, and I'm thinking of like Game of Thrones season two, I guess. Oh, right. That might have been the right era. G Game of Thrones and Skyrim is a complicated subject because they're contemporary with each other. Duh. Now, cutting skills alone isn't inherently bad. There are absolutely instances where a skill is nearly useless. Such as... Okay, don't show Ebony Smithing, but such as uh, language skills in Daggerfall. Or there's an arbitrary split in between skills when it would have made more sense for them to be combined into one. But as mentioned, that's not even fully the case here. Sneak used to cover pickpocketing, but now they're- He watched Van Helsing? That's a good theory because vampires. And hunting vampires with crossbows. And of course, uh, Bethesda are, are like, massively motivated by fiction. And so when- there wasn't very much uh, fantasy stuff going on in the 2010s. Of course, they didn't make any Elder Scrolls games. Are two different skills. Is blaming Immel the cool version of blaming Todd? I would say there's some stuff you blame Immel for, and there's some stuff you blame Todd for. If it's mechanical in nature, you should probably. If it's mechanical or artistic in nature, you should blame Todd. If it's a writing thing, 
or um, like an ideas thing, that it's probably an Emil's camp. Because Bethesda apparently didn't know what to put in the missing space, so all three specializations would have equal skills. Which I always, I always thought was like extremely arbitrary. Yeah, because not all of them are created equal. You know, if you're a warrior, you're picking one-handed and heavy armor, for mm -hmm. example, and maybe block. As a mage, you're probably picking almost all of them. And then a thief is two. So Assassin's Creed did add crossbows, but it was the wrist crossbow. Like it, it's not like a full cool crossbow. But yeah, I've always, like, I just disagree with the idea that, like, there needs to be an equal number of skills. But it looks cool. Yeah. It, I, it's like a, it's like the user interface dictated how many skills had to be in the game. I, I, I think that might be it. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. What was it that showed the early user interface? I think it was the making of docu- or the most recent documentary where they showed it before... Uh, Natalie Smirnova did her, like, UI pass, and it looked like dog shit. I don't know if you saw it. I don't know. Is that the one? It's the uh, documentary with, like, the nine developers. Yeah, where he was, like, interviewing them and everything. The mm -hmm. dude, like, the dude who made it was, was a former developer, right? Yeah, and there was, like, a yeah, bunch yeah, of yeah. friends. Yeah. I like that video. It had some uh, good was, stuff in there. It was all right, but I'm not big on, like, learning about, like, what artists are responsible for what. Because, like, what do I do with that information? I just kind of, like, offhandedly mentioned, oh, yeah, you know cows? Yeah, this guy's responsible for cows. And it's like some people probably, like, forgot that there are even cows in Skyrim. Like, yeah. Um, like, the, I imagine the only that information who talk are the artists. I and, imagine. Yeah, and, and like I said, those are the people who get praised. Yeah. I imagine that information is useful, though, to somebody out there. Oh, I'm sure. Like maybe but... maybe modders and stuff who are more, you know, artistically inclined, they can recognize the differences in people's work and stuff. But, yeah, for, like, a video analysis, like the stuff that we do, it's not exactly helpful. But there's still some useful tidbits in there, I feel. Well, yeah, it's like, I think... Like there's a there's a thing where I like found out that like Adam Adamowitz was responsible for Kavach and it's like does that even real does that need to be mentioned? Like I mentioned the lady who came up with Shaden Hall because she was also the lady that like made a quest. And also like so she was the lady that was like into goth stuff, and Shaden Hall is a very goth town, unsurprisingly. But even then, the problem with that is that magic. But I don't think I commented that on that in the video. Magic still outnumbers the other specializations. There are three skills that are split between two specializations: archery, split between stealth and combat, while enchanting an elk. Okay, okay, I disagree with this. Um, this is making the assumption that there is a single skill on the border. I actually think each specialization has two border skills. So the border skills for combat are archery and smithing. The border skills for magic are enchanting and alchemy. And then the border skills for stealth are archery and alchemy. Yeah. So it's like alchemy is both a stealth and magic skill. And archery is both a combat and stealth skill. And, and like enchanting is both a magic and combat skill, etc. I mean, I would argue enchanting is all three. Yeah, I mean, but... yeah, of course, but you can also say that alchemy is all three. Like, I think all of the crafting skills... The crafting skills are just universal. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe not maybe not smithing so much, actually, if you're a mage. It's been, like, 16 minutes since I've taken a note. <laughs> <laughs> like, this video is pretty fine. I am uh, nitpicking to complain about stuff. Would you say border skills or hybrid skills? I would say hybrid skills. Yeah. But yeah, I think they're wrong on this assumption. To me, two skills historically under the magic specialization are split between combat and stealth respectively. Even cutting mysticism was a stretch, but this just goes to show how important some of these... 
I like as much as I like mysticism, I understand why they cut it. It had so few effects and most of them got cut. So it's like it doesn't really make sense to have a skill for like if we're just assuming like I often work under the assumption of you get to change one thing about the game, right? So it's like you re-add mysticism, but you don't get to re-add the mysticism spells. Well, then yeah. like, what's the point of having mysticism, right? It would be a school of soul trap. And off the top of my head, that's like literally the only like old school mysticism spell that's in Skyrim. Like you would also have, in addition to have, adding mysticism, you would also have to add the mysticism spell effects. And of course, nobody at Bethesda is passionate about magic, so they have a. And if you want to know about quotes, they also have a great quote that's like, "We didn't want to make the magic too spreadsheety. We think that players looking at the numbers behind spells ruins the the magic of it." We and, don't want smart people playing our games. Well, not just that, but like, are you kidding me? Like, literally, <laughs> ma archery and melee are all about numbers. Like, there's so many numbers that are involved in that. And it's like... I, it just seems like it's such a lame cop-out for not having custom spells. Skills really were. And that arbitrary cutting in order to reduce them for the sake of reducing them isn't a good thing. Most of the spells under mysticism were simply given to the other magic skills, even though it makes no sense for most of them to be where they are now. It, that is true. If you go by the, like, <clears throat> the old cope is like, oh, well, all the schools of magic are like blends of each other, which is stupid. Um, if you go by, like, the hard definitions of what the schools of magic are, like, um, soul trap is not a conjuration effect. Um, like, telekinesis and detect life are not alteration effects. Because alteration is about altering physical reality. Well, how is detect life altering physical reality? That kind of deal. Yeah. Such as Soul Trap being a conjuration spell. Conjuration being a skill all... Why wouldn't Soul Trap be... Well, okay, because they'd have to add it. Never mind. I was going to ask why Soul Trap isn't an enchant spell, but that's kind of stupid about summoning creatures to fight for you and materializing weapons and armor to fight with out of thin air. All of this culminates in the overall experience being diluted, as you can never truly make a specialized character because you can do everything by default with no limits and with a reduced pool of skills, there's less to focus on, and this is made even worse by the entire combat system, which we'll get to in a bit. Who's that guy in chat who complains that every time somebody says, we'll get to this? What are your thoughts on that? I do it all the time. My Mass Effect 3 video, I probably did it a record number of times. I think it's there's, there's a degree of just, necessity to it. Yeah, there's there really is certain things where it's just... Like, like with my Mass Effect 3 video, I kept running into points where it's like, I'm I have to talk about Cerberus. I have to at least mention them because they're here. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to go too deep into it because... There's a better point much later in the game where we get very deep into it. And we get all the conclusion to them. So it's best to save it to then. And it just, just, just happens. It sucks sometimes. Where it, you, You'll say it like four times in a row. Yeah, we'll get back to it. We'll get back to it. Mm -hmm. But it's like, okay, the alternative is you never say I'll get back to it. That means you have to cover the topic as it comes up. And so your and video then... would be extremely front loaded. Yeah, and you just go into Tangent City where it's you'll disappear for 20 minutes into just tangent after tangent, and then you have to backtrack your way to the original point, and by then you've lost the audience. This also had I, another issue. Okay, so I agree with chat on the sense of like the, mu the music is absolutely <clears throat> distracting. Yeah, if I'm, I'm noticing it. That like, um, this is why you don't you don't want to use like chip tune music. You don't want to use um, like Hotline Miami music is very popular to use, but it's actually yeah. like extremely distracting. It's, yeah, you don't want to use super energetic music unless I don't think if it's you're even, using it's even it an energy very thing. briefly. It is um, music that is synthesized. I think I think like 
I, I've seen a lot of people who use music from uh, Doom, and that can get distracting that, too. Yeah, that would be extremely distracting. Uh, you want to know who's really good at music selection? Civi Eleven. He's like a mas gonna... He's a master of choosing the right songs that aren't distracting, but have the right impact for his videos. Yeah. That's the fact that it was possible to accidentally over-level, and as a result, it would make combat encounter. God, this footage is hard to look at. Because of the, like... Too much, yeah, too much mu movement. A lot of artifacting. Yeah, because you have this shield that's popping up in front that's on fire. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, this is... Well, even the UI is, like... This is reminding me... Having trouble this is st staying yeah. together. <laughs> This is this is why I would never want to stream on Twitch because this just looks like a Twitch stream to me. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. A guy commented on my Dead Space video saying how he was confused because I said we'll get back to that but didn't address what problem we were putting off in the first place. Yeah. That could that could definitely be a thing. Um, you want to be clear on like what you're going to get back to my issue with I, I'm always worried about um, saying I'll get back to it and then forgetting to get back to it. Like, I, I almost I, have, I almost had that problem with my Mass Effect 3 video. I literally had to start taking notes every yeah, time I have. So I, at the end of each section, I have a list of notes of things that like it's basically a to do list for that section. And yeah. every time I say I'll talk about this later. I add it to the notes to make sure that I actually get back to it. And and then just to cover my bases, I also control F'd my, uh, my script and looked up different permutations of that. I mean, I usually know what I'm what I'm saying. So. Oh, you want good background music? Uh, rice gum diss tracks. <laughs> there you go. It's far more difficult than they needed to be. For example, if you wanted to spend time to work on blacksmithing, enchanting, and alchemy to get some really good gear before really going out and delving into the world, then good fucking luck. Because now every enemy is going to hit like a truck, and you're going to be able to take hits like a wet paper bag. Okay, so I've always heard this. It's the, um, the meme of, while you were out picking flowers, the Draugr were training. I've never necessarily run into this issue, but I think it's experience with Skyrim that's taught me the right amount to y of crafting skills to use. I used to be in the camp of, I'm just going to save until I have a bunch and then do it all at once, but now I'm in the, I'm going to level a little bit of this crafting skill here. Like, crafting skills are a good way to, like, finish off a level. Yeah. Or to push into another level if you want to buy some uh, buy some levels or something like that from a trainer, and you're already in the city. So I think Bethesda was not. You're right in the sense that Bethesda was not prepared for the possibility of players like maxing out their crafting skills all at once, uh, especially in the. I guess especially in the early game because it's very easy to jump up like 20 levels at the start of the game. But. I think Bethesda's idea was that, like, you would use alchemy or what have you as you went. And when you do that, it works a lot better. So, like, just enchant with what you can get when you can get it. Don't wait for Azura's star, you know. Use what you got, right? Smith, upgrade your stuff as you find it. Or, like, take the time to use the resources that you're finding. Um alchemy you know you want to you want to use alchemy in general to boost your skills anyways right yeah it's, that's like a big damage source so what you're saying is listen to todd howard and just play the game just play the game but see okay that's the issue though when some people play the game they do have this issue of like i think it's what what is it that causes people to like save up resources and then do it all at once ah I don't know. Is it like just a... I think it's it, like optimizing the fun out of your game. Like they just want to grind it all at once. They see it as like a chore, I guess. So it's like they just don't want to do it. And then when... Oh, I have to do it now. So they do it all at once. Granted, this could be an issue in the other games too. 
if you prioritize advancing the wrong skills, but this was to a far lesser degree. In Oblivion, yes, and Morrowind, no. Well, yeah, it's like, if you max out the crafting skill, that means you have access to stuff that would make you more powerful as a consequence, right? So if you max out enchanting, you now have powerful enchantments. If you max out alchemy, you can boost your skills way higher, right? Yeah. So I don't I don't think this point holds. But, he, okay, it doesn't hold with us who know how to play the game. Crafting skills are... Um... Yeah, so I'm trying to think. I guess you'd still have the material requirements to filter out uh, lower level players, but there's still ways to acquire a lot of that shit. I, I think that's too metagamey, though. I think it's your own fault if you, like, if you know where to go to get, like, gold. To, yeah. Like, spam golden rings. Like, I don't think that's something that comes intuitively to a first time player. Like avoiding blacksmithing and then hitting the enemy ceiling and realizing you need to blacksmith to go further. I have to continue my training to go beyond. Three. And in addition to that, you added, this could be an issue in the other games too, if you prioritize advancing the wrong skills, but this was to a far lesser degree. And in addition to that, I had a PTS3 flashback. I thought the start of that sentence was The Witcher 3. I was about to cry. What are your thoughts on, like, the overexposure of The Witcher 3 in Skyrim videos? Um, Do you think it's I mean, relevant? The Witcher... the Witcher 3... Well, it's first off, it's hard for me to say because I've never really played The Witcher 3 much. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know, you know, it's, it's a good game. People really like it, so it's like comparing it to to Souls games. It's, it's like the next Skyrim, basically. So it's yeah, it, 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 there's a lot that it has in common, and I don't know. It seems pretty fair. I, I personally, I would, as a creator, I like to try and get a little bit more creative with my comparisons. That's why there's going to be a lot of Valheim comparisons if I do a Skyrim video. Well, yeah, I feel like Valheim is a lot closer to an Elder Scrolls game than like. Some people are comfortable with admitting, or Seven Days to Die, I think, is like really underrated when it comes to like, yeah, yeah. The leveling system is, I forgot, that also has a um, similar leveling system. I want to talk, like, I've got too much shit to talk about. I'd love to talk about Seven Days to Die, but I don't have time to do it. <laughs> You're waiting on the next gen patch for Witcher 3. I'm waiting on the Witcher 3 video from Joseph Anderson, <laughs> which still isn't out. What if Joseph Anderson's the one that gets pregnant? So like <laughs> he he keeps having like childbirths interrupt his process. You also had the knowledge that you could decide to not have armorer, for example, as one of your major or minor skills yet still level the skill up as much as you'd like because it would be useful to repair your gear on the go. You didn't have to worry about skills you don't use much contributing to your overall level and therefore making the enemies of the world stronger since- I agree in the sense of there's way too much assumption that you're going to have smithing like at around level 30. what like you're gonna have it completed by then well that like level 30 i think is around the range when like the game starts expecting you to like be tempering your equipment oh because yeah, i think yeah. that's when that's when like the progression of the armor that you actually get starts to drop off yeah it's bethesda seems to think difficulty simply means enemies do more damage and you do less Rather than no, 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 it's that they have more health. I like the enemy that I fought at like level six that had like 1100 health, and as it was a creation club thing, but 
I'm trying to make combat encounters more varied and interesting. But again, we'll cover that later. Just to focus on some particular skills, though, the way interacting with and using different skills... See, this is a Morrowind combat track now. ...skills has also changed in some weird ways. It's too loud. So, like, this track in particular and the uh, brass track in Morrowind uh, have to be lower than you would typically lower other songs. So when you're mixing audio, do you use headphones or do you use speakers? Headphones. I use both. Because well, I've yeah, gotten, there's a lot of people I've who gotten, do both. Yeah, because I've noticed sometimes I'll ha it'll sound great in headphones, and I put it on speakers, and I either can't hear it or it's way too loud. It's fucking weird. Yeah, and then you have to remember too is that there's people who will watch stuff using just a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Got to render so. the video and then like put it on your cell phone and listen to it. If you don't do that, are, you're not on the grind set. There's people who compliment my use of music in my videos but the honest truth is my mass effect 3 video might honestly be the last video that has music in it i, would, I hate i would not endorse that shit, that you can get lazy with it but i would not endorse cutting it out entirely yeah it's it's just the balancing of it is such a pain in the ass and like i said it's i think it's if i it. pull up if i pull up videos on my phone though or I use, I remember one video I had, I was listening to it on my headphones, it would sound great. And then I listened to it on my earbuds at work, and I couldn't even fucking understand what was being said. And most of that had to do with just the music. Right. Um, wow. Yeah, that's why like audio producers have, like, they'll listen to their, the songs they make in multiple ways. Yeah. Do no audio mixing like a chat. Just leave it at default vo volume so it's as loud as possible. <laughs> but yeah, I think music's essential for a video. Back in Morrowind, alchemy was a bit of a tedious skill to use. <gasps> I agree. Even if your skill is high enough to understand what effects each ingredient had, you still had to go through your entire inventory of ingredients to find matching effects so you can make your potions. Oblivion made a significant quality of life change here, where once you picked the first ingredient, it would cull the entire list of ingredients that don't share known effects with that ingredient, thereby making the whole process streamlined and easier to do. By the time- Yeah, exactly. There should be a level of skill involved in listening to the video. So, like, you should be, like, actively fo- like, lower the- the volume of your voice so that people have to actively focus on what you're saying. <laughs> oh, you really want to filter out those people who put it on just for background noise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so those people are just listening to the music. <laughs> Skyrim rolled around, they decided to invent a perk system, which feels like a little more than bloat upon the entire- Look at this fucking UI. Oh their game which had i mean to be fair it's like this because he hasn't learned any effects yet so yeah but still consequences like being at 100 alchemy yet no perks selected and thus making your potions completely worthless even though you should be a master yet if you do the perks with their ch yes and no i have complicated feelings about it right because I am absolutely of the camp that, like, if you have skill level 100, that means you're one of the best. But, how do you, like, why would you be skill level 100 and not have invested points into it? I guess if you like, went to a trainer every level and just... I, I guess, yeah, but there's way better skills to choose for that, and... I don't know, like... I think perks have the opportunity to represent like your specialization in that particular skill set, right? Yeah. So alchemy is divided into crafting potions and crafting poisons, and that's what the two like tracks of the of the perk tree are. So I think I think that's the that's the kind of advantage of the perk system is that it can represent the idea of like you're a master of alchemy, but you have a specialization in crafting poisons, for instance. Or it's like, you can be a master of blades, but then there could be, like, additional specializations for, like, you use thrusting swords, or you use cutting swords. 
what have you. And then the perks can represent those kinds of specializations and ideas. Changing skill level. Or like, I think hand-to-hand -hand would be great. Like, martial arts would be a lot of divisions. Uh, just give me the one where I can body slam people all the time. Yeah, you know, grappling. Since can actually break the game entirely, since the formula for creation uses multiplication. Who tested this? Uh, somebody who is really bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't know. What's the issue with that? Like, if you, it feels like a really weird thing to say. Oh, well, it, the formula uses multiplication, so that makes it a bad thing. Let him finish. Well, okay, I'm, I am too used to, like, um, I am too used to, like, the Acer Thorn standard of <laughs> uh, make a point and then don't elaborate on it. In this case, because the perks are boring, X percent better. Okay, so yeah, I do agree. Um, although I've always had the caveat, like, when people complain about the perk system, I think you should, like, don't be like uh, never knows best and say I've literally got infinite ideas, but I don't have time to actually tell you them. Oh. Right? Like how? What? What are your kind? And maybe you do do it, right? So like you gotta give me the benefit of the doubt here. I don't know what like you're gonna get into, um, but yeah, like I don't see the problem with like having some perks just be flat. Like you make better potions. I yeah, I don't I don't have a problem with that either. I actually. For the most part, I actually really like how it's also usually the first perk yeah. that you invest in. Unless it's destruction. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> most perks, with rare exception, simply did things leveling skills used to do, such as making you more effective in that skill, for example. It feels as though everything a skill had done previously was cut up in recent- Oh no, please do not click them. This is going to bother me if this footage is just him going down the list, clicking them. Okay, uh -oh. here's how you mass eat ingredients. You hit E, you hit down arrow. E, down arrow. E, down arrow. He sold to us as perks, because I couldn't actually think of enough unique abilities or bonuses to give us instead. This applies to alchemy and- Oh, thank God. Alright, I actually have to listen to what he's saying. Now that, like, I know that it's not going to bother me. <laughs> With rare exception, simply did things leveling skills used to do, such as making you more effective in that skill, for example. Is that necessarily a bad thing, though? It's a difference, but it being different it doesn't mean that it's bad. I think it's depend it's uh, skill dependent. So for me, my solution for alchemy is you remove the um, you know, the thing where it's like you need to put a perk in to eat items and get more. Uh, yeah. To discover. It, that would just be you automatically unlock it as you hit certain points in the, like, hit 25. So there were. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. So, um. It the feels like everything. Is Fuck. Okay. Um. More skills needed to have, like, spines, I think. And so it's like. Yeah, I, I like your your auto unlock idea so like you hit destruction level 25 and you auto unlock the first perk of destruction and then the perks that you select that you get the points for branch off of that spine yeah so for for the magic ones are actually pretty easy for me you just remove the how like um you know the perks for casting adept spells mm -hmm. apprentice spells blah 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 you just integrate that into so you hit 20 level 25 bam you can and cast adept yeah, cheaper. now you have that perk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to think of... I would have to go through all of these perk trees to figure out which perks can be moved like that. I don't necessarily think it's an issue that, like, perks replace a lot of, like, what skills used to do. Because there's actually a lot more granularity that the system can provide. Not that it does, but that it can. So yeah. I'm not going to say that the system, like the perk idea in and of itself is bad. I just think it is no, I execution, like, I, and that's probably where he's going. Yeah. The skill I've done previously was cut up and resold to us as perks. What What's the meme that gets that gets posted? Uh, they 
fuck, I cannot think of it off the top of my head, but it's the Oblivion map, and then it's like about level. Okay, here it is. They feed us poison so we buy their cures while they suppress our medicine. That's kind of the vibe this argument's giving me. Which, I mean, I agree with that sentiment, but it is funny that, like, he's basically making the case. Uh, they, they took stuff away and then are, like, selling us, selling it back to us. Because I couldn't actually think of enough unique abilities or bonuses to give us instead. This applies to alchemy in that simply leveling up your skill no longer taught you what effects each ingredient has. I was going to say, my issue with the perk is that um, the level requirements for the, the discovering ingredients perks are like really stupid. And it's like really far into the tree. Yeah. So it's like to learn all the level 4 effects from eating them, you have to have like level 70 in alchemy. Is it? I think it's... Is it more than that, I think? Uh, I can look it up. I think it might be like 80 or 90. Uh, you might actually be... You might be right. Um, which is absurd. Yeah, it's, it's 90. Yeah. <laughs> what, which is definitely absurd. Instead, you have to spend a total of three perk points, and therefore three entire levels pushing enemy scaling higher, just dedicated to unlocking the ability to find out every effect an ingredient has without- No, it would be, um, one, two, five levels. But I don't know, that seems like a really minor thing, like, Different builds have different levels of issues with this. Yeah. Um, like, magic builds don't have enough perks to really spare for this. Um, yeah, you basically, if you're a magic play character, you basically have to ignore, per like, two whole skill trees. Yeah, you have to pick, like, what magic skills you want to be specialized in. And then, like, later down the road when you can refund the crafting skill, which, we'll clarify, yeah. was not in the base game... Um, or you do Dragonborn, where you can refund the perks as well without resetting your skill level. Um, but yeah, like, you can refund the, the Benefactor perks. I don't think... You don't have to go past Physician unless you want the, the perks that remove the negative effects from positive potions. Uh, we said earlier the roleplay-oriented alchemy system would be a good thing where, like... You read in a book what Daedra Hearts do, and now you know, like, all the effects for it. I don't have an issue with that, because there's a lot of, like, opportunities of, like, you can learn alchemy effects from, like, all the alchemists that are in the world. Um, and I think the same thing is necessary for smithing, where, like, you have quests that are, like, special smithing quests for unlocking the ability to craft the gear. This argument is much better suited for Fallout 4, where you can't increase combat skills by not using them. Yeah, I'd agree with- I would agree with that. It's simple trial and error. This means you waste ingredients or throw up your arms in the air and try to deal with a guide online, which itself is a hassle due to the sheer amount of ingredients in this game. Well, okay, so if you open the door to using the wiki, then you can just look up the effect you want to make. But, obviously, like, you would probably agree with me in the sense of like it should be in the game you shouldn't have to look at the uesp to know like how to yeah. do alchemy yeah you know what always bothered me about skyrim reading a recipe doesn't unlock the effect on the ingredients themselves yep <laughs> even then you don't learn the effects of each ingredient by unlocking these perks you literally have to eat every single ingredient to learn their full effects this turns early alchemy into a fucking chore. Yeah, and it makes some effects, like, eff basically impossible to figure out. Like, because like I said earlier, like, Fortify Destruction is really difficult to, like, learn without look just looking it up. And I tried to do it. I tried to, like, figure out how to make certain potion effects without, like, looking it up. And some stuff oh, was yeah. just impossible. 
And it's, and a lot of the stuff, see, it would be better if the ingredients were a lot more intuitive as well. Mm hmm. But, um, I, I think they try to do that where it's like, oh, Nightshade, yeah, it does like damaging effects. Well, so here's the one that gets me is the colored, um, the colored, blah, 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 blah the, the colored, colored mountain flowers. flowers. Yeah, 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 where they don't relate to the colored juices that they're supposed to relate to. So it's like the red yeah, flower. Yeah, that is definitely dumb. Like, why wouldn't the red flower be health? Yeah, the red flower is magic, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah. And it's like, mm, why? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It seems really obvious. Even with the quality of life improvements of the crafting table, having each possible effect a potion can have listed at the side, so you can easily find the kind of potion you might want to make. This turns alchemy into a mess of a skill. Have you have you played Potion Craft? No. It's a pretty it's an indie game. It's it's fairly fun. Um, so it's about just being an alchemist, and so like the core of it is. Um, so like there's a map and when you add ingredients to the cauldron that moves the potion around the map and you have to find the points in the map that are certain effects and then like try to come up with efficient ways to get to those parts of the map. And so it's like you're figuring out like what ingredients are best used to achieve certain effects, but any ingredient could be used to achieve any effect is because it's just navigation. Huh? I don't necessarily think it would really be feasible to put in an Elder Scrolls game, but like it might be something they would want to play to like kind of get the cogs turning in their heads for better ways to do it. It is absurdly fucking annoying to deal with early on, though it does become profitable later, though that leads into a whole different issue. I like the uh the uh, like the background music. Very sinister music. Mm -hmm. uh, from the Sinister Music Pack. Oh yeah, none of this even includes the issue of alchemy being hard limited to doing it on a fucking table either. In both Morrowind and Oblivion, you could do alchemy on the go as you please because the items to do so were... items. In your inventory. I don't know- I, I do agree with the sentiment that like... Um... I don't I I think it the idea is you should have to keep the items at your house cuz they're like really heavy. Yeah. So I see my solution would be you can have like a pestle and mortar to make potions out in the wilds, but it's going to make inferior potions. Well, that's how it is. So this would Is it, wait, what? Yeah, the more the more stuff you have, the better the potions are. So, but oh. you you could still like just use the oh. mortar and pestle. Oh, yeah, 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 in Oblivion. I was talking about Skyrim. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that would just be taking Oblivion system. Yeah, I mean, I always ran around with the full, with my whole set. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people who don't, who don't like that aspect of it, though. But uh, what I'm saying is, so like... But you might not want to listen my, to those people. My solution in Skyrim would be, okay, you can have a, like, a pestle and mortar to make just, like, inferior potions in the field. But if you want to make the good stuff, you got to go to an actual station. Oh, and so that you would. So it's like a hybrid. To, of, it's a hybrid of stations and having a pestle. Yeah, and then that encourages people to prepare properly before they head out to dungeons and stuff. I can see that working. Maybe like you still have like calcinators and stuff that you can find because I like the idea of like there being Finding a progression to the to the tools that you have. But it's like you have Maybe an you alchemy should, station. You could, at your at your Find. camp at your house etc and then you can upgrade the parts of the alchemy station yeah or you know you find a bobblehead and now you make 25 percent better potions <laughs> <laughs> oh how the fuck we've progressed 200 years in the timeline only for technology to regress but i mean the, it's not that technology regressed, it's just that the uh, the Alchemy Crafters Union mandated that the uh, all the equipment be welded to the tables. Uh, it was so that people would have to go to the Alchemist shop 
to craft potions. So it was a union thing. <laughs> Here we are. This is a really dumb change. And it I like that joke. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> You ever text lines to yourself that you come up with when you're out in the uh like out no, in public? No, I, I haven't. I, oh, I, I have the um, I have a channel on my Discord where it's just me, and I'll just like post shit in there to remember for later. So if I'm like lying in bed, I'll just like hop in that in that channel and that's just. That's a pretty good. Like, that's a pretty good idea. I'll be right back. I need to get something to drink. So if you need yeah, to Yeah, I got to go to the bathroom. So, we'll be back. We're going to play some JXC for you. All right, I am back. What, you're not going to entertain the chat? <laughs> Harry Potter culturally made wands pathetic in fantasy. Isn't it the opposite? I th I th yeah, I thought people go to... They have that whole thing in, like... Was it Disneyland or Disney World or whatever? Where you can make your own make your own wand and pay like $300 for it or some shit like that. Mm -hmm. I think they made wands are really cool. Wands were made more popular in fantasy by Harry Potter. It feels entirely arbitrary. Speaking of arbitrary, the new enchanting system is several levels of bullshit and is extremely limiting compared to previous games. Just rip the band-aid off then. <laughs> <laughs> Back in Morrowind, you could put any spell onto a piece of gear, as long as that item was able to handle the spell, and this led to some unique and interesting custom items that could change the way you play the game entirely. Not anymore. Now you have to disenchant existing items in order to learn their enchantment. Okay, this is a weird one. I know you're going to go places with this, but it's like... Okay, why is this particular point contrary to be still being able to make like custom stuff?
I asked you a question. Oh, you're asking me. Oh. Um. Uh, it's not that different from having to learn spells to make enchantments. Yeah, honestly, I've never really thought too strongly about having to disenchant items. There's, um... There's a perk, right, in Vanilla Skyrim where it's you can retain the item after you disenchant it? Or is that a CC thing that I'm thinking of? I don't even think that's a CC thing. I don't know if that's a thing. Is it not? Oh, shit, I thought it was. I might be mixing something else up then. Sounds like a mod. It's definitely... There's definitely... It definitely has to be a mod then. Yeah, I don't see it as like a perk that you would like buy. Okay, then that had to be a mod. It must be getting mixed up. Once again. <laughs> Talking about this in the beginning of the video. But... I mean, okay, so there's a lot of different ways I've seen magic systems be done. I'm actually... Wands are interesting, but I'm I'm not a fan of them, but I can see their strengths. Because the cool things about wands are you can disarm somebody with a wand. You can make wandless magic like a sign that somebody's a very powerful wizard. Um, however, I think... And you can have, like, broken wands and what have you. I think wands in Harry Potter started to break down when they did, like, the... Oh, you disarm somebody, so now you own their wand. That sounds fucking stupid. That sounds like it would just be, like... Ah, fuck, I got disarmed, and now my wand's gonna suck. Can I, do like, dis hold on, hold my wand, I'm gonna disarm you, so that I can get my wand back, and it'll respect me. I think wands had a lot of potential, I was just thinking that J.K. Rowling's a hack who, like, wasted all the potential of her series. I like, I like the idea of, like, gem casting. Like, when I was writing, that was kind of my idea for casting, was, like, if you wanted to do high-level magic, you had to sacrifice gems. Bring back Welkid stones, but tie them to something like that. So you can enchant different items, meaning there's a whole extra step in enchanting items if you're playing a magic-based character. Uh, okay, again... This step still this step still existed in the previous games. It was you learning the spells. Yeah. See, I like this. I like the disenchanting system because it gives magic users a reason to pick up items. Yeah. Aside from selling them obviously, but after a certain point mad money doesn't matter, so I would pick up a lot of items and just be like, "Oh yeah, I need this enchantment." So It also gives you a level of control over uh, when you give effects to players because low level low level players in the other games can learn a paralyze effect really quickly, but yeah. you don't start getting paralyze effects in Skyrim until like farther down the line. Acerthorn disagrees. Well, of course, Acer Thor the Acerthorn would disagree just because Kratos said it. <laughs> well, here's the other thing, too. So we were talking earlier about, like, the standing stones and all that, and about how that kind of removes a lot of, like, um, decision-making that you have to make as a player. So why would disenchanting items be a problem, then? Because if, like, say I'm a, say I'm a warrior or something, I find a really awesome axe with an enchantment that I've never seen before, but I would like to disenchant it... Like, it, it it's a, have to yeah, it. it's a choice. Yeah, it's a choice you have to make. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily kind of vibe with this point. Simply knowing a wide variety of spells is now entirely worthless as far as enchanting goes. Now you is that necessarily a bad thing though? Like, say you have a character who is an enchanter but doesn't know magic. So they don't have to learn a, a wide variety of spells they don't use just to apply their trade. You very specifically have to go over your way to loot 
and keep items you might not want so you can go find an enchanting altar to destroy that item to learn its enchantment. Also, I was about to say, um, a lot of dungeons have disenchant like enchanting tables in them. Yeah, like warlock dungeons. So it's like, it's yeah. always nice to find one of those and then be like, oh hell yeah, the black the black soul <laughs> the black star is about to get like <laughs> literally everybody in here is about to get turned into shoes. <laughs> They're also arbitrarily. I, I don't know. It's like you can say that it's a pain in the ass to carry equipment that you want to disenchant, but the flip side of that is that like it encourages you to pick up items, like that you want to learn the effects of. Yeah, it requires me to sit there and actually deliberate. It's like, oh crap, I don't want to drop these three really fucking heavy shields. Yeah, because it, I want it, to disenchant them. It adds more kind of elements to looting. Which God, God knows, we need as many elements as possible to make dungeons actually interesting. But what so. we get into is that enchanters can enchant for you, which is weird as hell. I, yeah, I would say I agree. You would have to do it where like you need to spend a lot of money on it because otherwise there wouldn't be a reason. Like, you can't make alchemists make potions for you, for instance, or you can't make smiths make stuff for you. So like, of course, if you're Bethesda. You know, you got to think about, like, if you're going to add uh, enchanters making stuff for you, then you have to add, like, alchemists making custom potions for you. Which, I mean, that's the direction you could absolutely take it, and I don't see a reason why you couldn't commission an alchemist to make cool potions for you. But yeah, like, this element of disenchanting being a bad thing, uh, I'm wholly unconvinced so far limited on what enchants you could put on items. Again, in Morrowind you could put any enchant on pretty much any item. The you have to pick up things argument is weird. Imagine saying that about money. The money system forces you to go out of way to loot people. But people do do that because they complain that like you have to loot urns and shit. Well yeah and it's not like it's an issue of there's not a lot of enchanters in Skyrim because every city has a court wizard, so. Item. So you could enchant every item you're wearing to fortify acrobatics, for <laughs> example. In Skyrim, the only enchants you could put on an item seemed to be based on what the developers thought was suitable for that item. So anything that might involve intelligence, such as fortify alteration, can be enchanted on a helm. And something like Fortify Smithing can be enchanted on gloves. However, you can't put the Fortify Alteration on the gloves, nor can you put the Fortify Smithing on the helm, or boots, or chest piece. This results in what feels like an overly curated experience filled with arbitrary rules. Yeah, I, I would agree with the sentiment of it feels arbitrary. I'm thinking that they're looking at it from like a balancing perspective because if you can put whatever enchant you want on whatever item you want, the thing I'm imagining is like instead of it being easy to like make one school of magic free, you just like having a set of items that just makes every school of magic free all yeah. at once. Which which is a different fair, problem. It's not that system's fault. Yeah, to be fair, like that's really up to the player's choice if they want to do that, in my opinion. I disagree. I think you can mechanically influence people to want to do that. And Skyrim does by making the magic system, like, uh, not uh, not giving the player enough options to increase the power of their magic. So... Yeah, I, I would say I mostly agree on this. I can play in the sandbox, but only in the way that Todd says I can. As such, I can't enchant an entire set of armor to fortify alchemy so I can make stronger potions. I can only enchant my items the way they say I can. It did give you a lot of flexibility, though. Like, it's not that bad. Yeah, and you do, you do get the perk to put two enchantments on one item which helps a lot i don't know like i 
enchanting, like I finally hit like my final enchanted gear setup for uh, my mage character. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm wanting for anything. I feel like everything I need is there. My destruction spells basically cost almost nothing now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel uh, like I never ran into a thing. I never really ran into a situation where it's like I looked at an item and I said, well, I kind of did. I think it's like. I forget what the effect was, though, but there was something that I ran into that was like that. The only thing that felt wasteful for me was my gloves. I wound up quitting, like, making lock picks easier or something. Because oh, yeah. There's really, like, there there... really nothing else for a mage character. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot you can put on gloves. It's just, yeah, it's just Magicka and, like, it, for, like, a mage character, it's just Magicka. That's it. That's the only effect. So, like, yeah, I just put make easier fucking unlocks. I'd have to disagree. I like the... The master perk of enchant is one of the best perks in the game because it actually changes enchant. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that's that's what's that's what a master perk should do for every. Yeah, is it just makes it makes you abs much more absurdly powerful. So it's like, and also it basically just introduces a whole new thing that. Com can like completely shift your paradigm for mm -hmm. how you how you use the skill yeah it's like you're complaining that it's making you change all your items i think that's the idea because at that point you know you're you might have been using like dragon bone stuff for a while but it's like now you got to go through the effort of making a whole new set of dragon bone stuff so that you can put even better enchantments on it and it's not like the game See, I would have a problem with it if the game obfuscates the perks. So, like, you hit the end and you're like, wait, what the fuck? Now I can do this? Like, mm -hmm. it's there the, from from the first yeah, time like you something open you up the work thing. Towards. Yeah, so you can always have that in the back of your mind where, once again, it's like, oh, shit, I just found this really awesome piece of equipment. I'm Maybe I shouldn't enchant I'm it just level one. I'm almost level 100 in enchanting, so I'm going to save it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Why would you dislike that perk, but, like, complain that, like, a lot of the perks are, like, you know, just percentage upgrades? Like, that's one of the few perks in the game that changes the functionality of a mechanic. Yeah. Conjuration did that, too, with two summons. Yeah, I like the, con yeah. the master perks for Conjuration. That's one of, like, the best uh, spell-related perks that you can get. I mean, there's, like, an illusion you can get, like illusion spells affect everything but that's just like an admission that illusion there's just some dungeons you can't do if you're an illusionist i'm not saying there should be no limitations every system has limitations but this is the oh. developer's is that like a long pause? Or did I like mess it up? Items the way they say I can. I'm not saying there should be no limitations. Every system has limitations. But this. Yeah, that's a very long yeah. pause. <laughs> um, it happens. Yeah, I, I would say I mostly agree. It is probably too limited. Yeah. This is the devel Well, I just thought of the last perk of uh, Enchant for Ordinator, and I thought to myself, man, I don't like that because it's very short term. Like, I don't like the idea of the final perk of a crafting skill is some kind of like magnum opus item. Developers literally just saying no. In Morrowind, every custom enchant had limitations in terms of how strong an enchantment the item could take. And how strong you can make it. Yeah, Skyrim, like, Skyrim's enchant system sorely needs that, where, like, the enchants you can put on Daedric armor should be able to be stronger than the enchants that you put on steel armor. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Was... Were the other earlier Elder Scrolls games, like, Glass and Elven, easier to enchant on, so they had, like, a... 
So the I don't way think so. the way it, are you referring to like Arena and Daggerfall or what? I'm I just remember a game that I played and I don't know if it was an Elder Scrolls game or not, but certain like elvish gear and like glass gear or something like that, if you enchanted it, it just the enchantments were stronger. Okay. It's not really like that in Morrowind. So in Morrowind items have an in something a score called an enchantment level and what that is is a common shirt has like an enchantment level of five and a exquisite shirt has like an enchantment level of 120 and so the number of effects you can put on an item or the power of the magnitude of that effect increases based on the enchantment score so you see on screen right now yeah. the four effects he has on there has an enchantment score of 100 so he could not put that enchantment on a common shirt so like um there were various items that you could get like the daedric tower shield that had like really high enchantment scores and that is something that like skyrim would benefit from no oh no this is absolutely like this is not a bad skyrim video based on the soul gem being used weaker souls and items resulted in weaker enchants due to their limitations additionally you could oh yeah there were um so soul power levels so it wasn't just greater souls the greater souls themselves would have different power levels so like a winged twilight and a golden saint were both grand souls but wing or uh, golden saints had like more powerful souls than winged twilights oh, okay so that was also a thing like the 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 creature you were putting into the item itself was like a factor. That's why the enchant system in Morrowind is so interesting because the item, the soul gem, the creature that is in the soul gem, the, the magnitude of the spell effects, these are all things that like you control. And so there's like a lot of granularity in the system. Did they have black souls in uh, black soul gems? In no, that was introduced Morrowind? in Oblivion. Uh, okay. Which, that's why it's such a, a problem for the system that, like, homeless people are have more <laughs> powerful souls than Golden Saints. Yeah. So it's like, if humans also had a soul level, then Black Souls would not be as big an issue. I don't know, maybe maybe a beggar should have a really heavy soul. Just think about all the, it, the life like that a, they must have lived. Well, yeah, like, all that suffering. Well, yeah, it's like there's a lot of opportunity to tell like a really interesting... Like, to have it be a detail of a character like... This homeless person had a really powerful soul. They must have been like a veteran or something. Yeah. And like, like Narfi, the mentally ill... The, like, the... I don't know what his issue is. But he's like autistic or something he would have like a really weak soul because there's not really a whole lot going on with him because it was implied that if... like that hannibal traven had like a really powerful soul because of how smart yeah. he was even though he yeah. wasn't but <laughs> well it's, that's that's the uh, you should see um you just gotta believe us guys trust us he's really smart his his soul is just so big it, <laughs> it, it, you need a colossal black soul gym to fit how big his soul is I like the idea of, like, having unstable souls. Like, imagine if you go into the Shivering Isles and you soul trap a bunch of souls there and they're unstable souls. So it's like, you put that on an, on an, on oh, an item yeah. and, like, so, you could have just really weird effects happen or something like that. Like, every item is Ruin's Edge with, that does, like, random things. Yeah, or, like, you just put it on and it's just, the item is ridiculously powerful sometimes. And then other times, it's just weak as hell. Oh, yeah, so, so like, like, it changes the magnitude of the effect. Yeah. That would be cool. Oh, man. Yeah, but, so, yeah, yeah, there's, like, so much they can do with enchanting. So, when, when, you're, when you're doing, like, a script and you're coming down to, um, like, coming up with suggestions for how to improve a system, how... How much do you allow the ideas guy to take over? Um, my limit is um, things that were possible at the time. Uh, if I think that it would have been impossible, like in the time frame, and I'll clarify when like I'm kind of going on a thing where it's like, so this would need more time to develop and what have you, and then 
with storytelling it's typically the limit of i want to tell the same general story i just want to like doctor the script to be better yeah and then yeah i never want to my i never want to sit there and be like well the solution here is just to rewrite the whole thing well okay so the end of mass effect could be that i get a harem of reapers <laughs> that are shaped like anime girls <laughs> Yeah, so, like, you don't want to invent your own things. Um, I generally, like, take a broad approach to mechanics, though, where it's, like, I'll go wild with kind of mechanical ideas. Because my my sentiment is, if somebody of Bethesda is watching the video, I want to give them kind of food for thought of, like, what are some a variety of directions that they could go in or inspirations yeah. that they could take? I usually, so my, my thing is, I'll usually, first I'll look at, just how could we tweak this within the framework of the engine and the game itself like mm -hmm. is there is it just like we just could need to bump up it? a few yeah or even more than that like if there was just an ini file in here mm -hmm. would that be enough then yeah go to like the modding scene and then i like to go to what other games um contemporary to that game would have done and then lastly would be just coming up with some crazy idea I, well, I would add in tier of like what new games have done. Maybe yeah, yeah, that's that's a second good. to last. Yeah, yeah. I was I was gonna say, um, one of my things is like, if I could make if I could do this as a if I can see myself doing this as a mod, I'll include it. So like, I include yeah. a lot of script doctoring for how Battle of Red Mountain would work because I genuinely believe that I could make that mod. You can only put a single enchantment on any item you enchant, until you max out enchanting of course, and unlock the ability to put two enchants on a single item, thereby making everything you've enchanted up until that point immediately inferior. Wouldn't that be true for uh, Morrowind, however? I guess in Morrowind, like, I don't know, in Morrowind you have to level up to make more better enchantments. Unless you're paying for it. I'm so, just trying like, to think in terms of in terms of oblivion. I mean that Well in Oblivion, let's see, um Well you have sigil stones well, that you, level scale. Yeah, anybody can use them. I enchantments on items you can do and I think the pow the, the percentage the magnitude is based on the soul. And then enchantment uh, no, no, I'm thinking of spellcrafting. Okay, so enchanting. Um, it's based on the magnitude of the soul. And then you can only do one effect, I think, in Oblivion. Do anything you could enchant now. See what I mean by the perk system selling things back to you that you used to be able to do by default? I gotta put it on screen again. They feed us poison, so we buy their cures while they suppress kinda, our medicine. I kind of like that. I kind of like the sentiment, though. <laughs> well, it, it's true. Um, it's almost I like I don't necessarily like, think it's a bad thing, though. It, it would be like, I don't, what if it went in the other direction, where like the game got more complex, and then you would be saying like, "Well, we used to be able, like, we didn't used to pick our attributes. We used to just pick health, fatigue, and stamina, but now they're adding all these things and selling and us the cure gets, by, like... It never gets more complicated. The gaming industry only dumbs things down. Right, like there's only one direction. Well, I mean, there is only effectively one direction, but I don't know. It's like, I don't, fair, I don't necessarily see an issue with this. I don't know. And again, this applies to many of the effects the perk system has. Pretty much every starting perk of any tree is simply to do the thing better, which used to be the entire point of skill points. Yeah. It's kind of inconsistent what um, skills will do to whether or not, like, sometimes the skills make you more effective as well. Yeah. Like, smithing will increase your uh, tempering, right? And then you also have the perks that will also increase it even more. Yes. So, like, you could not have, you could have 100 smithing without the perk and still make, like, mass or whatever the top level legendary steel items, for instance. Yeah.
As such, the exact number your skill happens to be feels like a little more than an arbitrary gate between perks. That's not to say your skill level has no effect at all. It absolutely does make a difference. It's just so minimal in most cases. Yeah, it's like half a percentage point. Yeah. Especially since the perks do the heavy lifting now. A very grim foreshadowing of the future. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Fallout 4's like, perk system doesn't feel good. Skyrim's perk system is not the best, but it definitely, like, it doesn't feel bad to deal with. Blacksmithing is the only real new skill to Skyrim that didn't simply split an old skill into two or combine multiple skills into one. Technically, it's an evolution of Armorer, but that was literally just maintaining your equipment, not actual crafting. Smithing is very much a tedious and time-consuming task, and the only reason you'd ever do it is to improve your- Guys, come on. Are we really doing an Iron Dagger smithing meme? In the year of our Lord, 2021? Um, I don't know. I don't... Why is smithing tedious where alchemy wasn't? Alchemy in the other games involved a lot of just crafting the same fucking potions over and over. Remember, remember in Oblivion when alchemy was just like stealing everybody's food and making restore fatigue potions? Yeah. Or when or going alchemy... into a shop and just buying all the stuff and then... Yeah. Just... Rem alchemy in Morrowind did... The stores like sell uh, respawning, like supply, like instantly respawning. So, oh, he isn't doing what you think he's doing. So, okay, I'll I'll uh, let him finish, as you will. Equipment or to make dragon armor. Materials can be bought, which gets expensive, or they can be mined, which makes the whole process even more time-consuming. When leveling this. I know Your thoughts. He's, I didn't, he's apparently doing anything, but I don't know. I don't buy the, it could be expensive. What else are you using money for? What are your thoughts on mining mechanics in games? I think it's fine. Do we have to find a way to like try and make it interesting though? Like it would probably be better if like, instead of you being the miner, like you could invest in mines. Yeah. And get like a cut of the ore or something. Yeah, I could, I could see that. I don't know. I, I've always felt Skyrim's... See, Skyrim's problem with mining is that it's it's interrupts your gameplay, and you either have to go up and hit the A button and mine it slowly, or you equip the pickaxe and then mine it faster. But either way, then you have to go into a menu to mine and stuff. Right. That's, that's my main problem with mining in the game. It's not so much like, oh, I have to go out and collect resources, because if I'm running around the the world and i just see you know an iron in like an iron deposit whatever and i just run mm -hmm. up and mine it by the time i hit this hit a town or something i usually have enough to do something with it so it's not like egregious it's not like I think, oh i have to actively I think it, go out it's an unnecessary interruption in gameplay um i look at it from the warcraft approach of like you have the option of mining along the way but the system really works a lot better if you just you have a day where mining it is what you do. That's exact. See, that's that's exactly where I came from. Was that's what I used to do in a lot of MMOs, especially World of Warcraft. Is I would specifically go around and just mine like thorium, thorium veins and stuff like that. Yeah, you and could, yeah, it would just be. It would literally be like as you said, just a whole day where I would just sit there and just mine. You but can, I don't really have that. I was gonna don't really run into that problem in Skyrim. I was gonna clarify for the chat. Yes, you can just equip the pickaxe and attack it. However, that has a tendency of breaking the node so it won't respawn. Does it? Yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, what, what's even better is if you have um, two pickaxes and elemental fury. Yeah. <laughs> and you go into a mine, you clear out that thing in no time. Mm -hmm. I, I think the problem is like, also the number of items you have to craft like on the one hand it's realistic 
people complain about the iron dagger thing, but it's like, you know, a lot of smiths do like just create the same thing over and over. Like they just they just create nails and horseshoes all day, right? Um, there should be like a bit of specialness to creating like a sword. Like, I really like the first part of Kingdom Come Deliverance, where you're helping your father make this, like, craft this sword. Because it feels really special. Because, like, there's a lot of ceremony put into it. Yeah. But, at the same time, I'm not really certain how you make that a mechanical thing where you level the skills up. The skill on my own. I got until about 90 before I gave up and used cheats to just give materials so I could finish off the last few levels. You could simply spam making iron daggers, which is one ingot. I really hope that this is a bit. Um, Cause yeah, like I iron daggers hasn't been a thing in years. Like it wasn't even a thing when Mr. Caption did it. And one set of leather strips, but buying your way to the top essentially results in a loop of fast traveling to each town you know has a blacksmith buying the necessary materials, making the daggers, selling them, and continuing on. I had god mode on, so I didn't have to deal with carry weight, so this only gets more tedious than what even I had to deal with. If you really want to make- I mean, you could just get a follower. Yeah, like, just get, get somebody, get Lydia to carry your burdens for you. Also, you were playing on god mode? That's like, okay, there's a list of things that you should never admit to a YouTube audience, and one of those things is that you were playing the game on God mode. Yeah. Or at least say, like, I I did a playthrough on God mode, but my main playthrough was, like, still legit. I don't, I don't cheat. Even though I cheated in my Skyrim playthrough, because I would, so, like, the first step of my Skyrim playthrough is once you get to Riverwood, you chop out wood for an hour so that you get, like, enough gold to train, but I just used the console command to give me an hour's yeah. worth of gold. When you're when you're on a production schedule, I had the same thing with Valheim. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm gonna be honest in the video and admit that there were times where I used console commands to get around because it's like I have to spend three hours like going around in my boat or something like that. I have limited time in my day, and I want to get this. Okay, this this wasn't even a planned video either. There are points where Valheim can be ex exceptionally tedious with some of its what, mechanics. What's, What's your thoughts on the metal bands going through portals? I understand why that is the way it is. Um, it's still tedious to not be able to take metal through portals. I installed a mod after I found out that there's a way in game to circumvent it, which is just, you know, yeah, abuse. You, uh, transfer worlds. It's the old Terraria yeah. trick. Yeah. So I was like, all right. If they haven't patched that out or something like that, well, how then can you I'm, patch it out? I don't even you would know. Basically, you would basically you just would, have to block people from logging out with, with ores or something like. You would have to like clear people's inventories when they go between worlds. Listen, if you're setting up for a bit, this is like the most elaborate. I was punking you guys bit. I've seen. But yeah, um, Valheim is kind of fun because it's like, I'm going to establish like a line where I take a cart down a road or, you know, yeah. a shipping lane or something. But like the end result of the system is that you spend like an hour sailing. Like, I think it's an issue of resource costs or maybe like. Maybe the game is trying to encourage you to like forge at the place that you're getting the ores. I think I think that's really what it is. Like so like they they want to encourage you to build like forward outposts, but it's like it doesn't take very long to set up a forward outpost. I can set up smelters and stuff in about mm -hmm. 10 minutes because I can bring those like heating cores through a portal. So yeah. it's like well, you're also just Here's You're just thing. nickeling and diming me at this point for my time. I think the progression of biomes is backwards. I think that mountains should be before swamps. Yeah. Because there's always a mountain on like the starter island, but there's like there's no there's swamps. The game can be really far away or the game also has pro the game also has trouble like generating swamps. I found the amount of swamps that I found that are just like a tiny strip of mm -hmm. like six trees. 
Yeah, that happen that happens a lot. Like the finding an actually decent sized swamp can be an issue. Although once yeah. you do find one, I can't imagine how it is for a solo player because I mean like legitimately going for an iron run in Valheim took like four of us. So being by yourself, you have the belt. For me, yeah, so I would have the belt and I would even get, with the um, belt cuz the weight too. I would um bring my boat in as close as humanly possible and I would just run like laps between the boat to the to the sunken crypt. And when I got the longboat, it made it so much easier. So I was able to basically with the longboat, you can basically mine out like two dedicated crypts yeah. before having to go back. I think also I'm, the big thing I'm waiting for is a naval rework. But anyways, let's let them uh, <laughs> pull, pull their epic prank on us. This process more tolerable in one regard, but far more tedious in another. You could craft gold rings, which give far more experience and sell for more than daggers. So where does the tedium come in? Well, to effectively make gold rings, you you go to Kolskegger Mine. <laughs> you could also like get gems and make the high tier jewelry. Dwarven bows are another one. I mean, like you have options. Yeah. Um, transmute ore, while annoying isn't isn't the worst thing like especially compared to a, the grinding that you do in oblivion okay here's oh. the grand total of me casting a spell in place in skyrim it's about 15 <laughs> minutes of me casting transmute mineral ore i have hours of me casting fucking spells to grind levels and restoration restoration yeah. dude oh dwarven bows are fine i think in my opinion, gold rings are a lot easier than dwarven bows. Dwarven bows are worth doing. Gotta see what the swamp and Elden Ring would be. Yeah, don't remind me that there's going to be another PvP swamp area. <laughs> you need gold ore, and to get gold ore, you need to transmute silver ore. And to make silver ore, you need to transmute iron ore. A single The worst part- okay, I hate transmute ore as a spell because one Skyrim would have no spells that you're encouraged to just sit in place and cast without transmute or also it creates lore problems also it's a yeah. pain in the ass if you want to make silver stuff and there are like instances where you want silver to make like full use of your flawless gems so yeah Tra yeah transmute or has like a lot of problems or at a time twice for every single gold ore, and you need two to make a single bar yeah, I had a macro to do this. It, yet a very <laughs> like a very meticulous macro to like uh, cast it as quickly as possible. But yeah, and dual casting the transmute spell does not make this process faster. In fact, it wastes more magicka to do the same exact result. Even gaming the system is a tedious chore. Admittedly, you can get some pretty damn powerful gear from it. But the time investment doesn't even really feel worth it, unless you're on the highest difficulty. The perk system again- I don't know, I think it's- Bethesda didn't do a good job of encouraging people to do it along the way. It ...rears its ugly head, as each type of armor and weapon class is locked behind a unique perk, rather than being unlocked naturally as you progress through the levels. Meaning, you may have to waste perks and thus- Okay, so here's the deal with Dwarven Bows, here's how it works. You can melt dwarven scrap stuff down into dwarven ingots, and then you end up with a shit ton of ingots. Now, sure, you're not going to be able to sell them, but there are better ways to make money than selling the shit that you craft. Um, but you are allowed, you will create a lot of, like, decently valued items for not a terrible amount of work, and unlike mining gold, uh, the dwarven metal actually comes from, you know, dungeons. So, so here was here was something that I thought of originally when I got to the College of Winterhold. You know how they have those like giant beams of like mana light. Mm -hmm. I assumed that if I stood there, it would regenerate my mana. Mm -hmm. So I would stand there and like like spam spells, and then I was really disappointed when I found out that they don't regenerate my magicka. Yeah, and I feel like that would 
That would be interesting. If you have something like transmute that encourages you to just stand there and spam spells, maybe if you stood I mean, near like some sort of magicka well, it would at least go up a little bit faster. I don't know. Transmute's the only reason to have equipment that reduces alteration magic costs. <laughs> Oh, also, yeah, is that fun yeah. fun fact about transmute it is the only spell in the game that does not give you xp based on magicka as in every spell in the game gives you i think one point of xp for every point of magicka you spend transmute gives you like 0.1 xp or like 0 0.01 like some ridiculously low amount for every point of magicka you spend I think that they were like actively aware that transmute was like encouraging people to grind levels. So they did that to discourage people from like grinding alteration by it. But the game doesn't tell you how much XP stuff gives you. So you might just assume that like you're going to level alteration a bunch using transmute and not realize of how little XP it gives you. Yeah. But yeah, I found. I've, I was really tickled during my long magic rant about the fact that literally only one spell in the game has that property. As to levels, unlocking crafting tiers you don't want, rather than spending them on something a bit more important. Oh yeah, and Transmute Ore comes from a really stupid dungeon. Transmute Ore is such a powerful ability, it should be at like the end of a Dwemer Ruin. It should- that should be like buried in Labyrinthian. Yeah, like, that should be, like, Shalador's greatest work that's buried yeah. at the end of, like, his maze. And it's literally, like, guarded by three dragon priests or some nonsense. Right, like, it's just in an inconsequential cave being read by a fucking, uh, uh, like, bandit chief. Playing the fucking game, such as damage bonuses. This is really where the perk system is at its worst and perfectly highlights the issue I mentioned a few minutes ago, where rather than coming up with unique abilities and effects that relate to the skill, they just lock progression behind perks. What's worse is that due to the way the skill- But is that a bad thing? It's different, but is it bad? I don't know about in smithing. I think I agree that the smithing perk tree kind of sucks well i'm thinking about how like you unlock abilities in like a watchdogs or a middle earth game from the perk tree yeah i i don't necessarily think that like unlocking like okay unlocking like do you want perks to be functional or do you want perks to be percentage points upgrades because it seems like you have an issue with all the perks that provide extra functions You know what I mean? Like, they had an issue with the with the ingredient discovery perk. They had an issue with the final perk of enchanting. And now they have a perk issue with all the perks that, like, unlock new tiers of stuff. The common yeah. trend between all these ish things is that those are all perks that do functions. Now, you can say it's a they're bad ideas. They probably... And they are in, in a lot of ways. But it is just something that I'm noticing works is largely useless except for endgame gear. You're likely to be replacing much of your gear as better equipment spawns, rather than collecting the materials necessary to forge your own equipment for most of the game. I, I can't imagine a way where you could feasibly, like, control the rate at which players create stuff, though. Because, I mean, like, look at Fallout and how it, could, how it like, it really badly controls the rate at which you unlock, like, high-level mods for guns. Yeah. That's, like, kind of what I'm thinking. Like, how do you actually make a system where, like, you create, you can create Daedric items, but you can't create Daedric items before, like, you create eight Daedric items, but it's only, like, a couple levels before you're supposed to get them. In fact, going out of your way to craft steel and Dwemer and Orcish armor is entirely redundant as you're likely to just fly by the set of levels where those items are common in the loot pool. And worse than that... Yeah, I do agree with this sentiment. It's way too yeah. easy to fly, pat fly up to like level 20. And like there's entire sets of items that 
are basically worthless because it's too easy. But, uh, but <laughs> see, uh, what's funny is that it's situ. So if you're playing a mage, flying past those levels is kind of great because you need a lot of skill points early yeah, on to become viable. There's so but, many perks that you have to buy. It's like you ha <laughs> you have perks that you need until like level fifty. Yeah. Right. Pretty I, much. I was figuring it up. Like, okay, melee and archery characters are like. I don't know what to spend my perk points on. I think I'm going to save it in case I really want this speech perk at some point. And then it's like, mage perks are like, oh my god, there's like six things that I need right now. <laughs> it's like, it's like you don't understand. I already spent that perk point ten levels ago. <laughs> uh, I've said before, my idea for smithing is uh, the perks unlock quests that you have to do to actually unlock the ability to smith stuff. And so it's like you would meet a smith of that type that you would learn from. And then in the dwarven case, like, so there's that quest that you can do uh, that gives you this dwarven smithing perk that actually makes you get more experience from everything but dwarven smithing. <laughs> um, Wait, what? That, yeah, so there's a, there's a dungeon that you do you can do that at the end you get a perk that is makes dwarven armor better and gives you more points for smithing dwemer armor but it's bugged and so you get more experience for leveling everything except dwemer armor uh-huh what what quest is that it's um i think you get it in riften like in the waterfront oh okay so it's just like a random side quest yeah yeah, it's not like a big quest. A Lord Wimmer Metal. I gotta find the Skyrim page. The ancient knowledge ability from the unfathomable unfathomable depths. It's a uh, Avanch Zell. There's an Argonian in Riften named From Deepest Fathoms that gives you the quest. This is going to my spreadsheet. Did not know this existed. I heard in the lore that smithing Daedric is tedious and can, can take a real long time, but in gameplay you can forge them first try very quickly. <laughs> yeah, that's an issue. Is like, I don't think they sell the idea that the Daedric items are sentient, which is a thing. Like, Daedric items are literally Daedric spirits in the shape of armor. So, like, crafting them should be, like, something that you have to really work for and not just, oh, yeah, it's an ebony ingot in a Daedric heart. Yeah, you should, you should have to at least do some sort of radiant quest in order to trap a soul or something like that. Yeah, think about, like, what if instead of Mehrun's Razor, Mehrun's Dagon's reward was that, like, a forge that unlocked the ability... To make Daedric items. Right? Like, that could be... Instead of, like, yeah. more useless weapons. Or it's, like, an additional well, thing. Well, it already acts like that because that's the best... His shrine yeah, is the oh, best place yeah. to get Daedric yeah. hearts. That's literally, like, the only consistent place in the game to find Daedric hearts. At, unless you completely tunnel vision smithing, these armor and weapon tiers are likely going to be far below the tier of equipment you've currently got by the time you unlock the ability to craft them. So when I did my melee character, he did smithing along the way, and I didn't have this issue. <laughs> so, you know, works on my machine. Ultimately, it just comes across as Bethesda attempting a crafting system again, and just not making it interesting enough to do, and not under- Again? Wasn't this their first uh, stat? I guess, well... I don't know, that's the thing. Like, they always had enchanting and alchemy. It seems like yeah. this was the place to go. And spellmaking. No, it's true. And spellmaking. People act like, oh, they added crafting to, to uh, Skyrim. No, they always had crafting. They just added, like, I don't know. It's weird to, that he's complaining about something being added. Understanding how fast our players will level and how slow the skill will level. At the same time you're doing this, the enemies are getting stronger in the- Do we have to watch the Sabercat fight again? 
Not, not my bitrate, what, please. What no. are your thoughts on reusing the same footage? Um, don't do it too often. I agree. It's fine. It's I, I, I'm actually of the camp. Don't do it ever. So I'll reuse it, um, towards the at like especially during like the conclusion of my video if I'm summarizing things because I'm a visual learner. So it's like a callback. If, yeah. So if I see something like in a conclusion that. It, it, like my, I will remember what the person was saying, you know, 20, 30 minutes ago when, so when that was on screen. When I cut the so video, it helps me. I put the footage into a sequence and then cut the footage out of that sequence, like literally cut it out so that I know not to reuse it. Oh, that's interesting. So like I have a methodical system. There are very few instances in the Oblivion video where you will see the same footage twice. The game because your level has gone up and therefore the enemy pool has shifted higher meaning that encounters like bandits can go from your standard highwayman affair and into a fight against bandit outlaws that have far more health you will barely chip away at because you haven't leveled your combat skills again is this a problem a lot of people rant run into i've heard the meme before but it almost strikes me as like a a second or third playthrough where you know what you're doing issue. So you better do that, but oh wait, that means more levels, which will make the enemies even more dangerous and turn them into bandit marauders that have even more health and do even more damage. This goes for every single enemy type in the game, thus turning combat into a slog up until you hit a critical mass and fully break the game. I think it happens anyways, though. Yeah. I don't think it's a, a crafting... I don't, he's not saying it's a crafting exclusive problem. He's just saying that it is a problem that can happen if you craft too much. And what's um, funny is Fallout 4 has this issue even worse because if you're somebody who likes to do base building and you go off and you build your base, yeah. you gain like four or five levels because that game is so heavily dependent on gear as well as levels and stuff. You'll go out in the world and just get stomped, so you have to hang around the the baby areas, just gaining, just finding gear before you can go out into the bigger areas where you're really supposed to be for your, uh, for your level. Well, okay, so you had this issue on Legendary Difficulty. Yeah, of course you had that issue on Legendary Difficulty. Legendary Difficulty is, like, literally a meme. Yeah, it's, the game's not. It is the massive... Legendary... Like, of course... Okay... Now I understand the core of the issue. Legendary difficulty makes the assumption that you are literally using every single opportunity that is given to you in combat. Which means, so like when you complain that it, the system is expecting you to use crafting, yes, it is expecting you to use crafting. It's literally expecting you to use every single crafting implement in the game to make your stuff better. It's expecting you to try and maximize your alchemy for... Uh, enchantments so that you can make better potions to fortify your combat skills. Yeah, I, it, it is dawning on me that like Fallout 4 is basically the issues with magic leveling in Skyrim, but for the entire game. <laughs> but yeah, I, if you are not interested in playing Skyrim to its fullest and trying to really engage with it mechanically, then you're not supposed to play on Legendary Difficulty. I th yeah, I think the right difficulty level is adept. Yeah, I, and I think Bethesda very, like, Joseph Anderson had this observation where you're supposed to modulate the difficulty based on, like, your character, and I think that is legitimately what Bethesda's doing. Now, I don't really yeah. have evidence to back that up because the mechanics designers don't really talk a whole lot, but, yeah, th I feel, didn't I think Acer Thorn had this exact same problem where, like, he was assuming that you're supposed to play on the highest difficulty possible. Legendary assumes, isn't it just a flat modifier to damage with no thoughts whatsoever? Yeah, that's all the difficulties in the game, but I mean, Legendary difficulty worked for my characters when I was engaging with all of the mechanics to the fullest extent. So I guess you guys have that in common with a Mr. Acerthorn. But yeah, like, 
Legendary assumes that you're using all the crafting skills, that you have exactly the right perks, that you have a companion that you fully kitted out as well. Like, it is assuming so much of you. That you're using dragon shouts. You Like... Okay, th th yeah, that actually explains quite a bit. This is why doing game analysis can be um, tricky. Because playing, just choosing a different difficulty can lead to so many different conclusions. Mm -hmm. I don't like modulating, uh, modulating the, be, or sorry, ex being expected to change the difficulty on the fly, uh, especially in Oblivion. Yeah, because I feel hard coded from many other games where it's like knocking the difficulty down is an admission of defeat. Mm -hmm. So I feel much more obligated to just brute force my way through a situation or just. And then and then the other thing, too, is like you run into the situation where, you know, there are certain games like Valheim, for instance, where running away is absolutely the viable and preferred strategy to taking a fight that you can't do. So where do where do I draw that line in Oblivion where or Skyrim I should say where I'm supposed to just run away instead? Am I ever supposed to do that? Yeah, I don't think you're ever supposed to run away from encounters in Skyrim. It is yeah. it's something that I think is encouraged in Morrowind and I think they were confused about in Oblivion. <laughs> Because it's like, yeah, I could drop any encounter down to very easy and then just blast through it, but am I, should I do that? Pussy mode, chicken hat mode, you know, yeah. I call it game journalist mode. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, yeah, like, from my experience, melee characters have it the easiest, archers have it medium, and then uh, magic characters have it the most difficult in Skyrim. And this is in terms of like, I'm basing this on when I ch when those characters were able to uh, increase the difficulty. So yeah. the melee character was able to increase the difficulty the fastest, despite the fact that he didn't use enchanting, and he didn't really he didn't use alchemy either. He only used like the blacksmithing potions that you get from the game, that you find in like dungeons and stuff. And he was still leagues ahead of the other two characters I, the, the main problem with magic too is that you can't even scale your damage so yeah he's like literally the only way you scale your damage is two perks and potions yeah or another or a new new spell entirely ah uh, yes higher level spell. a higher level spell a higher level spell that does like 20 percent more damage and costs 80 percent more magic <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and it's like Fireball is not an upgrade to Firebolt because... No. It's just not. It costs more and it's an AoE, so it hurts your it's, companions. Yeah, especially if you get um, impact, then mm -hmm. it's just... No, Firebolt is just the superior choice. The game literally encouraged you to just spam Firebolt until, like, level 40. Yeah. It's actually insane. Because it's like, are you going to use Lightning Bolt or Frostbolt? Slow is a meme when you have Stagger. And fire does more damage than lightning. <laughs> yeah. And what's the point of draining somebody's magicka when you can just make it so that they can never cast a spell in the first place? Yeah, so, like, there's an imbalance between the elements, and then there's just too much incentive to cast a single damage spell for the entire game. I and not even I have enjoyed. the flexibility of like having a, another spell in the offhand because you're incentivized to dual cast it. Dual cast, yeah, exactly. Super Spence Bros says I enjoyed magic with the CC spells. Yeah, um, that's one of the only CC uh, things that I actually enjoyed. My big issue yeah. with that creation was that you can find all of those spells. All of them. Dungeon. Yep. It's ridiculous. And I accidentally, I accidentally found that. Oh, me too. I was like, what the? I fuck? actually, I found it from a Radiant quest. For the, for the College of Winterhold. <laughs> I also accidentally found the Crusader gear. Yeah, you can just stumble on that shit. It's not It's not even in a dungeon. No, it's, it's in the world, just sitting there. Yeah, like, 
I shit you not, what I showed you in the Oblivion video, that's how easy it is to get. <laughs> uh, they, I, I guess they added, like, you have to do a pilgrimage. Yeah, in order to equip it, you have to I do I think the they literally, like, saw my video and were like, oh, fuck, we gotta <laughs> update that. <laughs> but it's like, it's still also lazy, like, so I intentionally did not mention the Chrysomere creation because I wanted to see if, like, I wanted to gauge if they were, like, listening to me. So it's like, <laughs> the Chrysomere creation is literally just tacked on to the end of a dungeon, and it, it was not changed. I didn't mention it, it wasn't changed. <laughs> oh no. So, <laughs> it's weird how the creations I complained about in the Oblivion video got changed, and the ones I did not complain about stayed the same. And then they patched Fallout 3 to work again. Mm hmm I don't know, man. The patterns. What do the numbers mean? <laughs> what a vicious cycle of shit. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, that's the line to pause on. <laughs> like, uh, sometimes you just gotta hit him with the with the hard with the hard facts. Yeah, that's a that's a the old uh, sucker punch right there. You type in the game, thus turning combat into a slog up until you hit a critical mass and fully break the game. What a vicious cycle of shit. Fat Continues pause. Continues to suffer from entropy <laughs> due to- Holy shit. That was a mic- that was a I'm dropping the mic moment. Yeah. You should do the- but, okay, sync up the visual editing when you drop the mic. No, don't do it. Don't do it, Mr. Caption style, where you fade the black and then you come back and continue the point. Because the end result of that um, was that it seemed like he was dropping the mic and then, like, slowly <laughs> bending down to pick it back up. <laughs> Incompetence in implementing it in any meaningful way. Even back in. That, no, truly, I I appreciate the emotional inflection that came across with that uh with that line. It made me laugh. So you know, like, sometimes yeah, you just gotta make people laugh. The best just jokes gotta... catch you off guard. Although I yeah. don't think the intended way you were supposed to take that joke was that you would pause right before the the punchline. In Morrowind, speech was basically a dump stat and wasn't too significant to gameplay. In Morrowind. There were lots of quests in Morrowinds that involved disposition. And the speech skill was like the big way that you would do that. Also, something cool you can do with speech in Morrowinds. Uh, calm NPCs with illusion magic and then use intimidate on them. And so they will lower their fight score because they're scared of you. And then when the calm effects ends, they'll still be scared of you. And so they won't try to fight you. You could admire, intimidate, and taunt NPCs to change their disposition or provoke them to fight, but if you ever needed their disposition raised, you could just bribe them. It wasn't ever a problem a couple hundred gold couldn't solve. The gold has a lot more value in Morrowind. I mean, it's true, there is a, there is a point where, like, you can just buy your way out of quests, but I do think that, like, in the early game of Morrowinds, um, the system works really well. So, in Oblivion, the economy breaks. In Skyrim, the economy breaks. Like, at what point in Morrowind does it end up breaking? You have to get something, like, really powerful. So, um, let's <clears> see. <throat> Daedric items in Morrowind would cost in a range of, like, ten to 50,000 gold. Uh, which most NPCs in the game just couldn't buy. It's most NPCs, like most, like blacksmiths would have like two thousand gold, right? Yeah. So like, it's fair to say once you get about twenty thousand gold in Morrowind, you really start to snowball. If you're not buying training, like training is the big money sink in Morrowind because you can spend a lot of money on it. Um, once you start being able to run Daedric Ruins and getting your hands on lots of Daedric items, the like the way the way to go is like you drop the Daedric items in like Creeper's house and like wait for him to regenerate his money and just like stop by every now and then and like 
tra barter with him where like you're taking money from him because you don't lose money on the transaction he's a creature so he there's no bartering it's just trading the flat value it i forget what it's called there's a name for it but like I don't know. The economy doesn't really break in Morrowind because of training. There's always something that you can sink your money into to make your character better. That's, yeah. That's that's why... See, that's what I liked about durability and item enchantments and stuff in Oblivion was that come mid-game, that was really the only <clears throat> money sink you had. So, removing that in Skyrim kinda sucks. Yeah. Because you lose... You lose that and i don't even think those are sufficient enough money sinks to stop you from just like becoming absurdly rich yeah because not only are so, you making more gold but you're finding more valuable items too yeah so what i had I, there was a mod that i had in oblivion where um it increased the number of you charges on a on an item so that would act that actually wound up making it so when I would go and get recharges, it would cost ridiculous amounts of money to recharge mm -hmm. items. Yeah. And you can't it you can't does. incrementally Yeah. And you can't incrementally recharge. You can't be like, oh just charge it up like thirty percent. It's yeah, like no, no you, you have to charge it hundred percent. Time to dump thirty K and recharging the fucking uh so, all those danger guard effects you have. Yeah, so I was poor for quite a while. I kind of enjoyed it. Oblivion tried to turn this into a mini-game, which most people, myself included, couldn't fucking figure out how to do. Oh, uh, um, you couldn't figure out Persuasion Pi? Is this like a Spectrum thing? The key is the rotate button. Well, yeah, and it's like, I'm sorry, but, um, Oblivion does not have, like, you know, high-tech fucking you know, Metal Gear Solid 5 Death Stranding facial capture, okay? <laughs> when, when the NPC doesn't like it, they they don't mildly frown. Okay, oh, well, that's... I'm looking for... What's, like, a angry face? I could do a shocked face. Oh, what, with your uh, model? Yeah. This one doesn't really <laughs> do angry face. But, like, yeah, the the character faces are, like, extremely exaggerated i how do you you're, you're making the claim that most people can't figure out persuasion pie and i don't buy it the most convincing argument i've heard against persuasion pie is that it's difficult against argonians because it's hard to tell what emotions they're showing but even then that's in character like i think there's people in the games who comment how hard it is to read argonians because of how like alien their facial features are but yeah the key is also the rotate button which to knowledge to memory i don't recall a whole lot of oblivion videos even bringing up the rotate button also minor thing i feel like um it would be useful to show it oh yeah in this if we're going to talk about it we should we should see what it looks like <clears throat> not to mention it was rarely ever necessary yeah that was true fame basically yeah. oh, killed yeah. <laughs> uh persuasion like fame was ridiculous like I didn't realize how ridiculous fame was until I did a like a numerical breakdown of like the champion's raiment, how much persuasion it gives you versus how much fame that quest line gives you. Yeah. And it's I don't think there even isn't like a point in the game where it explains to you how fame works. No. So you'll just you'll just be walking around and suddenly all the guards really love you and will just look the other way when you're committing a crime or something. It's like, wait, what? Which might be an intuitive thing, like... Because it's almost like it doesn't seem like it's a game mechanic. It just creeps up on yeah. you. As you become more popular, people just like you more. So that might be something that, like, they don't want players noticing. But the fact is that, like, being famous in Oblivion just completely takes a fat shit all over the persuasion system. 
And then you could always just make a 100 point one second uh, charm spell. Yeah. You're really, really struggling there. See, that's what I like about Tez 3 MP is it stops you from doing the one second spell things because all of the menus are real time. Because the oh, game yeah. can't pause. So that's a that's a cool like inherent balance feature of it being multiplayer. In fact, you could probably get through the entire game without ever needing to even bribe anyone. In Oblivion? I mean, you're saying that, like, I don't understand. You're complaining about Morrowind's system because it, like, was invalidated by bribes. But Oblivion's system got shit all over by bribes because, like, like... There's no money sinks in the game aside yeah, from... And that's how you assault. avoid playing the mini game. Yeah. That's like the only thing to spend money on for some characters is bribing NPCs. That's, is like bribing that's merchants. What, that's what I would do when I was too lazy to equip my charm spell. I would just yeah, sit there like, and I don't want to fucking do this. And then like you just, <laughs> oh yeah, there's no there's no problem that the Oblivion persuasion system can't be solved by a couple hundred gold donation. But like, um, yeah, it's like I don't. Which I mean, I'm not saying. I don't think he's making the case that, like, Oblivion's system was way better than Morrowind's, but... That said, speech did have some impact on barter prices, as it does in Skyrim. However, it's even more useless here, despite the fact they tried to include it into dialogue. The problem is that most... Oh, you, you can hear that this is a different new, recording day. day. Yeah. Speech checks are worthless, or are used as little more than added flavor to a section of the game rather than being important at all. Since it seems to have been inspired from Fallout, I'll use an example from that series. Speech oftentimes opened up significant alternative options or ways of solving quests. Be nice to see it. Um, that seems like a good thing, doesn't it? Like, I have it on good authority from a few other analysts that uh, taking the game in the direction of having more skill checks seem is a good thing. Such as reaching the peaceful ending for the cons, for example. Or like, uh, speech checking your way out of the final boss. That's always a- that's an art- like an RPG meme. Saren, you should kill yourself. <laughs> In Skyrim, it almost comes across as an afterthought. For example. I really like the idea of, like, I gotta help these orphans out because uh, I need more Paragon points so I can convince Saren to just kill himself. <laughs> or it's like you game it so that you get enough Paragon points and then like you just call Saren before the Battle of the Citadel and tell him to kill himself and he does it. <laughs> Bro, listen, I, I killed the Rachni Queen. What do you think's gonna happen when we meet? He's like, oh shit. Oh shit. Just hear a gunshot on the other end. Yeah, he's, he's just... Uh... <laughs> I hung up on the council three times. What just, do you think's gonna happen, bro? When holy we leave? fuck, do not hang up on me, bro. <laughs> and you just hang up on him and he like blows his brains out. <laughs> See, speech checks in Elder Scrolls is a complicated subject. I have said it before, and it's because skills in Fallout are like surround technology, but skills in um in Elder Scrolls is like actual skills so it's like yeah you can come up with speech occasions but you have to come up with enough speech checks to actually make it like a system throughout the game otherwise it just seems like a a forced addition during the quest at the film yeah but I like the idea that Shepard does want Saren to kill himself I'm Commander Shepard and you should kill yourself It's a bit fucked that 300,000 Batarians had to die. But I'm going to trust your judgment that that was necessary to stop the Reapers. Reapers? Oh, sh bro, I just finished with the Quarians. What are you talking about? Catch up. <laughs> I'm Commander Shepard, and I endorse Galactic Genocide. <laughs> I would love if, like, the final twist of Mass Effect was that, like, the Reapers were, like... 
illusions created to like trick the council into increasing the power of humans. I mean, like, if you're gonna piss people off with your ending, just go wild. It was a Cerberus ploy it all was... along. <laughs> right, like, it's just, like, they're actually <laughs> Cerberus ships. That's why, like, ind indoctrination isn't real. It's just, like, they're just pretending to be indoctrinated. Uh, I can't Venezia. contain myself, hangs up. <laughs> oh, thank God I was tired of pretending to be in indoctrinated in front of Shepard. Like, the, the elusive <laughs> man's, like, tearing off all that, like, face tattoo shit. <laughs> all those years plant doing cosplays has paid off, finally. Amor Embassy. If you know at least one of the Jarls, you can convince one of them to create a distraction for you. However, there's already a guy there who will do it for you, with no effort. Yeah, the man of last resort. Yeah, you gotta get him a drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hate I hate shit like this. The issue is that if you don't know any of the Jarls, what are you supposed to do to create a, to create a scene? It's it's almost always that there has to be something for the player to be able to do, and whatever there is is going to be criticized because it's a it's a rot of last resort. Yeah, I mean the only way I could see it is you would have to make it so getting getting uh razzle in here to do something should take like 10 minutes of yeah i think like, that's like work or that's something. a deus ex kind of design philosophy of there is a route of last resort but it's a pain in the ass yeah but then but then the other thing the flip side of that is people are going to be like well why would i want to ever then do this stuff for the why would i ever want to have one of the um you i know, don't know uh yarls do something for me because then i'm missing content if i'm going to them that I, just under helps me. I understand that complaint but i don't really hear a lot of people complain about that with like the new deus ex games so i think people understand that um like how a root of last resort works the arl's distractions aren't any better than what you would have gotten anyways it has the same outcome, regardless. Most instances of speech in the game that I've been- I love- yeah, I love this scene because it's like, you can talk about, like, some seriously seditious shit right next to, like, an old Mary guard. Oh, yeah. Though I, I do have- I have to disagree with how he says, uh, you know, there's- it's all the same because I had, um, what's her face? Maven Black Crow, whatever the- Black Crow. Raven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the one from... Um, oh, Raven... Uh, Ingrod Ravencrone? Um, the one from... Uh, the fucking Swamp Riften. Place. Yeah. Okay, so Ravencrone. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she she basically pretends to have dementia and starts yeah. like... Um, there's, like some that's amusing, pretty cool. there's some amusing stuff that can happen. Because for me, it's like... And this is what I liked about Mass Effect, is a lot of the dialogue in that game is its own reward to me. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. I'm missing content. <laughs> ...able to find, lack any significance in gameplay. Sure, maybe convince a bandit here or there to pay them less gold than you would have otherwise, or gain a small piece of information here or there, but quite often it comes across as largely anemic because it can be bypassed entirely by other options <clears throat> with a zero cost to the player or the information you gain is so small that it's basically yeah it's the um the conversation with the bosmer guy as part of the main quest where you get like the third copy of the mythic dawn commentaries oh yeah yeah that conversation is like every skyrim speech check pretty much really meaningless speech is really only important when it comes to bartering and there's perks related to how good of a deal you'll get when trading with merchants. Yeah, so really it's like the speech skill is actually just mercantile with, mercantile. with speech <laughs> stuff attached to it, like stapled to the side. Has anyone cared about missing content in Skyrim? Um, okay, so as far as videos go, no. Is it possible to miss content in Skyrim? Like, literally, some of the only content-exclusive stuff is the Civil War, and as as Acerthorn loves it, half the quests in the game which have betrayal paths. 
Did, did you guys know about this? That Acer Thorn thinks that half of the quests in Skyrim have betrayal paths. That was one. That's on the list of wild shit that Acer Thorn said. However, it also be he also said that like Skyrim is better than The Witcher Three because it has more quests. Oh right, that one. Which which is also a wild one. And then he acknowledges he like. He lampshades the quality versus quantity argument. He's like, now there is an issue of quantity and quality, but it's not an issue because you can betray people in half the <laughs> Skyrim quests. And I'm like, okay, I'm sure you have lots of options in most of, if not all of the Witcher quests. Pretty much every quest, even the minor ones I did in the Witcher, were like by default at the level of Skyrim quests or better. Like at by default at the level of the good Skyrim quests. Yeah. It became very necessary if you want to acquire gold for any reason. While the economy of Skyrim is a broken mess, a huge issue that arises is extremely limited merchant gold pools. Yeah, because that stops you from getting 109,000 gold. Yeah, that's see, that's the thing is it. It's it almost feels like an arbitrary roadblock because there's no money sinks or anything else in the game. So that's really the only thing that holds you back. Like, I don't know, this is true of uh, Morrowind and Oblivion as well. Onion Hat for sale says that I missed missed out from the stream last night. No, I was there for most of it. I was just lurking. Yeah, and plus it's like, how do, how do you remember just, all of the crazy shit? There was so I much. I just, yeah, there were. I would need I a, have a you would need a wiki. Like Acer Thorn have, is almost um, to the level of needing a, a quickie style <laughs> wiki of like just documenting takes. Like there's one guy in the chat who can at will quote Acer Thorn on stuff. So I have a um. A defense a mental defense mechanism from working nine years in retail where if i start hearing like really crazy outlandish things my brain like i just i can no longer hear what's being said yeah they call and, that the, they call that the fluoride stare <laughs> that's basically uh that happened very quickly in those streams at least it was entertaining like, oh yeah there's like five my my, fa my favorite still the joan allen thing yeah <laughs> I as much as I like the Joan Allen thing, I'm more partial to like because where the stream really started to break down was the <laughs> radiant AI is gonna make processors explode. I think take. I missed that part. I think I got home uh before that or Hey after boys that and girls. Yeah, there was a lot of hey boys and girls. Oh yeah. <laughs> or like the secret joke contest where like he's trying to make people schizophrenic by like <laughs> finding Finding the secret joke in his videos. Acer historians. Acer historians. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where pretty much every merchant in the game has below 1,000 gold by default. Some as low as 500 gold. This meant if you had a lot of things to sell off, you had to fast travel around the map to different merchants to unload your goods. Okay, so I've heard this complaint before. Um... One thing is that, like, one of the rewards of doing the Thieves' Guild is that you get a bunch of merchants who congregate at one place, and all yeah. the fences ha will get, like, I think <clears throat> four to 5,000 gold. And I think a lot of those merchants also will have 2,000 gold each. Yeah, so, like, that's one of the rewards. I think a way of fixing this system is, like, like investing in the mines, you should be able to, like, hire somebody who, like... You just give them your stuff, and their job is to be like a traveling merchant who sells your loot. Isn't... No, nah, this is probably a fucking mod, where it was like your spouse would set up a shop, and you could just give them equipment to sell at the shop. Uh, Pretty it... sure that was a mod. Um, it's I, I haven't gotten married in this yet. It's complicated. I believe if you marry a merchant, they s will still perform their merchant duties if you if they continue to live in their shop okay like it's extremely arbitrary 
But even yeah. then, like, they will usually have, like, an insignificant amount of money. See, that... I think the main problem with this is that general goods merchants only have 500 gold. I think they should have, like, a thousand. They Yeah, they should be some of the wealthier NPCs, but they don't necessarily have, like, a lot of things that you can buy from them to give them more money. Yeah. But, yeah, like, um... Yeah, there just needs to be, like, a trash can that you can just shove the shit you don't want in. And you get less money as a result for it. But, and, like, the money comes in gradually as, like, the guy is going around selling stuff. And you might even, like, get to see it, like, from merchants who bought it. Yeah. So it's like, oh, yeah, this is one of my items. But, like, um, you would get less money because, like, the guy's taking a, a cut of it. But you wouldn't have to actually, like, run around selling shit. And even then, was, like, what's the point? Again, like... Yeah, the money money issue does... The guy... It's, right, it's never an issue. On right now, the guy has 110,000 gold. So, and what are you... What are you trying to get money for? Now, you can say, well, they should come up with a way to... Like, for They should come up with more things to spend money on and, and all that, sure. But, I don't know. Like, it, it's a piece of shit, but I don't know. It's optional, so. And as much as I don't like the it's optional, so don't do it argument, it is very much a case of, like, show me on the show me where Todd Howard forced you to loot all those urns kind of argument to it. Which is arbitrarily time-consuming. Raising speech unlocks perks to allow you to invest 500 gold into most merchants, permanently expanding their gold pool, and a perk that increases all merchant gold pools by 1,000. If you want to do any extensive trading, the maxing out speech, an incredibly tedious task, is essential. I'm not saying every merchant needs to be Creeper from Morrowind, but the gold limits on NPCs is pretty ridiculous. He didn't really complain about it, but isn't it funny that, like, he kind of complained about the perks that also have functions? That weren't just like stat percent increases. I imagine he consoled in that amount. I can believe it. I had over a hundred thousand gold, and I was like spending thousands of gold on training every level. I was also I was buying a crap ton of houses too, and I still was like, it is not loaded. it is not hard. Because what you do is you make the po you make the potions that have four effects because those can be worth like a thousand gold a piece, and then like every merchant that you talk to, I had a routine for it, so I didn't ne I never really like traveled around to do stuff. It was just like oh I'm in Markarth, I better visit the alchemist and the smith. Every time I went to a town, I would just go to the merchants, uh, take buy supplies for crafting, sell loot that i had on me and then sell the potions to get like the the total amount of gold and then like even though i was spending like five to ten thousand gold every level i was still like making a significant amount of money without like there being really any grinding to it so the best was um the college of winter holds i want to i want to yeah. mention that the college of winter yeah Hold, buying that's exactly gold what I not, not even buying grand soul gems. You can buy grand souls. That's a like great way to make money. Yep, and and then you can use them for uh, for training. Mm -hmm. Then they get a bunch of money. So then you sell the items, sell yeah, items back to them. All the trainers are also merchants at the college. So, yeah, like, oh. you spend like ten thousand gold training at the merchant, and then you just get all the money back. So then you, you get free levels. Yep. This is a speech skill. Wait, did this guy say looting all the urns was tedious and was somehow necessary? No, that's a never knows best thing. It's a hole. As mentioned earlier, mysticism was put face down in a ditch and shot three times in the back of the head. Listen, I will not tolerate such spurious allegations against uh, Mr. Toddathan Howard. It's remaining spells being relegated to other magic skills, but that wasn't the worst of the damage done to magic. 
It seems Skyrim had an axe to grind with the magic systems of Oblivion and Morrowind. <coughs> Certain if they did. There's some great quotes about it too. Like, um, hang on. Let me pull up the quote I used in my script. So, so he was asked, Todd Howard was asked, are you going to be able to craft spells, potions, and items? And he responded, we do have crafting within each discipline now. We do have smithing, enchanting is back as, as a skill, and then alchemy we're sort of treating as, it doesn't matter that much anymore, but it's sort of in our stealth category now. We have blended skill lists, so alchemy is sort of the most magical of the stealth skills, and then we have lots of other things that are not skill-based that you can craft, like cooking and things like that. And then I say, it's funny because the interviewer had to ask about spellcrafting again. And then I continue with the Todd quote from like a minute later. You know, I know one thing. When I was down to see you guys at the stu oh no, this is the this is the interviewer. When I was down at the studio, you guys were still exploring stuff that was related to how spells would interact with each other, and I would suspect the results of your experimentation on this stuff would affect whether you have anything like spellcrafting, right? Todd responds, Yeah, spellcrafting is a real wild card, something that we've done a lot, and there are pluses and minuses to it. We'd like to find... We have some ideas that we don't really like on how to solve that, and I don't know where that's going to go, but the thing that we don't like about the previous systems we've done is that it becomes very spreadsheety. It takes the magic out of magic. I'm going to summarize, and then I say, I'm going to summarize the rest of this. Todd has a long bit about where he describes the different, how different destruction effects work, which is my job, Todd. And then he says, <laughs> so our main goal is to make magic feel like this arcane powerful thing. And once it goes into a spreadsheet in the game where you can say, I want something at this distance and this power, it removes the illusion of like how this stuff actually works. So, and then I say, so Todd is somehow of this impression that spellcrafting ruins the illusion of magic, but that grinding out your smithing skills so you can make your weapons and armor better is fine for combat. And he then ends the part by saying, there are opportunities there for combinations and things you can do without getting into the spreadsheet aspect of it, which I do know some people like, but it does take away from the impact of spells that you're finding out mechanically how they work. And I say, Right, because the other playstyles don't figure out mechanically how they work, and magic playstyles won't figure out the mechanics of how their gameplay works over the course of several dozen hours of using the exact same spell over and over and over. So, like, yeah, there's there's some great stuff that Todd said about why spellcrafting had to go. I, like, I get what Todd's saying, and maybe in a certain type of game, that's that would be okay but i don't i don't see that work that mentality suddenly being introduced into the elder scrolls and it, it feels like a really shitty excuse too because it's like yeah um numbers are a big part of the other play styles yeah exactly it's like what do you have against numbers man i'm i can't recall right now do spells tell you how much magicka they use in the default interface? Yes. Okay. Effects were cut between those two games, but Skyrim decimated what was left. Just to take an example, Destruction in Oblivion had 17... Wait. What was the clip he was just playing of him killing Durak and then it, like, failed the quest to find out about the Dawnguard? What's going on in this clip? This is the speech skill as a whole. As mentioned earlier, mysticism was put face down in a dip. Okay, so he's fighting a challenger. I am having difficulty remembering who the challenger is. Isn't that just like some random uh, I think, radiant thing? I think this is Dawnguard radiant stuff. Itch and shot three times in the back of the head. Its remaining spells being relegated so, to other magics. Oh, and I, he was chain I lightning. I assume this is, well, chain lightning is actually one, like one of the good adept spells. Yeah. Um, but, okay, so he's got, he seems to have a quest to kill, he either has a quest to kill or talk to Jurak. Kills, but that wasn't the worst of the damage done to magic. It seems Skyrim had an axe to grind with the magic systems of Oblivion and Morrowind. Certain effects were cut between those two games, but Skyrim decimated what was left. Just to take it. And then he fails a quest to find out about the Dawnguard. The Dawnguard. So isn't Durak essential at that point, though? I have no idea. 
Apparently not. Like, I don't know what that quest objective is. I don't think he's essential, but I don't know what happens if you kill him. Yeah, I'm I'm confused. I don't know what this is. Cuz I looked on the Dawnguard quest page and there's not like a there's not a quest stage that's like failed. Is that Great, something to test. What happens if you kill Durek? <laughs> I don't, he doesn't play any essential parts in the quest line other than like approaching you and recruiting you. I'm trying, I'm reading chat. You lose the location of the Dawnguard base. So it's basically if you kill Dirac, then you have to like just find it on your own. It seems like that would be the way to start the vampire line. Like, if you wanted to never, like, visit the Dawnguard and just want to... Like, killing Durek would put a target on your back or something. I don't, I'm not sure what's going on here. An example, Destruction in Oblivion had 17 basic spell types. Okay. I was making sure he wasn't counting the ones that aren't actually spells, but he wasn't. Without accounting for variations, the three basic elemental attacks. Drain Attribute, Damage Attribute, Drain Fatigue, Drain Magicka, Disintegrate Armor, Disintegrate Weapon, Drain Health, Damage Health, Drain Skill, Weakness of Frost, Fire, Shock, Poison, and Magic. And these effects were turned into dozens of varied spells through the game. Sky I think you're being generous calling them varied spells. Um, you probably get into it, but like, okay, something like damage strength was obviously cut because, well, strength's not in Skyrim, right? Disintegrate armor is going to get cut because durability is not a thing, what have you, right? So, um,. Hang on. Someone said Pyrocynical made an eight hour video, so. Well, yeah, that's the privilege that you get when you get a gold play button. Because you get, you can get eight, hour, eight million views on it. Um. Rim, by comparison, has a scant four. Okay, so, like, I hope he really, like, clarifies some of this stuff, but it's, like, you do have to say, like, but they also did add, like, cloaks. They added the cloak spell effect and, like, runes. Um, like, chain lightning is new. Um, you know, you got stream spell effects, which basically replaced on touch. Then you got target effects, which are, like, the bolt spells and... You got the master spells. Like, there's new ways that the magic is, like, implemented than just... Oh, yeah, there's just fire damage. The three elemental damage types and absorb health. There is technically drain health, but that's exclusive to vampires. Some of these removals are due to significant mechanical changes, such as the removal of both attributes and equipment degradation. Others seem a bit... Yeah, see, he mentioned it. I gotta yeah. say, he mentioned it. But yes, okay. Arbitrary. Conjuration has the same issue with the amount of Daedra being reduced. In it's one of those things where it's like, if I pause and I say, and I like counter a point that he ends up countering himself, that just means that the criticism I applied earlier just isn't like accurate. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know why it bothers people that like, oh, you stopped and countered his point before you let him finish. And it's like, okay, then that yeah. means that it's just not 
applicable significantly to just four basic types the Antronok trio and the Dramora. Because yeah, okay, so yes, conjuration like was drastically cut down. Also, uh, familiars. Um, one of my issues with the Creation Club, however, is just how much shit it adds that you can summon because Skyrim's default user interface is not built around having that many yeah. like spell effects. Yeah, even even with like how you can go into like conjuration and stuff, you still have to do a lot of scrolling. Yeah, the magic menu is very neat and lean with the current list of effects. If you actually just start adding more and more shit that you can summon, the conjuration section of that menu just turns into a nightmare. Yeah, so then you then like, you're in inclined to start favoriting more things but then your favorites menu becomes a nightmare yeah like okay so there's conjure golden saint and then there's conjure golden saint archer like why <laughs> and then there and there's also dark seducers so there's the dark seducer and then the dark seducer archer yeah and stada she's a summon too because the types of different spells have been reduced you're a bit Conjuration in Skyrim is pitiful compared to other games, but that's Skyrim's the game that added necromancy. Again, you like you can complain that there's less summons, like it's sad that like the spider danger is gone, right? But they added necromancy, which just wasn't in the past games. And they added stuff like the like the thrall summons. They added a way to actually progress your summons, so it's not just you summon a flame atronach who has the same stats at level one and level one hundred. You can make you can make the stuff you summon more powerful too. But I'm going to assume that they have an issue with those perks because they actually do things that aren't just percentage upgrades. <laughs> That's such a weird thing now that I've noticed it. Like they, like like I said before, they complained about percentage upgrade perks, but they fairly consistently like also complained about perks that aren't that. Ability to interact with the world in interesting ways has been reduced as well, and this includes combat. Wait, part two of part one. Oh yeah. As with every Elder Scrolls game, I'm gonna say that necromancy is fine in Skyrim. And I actually, like, prefer how necromancy works in Skyrim to pretty much how it works in literally every other game ever. Like, necromancy in ESO is so sad. I thought, I figured they would just, like, it would be like necromancy from Skyrim, where it's like, you would kill things, and then you would reanimate them, so it's like you could get a ball rolling and become, like, increasingly powerful until, like, you ran out of stuff to kill, but that's, it's just summoning. Game. There are three basic combat specializations. I've okay, hold on. Did he get a lot louder all of a sudden? Sounds the same to me. Because the types of different spells have been reduced, your ability to interact with the world in interesting ways has been reduced as well, and this includes combat. As with every Elder Scrolls game, oh, yeah. yeah, he's louder. Was that RimWorld combat music? It made me think of uh, like red versus blue music. It sounded like uh, the ending theme song for Mass Effect 1. It kind the of does. It's not font. bombastic enough. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking about fonts at the end, like the, the licensed music that they use during the credits. Oh, okay, yeah. Don't you have a limit on reanimated corpses and they only last a few minutes too? Yeah, you also have a limit on how long summons can last. And also, like, the end, the end perk of Conjuration is cool because you can permanently reanimate things. So you can have, like, a, a body that you kit out with gear and just keep reanimating. So, like, at 100 Conjuration, you get the thing where you can reanimate two bodies at once, and you permanent reanimate two fucking Dramora Lords. 
and then you also have Jizargo if fully kitted out in Daedric gear. So you just have like a squad of people wrecking shit. And then you get the uh, the goblin follower, a pet. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's like, okay, he is ridiculous. He gets annoying after a while because he. Oh, the gob the goblin sum- dude also summons storm atronachs. Yeah, he so he summons a storm atronach, <laughs> but that guy is so sensitive to friendly fire. Like, if if Gog takes like one point of damage from you, the storm atronach like turns on you. <laughs> Yeah, but you can spam summons, reanimated corpses turn to ash. Yeah, but if you're good at necromancy, you can reanimate powerful corpses. And you can upgrade the necromancy. Like, again, you're not make, you're not making a particularly cool case for why necromancy isn't cool. And it's still preferable to how literally every other video game has ever done necromancy, which is just, you summon stuff. No, listen... You don't want... A, you can summon... You can reanimate as many corpses as you want. It literally breaks Skyrim. There are three basic combat specializations. Melee, Magic, and Stealth. You He's can use any up. combination of skills under these specializations. Or, you could go all in on a single specialization. Unfortunately, each combat specialization has significant issues. Starting with Melee, it's largely reduced to a game of picking either a single-handed or two-handed piece of metal in your desired shape and spamming the attack button until your enemies die. Dual wielding- You can be reductive, but you could also be, like, reductive with Oblivion's combat system, and it's the same, and Morrowind's combat system as well. And Kingdom Come Deliverances, and, you know what I mean, like, Yes, it's true that's what it is, but I don't think that's particularly accurate. Healing has finally been added to the series, however, it comes in the most useless form possible. There are no real special attacks for having two weapons outside of power attacks and clicking both attack buttons at once. For regular attacks, a weapon in each hand simply acts as a single weapon as you can't start a swing with your off weapon while swinging with your main. If you do the double swing attack, it stops you from moving entirely, which is obviously detrimental during combat. It also- I- okay, my issue with dual-handed is that you don't have the same functions in the left hand as you do the right hand. What, like moves, you mean? Yeah. Like, the left hand- like, your character's very obviously right-handed, because the left hand is, like, less function to it. attack animations making it well okay yeah like somebody said in chat um doom and modern warfare are both games where you go shooty shooty bang bang visually boring the main appeal seems to be in the kill animations which are a genuine improvement to the series and i hope they keep this aspect going forward okay that's uh that, that, that's an that's interesting first, one uh, that's the first time i've ever heard somebody compliment those Um, my issue with kill moves is the same as my issue with, uh, glory kills, which is that they just slow down the combat. Yeah. Like, I've never been one to be like, oh man, these kill moves are so, well, okay, I was, I was like 14 and really into Assassin's Creed. Uh, but like, this is not something that I've felt really fits in the formula of Elder Scrolls. I don't remember. I don't think Fallout 4 has kill moves. For melee? I don't think it does. Uh, for melee? I don't know, because I've never used melee in Fallout 4 that much. I'm trying to remember. My issue was I was doing power armor, because obviously. Like, what else would you do if you were doing melee, right? Um, and so, like, maybe power armor stops you from getting kill moves, but I don't think kill moves are in Fallout 4. Also, I never understood why Fallout 4 didn't implement dual wielding. Like, that seems like an intuitive step forward for Fallout, doesn't it? Dual wielding guns? Um... It does, but hang on, hang on. 
Are we counting the kill moves in Fallout 4 as it slows the game down as you just do a normal swing animation? However, it's ultimately superficial and- Hang on, now I'm curious. Because I inherently don't trust chat. Yeah, I always, I'm always skeptical about dual wielding now, especially guns, because of what happened in Halo 2 and 3, and how they had to balance around it. Okay, you can't give me a one-word answer and not clarify which of my questions you're answering. So it looks like it does, and I just never got them because I was using power armor. Nice fucking system, Bethesda. Doesn't save- Like, doesn't it seem like the one build that would actually use power armor would be the one that's going into melee combat? The combat system in the slightest. Another problem the series has always had issues with, made worse by Skyrim blending all melee weapons down to just two classes, is there's no particular utility for using a mace or an axe over a sword. But let's be honest, there never was. There only was in Morrowind in the sense of like which swing, like which weapons would do damage and which swing types. But since like use best auto attack exists in the options that like that's literally pointless. Like you're always going to poke with a spear. See, the reason there are different types of weapons. But here's the thing. I use third person in Fallout 4 because it's better for melee than first person. Weapons in the real world is for different utilities in combat. Axes, alongside spears, were the mainstay in combat due to their ease of use and cost of manufacture, while being able to do significant damage to enemies in lighter armor or with wooden shields. Yes, this is true, and I never understood why Skyrim didn't have a primary axe focus, given that it's the homeland of the Nords. Like, you would think that swords would be in the minority. Yeah. You would, you would think the, the promo material would have a Dragonborn holding an axe, but... It's a big fucking axe! And why are you scared of, like, marketing it as an axe? You might say, like, like swords are more intuitive to fantasy, but, like, you know Gimli used an axe, and he was pretty popular. I wonder if Skyrim was re released today, if they would have made it so that the Dragonborn was holding an axe instead. Because when you watch, like, Vikings on TV, mm -hmm. they're all using axes for the most part. Yeah, there's no way a modern and Skyrim would not, like, be axe-focused. Right? <laughs> At least Mace has armor rating ignore perk, except most of the enemies in the game don't have armor. Yeah. Like, not even dragons or chorus or anything, or, like, uh, automatons. Maces and Warhammers... Yeah, okay, here's the problem with your they swing slower but do more damage theory. Skyrim was very meticulous about making sure that in the aggregate, um, every weapon does the exact same amount of damage. Like, it swings slower, but it does slightly more damage is exactly the same as it swings fast, but it does less damage. Like, there's literally MMO balance to how weapons work in Skyrim. The real Warhammer, not these insane two-handed mauls, were used to deal with armored opponents, to break bone beneath the armor or ruin metal shields, and break the shield arm from an impact. Yeah, but it's almost like the Vikings were Ravagers who had to, like, break into places, and that axes have one really useful skill, which is that they're useful for breaking down wood. Swords were a status symbol of wealth, but were also more versatile in combat. Using various stances, you could try to poke through gaps in armor, or more easily deflect incoming blows, and use your opponent's momentum against them, or even go for powerful cuts and stabs, with easier recovery time than an axe. Elder Scrolls, and Skyrim in particular, seems to treat them as entirely cosmetic differences, rather than having any kind of practical difference in combat, outside of very generic perks on the constellation chart. This makes the admittedly somewhat bland combat from previous titles even more bland. 
Skyrim tries to make up for this with perks, but even then, the difference is minimal. Do you want some bleed damage on your axes, whether one-handed or two-handed? Which doesn't explain and is really inconsistent. Handed. Do you want your swords to potentially critically hit? Which it also doesn't explain. Skyrim is very terrified of numbers. Do you want the mace or warhammer to ignore some armor? That is your entire lot when differentiating the weapons in Skyrim. In oblivion. Yeah, I think I have, I have a thing in my script where it's like, you could probably, if you could surreptitiously install a mod on people's Skyrim games, you could switch all the models around and people wouldn't even notice. Well, you'd have to, you would, you would have to change the names, but if you switch the models and names around, people wouldn't notice that like, iron maces have the stats of iron swords, for instance. Oh, yeah. Raising any skill to the next tier unlocked new abilities. As mentioned earlier, for alchemists, it was learning additional effects of ingredients. For weapon skills, it came across as a natural progression of a character learning to utilize their weapons as effectively as possible, even though most weapon skills shared the same bonuses leading to a similar problem. It's really good that this is 40 minutes into the video because this would just bore people if it was like at, at the 10 minute mark. Why is balance and swing speed and damage the same? Alright. Here's why it's the same. Okay. It has to deal with something called equivalence formulas, which you do a lot of in chemistry. Um, or like, say, a unit conversion or something like that. So, um, you, on the left, you have, let's say, 2 over 1. It does 2 damage for 1 speed. That is equal... Well... Yeah... No, 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 that's, this is not the way to explain it. Um, the way to explain it is to say, if a sword does... Hang on, how does Skyrim do it? Swords are the fastest, but they do the least damage. Fuck it, I'm going to look it up on the UASP and just use the numbers. All right, here's how it works. Swords have a reach of one, a speed of one, and a stagger of 0.75. Axes have a reach of one, a speed of 0.9, and a stagger of 0.85. Maces have a reach of one, a speed of 0.8, and a stagger of one. Daggers have a reach of 0.7, a speed of 1.3, and a stagger of zero. The end result is that because you have only minorly changed one number, and like you've minorly increased one number and minorly decreased another number, your overall damage per second is exactly the same, right? So sure, swords do seven damage, axes do eight damage, and maces do nine damage. However, maces swing at 0.8, war axes swing at 0.9, and swords swing at one, which means that over the course of the game, your damage per second with a sword, even though it does less damage than maces, is gonna be the same as maces regardless. Unless you throw enchanting into the mix, because enchants even activate. with enchanting. Oh, really? I would imagine, yeah. If you're like, what enchant? Like fortify one-handed? No, I'm saying with like, um, like a fire enchant. I mean, okay, so you, your argument is if you have a fire enchant on, like, a fast weapon that you would be yeah. applying it more often. So, yeah, yeah, but I mean, then, the, like, the top weapons in the game would be daggers because even though they do four... Uh, an iron dagger does four damage to an iron sword seven, it would apply more frequently. I, I mean, I guess you can make that argument. That would make daggers the best weapons in the game. Sounds like something I gotta test. But yeah, like, if we're talking about the main weapons in the game, a, there's not a statistical difference between a speed of 0.9 and a speed of 1. And it's not something that scales out where, like, once you have 100% more damage, 100% more damage doubles the numbers. So an iron sword now does 14 damage, and an iron mace now does 18 damage. But, like, 
that's still significantly this is still statistically insignificant in a game where npcs have like 400 health or what have you like there is not a numerical difference between the weapons i mean there is a, there is a difference but over time there's not Part of the pr problem is attacking largely comes down to just slapping an enemy model with your weapon and chugging potions when your health gets low. Yeah, the, the gunplay in Doom just comes down to pointing at an enemy and hitting left click. You know what I mean? Like, um, this is why I don't like reductionism, because it's very easy to just make this argument with, like, literally anything. Rather than there being any kind of strategy to dealing with enemies, slap, 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 block their attack, and do a power attack to break their block. Unfortunately, the combat system is so lacking. It's a problem of, like, utility. Like, Skyrim desperately needs actual parries. And, like, reposts. I think the other problem, too, is limited AI and the fact that the game doesn't really ever force you to mix things up yeah because it doesn't want to impose a play style on you yeah that's but yeah if you want to know more about like the numerical differences between weapons j you can go to the uesp page for skyrim there's a weapons page that has every weapon on it and it you can just like you can look at all the weapons in the game and see how like insignificant the differences are Spamming attacks is genuinely your best option for melee combat, too. Power attacks can stagger an enemy or break their block, however, doing power attacks on legendary is a death sentence. Spam clicking attacks levels the skill faster if you actually want to get level unlocks. That's not as big a problem in Skyrim, though, because, like, even if you're going as slow as possible, you'll max out your one handed skill pretty easily. and allows for a chance to back away from opponents, which is far safer than being locked into a long animation wherein the enemy and others can get free hits on you. A lot of this comes from the permanent damage debuff the player is saddled with, meaning enemies only take 25% of the damage, while the enemy has no such considerations and deals three times the damage to the player. So spam clicking and popping the menu open to chug potions becomes the most comfortable option. In truth, you really yeah, but the way that you're supposed to navigate the combat in in Skyrim on legendary difficulty is again, like I said earlier, it's about how you prepared for the fight beforehand, and less about like your actual skill in the fight. So it's like it's annoying that I have to make full use of potions. Well, that's legendary. That's the point. want to try and avoid getting into melee combat as much as possible on legendary well what about weapon bashing to get around this problem yeah that's how you win assuming you can yeah. even get the stagger to work with a power bash which requires level 30 and blocking okay okay one level 30 and blocking is really easy but two um i did not have this issue on a melee character i could stun lock anything in the game to death like, just use sword and board. The enemy- Oh yeah, and the music is distracting. He will be stunned for a longer time. There doesn't seem to be a consistent way to stagger a person, even with a power bash, thus making it unreliable and even more notorious. There are still bugs present to this day that negates things like disarm bash, level 70 blocking, even- Oh yeah, no, the block tree is busted, but I mean, early on, yeah. Working at all. It's fine. As it turns out, if you play an Argonian in Skyrim, you cannot- You don't have rights. ...not use Disarming Bash at all, which has to be fixed by an unofficial patch, but go on and tell us how Bethesda doesn't rely on- There's a lot of numerical stuff like that that's broken, like, um, bleed damage on axes is really inconsistent, and there are several axes in the game that, like, it doesn't apply to.
on modders to fix their game at all, Oxhorn. I don't think Bethesda relies upon modders to fix the bugs in their own game. Oh, shut up. This is exacerbated by the fact there's little in the way of you- Yet, yeah, if I was at Bethesda, even if I was doing like the let the modders fix it approach, there is still like core stuff wrong with Skyrim that I would fix. You need yeah, because, contact you know, not everybody's going to download the freaking patch. Especially console players. Space attacks. For example, swinging at an enemy's head and swinging at their legs is effectively the same. It's effectively the same? No, it is. This is a minor thing, but like, yeah, there's a lot... There, there are a lot of people out there who will say something effectively is when... I think it's a, you don't want to commit to, like, saying with certainty um, that it is, but in this instance, yeah, it is. There's not locational damage in Skyrim. You can't cripple your enemy's ability to move, nor can you stun them a moment by ringing their head like a bell, nor do they feel the need to protect those particular body parts because those effects simply don't exist. There's no special animations for trying to smash an enemy's knee with a warhammer, nor are there animations for enemies trying to specifically dodge or block those attacks in any way. Blocking doesn't simply cover the shield, but effectively the whole front side of the character model, and this is literally only ever done by raising the shield to cover the chest area. This is made even worse yet, by making attacks largely feel weightless outside of certain circumstances. Slap, 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 yeah. That was some like MMO MMO level combat right there. What? Well, it's like I, how I showed the Morrowind's uh, combat comparison, where it's like the difference between skill level 100 and skill level 15 in each of the games, and like what the actual gameplay looks like. Because there's little reactivity to attacks. The only real feedback you get is the enemy attempting to block or their health bar going down. This makes combat look and feel particularly awkward, best demonstrated in dragon fights. Because only simple and generic reaction animations have been made to taking damage, you end up with these awkward situations where models are simply pushed around as they're taking damage, quite literally as the model slides or hovers along the ground rather than any kind of believable reaction to taking damage. As a result, melee combat is a very boring affair. It's a slap fight of spamming attacks with your weapon of choice, with little to it, besides healing, and occasionally power attacking to stagger a blocking opponent. Additionally, because stamina is so worthless as a stat in this game, it doesn't seem to impact enemies a whole lot, unlike in Morrowind, where it was actually a strategy to drain an enemy's fatigue to knock them down, Especially with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, yes. I'm trying to think what what did it was it that I wanted to say. It's like I I didn't know until like way too late in Oblivion that like damage was scaled off of fatigue. So like being low fatigue in Oblivion is a bad thing because you do less damage. I didn't know that even when I was making my videos. So yeah, like. The game, like, the game doesn't elaborate on it, and there, it, it's not an consistent enough, like, okay. If it was Dark Souls, and Dark Souls had a mechanic like that, you would fight, like, the same axe enemy over and over, and so, like, if you fought one axe enemy at full health, and you saw that you were doing 125 damage, and then you saw, or, well, stamina, and then you fought the same axe enemy later, uh, at at low stamina and you were only doing 75 damage then you would figure out that that mechanic exists but because there's such like variability on an enemy by enemy basis um it, you can't really notice that like your attacks are just doing less damage when you're low fatigue and oblivion yeah now if we were to look at a different oh oh <laughs> speak of the devil The old unethical comparison. 
Or is it? Un no, it, it's inhumane. <laughs> Man, Dark Souls Remaster is looking good. <laughs> For game, you could see how adding just a couple extra moves and making attacks more impactful can make combat more interesting. But that's not really fair. Dark Souls is widely praised for its combat, so how about we try a different game? Sir! Sir, wake up! The manor is under attack! There are necromancers everywhere! I'm gonna see if the master is alright. Hide yourself! Who can't find the will to play some Dark Messiah? There's a light I'm going to... There's no way out! We're trapped! Also, this clip could be, like, cut better. You won't make it. Show some skill before. What was that? Oh, okay, so that's why he's using this footage. I didn't get debated. I didn't say, man, he should really bring up Dark Souls. It would be really pressing if he brought up Dark Souls and then he did it like a second later. See how the level of interactivity with the world turns combat from simply slapping an enemy with a sword to a- Okay, but if Dark Messiah is good, you should be able to just play it and get a clip of the combat looking good full-on tactical use of your environment to dispatch enemies? I'm not even saying Skyrim has to do anything this complex or unique. Just do more than making combat as basic as humanly possible. However, that isn't entirely fair either. The games came out in entirely different years, so maybe that level of interactivity in RPG combat wasn't yet available. And also they had, like, different design priorities. Like how Dark Messiah... Dark Messiah is a famous big open world game with lots of AI in it and looting and what have you. I don't know, like, as much as I love uh, unfair comparisons... Yeah. Remember the Dark Messiah was criticized because the combat was shallow. I'm gonna say... The Dark Messiah is criticized and deserves to be criticized because the combat is shallow because everything is solved by kicks. Like, as much as I love Dark Messiah, I think its combat's worse than Dishonored. Simply because um, there's not really, like, a one-button game over for NPCs like there is in Dark Messiah. At least in terms of the melee combat. Well, okay... That's a bust, but maybe Bethesda had never heard of Dark Messiah. After all, it wasn't a super triple-A release. I already know the punchline. Yeah, and who can is... expect Bethesda to know about the games of studios they personally bought because of said game? Right, because the Bethesda that develops the games is also the Bethesda that does all the business transactions. And then it owns said studio a year before Skyrim's release. Huh. Now to actually be fair to Bethesda, Dark Souls released just before Skyrim and went on to be a massive hit. I am not saying that Skyrim should have had the foresight to see what Dark Souls would be. We are using Dark Souls as an example of adding weight to combat to make combat far more interesting, something Skyrim's combat is sorely lacking. We are, however, using Dark Messiah as something Bethesda absolutely should have taken notes from to make their combat more interesting, as it was a studio they scouted and went on to own years before Skyrim's release. Again, Todd Howard is not the, is not the man who, you know, buys companies. You know, it wasn't Todd Howard's decision to buy whatever the fuck company made Brink, you know. Why didn't Bethesda learn from Brink and add 
asymmetrical multiplayer. But yeah, like, okay. So, with the melee section done, or at least part of it, given stealth still needs to be discussed, how does magic fare in all of this? Where do we even begin with magic? You don't. You don't begin with magic. You don't have the two hours needed. <laughs> like, I actually have a joke in my script, which is, my College of Winterhold section, um, typically there's a tangent in the, in the faction section about the mechanics, but in that instance, it's more accurate to say that there's a tangent about the College of Winterhold in the magic <laughs> section. <laughs> Because um, as, like, the magic person in the Elder Scrolls review space, uh, my feelings have not been... I have not seen a single person really talk, like, express my feelings on the magic system. I don't think anybody's even gotten close to... Like, n nobody even discusses how damage is like uh destruction has been broken down into stream spells target like mm -hmm. yeah i feel like i feel like that's the direction this is going because um either they were disingenuous when they presented the number of spell effects and destruction by not including that information or like they're just basing it off of like reading the wiki but um Yeah, as someone said, Dark Souls combat is kind of boring because it's just, it is is just a light attack and a heavy attack. And then for shields, like, the light attack is a block and the heavy attack is a parry, right? Dark Souls combat in of itself is not particularly engaging because it has a very simple move set. What makes it engaging is, like he says, enemy variety, tight hitboxes, and I would also add, like, level design and animations as like big parts of what makes dark souls combat actually uh fun to play but as far as like the move sets itself dark souls is extremely simplistic in terms of like uh third person action role playing games well listen we don't bring up dark souls 2 in the house of our lord should elder scrolls have environmental interaction well, yeah, that's another big thing is, like, you can't really, like, pick up and throw objects like you can in a Source game. That's a pretty big, like, engine difference. Is yeah. that a big part of Source is um, prioritizing uh, environmental interactions. However... They do, have, they do have environmental interactions in Skyrim, though. You have, like, the fire pots and stuff you can shoot down. Mm -hmm. But you don't, you don't really have an instance where, like, you can pick up an object you, and throw it, and it, like, yeah. breaks slightly. Damn, I'll imagine all those urns you could throw. <laughs> right, like, just chucking the urns at the Draugr. But, yeah, like, okay, here's the thing. Half-Life is a game about environmental interaction, and as a result, most of its first-person shooter mechanics are extremely simple compared to other mechanical first-person shooters that don't do environmental interactions. There's a cost when it comes to implementing that type of combat system that you can do with Source that might not necessarily pay out or pay off in an open-world role-playing game. Well, it's also... It, it's a role-playing game, so how do you balance throwing objects at enemies? Like, how does, right. how what, do skills how does that factor into that? skill? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that is another thing, is, like, arcane games very heavily rely on player skill over character skill. Like, um, they, like, later on with, like, Dishonored, they just completely, they basically dropped the idea of, uh, there being an RPG progression system. I suppose a good starting location would be to talk about the initial release of the game, when Magic had no special animations for it, when highlighted kills were not a thing, and before they simply co Because you think that's a good thing. But even when they were implemented, I, I, I have to hope the next line is that when they were implemented, they were bad. Because the Magic kill animations in Skyrim are fucking awful. 
they get you killed. Yeah, at higher difficulties, they trigger too liberally. Copied over the bow kills with some added touches at the end. After Become a chat and compare Skyrim combat to Dark Souls 2. That would be that would be funny to do a Dark Souls comparison, but I'm actually playing like Dark Souls or Demon Souls or what have you. Getting some healthy and deserved backlash. From this, you begin to see that Bethesda's view on magic was an act kill to talk the about the initial the release of the game when magic had no special animations for it, when highlighted kills were not a thing, and before they simply copied over the bow kills with some added touches at the end. Okay, so the bow and magic kills were post-launch content that were developed during the Bethesda Game Jam. Um, so they were developed side by side. After getting some health- Well, I just saw DS and 2, so I, I immediately assumed Dark Souls 2. Please don't be ironic in your video. Irony is extremely difficult to pull off because when you are being intentionally disingenuous for the sake of, like, doing a bit, um, even when you're not doing, like, a, like a reaction stream, it can still be, like, it could still be a trap that catches people. And uh, people, contrary to popular belief, people are not big fans of traps. The deserved backlash. From this, you begin to see that Bethesda's view on magic was an afterthought. Oh, absolutely. I am adamant in the belief that there is nobody at Bethesda who actually, like, primarily plays magic. A burden they had to put into the game. And hopefully by the end of the section, you'll- Oh, no. At Dark Souls is absolutely an action role-playing game. Like, it's not the meme of Skyrim's an action-adventure game. No, like, that is what Dark Souls is. You'll understand just how much it has been gutted and dumbed down. Magic may be one of the most underwhelming experiences in all of Skyrim. Simultaneously great once you slog through the mediocre bits, yet always feeling incredibly weak unless it's used against you. At first, the system looks like it has depth. You have your left and right hands, which can cast different spells, or the same spell just power- And so you're like, damn, this is gonna be like Magico, where I combine spell effects. Yeah. Power it up. That is, if you have the appropriate level to then spend the level up point into said perk. Assuming you also had the other perks- Okay. Uh... Give me one second here. What does phantom power even do? All right, listen. You need a pop filter because there's pops in your audio, and when you have a pop filter, you stop having as many pops in your audio. It's unlocked before that in the chain. A big problem with magic is that it is a very linear progression of power. There are no special magic combinations, like if you did frostbite with flames, like in the game Magicka, which came out 10 months oh my before God. Sky. <laughs> well, see, it's the same wavelength. Like, <laughs> that's, like, that's gotta be, um, th that's gotta be the system that it makes you think of. Because, like, when you think about, you have two hands for a magic system, it, that default, Magicka. Instead, it's just a flat damage bonus, or duration bonus, to whatever skill you use. This is only the tip of the iceberg There's the problems with magic in Skyrim. So many magic skill trees feel completely pointless, and when a vast majority of the upgrades are incredibly generic, does X% percent more damage, allows two summons instead of one, This Christmas music playing in the background. Yeah, the the music's disconcerting. Um, I don't know. It's like, so what makes a non-generic perk then? I 
I also disagree with that there's useless magic tree perks or magic trees in general. I think they're all they all have pretty useful. Yeah, they all have they all have uses. Um Yeah. Like I would say like illusion absolutely you need to put the if you're going to be using illusion spells you need to invest almost that entire perk tree. Yeah, it's, it's, it's destruction it's really half annoying. of it's half of it's essential. Restoration is probably the weakest one, but even then, there's still perks in there. No, where there's it's still, like there's still stuff that you want from restoration. Like yeah, like the faster magicka regen or something like one that. One of the best magic perks is the one that adds uh, when you use healing magic. It also gives you stamina back because it yeah, adds like true. a new it adds a new function and utility to the game. But they seem to have a lot of issues with perks that add like functions <laughs> and utility. So it's like he has a problem with the perk that lets you conjure two things at once. That's kind of like one of the biggest perks in conjuration yeah because it changes the the entire way that that play style works i mean not the entire way but like two summons is a it doesn't sound like a big deal but it is a big deal because you can mix and match then be like all right i'm gonna have an atronach and then i'm gonna have a dramora. animated dead yeah or, yeah you could animate animated. stuff and summon can dual cast for better stats or spells of that tier. Well, I will say, if we're comparing this to other videos, this is definitely better than Salt Factory. Cost half as much. It seems like the absolute cratering and watering down of magic has been completed. No, it hasn't. There is so much farther we can go down. <laughs> we can remove magic entirely. Yeah, never assume we're at the bottom. Just play, just play uh, Fable Three, and you can see where it can really go. Yeah, I w okay, so I would say the weakest uh, magic perk tree is definitely Alteration. But it still gives Mage Armor, which is very useful. I don't think so. I think that you can get more utility out of wearing armor. Is there, is there a downside to mages wearing armor now that I'm thinking about it? I, I don't think so, because there's not like a spell effect in this component. Yeah. There isn't. So if you're in, like, I the only way mage armor is useful is if you refuse to do smithing. And see, because here's the thing: if you're, say, you're wearing like heavy armor, mm -hmm. that's a lot of that's a lot of points. That's a lot of weight that you have to carry around all the time. And if you don't invest any points into, you know, the what is it like good fit or something like that, where it mm -hmm. negates your carry weight. Um, that's a lot of weight that you're going to be carrying, and chances are, since you're a mage, you're not going to be investing in stamina. So, but you also don't have to carry weapons around. Yeah, but if you're wearing light armor, it's like, how much weight is light armor really? I think max light armor, like dragon scale, could probably hit the eighty percent armor rating threshold, which is like five hundred armor rating. Yeah. Right, you don't need, and you don't even have to hit max because you could still add on ebony flesh which is like a hundred points of armor rating I take it like this and what my point during the script was two summons shouldn't be the only really intricate one more interesting things like perhaps a magic perk that can cast from health instead of damage I think that every magic system ever that uses magicka can benefit from a spell called life tap from world of warcraft which isn't even in retail by the way and pisses me off life tap is one of the coolest fucking spells in a setting ever it makes warlocks like an extremely cool class and differentiates them heavily from mages right mages are just i'm boring i cast frostbolt i cast frostbolt i cast frostbolt i'm out of magicka and then like warlocks are like I'm going to put all these fucking dots on the enemy, and I'm going to put Siphon Life on them, and then, oh, I'm out of Magicka? I'm going to sacrifice health to get more Magicka. You don't have to stop. If you have a healer, you don't have to stop as a Warlock. It's legitimately cool. And yes, Equilibrium is in the game, but it's busted because it, like, scales with difficulty. But, I mean, this is sort of the thing, right? If you want to talk about how there's, like, useless perks in Skyrim, 
then I would be really interested in he hearing your ideas for what exactly like useful perks would be would be but I'm assuming that you're of the position that perks in general are a bad thing which I actually disagree with No longer can you level up a magic skill to pick locks for you. You need to grind lock picking. No longer can you cast spells. But what about the tower stone? <laughs> See, this is why my videos are like 12 hours long. <laughs> <laughs> to slow others or lighten the burden of what you carry. No longer can you summon shields or armor or even daggers until Dragonborn at least put bound dagger back in. No longer can you summon Daedros, or Clan Fears, or Wraiths, or Liches. No longer can you destroy someone's armor, or drain their stats. No longer can you bind people to your will, or purge Magicka from an area. No longer can you cast spells to reflect enemy spells back at themselves, nor can you fortify your own abilities through magic. The problem is Oblivion had all this and had no incentive for why you wouldn't just do fire damage. Exa yeah, that was... That was my main pro it's a it's a fun magic system but there's just absolutely no incentive whatsoever even when you're playing on higher difficulties yeah you can have just... all the utility in the world but if there's no reason to use it then like for instance as somebody mentioned earlier a holy weapon in dark souls stops skeletons from reanimating that's utility that you can use in combat but if the solution yeah. to every problem is just reduce their health to zero then there's no reason why you should ever actually use any of the effects that he's listing off. Yeah, I, I guess. I, I keep forgetting. I have no way to remember to kind of update the model. Oh, yeah, because you're not getting the super chats, so... No longer can you create a spell that summons an entire set of armor and a weapon to you like in Morrowind, or Oblivion. Needless so this always comes up as an example, and I'm kind of curious. How much Magicka does it take to summon a full set of armor? It's got to be a lot. Like a single point, I... a single piece for like 30 seconds, I think, is like 8 Magicka. Yeah, I just never understood using it because it expires and then disappears. Um, so it's useful because you get a Daedric level item, and the Daedric level item fortifies your skill. So, that's why, that's like, um, the Binding Swordsman is like one of the coolest builds I've ever come up with for Morrowind, which is you summon your sword into combat before every fight. Yeah. Because... Not only does a red guard, a red guard with long blade, have like sixty-five or something long blade skill, but then the Daedric sword you summon bumps it up another ten points. That doesn't happen in in Oblivion, though, right? No. Okay. Let's just say this also means that enemies cannot do these things either, which makes magic duels little. Yeah, because they really did it in the previous games yeah the mythic dawn did it <laughs> yeah like there was so little like the ai is just not robust enough to make effective use of magicka without yeah without like some either dynamics shit because the way like enemy spell selection would work in morrowind is that basically they would just pick random spells and go I said equilibrium, and it sucks because it scales with difficulty, so it does. It takes more and more health the higher difficulty you're at. Like, it's a really poorly thought out spell. And it's not even really a solution because. Here's the thing here's why Warlocks with Life Tap work, where, like, using Life Tap in Skyrim does it. You don't have the points to really invest in health in Skyrim. Warlock's primary attribute in World of Warcraft is stamina, which means that they have, like, shit tons of health. Like, very, very nearly, we almost got the concept of Warlocks being caster tanks because of how much health they had. A little more than long-range slap fights, 
Unless we forget the I challenge you to a magic duel guy that shows up literally naked to pew pew you with spells. You best believe we will be discussing this naked antagonist in later videos. Okay. The sheer volume of spell- That was a long pause. And we're back with a different microphone, or a different recording yeah, it's a day. Di it's a different day. His recording days seem to be like 20 minutes. Mine are usually only about 40. Yeah, 45 to an hour. Yeah. Spells removed from Skyrim is staggering. And while you may say they were trimming the fat, it is clear they are continuing the downward spiral as simplifying, dumbing down, and removing what made magic special. Uh, they are dumbing it down to appeal to casuals. In the Elder Scrolls series, so that they don't have to put as much effort into their game. Yeah, but Warlock's only got one encounter and I think AQ to actually, like, tank. Like, there were so, like, it was a poorly thought out mechanic, which was hilarious because Warlocks had a spell that, like, would just arbitrarily increase their threat rating, which is like, okay, why would a Warlock want to increase their threat? That would make them a tank. And it's like, oh yeah. Games. As we found out with ML, effort is a very bad word at Bethesda. ML. Bethesda when they would much rather just wing it with no plan or thought. Great games are played and not made. This is like, I don't know, it's, co it's, this is like uncommon bingo, right? So like there's the common bingo that actually makes the card, but this is definitely like up there, this particular presentation, because it gets around. Downward spiral. What a terrible model and work philosophy. Oh, absolutely. Emil's got some gems out there. I think, I think someone at Bethesda uh, made Emil sign like an NDA. <laughs> he, ha he hasn't <laughs> talked in a while, so like everything you us say makes us look worse. Look bad. <laughs> it's sort of like how. They did the Bethesda Game Jam, revealed that they could, like, make a shit ton of stuff in one week, and realized, oh, that's not a good look. Yeah. And then never did anything like that again. It's unfortunate that, like, people get punished for being honest because they don't realize that, like, their honesty exposes them. And so, like, the reason why there's so many disingenuous people who lie a lot is simply because... You get punished for being honest. One that doesn't even remotely work. Who thought kid in a fridge, or finding a cat and telling it to go home, were great play experiences? Go home. Your family misses you. <laughs> <laughs> on top of all of this, the entire concept of making- Yeah, I got that clip on my second channel. Or, well, I guess this is the second channel. Making your own magic spells has completely been removed. You won't be able to take her around and find interesting combinations, or change ranged spells into touch spells, or tailor spells to be more efficient for the exact purposes you want. All of this has been thrown away to give you less options or variety in magic. If you go more than 45 minutes, you start making, like, doing worse recordings, in my opinion. really cuts the feet out from under you when an entire college of mages are a little more than generic trainers and spell salesmen, but that'll be discussed in the future. So what can you still do with magic? Magic is- Spam firebolt for like 40 hours. Separated Bam, into uh, three one different- One of my favorite things to do is get, um, become ethereal and then put, uh, what's it called? Flame cloak on myself and then just run into enemies. Uh... I think I talked about it before. Um, one of the exploits I found that, like, not even the stream chat told me about was Fortify Destruction as an effect has an, in an interesting interaction with uh, cloak spells. It increases not their damage, but their range. 
So oh. if you have a sufficiently <laughs> powerful... Yes, okay. If you have a like 400% Fortify Destruction potion and you take it, you can literally walk into a dungeon and kill every enemy in it with a cloak spell. I wonder if you could use that and then snipe dragons out of the sky by just yeah, standing can. under them. <laughs> like, it's absurdly overpowered. You can just stand in the middle of a fort battle and watch it end. <laughs> oh my like, god. I got, so I switched from fire to lightning because of it. And so, like, I would just walk through dungeons and there would be piles of ash everywhere. <laughs> Different damage types. Fire solely does health damage. Ice does health and stamina, lightning does health and magicka, yet even for those three distinctions, it feels like those split damage types don't actually do anything of substance. This isn't strictly- I'm sorry, I phased out there. Can you still do with magic? Magic is separated into three different damage types. Fire solely does health damage, ice does health and stamina, lightning does health and magicka, yet even for those three distinctions, it feels like those split damage types don't actually do anything of substance. This isn't strictly true, though. Technically, they do actually affect Magicka and Stamina. But yeah, you they don't feel different. Yeah. It is just with level scaling, and depending on difficulty, it becomes impractical to actually utilize the differences in combat. For example, while Lightning is supposed to do Magicka damage, thus removing a combatant's ability to use spells, on Legendary difficulty, with the permanent debuff to player damage, it just doesn't feel like it works given it takes very few spells to kill the player, and you do very little magicka damage to enemies. For us magic do I would have to test that to know the veracity of this claim, because you might do less health damage, but you might still do the same amount of magicka damage. Does seem to work, but are they actually removing stamina? Well, listen, sometimes your brain just turns into chicken breasts. And you gotta ask the question, are they raw or cooked? As far as it appears, it just gives a slow debuff and isn't draining to their stamina at all, as they could still attack and do power swings. Yeah, but on Legendary, <clears throat> ice is useful because uh, it's not, like, the slow effect isn't scaled, right? So it's not like a 600% weaker slow effect. Yeah. So it gives you some measure of crowd control, even if it's really lame. We have tried testing this on several magic enemies, including some dragon priests, and it does not seem to affect their ability to cast spells, or even the number of spells they can cast. So, I guess- I think we proposed before a spell idea which was like a stream effect silence. I think that's in my script, actually. I don't know if I did it on stream or in the script. Silence. A stream effect so like flames but yeah, silence yeah so you, it would be constant and you'd have to hold it on them but they couldn't oh cast spells yeah i have well, it I, mean, in my, I have it in my script you could just hold up a ward and achieve something kind of similar yeah the problem with ward spells there's there, there's issues with ward spells well you can get knocked out of them yeah it is funny that like I don't know why dragon shouts are based on mana. I assume that's because they can't do the shout. Like, the shout cooldown timer would mean that dragons wouldn't breathe fire often enough. Or, like, they would have to have, like, different shouts. So I think it was just easier to use magicka. But the end result is that you can drain the magic of dragons. But, yeah, like, silence slash counterspell is, like... I consider to be a a essential spell to have in a game. Just to let us know if we're missing something here. In contrast to what we were told about dragon. Because here's the thing, okay. In World of War, in World of Warcraft, counter spell exists, right? But it doesn't have the the Elder Scrolls problem of why would you ever bother when you could just do damage? Because counter spell is an instant effect that always hits, and um. Like, because it's just the way that Warcraft's combat work actually incentivizes you to use that kind of utility spell compared to Elder Scrolls. Dragon shouts. Electrical spells will actually stop dragons from being able to use their breath attacks. 
and draw her from being able to use any shouts at all. Given shouts are supposed to be Thum, which is ancient and far more potent magic than your standard magic in lore. Um... Not necessarily true. Magic is a consequence of, um... The, like, flow of Aetherius into Mundus that Magnus created when he left the plane. So, magic is, like, as old as, like, other lore stuff like the Thum or, like, um... Uh, architectural tones or anything like that. It's just that, like, the Thum is it is very powerful compared to, like, just common spells. It feels odd you could so easily stop Thum and not Magicka. And but that's a difficulty issue. Does that apply at, like, moderate difficulties as well? Like, this is coming back to that... No. Why are, why are you playing on legendary difficulty kind of question? On Adept, I've totally zapped mages enough that they had to switch to using daggers. Yeah, like... Like, you use run into a room with chain lightning, zap them three times, and they all switch to their daggers. It's actually kind of interesting. It's pretty... Because I've... In Oblivion, I had that problem and where I rarely... So, rarely depleted enemy magicka so people don't talk about magic here's one thing about magic um you're actually supposed to use i think you're supposed to use cloak spells in addition to your normal spells yeah so like once you reach a certain point you should be having a cloak spell on at all time because i think cloak spell i think this is a thing they increase the damage of the effect i could oh, be really i could be wrong there hang on I don't want to be wrong, so. See, my main problem with cloak spells is that. But they still increase your DPS. First, so. If you're playing in first person, it's really obnoxious. Yes. And they last so long, too. So, like, I'll put it up, the encounter lasts 15 seconds, and it's up for like a minute and a half. Yeah. They last longer. If only we had a way to just spell them. I've played with mods that added to spell effects exactly for that reason. <laughs> oh no, dual casting increases range, not damage. No, I okay, I think I'm wrong there. Instead, the primary way to look at these three damage types is a slow fiery projectile, a slow icy projectile, and a hit scan electrical projectile. This can make lightning damage useful for range. Again, I feel like the extent of his, like, he seems to think magic is just the bolt spells. Like, I mean, we're talking about magic, but he's showing us, like, a conjured bow. Yeah. As stealth archer. And fire useful for up close fighting. Like, <laughs> As it gets I'm sorry, this is kind of a meme of like, we're in a magic section of a Skyrim video and we're seeing Stealth Archer gameplay. <laughs> and the only magical part of it is that there's a conjured bow. I never noticed stopping enemies from casting save Draugr and Dragons and only Draugr that use shouts and not standard magics. Um, I'm going to say I didn't really notice it on this most recent playthrough, but I also primarily just used fire damage. Gets bonuses to damage once the target is set on fire. You could even argue that you should switch to ice- Like, casters are danger- well, okay. I think a big part of nullifying casters as a caster is the- it is the Atronach sign. Because that means you absorb 50% of their damage. Yeah. That and wards. Ward, ward spells. Yeah. yeah. And there's perks for increasing spell absorption. Ice spells to slow targets when they get close. Yet, this just means juggling with the awful UI to switch between spells. Yeah, it's true. Yep. <laughs> to use the favorite menu, which showcases all items and favorites, so it needs the player to continually prune it. Okay, so I explain it as a concept called the apathy threshold, where my decision on what spell to use on an occasion has to pass basically a check of the apathy threshold so it's like 
if it's in my favorites, it has to pass like a low apathy threshold check. And then if it's like in the spell menu, it has to pass a high apathy threshold check. So it's like, oh, there's a piece of oh, situational yeah. magic I could use here, but I have to open the interface. Uh, roll a d20 to determine if you're going to pass this apathy threshold. <laughs> Also, also, um, if it's hot keyed, that's another threshold. <laughs> oh yeah, like so. Yeah, I have three tiers. There's the low threshold option of hot keys, the medium threshold option of the favorites menu, and then the high threshold option of the, like the actual magic menu. I would even argue that there's two thresholds for my hot keys. So one through oh, five. Yeah. I said then... that. I, yeah, I said that too. It's one through five, and then six through zero, and so. <laughs> Like, 6 through 0 is still better than the favorites menu, but it's worse than 1 through 5. <laughs> yeah, I actually said, I, like, legit said all of that. <laughs> or to make different spells in different hands, which actually removes the ability to stagger enemies, assuming you've sacrificed a level up point in the destruction tree to allow dual casting to stagger enemies. If, okay, listen, if you're a magic character, there is <clears throat> one perk... You need technically two because you need to unlock the first perk to get it but there is one perk that is, is worth spending your perk point on and it's called impact it will literally change your life <laughs> like i i don't understand this like penny pinching uh well you can't really justify like i wonder if he's gonna penny pinch later about like the stealth perks that you need to do extra damage I think, was it like Indigo that was like, I have to spend for four perk points to uh, oh, yeah, yeah. to to do this extra damage. And it's like, wow, welcome to magic where you got like 40 <laughs> fucking perks that you need to get before you have the option to start choosing like perks for fun. Yeah, but you got to grab that impact. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's players who will not pick impact out of principle I've seen because like, well, it just breaks the game. Yeah, that's yeah. sort of that. That's like um, when you play Middle Earth, intentionally <clears throat> like not using the uh, the dominate ability to control orcs. Oh yeah, yeah. Because it ruins, um, like, but it ruins like the assassination side of that game. In my opinion, impact brings it levels the playing field because before impact, yeah, mages are at such a disadvantage. You're gonna get destroyed by a dragon if you don't have impact. Oh yeah. It's like, it, it is legitimately like the best and worst perk in the game. It's the best <laughs> perk because it makes, it's a it's the equalizer. It doesn't matter if they're like a shit eating beggar it, or a dragon. It, it it will stagger them. It staggers it them more than anything else. It probably should have, it's it the should worst. probably have like a percentage to proc. It is the worst perk in the game, however, because of the fact that it makes the gameplay highly repetitive. <laughs> dragon shouts and just like, become all right use dragon rend and then just spam firebolt yeah it forces it, it forces you to dual cast as well like there's like yeah it, trust me i'm aware impact is a very terrible perk for the way that the game flows but if there's any perk that you can justify buying and trust me you've got perk points in skyrim that's the one enemies at all a common issue in magic usage is that it takes far more levels to make it work, and even then, only certain destruction spells can even benefit from said perks, those with projectiles. This leads you into running up against the game's level scaling. You could get around this by summoning creatures in to take the hits for you, while you try and pep- Not you can, you will. Again, like... I don't think he really gets, like... Or they, in this case. I don't think they really get that, like... The higher difficulties demand certain things of certain playstyles. It's like saying that like shield builds have to have to actually use their shield bash, or like archery builds are encouraged to use stealth at high difficulties. It's like yeah, I think that's intentional. It's like conjuration is a skill that you have. You either have to conjure enemies or you have <clears throat> to crowd control them with illusion magic. You yeah. have to do one of those or the enemy from afar. Though this has its own problems, as many of the summons aren't affected by the skill- Is he using the arg- He's using, uh, Dekiath. Dekiathus. 
or Dirk the Dirk the See, like, yeah. how stereotypical can you guys get? You're literally using the scaly companion. Skills you actually put into the tree, like familiars and Dremoral. Here's the thing, um, if it comes off as negative, like, they're taking it in in uh, with with good faith, uh, but if it comes off as negative to anybody else, that's just because they have things to say. This is a really good Skyrim video. Like, it is legitimately good. Especially compared to the shit that I've been subjected to. And I, I use the word subjected very intentionally. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do? Not stream Skyrim videos? Am I just supposed to die? Lords, and you have to rely on AI fighting AI, which is, well, let's put it watching the AI fight each other in this game isn't exactly inspiring confidence and relying on said AI. I think this is something I was wrong about in the Morrowind video, but also it is kind of necessary. Like, they added the hireling system, and I think that they were built the game around it. Like, yeah, it looks like shit, but, um... Like, the enemies aren't punching you. Yeah, that just the utility of that alone, especially as a mage character, justifies having your followers. Yeah, even if they're doing dick, dick all damage. And the Atronex are kind of, kind of cool, right? Because you got the flame Atronex, and it's like a ranged, and then you got the frost Atronex, yeah. and it's like a big melee guy. I always liked using the flame Atronex. Um, in the beginning when I have to fight dragons, but I run out of mana immediately. So I would mm -hmm. immediately spawn one of those dual cast if possible mm -hmm. and then just hide because there's a good chance it's a fire a dragon. So, yeah, so just can't kill damage thing. it. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's also the cool thing about Atronex is that they're immune to like, if you summon a flame Atronex, it's not going to get damaged by a fireball. Yeah. Mention the fact your own summits could spawn randomly around you you could always go back to strategy. Strategy was not the worst. It could oftentimes actually- There's different worsts. I would say Acer Thorn was the worst in terms of like crazy ass takes. I would say that Salt Factory was the worst in terms of entertaining content. Actually block your escape route from an enemy, almost holding you in place to get pummeled. Maybe you want to use the bound weapon spells, but then come to find out it scales based off your skill in said tree. Unlike- What? Bound equipment raises the relevant skills temper. Why wouldn't it? Maybe you want to use the bound weapon spells, but then come to find out it scales based off your skill in said tree. Unlike in Morrowind, where bound equipment raises the relevant skills temporarily. So I hope you've been leveling your one-handed, two-handed, and archery trees. I mean, maybe it's for a specific playstyle, like the Binding Swordsman. This is where I wanted to see Ether Dynamics content, but it's now entirely considered a mod, so it's not well, no longer relevant for the video since it talks about unmodded. You can still talk about it. Why is it okay to talk about um, other games entirely, but actual like mods that work inside the engine and have been proven to be possible within the constraints of the game aren't valid? I thought Stag was the furry council. I thought there was uh, representatives from each faction there. Turning your follower into a big health sponge with enchants is the best you can do on high difficulties. Arguably, I would say that that's like an intentional part of legendary is like you're not just fitting yourself with gear. You have to fit your own character or you have to fit your companion as well. Yeah. You have to actually, like, give them stuff that they're skilled at, which is kind of an issue because the game doesn't tell you what people and it's are also, good at. And um, it's counterintuitive if you're using an unpatched version. This is why I one of the only things I like about the official patch is that it fixes, like, you'll get a two-handed warrior and he's actually skilled in two-handed, unlike in Vanilla Skyrim where he would actually okay. be... But I want to clarify because you guys don't seem to understand something about um, Aether Dynamics, which is that 
it's a mod but it's <clears> not <throat> like it's not an ai mod that you can just turn on and then it changes the way that the ai works in skyrim it's a very specific technical demonstration Like, it's not, it doesn't overhaul the AI, because that's outside the scope of what it can accomplish. It's just a demonstration of, if you are very deliberate, like, it's basically um, the fear AI design philosophy of using, incorporating level design into your AI. On top of that, make sure you're leveling up and putting your points into your Magicka. But don't forget stamina to carry more of the random loot you find. Yeah, this is true. And I think it was White Light who was like uh, the like mages have it the easiest in terms of what attributes they pick. But it's like, no, mages need every attribute. And oh, you need to bump up health so you can take a few hits from enemies just in case. If you aren't seeing the problem with Magicka, let's put it this way. To get the same thing done as either a melee or stealth character, you'll need to branch out into multiple different trees requiring far more levels, thus making enemies level up with you and dragging out fights longer and longer until you eventually hit a broken combination. Yet, the fighting just keeps this pace and never feels epic or interesting to be a mage and to survive, you'll often have to take a back seat to your companions and summons for the majority of Exactly, you gotta live the heel slut lifestyle. <laughs> ...fights while you backpedal away from enemies. So become more self-sufficient- Oh god, I am not making a Flesh Atronach V2 model. I will not be responsible for the first Rule 34 drawn of a Flesh Atronach. ...you have to do far more work <laughs> than either a melee character or a stealth character, leveling in multiple different trees, likely dipping into melee and ranged weapons on the side, leveling armors to keep you alive, and enchanting so you can make that armor give you Magicka back, and best level- This is true, but it's- Okay, here's why, like, I do a lot of, like, oh, you're nitpicking corrections on things you agree with. Yeah, I agree with it, but it's, like, it's frustrating to me because this is exactly something that I want to spend considerable time ranting about, and it's just slightly wrong. Alchemy for some backup potions and smithing so you can make the armor to keep you alive out there. As such would put it... Because it is absolutely true that, like, um, there are, like, way too many skills that you have to invest in, including, like, you are incentivized on Legendary Difficulty to invest in smithing and then refund those perk points as soon as you have the gear that you want. And there's no other build in Skyrim that encourages that other than pure magic. Having played the game on Legendary Difficulty with the restriction of only using map- How do you know it would be the first drawing? Because I know the general state of Rule 34 for Elder Scrolls, and I'm going to assume that, like, there isn't any for the Flesh Atronach yet. Magic and fights, this includes bound weaponry, the game is a complete fucking chore. Why play on Legendary, you ask? What? Alright, we're getting- I'm wondering that. Yeah, we've, we've been asking for a while. It's good that we're... Why play on Legendary? It's good that an hour in, we're finally getting to the answer. Probably should have <laughs> probably should have opened with this. Because it's a big, like, big assumption, like... To say that the game was developed around Legendary, when Legendary difficulty didn't ship with the game. Yeah. It would be one thing to say Master difficulty, but to say Legendary... Well, okay, here's the thing. This is pretty much the rigor that I have applied to every single Skyrim video. It's not my fault that most of them are fucking garbage, have nothing to say, or have the things that they do say are unbearably fucking stupid. Right? Right? Am I am I wrong here? It like literally the rigor is the same. It's just that this video isn't dog shit. So it it, it just comes off as being nicer. Well, to make sure even the smallest issues would easily be highlighted, and so we can safely okay, plea- As such we chore. Why play on Legendary, you ask? <clears throat> well, to make sure even the smallest issues would easily be highlighted, and so we can safely make the claim, the game is never difficult. 
just tedious and frustrating. Didn't you, like... Interesting. That's an interesting perspective. So Dark Souls is considered difficult because it causes you to die a lot, but it's not considered tedious. Now, I don't know. It's... That is a really interesting reason to justify playing the game on Legendary. It's like saying... Why are we? Re why is our review of Doom playing the game on? Um, is it Nightmare or Ultra Violence? Uh, like the the top the f highest difficulty level in Doom is not meant to be played single player. That's literally been stated. It's meant for cooperative play. Um, and then like it's the same thing with Skyrim, although obviously not for cooperative play. But yeah, it's like. Even then, as to why you're justifying, like, you're saying that only you played on Legendary, I still think that, like, I still think that there's, like, a core problem here. I think it's unfair to criticize Fallout 4 for being poorly designed because you played on survival mode. You can explain why, like, like you can absolutely spend the time to explain why, like fallout 4 and survival mode are not very compatible but to say that like bethesda's at fault for poorly designing the game when they clearly did not intend for survival mode to be the way that it was meant to be played legendary is much the same way it was post-launch content that was added because there were some people who thought that master difficulty was too easy and that's true master difficulty can be too easy if you're playing the game well and that's not to say that it's the, playing the game well in Skyrim is not an issue of like player skill, it's not an issue about like knowing how to like fight enemies in a way that no, it's it, it's completely about like figuring out how to game the system. But there yeah, is there is of... there is absolutely a point where master difficulty I would start one shotting things. So the question is, what differentiates a game that gets more challenging as it gets more like a, as a difficulty increases and when it just gets more tedious right um because a lot of people like to throw tedium around yeah tedium is definitely a hard thing because it's a it's a subjective phrase right yeah it's hard to it's, it's hard to objectively it, quantify tedium um is it like my death was caused by my mistakes so that makes it fair challenge right. as opposed to what my death was just because the game did something cheap or what is it uh, that like, makes dying over and over valid yeah like in dark souls it's valid to die over and over that doesn't necessarily make it tedious um i'm trying to think because the thing is i do agree that skyrim's combat is tedious but I yeah. think the tedium comes from it being highly repetitive. Yeah, it it comes from the fact that the game does not actively encourage. If anything, it discourages you from experimenting and going outside the bounds mm -hmm. of what yeah. you found to be the most efficient way of dealing with every encounter. Right. It's like I'm, every, I'm gonna drag once it, we find the solution, it's applicable to almost every single encounter. I'm gonna drag an enemy into this rune. Oh wait, runes are extremely punishing to use unless it's the paralysis room. <laughs> and then it's extremely overpowered because it's creation club content. Yep. Joseph Anderson <laughs> explained playing on the highest difficulty in his God of War video and he was just like Private said it's to identify issues with the combat that aren't noticeable on the lower ones. I don't necessarily agree that that's valid, though. That's like saying you're trying to find the issues with Doom by playing on the highest difficulty. That wasn't made for... You know, that it wasn't it's, built around. Like, Halo was built around like, your heroic difficulty. It's like if I get into a four-cylinder car and take it onto the highway and just keep doing, like, 100, 110 miles an hour, and then yeah. eventually the engine blows up and then blaming the engineers for it. Mm -hmm. when it's like there was a specific way that this was supposed to be used it was not yeah, it meant was... to be maxed out yeah but yeah i would say difficulty is always a hard question i think civi 11's rule is almost always to play like a medium difficulty in his videos 
I don't That's... like I don't know. It's like I'm pushing I'm pushing it to the limits to understand it. That's like saying I only watch movies in the new in the nosebleed row. Or I only eat food through a funnel. But yeah, it's like, Jackal Snipers in Halo are a problem on Legendary difficulty, but I think that's because, again, Legendary was made for co-op, and in co-op, Jackal Snipers aren't actually a problem. To be fair, or they're a problem. Much, they're a problem. a problem. They can one-shot you very easily in Heroic as well, and Heroic is the intended single-player experience. I, still, I, th I do think it is still less of a problem, though. It's less of a problem, but it can still be a problem. But, I mean, like, what else can you do? Like, the the issue with Jackal Snipers is that they don't have shields, right? So you can headshot them. Yeah. But, like, okay, so let's say a Jackal Sniper on Heroic just drops your shields. It's That's a very easy problem to respond to. And we're talking about Halo 2, which has no health. Right? So... It's like, there's no way to kind of punish you for stepping into a Sniper's sights in Halo 2. I think that's... It doesn't... It The problem, too, then, is that, like, the, the the obvious problem is if you're in that scenario and you don't have a long-distance weapon, or even a medium-distance weapon. That's a level design Just, issue, and I think almost always, to my memory, in Halo 2, you had access to, like, if not earlier in the level, AI companions who have headshot weapons. They usually, when you run into a jackal area, there will be medium and long range weapons somewhere around. Yeah, like a battle rifle or the pistol. Yeah. Well, actually, no. That's I don't think that is true. But okay, so ODST ODST section. has the, the exact same jackal sniper enemy, um, but it does not have the exact same problem, and that's because the pistol is a long range weapon in ODST, and there's yeah. health. But yeah, it's like either jackal snipers are overpowered and instant kill you, or they're underpowered and are easy to kill. Yeah. I think Halo 3 is a good example, because in Legendary, they are... They're pretty fucking obnoxious, but... Once again, Legendary is meant for co-op in Halo 3. Mm hmm But then in Heroic, they're... Yeah, I guess in Heroic, then they're almost... They're a little bit of a joke. Well, yeah, like I said, they're binary enemies. They're either deadly yeah. or not a threat. Well, and Halo's the Jackal Snipers are infamous for Halo 2 because of the Mombasa Streets level and the way that yeah. it used them. <laughs> like, you have removed that from the equation, and I doubt very many people would complain about it based on, like, the rest of the game. Uh, that's a part in regret. Where you go underwater and you're in this t in this right yeah. giant corridor with hunters and stuff, and then they're on the sides. That part sucked too. But a key example is because you'll need so many more levels to be viable compared to the other two types. You'll end up power leveling the game's enemies along with you, and wind up in a situation where you are always weaker, always having to hide behind summons. I also think that like, um. Legendary difficulty is not meant for first-time players. So it's like, if you don't understand how the systems work, then you probably shouldn't, like, play it. I don't mean that as an insult, I mean that as, like, a first-time players are, aren't gonna know this kind of stuff. I, so I'd like to say here, because the difficulty is just a damage health modifier and nothing more, while in Dark Souls it is a set difficulty for a tailored challenge with a steady increase in challenge. That is why Skyrim's more tedious, but Dark Souls isn't. So basically you're saying that Dark Souls is already is preset at the intended difficulty, but Skyrim... Well, at that point, then, you should just guess what the intended difficulty of Skyrim is. I've heard... Probably in equal numbers that the intended difficulty of Skyrim is adept and expert. So really, if you're playing above that, you're just it's because you're subjecting yourself to that. 
always in fear that a stray arrow- Which, I mean, that's what you admitted, but I don't necessarily agree with the premise. Like, I don't think that it's valid to claim that, like, oh, well, the issues with the combat system are going to become more prevalent on higher difficulties. That's like saying the issues with Ornstein and Smog become more present if you set their health to, like, a million. No, you're right. First-time players shouldn't even look at Legendary or Lasso. Lasso is kind of a joke. La okay, listen. There's a difference between Lasso and Slasso. Uh, Slasso oh. is single-player Lasso, and then Lasso is cooperative Legendary All Schools On. And I, I le All Schools On on Legendary is a cooperative thing. Or you're you're like really good at the game. And you understand, like, exactly... What, like, you're a speedrunner, and you know exactly what's going to happen. ...will hit you and take you from max health to dead in a single love tap, always on the back foot, and it makes every encounter exhausting. This trend continues until you finally hit enough levels that enemies suddenly stop scaling at all, and the balance completely 180s into being a cakewalk with nothing challenging you at all, as you become the harbinger of death. I mean, that's true, but that's your reward for sticking through it to level 50. Because, like, the leveling slows way down at, like, level 25. And just, like, it increasingly slows down. That is fair. Like I like I said, it is interesting to hear someone with a different take, especially on something like different difficulty selections. Yeah, it's not something you hear a lot of people talk about in terms of like what they think is a good difficulty to play games at. That's like playing Morrowind on the 360 in order to push the game to its limit. Yes and no. The point of that bit was to demonstrate that if I can stand playing the game at its worst, then other people can stand playing the game normally. So that is slightly different. I didn't do that for the sake of, here's why Morrowind... Here's here's a test of uh, why Morrowind is like... Uh, of Morrowind systems. Because I don't think that that's an accurate way to figure that stuff out. Now just to make it clear, there are things that Skyrim added to magic that are interesting or a good idea. Stuff like being able to cast in either hand could have had interesting effects in spell mixing, and necromancy actually exists now by raising the dead, and not just conjuring skeletons, though this is broken because of level scaling, since the level of the dead enemy actually affects the spell. Yet, we lost so much yeah. of what made magic interesting. Yeah, the issue with it is that the game doesn't communicate what the level of stuff is. Y yeah. Remind me, you played with a mod that told you, told you what level enemies were, right? Yes, and it made a world of a difference. Yeah, I would say that's just a lack of uh, information. Just feedback. Yeah, because Maybe, once again... Alright, here's something they could do. And it actually do pretty easily. When you have a reanimation spell effect activated, the bodies that you can reanimate either glow like red or green based on whether or not that spell can do it. Yeah. Thing. And that was oh yeah, I'm sure like we were looking at the Acer Thorn response crowd. Um and to be honest, there seems to be like a lot of insane people that you guys deal with. So I wouldn't be surprised if, like, it was refreshing that, like, somebody's talking about your takes without, like, insulting you or call calling you, like, a, uh, a Bethesda hater or what have you. Well, you're just a 4 chaner. I was I just talking oblivion. Opinion. I see a based opinion in chat. Gravemind is the best level in all of Halo. I agree. Which one's Gravemind? Um, that's the one where... You get teleported as Master Chief and uh, to the, in Halo 2. To the, the Covenant, you know, Big Covenant City? Yeah, yeah, it's the first level there. Yes. And then the second agree. level is high charity. Yeah. That, I feel like, 
demonstrates Death Halo at its like peak. Yeah, that part of the game is like actually where it really starts to get good. Yeah. Actually, it's it's funny because it's like a, it's a horrible first encounter that first room, but then mm -hmm. once that once you get out of that, it really opens up. Yeah. Yeah, I have nothing but like positive thoughts for that part of the game. There's a lot of Halo 2 that I kind of like. Like I have positive memories of the Arbiter levels, um, where like Arbiter's equivalent of the library. Uh, I think Arbiter's like final level though isn't very good. The Sacred Icon and his his first two levels were pretty good. Oracle and mm -hmm. uh... yeah, his first two levels were a lot better than Master Chief's first levels. Yeah, I could agree with that. Like, the first level of Halo 2 is fucking awful. <laughs> like, I think it's going for, like, a Pillar of Autumn thing. Yeah. But the changes in its mechanics really bring it down. Which itself is a massive downgrade from Morrowind. This doesn't even begin to get into the over... What was a massive downgrade from Morrowind? We lost so much of what made magic interesting, and that was just talking Oblivion. Which itself is a. I think this is Warcraft 3 music. Massive downgrade from Morrowind. Okay, so Oblivion was a downgrade from Morrowind. I should have assumed. This doesn't even begin to get into the overwhelming problems with the associated faction that mages would join. Trust me, when we get to talking about the world and story, we are going to cover the College of Winterhold and how much of a disaster it truly is. I almost feel like. The College of Winterhold is completely secondary to the issue of, like, magic mechanics in Skyrim. Yeah. Like, it's like the cherry on the cake. There, <laughs> there is some, but there is absolutely some, like, fucking stupid shit in that, in that faction quest line. Like, I that's still, gonna be the girthiest part of the video, is... I still would take Skyrim's magic, uh, college over the Oblivion's Mage's Guild. Just because the utility that the college actually provides. Uh, yeah, I guess the college is much more useful than the Arcane University. They did nail that aspect of it. And uh, the, another thing the college has is that it is, it's exactly the same formula of just quest after quest of dungeons, but it, it is mercifully much shorter. <laughs> like, so literally the only benefit is that like it's shorter. Yeah. It's I don't think it's better. I think that the the lore stuff that's going on with the Oblivion Mages Guild is a lot better than what's going on with the College of Winterhold. And I, and I think even even Moronic Mana Marco is still better than like Ancano and like just oh. blame the Thalmor. <laughs> I wouldn't say Medicur shouted me out. The The clip is just he says that like he's willing to listen to an 8-hour Morrowind video. It's all recognition. No, no, I appreciate it. I actually, I would rather him have said that than him have named me in an internet blood sports stream. Yeah. So. Finally, we've got stealth, which is broken in more ways than... He specifies mm. gameplay not on legendary. Legendary, yeah. I'm going to assume that whoever, like, this is now a different person writing this section, since it's about a different style of gameplay, and the the uh, person who wrote the magic part was playing on legendary was the only one doing that. One, stealth has never been a particularly strong aspect of Elder Scrolls games. Is he in and this stealth? This is especially true for Skyrim. As far back as no, he's just standing. That's a good start. Morrowind, at least, stealth has generally felt like it was slapped into an otherwise complete game for the sake of the third specialization. Oh, but I have it on good authority from Acer Thorin that the stealth in Oblivion is some of the best stealth gameplay ever made. Acer is that Thor the one where he said yeah, he, he did it like a dozen times? He did a dozen stealth playthroughs. <laughs> and like, not like over the course of like 15 years. What I mean by that is because the game isn't specifically designed around stealth, it feels very minimalist and, well, silly and sometimes non-functional. 
Nearly everyone knows of the exploit. I dislike blood sports, but I could find myself fitting in with the commentary community. I think blood sports is basically an embarrassment to m pretty much everybody who ever was involved with it. Like, literally the only reason that genre ever existed was because streaming was new and the algorithm didn't know how to recommend those streams yet. Of placing a bucket on an NPC's head to blind them so you can rob them worry free, and it only works because the AI has it set that any surface blocks the line of sight. Yeah, and the funny thing is they could literally fix that by just adding an invisible polygon on top of the bucket so that things can't go inside of it. I guess that would break like baskets of fruit. But it also wasn't really a problem in Oblivion, because I don't think it was like really hard to get it to work. I think it's just the shape of the buckets. If the games were designed with a heavier stealth focus, that might unintentionally alienate players who prefer the other two playstyles more, simply due to the heavy emphasis on stealth. You have to balance the game. You have to balance the playstyles. Do you think that's true? If if one specialization was more powerful than the others, then it would alienate players? Uh, no. See, I think it is true because there is the odd person who complains that, like, if magic was more powerful, they'd like the games less. Because they don't play magic. Like, yeah, I could see somebody making that claim, but that doesn't really mean I recognize it as valid if that's, yeah, I was like, gonna, the odd I was gonna person. Say, it really doesn't it doesn't seem like a valid opinion either because it, i i don't know it's like i don't see a downside to like magic being extremely powerful or even stealth being extremely powerful like as somebody who hates the stealth playthrough if it was extremely powerful you know it wouldn't be any uh it wouldn't bother me as much as like the fact that my own specialization is fucking boring it's yeah <laughs> that's the word that's the worst part Problem is, stealth becomes incredibly inconsistent and annoying to engage with as a result. After putting in yes. many, many, many hours into this game, I still don't know how to engage in the system effectively. Well, you need to start with crouching down. Like, am I, am I missing something here? He's not in I, stealth. Yeah, I think what he's trying to demonstrate is the fact that arrows, like the trajectory oh, okay. of arrows isn't yeah and that probably gets or, thrown out of whack if you're stealthed i, I think know. maybe that like he's trying to demonstrate that like if you get hit from an arrow from nowhere why would it do more damage just because you were in a crouched mm. position yeah that too but i don't know it's like that's not really a thing i have an issue with that like yeah, because crouching is but like if crouching if is if just wanna, the way that you, you have like, the you, that's the way you ask for initiation <laughs> on the fight, like, or initiative. And it also, you know, gives you the omnipotent eye so you can see if you're actually being detected or not, if your stealth attack's going to work. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why would I not be stealthed if I'm trying to do stealth attacks? I don't it's know if that's what they're going for, but, like, it is really weird that, like, he's talking about stealth and he, we're watching, like, just archery. I, th my read is that he's just trying to demonstrate how the arrows don't hit true to their, to the crosshair, which is a very frustrating thing to get used to. Yeah, I think that I always look at the crosshair as like a guide. Like part of the skill of the game is like figuring out how projectiles actually like go. Yeah, which can be annoying in a short-term game, but like for something like Skyrim where. It's so monotonous because a bow works exactly the same way the entire game. See, that's the thing. It's like if it's not going to aim true, then there should be other factors that play into there should be like, you know, significant drop off. There should probably be like some sort of wind system. Right. Otherwise, it's just like, oh, you fooled me but I figured it out now. After two hours, I managed to figure it out. To give an example. I did a few dungeons for quests, particularly. I had a uh, I had a write up on um, 
on V about like why Fallout 76 player versus player doesn't work. And it's because um, bandits are an essential part of Fallout. And if you can't roleplay as a bandit in Fallout 76, then it's just not going to work. So like mutually, consen mutually consensual pers player versus player is just stupid because like, like who is going to consent to being robbed? You know what I mean? Like this isn't yeah. This isn't a role play server. Well, that's that's one of the things is F uh, Fallout seventy six definitely needed server like uh, server specifications and stuff. Like if I'm opting into combat, everybody I should be getting put into servers where everybody's opting in. Right. I think they were worried about splitting the player base with that. Probably missing in action in Break of Dawn. A quest to rescue a Grey Mane from a Thalmor prison and Meridia's Daedric quest, respectively, and trying to go through each location purely through stealth was annoying. Yeah. Each dungeon is. There's very few instances of areas that felt designed around stealth, and even like the Somerset Shadows quest was really annoying to try and do it in stealth. Lit up well enough that enemies should have no trouble spotting you unless they genuinely have poor sight. However, I could be standing in front of them in stealth mode, and they would not see me. If they had gone into active mode for any reason, they would almost certainly detect me regardless of how well I was hidden, unless I backtracked far enough that they would not get close to me at all. Because the system is so inconsistent, it's impossible for me to tell what is and isn't the best way to hide, and what is the best- Why did you fucking power bash the AI? that many times or not power but like archer bash best way to proceed it seems as though enemies would just randomly detect me when i thought i was hidden this gets to the point where enemies almost seem omniscient as a result to give another example what are you doing archer chan example while attacking that thalmor fort i tried taking out the outside guards using stealth at night no you didn't if this is the footage of that, no you didn't. <laughs> because I landed a shot on one of them, the other guards went into alert mode. But they didn't search the area, they beelined for my exact location, despite not having fully detected me yet, even though they should be totally unaware of where I am. So in terms of the why of, the, of why this is, I've always looked at it like, because Elder Scrolls is trying to do like a generalist thing, it can't be like particularly good at things like it would be nice if it was like metal gear solid 5 where it's like there was a sniper like how much metal gear solid 5 have you played uh almost none okay so in that game enemies won't know where a shot comes from if it's the first shot but they will start to like figure out what direction the shots are coming from on subsequent shots okay it's actually like a really realistic kind of feature and then like enemies will canvas the area where the shots came from so you can do actual sniper tactics of like shoot move and then shoot again and it actually works because of the way that the uh the way that the ai is made that said however metal gear solid 5 does not have a magic system <laughs> or a melee system. you know what i mean like yeah it's good at a very specific thing but when you try to be good at a lot of different things, it's it's difficult. And this is something that, like, I think I realized partway through the Oblivion script. Requires a lot of uh, QA testing, too, and, well, we already know how... Yeah, how much of that gets done. Yeah. <laughs> this also brings up another issue with combat. If you're using... Okay, in fairness, Gaiden, I'm gonna say, um, that we're gonna work off the assumption that, like, he had moved, but the AI had still, like, gone straight to him. Because that is what happens in... That is what happens in Skyrim. Well, I was just making the point that, like, Metal Gear Solid V has, like, really cool kind of mechanics around uh, attacking enemies from range out of stealth. Ranged weapons? Enemies will never take cover nor will they attempt to close the distance between your shots. They just run straight at you, completely disregarding the danger they'd be in. On the flip side... I mean, in fairness, 
the best thing to do Mordhau has taught me that the best thing to do when confronting an archer is run straight at them at full speed <laughs> like if you try to take cover from an archer and Mordhau, they are eventually going to kill you unless you're extremely confident in your own side's archers it's a lot safer like you will survive more often if you charge archers They can randomly choose to instantly dodge to the left or right by several feet. Which is definitely like a weird thing. Like, I think it, it's almost, it reminds me of the AI packages from the arena. The, oh yeah, the AI can just like randomly dodge the attack. Like it looks, it looks goofy. I think they, they move too much is the deal. Yeah. Like if it was just a foot, it wouldn't be as big an issue. Not even bothering to move their legs as they slide over the way, like some sort of anime superpower, regardless of you being detected or not. Even with all that said, stealth that's, is objective- That's where I would have really appreciated a, a demonstration on screen. Yeah, that's kind of an issue that I'm having with this video, is that there's a lot of, like, specific demo- specific examples given that aren't don't necessarily have visual representations which and, i get when yeah i'm I editing a video it like it's this a, it's a pain in the ass yeah to do shit but like that but it is worth there's it. yeah there's certain certain things that really would benefit from it this is one of them i sort of bring that up as a like if you want to if you want to go to the next tier like then you gotta, you gotta find the strength to, uh, by the way, bad feels, you guys got less views than the Acer Thorn video, but good feels, your video is much more recent. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, visual examples are the bane of editing. So I'm trying to use, um, what's it called? Shadow play, which has like an instant replay sort of feature. So yeah. If there's something that happens, I can just hit a like a button and it's just I have, like, all right, last five minutes saved. I have hours and, of Rainbow Six footage I want to use at some point to like talk about when the game was in its golden era. That is like shadow play footage. So it's just yeah. like clips of stuff that I wanted to save. And it also helps too when I'm finding because um, that's how I recorded Valheim. That's my test for this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'll go through and I'll look at the footage a month later. And I was like, oh, right. That's exactly, I wanted to talk about this, this point. Right. Where it kind of makes it so I don't even have to take notes anymore. Because it's just like, that's, oh, yeah, right. Okay, so um, that's Mandalore's approach is he, I think yeah. he uses almost entirely shadow play. And he has just named clips of like everything that he wants to talk about. That's something yeah, he which talks is... about in his advice. I think that's a valid way to go about things. But I still think that like... Especially for longer term stuff, notes is notes is what the way to go. Yeah. I agree. Like I said, Kretosis does best when he does response videos because he's guided directly to what he needs to find and use in editing. Well, just look at it like you're um, preemptively responding to stuff. Because, yeah, like, the thing about a video is if it's not a response, that means that it is a first, it's an initial argument. And so you need evidence in an, in an argument. What is Shadowplay exactly? So it's uh, NVIDIA software that works with the graphics card and it can be used to either record gameplay or you can turn on instant replay. Act OBS can do this too, but it's not as good. Yeah. Um, and so you just hit a hotkey and it, will save the last five minutes of footage. You can even, even you can if you specify weren't recording it, it too. Yeah, you can you can specify it too, like ten minutes, fifteen minutes, two right. minutes. I just use five. So yeah, like um There's probably an AMD equivalent. I just don't have an And AMD even card. if there isn't that you can use OBS, but Yeah. It's one way to do things. I don't necessarily think it's an effective way i also haven't really experimented with trying to do it i'm gonna try it so all my footage for my mage character is the conventional all right i'm starting the game open up obs and just hit record mm -hmm. i'm gonna try with my melee character 
just using all shadow play footage, and I'll report back. Definitely the best option out of the three, due to how overpowered it can be. The bonuses to sneak attacking are a bit insane, and can often lead to one- Yeah, those three times damage modifiers on- or six times, I guess. Is it three or six? Am I thinking of Oblivion or Skyrim? Shotting enemies fairly easily. There's a reason it's become a huge joke that everyone plays a stealth archer. I understand the idea behind it, that catching an enemy unaware could lead to an easy kill shot, or you might be able to pick- This is hard to look at. Pick ...enemies off from a distance with a bow. Also, what does this have to do with stealth archers? This is a meme about Altmer. So it ends up being a bit of a double-edged sword as a result. It makes sense that unaware enemies are easy to kill, but that becomes overpowered when not balanced somehow. I think part of the issue is that the other combat styles simply aren't interesting or engaging enough. As mentioned, melee is just a slug So, like, s stealth archer's worse because magic sucks? I mean, I guess that's true. Fest, magic seems expertly crafted to be as boring and tedious as possible. As a result, being a sneaky archer assassin is far more engaging as you're not only powerful, but it's possibly the most complex combat gets as you try to sneak around and take out enemies at opportune times. Hey, you guys agree with Acerthorn. I think that stealing people's armor is underrated as a stealth tactic. Like, it is actually really powerful to, like, preemptively steal people's armor, because it means they have no armor writing. Though it's more of a winner by default, because the other combat specializations are sitting in a corner and eating paste. But... I think we already said that. Unfortunately, even stealth isn't completely free from the paste eating. Being a stealth archer presents its own unique frustrations, one of the most annoying being crouching and standing while using bows. Of course, there's no good way to, uh... There's no good way to play Skyrim. It's a... What's a... What's a term for that? There's Pick like, your poison? Well, it's like, there's a torture device where it's like, um... Everything you do is, is awful, and you're like... What makes it horrifying is that, like, uh, you have to pick, you have to figure out what, like, the least awful part of it is. Which take a fair bit of time, will interrupt attacks, and cannot even be done until you fully draw or release an arrow. Fortunately, the game's AI is crippled enough that this only becomes an issue when the stealth system breaks apart and they suddenly make a mad dash straight at you. This is one of the reasons why um, there were a lot of people who were kind of looking forward to like, oh, is Bethesda, did did Bethesda, the publisher, pick up Arcane and have them make the, uh, the Void engine, I think it's called, because like they wanted to use it as a new engine for uh, Elder Scrolls 6. Because I don't think, Vo I think Void engine would have been a better, a, a good foundation, maybe even better than Unreal. But um, that doesn't seem to be the way it's going. Who's who's the Void engine? Arcane. Oh, okay. So that's what that's the engine Dishonored Two and Prey use. I no, not Prey. Sorry. But it is actually like a pretty impressive engine. The lack of awareness from enemies is fucking absurd. This is main- The keyframing on that was not very good. Only due to their alert status going away so easily. If you alert enemies, they'll go into a bit of a searching mode, though it's naturally handled as lazily as possible, as the NPCs will either just run around the area hoping to run into you at complete random, if you are in an area they can't path too easily, or will run directly to you, because they know you are there, but haven't seen you yet. If you manage to stay hidden from them, they'll be thrown out of alert mode after a minute or two, 
and they'll have a line in which they say, It must have just been my imagination, or it must have been the wind. Damn, I need to double my dosage of schizo medicine. Yeah, um, I don't know. The thing is, how do you, how do you resolve that problem? This has been like one of the oldest problems that stealth games have had to deal with. And I, having an open world component to the stealth game only makes it more uh, complicated. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like, what's the alternative? They just remain on alert for the entire time. Yeah, you're just fucked now. Yeah, because you dropped one dude. I don't know. See, I'm not I'm not a stealth player either, so it makes it makes it more difficult for me to come up with like good solutions for how to fix thing fix right. it. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the thing is like there's entire studios that like tr have, have like spent their entire development process trying to answer these questions. And in my honest opinion, I just I don't think anybody's really figured it out very well. Now, maybe if they were on alert mode due to a noise you made, that might make sense. What doesn't make sense is that an enemy could possibly be doing their best impression of a fucking porcupine due to how many of your arrows are sticking out of them, and they still don't seem to think there's any threat worth investigating a little- Metal Gear Solid 5, we can't find him, get back to your regular shifts, he must be gone. In fairness, um, a an area exiting alert state takes like 8 in-game hours at least. And like, um, when an area goes on alert, if it can contact other bases, it will contact other bases and they will go on alert as well in the region. A little more than not at all. This is worse if there's a group of enemies and you imagine- Well, and yeah, that's another thing with Metal Gear Solid Five. So there's like, there's a white state for bases, which is, um... They're like walking around, they're in casual mode. There's a red state, which is like combat alert. And then there's an orange state, which is we're aware that somebody is in the area, but we don't, necessar we don't necessarily know if they're at this particular location. So we're, we have guns at the ready and we're like searching dumpsters and uh, like porta potties. And we're like checking hiding spots to see if the guy is here. Like there's multiple alert state for bases in Metal Gear Solid Five. Managed to kill one of them, only for that dead guy's buddies to go off of alert mode. I don't know, here's the thing, okay? If you're in a military facility, which is also a prison, which is what North Watch is, and someone randomly suddenly gets shot, like, that's it. You gotta figure out what happens. So them going on alert for a while is more realistic, but it poses mechanical problems if you don't have like a more developed stealth system it gets downright fucking comical the first few times an enemy is saying it must have been the wind as he's literally stepping over the corpse of a fallen comrade but perfectly highlights the absolute lack of awareness and PCs have I could fire a dozen arrows at enemies occupying a location only for them to simply not give a shit until I hit one of them, then hide for a few minutes, then they return to normal, as if nothing happened. It's a really great way of ruining any sense of tension or stakes. I was worried he was going to say breaking immersion. <laughs> this ultimately makes failure at remaining undetected utterly meaningless, because it's trivial to reset enemies to their state when you first approach them, rather than changing the situation, and having to be more careful as a result. But yeah, like, there's... There's a lot more to it than just the AI is busted and, like... Well, the level design doesn't... Like, how... Yeah, you gotta, you you gotta facilitate... Fix the, you have to fix the level design first to, like, give people roots around stuff. And, like, proper hiding spots as well. Yeah, and then you have to, like... Then they have to figure out how, like, patrol patterns work. This is all things that they could accomplish. But it is definitely, like, a multi-stage problem. Ideally, the game should encourage and reward picking off enemies one by one, and killing them in locations where their bodies are unlikely to be found, 
And similarly, the game should punish you for leaving bodies out in the open. Yes, I agree. You have a mechanic in Elder Scrolls where you can move bodies. I don't know why they don't try to make <laughs> use of it. And even, not only that, they added a system where AI will respond radiantly to finding dead bodies. So again, it's like, it's not like it's outside, like it would be outside the scope of what Oblivion could accomplish to add a system where you, like, AI patrols could find bodies. Like, gar like people have generic comments about it, right? But I think yeah. it's perfectly within the scope of Skyrim's system to add, like, there's a body here. There must be somebody nearby. I'm going to go on alert. Yeah. It would also be interesting if you could move bodies with telekinesis or something like that. Yeah, uh, moving bodies is a little stiff in Skyrim. Or not managing to get that kill shot. If you kill an enemy in a wide open room, then another enemy enters that room, they should never treat it as a total non-issue that one of their friends is dead, unless we're talking about- Ah, uh, it's fucking Steve, he just killed himself with a bow. Shot himself in the chest with an arrow six times. I am super relatable. ...about literal undead thralls. Now don't let it be said- I mean, the value of life is so low, it, it may well be possible that they just assume, like, well, someone finally did it. <laughs> someone finally went postal and killed Steve. We are being unreasonable here. We're not just going to ignore everything Skyrim does that is actually interesting, and the kill animations are just that. Yet, the entire- that's kind of like a non sequitur, like, um, I don't know. It's kind of like Acer's Thorn. Set up a point, and then, like, we're going to defeat it by saying that, like, well, and also Skyrim's good because kill animations. The entire substance of fights is so dull, so repetitive and mindless, that the animations show up as faint sparks of style on a cake with no substance at all. With combat being so one note, you could at least rely on a wide variety of enemies to fight, right? Well, and are you gonna play seven minute, seven minutes straight of Mr. Caption? <laughs> that that's still that's oh, still right. wild to me. So, I found it interesting. You were saying how that's not plagiarism because in one of my classes, I had to take a take a whole thing. It was mm -hmm. a whole chapter on plagiarism. And in that class, anyway, apparently, there really is, if you use a long enough clip that is considered plagiarism, even if, if you, you put like a it. whole, yeah, yeah, if you, I have heard that argument lit. before, yeah. So, at least according to the class that I took, that was considered plagiarism. I, it, that was literally the first thing that came out of okay, my mouth when so I saw this. I'm like, this is fucking plagiarism. It is plagiarism because there has to be an academic way to publish, to like punish people for it, but I just, yeah. To me, I would personally say that's just outright stealing. Yeah. Because stealing a has a more negative... Definition. Stealing has a much more negative connotation to it. Like, plagiarism is a, is a minor thing in the sense of, like, you're being academically punished. Like, nobody goes to jail for plagiarism. But people yeah. do go to jail for stealing. But yeah, like... That has to be one of the wildest things I've seen in a Skyrim video. I can't believe there's so many things I can say that about that video. <laughs> that like... Oh yeah, there's just seven minutes of unedited Mr. Caption. Unfortunately, no. As it turns out, generic humanoid and- And it's like, okay. I think I can understand his logic. Mr. Caption explained it better than me, so why don't we just watch Mr. Caption? But then it's like, just link the video, give a timestamp. And sure, the link would be broken after the fact. That does suck, but like... I don't or know. Just, or just or don't. Or just summarize yeah. what he said. Or just be like, Mr. Caption said it best when... Or, blah, blah, and blah, the blah, thing blah. is, of the clips he used, there, like, you could cut out the entire, I'm gonna list all the enemy types in the game. <laughs> yeah. Enemy will be the mainstay for the overwhelming majority of the game, 
and they all fight in the same way, with a minor caveat here and there. Yeah, okay, so this is why we brought up Acer uh, Ether Dynamics, because Ether Dynamics showed that, like, inside of Skyrim, they could absolutely have a thing where um, you can differentiate between the ways that Forsworn fight and a different, like, uh, knights would fight. You can completely change their tactics to make the Forsworn fight way more recklessly than other human enemies. And to really make it feel like uh, there's a difference between, like, humanoid enemies. Draugr will fight like bandits, but can use a weak Fus Roda from time to time. Falmer will fight like bandits, full stop. Vampires will fight like bandits, but can cast a health drain spell as they do so. And of course, either the Stormcloaks or- And reanimate the dead. I think that's one of like the most dangerous parts of vampires and necromancers, is that they reanimate fallen enemies. I'm telling you, Acerthorn is the final Skyrim video boss. No, I think that's Salt Factory. Academic plagiarism is such bullshit. You cited who said that and what book, but the page number is wrong, so you stole their work. I mean, don't get the page number wrong. I don't know. I've written a lot of essays. That just sounds like they wanted to college. get. That, that just sounds like you got expelled for plagiarism because the guy. That your academic resource officer fucking hated you and wanted to get rid of you and made up a reason. Yeah, there's, at least in my school, there's a whole, you go uh, in front of a whole board and everything like that. I don't, I've never heard of anybody getting kicked out because they got page numbers wrong. Yeah, again, I want to clarify, I come from a family that works in, um, uh, in the college industry, basically you know, works for colleges, has worked for universities. I haven't heard of, like, plagiarism boards being that uh, vigorous with how hard they work. They typically, because they're they're busy enough as is with no shit plagiarism. Yeah. <laughs> so the Imperials will fight just like bandits. One of these especially is troubling, as Falmer is supposed to be blind, but will actually still use spells and bows with no trouble whatsoever. They got that daredevil sense. Not, it, not expelled, beat. had to redo it. Yeah, I'm sorry, you didn't get punished then. If you only had to redo it. Like, minimum punishment for plagiarism at, for, like, all of the institutions I've dealt with was you instantly failed that course for the entire semester. Like, why bother stating they're supposed to be blind at all if they show no weakness to eyesight and no enhanced hearing? Supposedly they do hear better, but does Did the video stop? Does that actually function in game or is that just lore? Yeah, it's it not. seems indistinguishable, and echolocation ain't so good as to give a perfect indication of distance to use a bow and arrow. They got magic though. Like yeah, it's a problem, but it's really stupid to say this is a blind enemy and then like the only element of them being blind is that like they don't see so <laughs> good. These archers and spellcasters should be putting arrows and spells all over the place. All of this coalesces into the combat system as a whole, which is what you're going to be is it dealing with. still not with. moving for you? Yeah. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to check the original video in, in a different browser. So 107.45. No, it's actually like that. Okay. Okay, so this is something that you want to cut. Throughout most of the game. Skyrim's combat ultimately- Oh, I'm just gonna say say it. The Dragonborn's got a stanky pussy. There's no way the Falmer can't find you that way. <laughs> it comes in two forms. Piss easy and tedious as fuck. This means combat in Skyrim both sucks and blows. Many enemies will simply crumble in front of you. Okay. Due to your sheer overwhelming power. 
Wait a second. I thought that... I thought that you were going down like it was nothing and having trouble dam doing enough damage. Anything that doesn't will quickly become unnecessarily long and drawn out. That's not to say long fights are inherently bad, it's just that Skyrim's combat is so basic and unengaging that long fights end up becoming a chore more than anything else. Search I think this is a winner for levels, um, 51. It's got nothing on my 68, but you know. 68 on what character? The mage character. Uh. Yeah, you gotta grind those levels to get the get enough perk points. <laughs> grind that illusion. Keep uh legendarying it. Certain enemy. But yeah, uh needless to say, the I'm gonna stop for like 30 seconds. You should probably just cut the, the beginning and end of that clip and just uh, keep it moving. Because it's sort of like when you have an extended silence, no music, no vocals. People are going to think like, wait a second, did like my headphone turn off? Oh, uh, yeah. Certain enemy types make this even more tedious, especially when they often show up out of nowhere and sometimes even manage to kill certain NPCs that are useful to you. And certain additional abilities. Has anybody had that problem of the dragons actually killed somebody useful? I've always heard that like, oh, dragons are such a terror because they'll kill like, in they'll in the battle kill like as like town NPCs or what have you. I've never experienced that. Yeah, I've never I've never actually had that problem. But I also did have was it Run for Your Lives mm -hmm. installed for mo for most of the time. Yeah, I guess I can't ask you. But yeah, I've like always had, I've always, like in the modded playthroughs, I've always had that, but like in the two, okay, no, I'm not going to say 200, in the 173 hours I played Skyrim, I never, I don't think I had a situation where like after a dragon battle, I looked around and like saw somebody useful that was dead. I, I've seen a lot of dead guards, I guess. Well, these do yes, Kratosis critiqued me. Um, this is, this is retaliatory. I said that there would be... Mutually assured destruction if Kratos has ever covered one of my videos, and he did, and this is the retaliation. I am epic style owning him. Do little to make the game any more engaging. The Revenant, right? Everyone loves to see him. Leo fighting the bear. Fighting, you know, watching Leo fight the bear is great. Fighting the bear yourself, also pretty great. Yeah, apparently this hack thinks of this is better than this. Yeah, I would really ballsy using this. I would definitely have to agree that like, um, I don't think Immol is like attached to reality when it comes to <laughs> how impactful the gameplay systems he makes are. Never under I, I okay so I haven't seen the Revenant but I don't know I feel like movies tend to portray animals as being far more aggressive than they actually are like a bear will fuck you up but there there are um, there are steps you have to show to get to that stage yeah and also yeah like they usually have to be very hungry and desperate. Yeah, which that looked like a fed ass bear. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I'm surprised that bear wasn't getting around with, with a mobility scooter. <laughs> Dude, when ML said the Red Wedding is cool, but it's so much better if you do the Red Wedding and then show... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, the wedding quest fucking sucks, so... <laughs> the idea that he would compare it to, like, one of the most was... talked about scenes from Game of Thrones is, like, insane. Wait, he, that was actually a point of comparison. <laughs> I'm going to assume that that Setch is not lying. That like Emil said that I can absolutely believe that. But yeah, like, good, good lord, he was gonna kill our babies. Well, yep, there you go. You fucked up. 
Oh, uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense then. The, um, I don't know. It felt like when I was doing the Dark Brotherhood quests that Emil had, like, played Blood Money. Uh, unfortunately, Absolution would come out in 2012, so I can't make the joke I want to about, uh, <laughs> him being inspired by a really shitty Hitman game. But, yeah, it felt like, it felt like he was trying to do Hitman. Um, but he didn't really understand why Hitman works. Now, delving into dungeons and getting loot or killing monsters has been a fairly big part of the Elder Scrolls since at least Morrowind. So this hey, you guys just agreed real with Acer strong. Thorn. Acer Thorn said that uh, Skyrim's genre is a dungeon crawler. No, I've I have the paper airplanes speech in my um, in my Skyrim video. I guess I I just didn't recall that he made a, a comparison to the Red Wedding, which I'm not a big Game of Thrones fan. I don't really know, like... I don't really know much about the Red Wedding. Um, I know that, like, some main characters die, so it's it's shocking. But, like, I also know that it's definitely not a fair comparison for him. I'm gonna spend a lot of time doing it. Unfortunately, Skyrim falls rather short here as well. First and foremost, a variety of scenery is important to keep things visually interesting. Morrowind did fairly well with this. There were Daedric ruins, Dwemer ruins, ancestral tombs, ancient Dunmer fortresses, and Velothi towers. And I think the lighting was also really interesting in ruins. To differentiate things, and it wasn't just, oh, there's lanterns and braziers everywhere. After that, however, this variety became far more limited. Still trying to wrap my head around how Emma relates the Dark Brotherhood with the Trinity or the Veneration of Mary. Yeah, that's a wild one that, like, he thinks that he understands Catholic theology enough to, like, relate the Dark Brotherhood to it. And I think it's just because he is Catholic. Or, well, was. He strikes me as a Catholic with, like, the way that he hushes his voice when he talks about killing Nord girls. Oh, little Nord girls. Oblivion's dungeons consisted mainly of old imperial forts and alien ruins. Skyrim didn't- <clears throat> Hey. Hey. There were caves. There were caves. There and were mines. Yeah, which were caves. And mines. Which, <laughs> with, which were caves with, with wood pillars in them. And lootable ore veins. Mm -hmm. That were worth jack shit. <laughs> and, um, you know, Oblivion Gates. Can't sleep on Oblivion Gates in a discussion of Oblivion Dungeons, but everybody does, anyways. ...fare much better with ancient Nordic tombs, old Imperial forts, and Dwemer ruins. All three games, of course... Yeah. It's like... The Imperial forts needed to actually look visually distinct from the Nordic ruins. Like, that should have been an opportunity to, like, I don't know, say that there's red clay in Skyrim or something. Like, do anything. Yeah. Like, carve the shit out of, like, flat stone surfaces and, like, put tapestries up everywhere. That sounds like a job for a mod. Contained caves and mines as well. Now, Skyrim does have one additional dungeon type over Oblivion, unless you count the Oblivion Gates... The issue then beca uh. becomes how simplistic <laughs> they are in terms of design, for the most part. Why would- okay, but- okay, let's ask the question. That implies that, like, you wouldn't count the Oblivion Gates yeah. normally. But why? I guess because- They're um, random? They're random, and you it only pulls from a pool of, what, seven? Yeah, there's- well, there's seven random worlds, and then there's a couple preset then, worlds. Yeah. Alright. If you've seen one Nordic tomb, you've essentially seen them all, and you start to notice how artificial many of them feel. In particular, if you know, oh, Skyrim's gameplay loop. 
becomes a- By the way, he's showing off a dungeon that, like, I got stuck in on stream because it's, like, got a really stupid fucking pull chain. <laughs> like, it's located in a really stupid place. Yeah, I- yeah, I- I get the embarrassment of getting foiled by it. It's really <laughs> easy to spot which Draugr are the ones that are- Okay, if it wasn't so distorted, you would be able to see it on screen. You're gonna wake up and attack, and those who don't, after you've seen it a couple times. What was once a bit of a surprise in the first- Yeah, it's sort of like in old animations when an environmental detail would be affected that it would be like a different color. Yeah. This Nordic tomb you do quickly becomes old hat by the third or fourth, and you realize this design is standardized between all Nordic tombs. Yeah, it's in fact, interesting too because various Nordic ruins are implied to be like separated by upwards of a millennia in terms of, like, how old they are. So, like, it's really unusual. Like, if you look at real-world architecture in a, in a similar region, uh, two different ruins will have vastly different styles based on the time period. Yeah. Standardized seems like the best word to describe all of these dungeons, because that's how it feels. I... If you made the, if you made the case to me and could show me, like, instances where... Parts of, of Skyrim dungeons were copy-pasted from other Skyrim dungeons, I would absolutely believe you. Like, I think straight up there's, like, the same... It's not just that, like, oh, the, lev the level piece is the same, but, like, the yeah, same it's... parts as well. Yeah, they literally just copy-pasted entire sections. Many of the Nordic tombs have insultingly simplistic picture-matching puzzles to lock off the deeper reaches of the dungeon. It's supposed to keep the, the Draugr and the Dragon Priests in. Even though, from their side, they have a pole chain that <laughs> unlocks it. <laughs> and these come in two forms. Spinning pillars, in which the answer is usually in the same room as the pillars themselves, and Dragon Claws, with the rotating wheel doors. In fact, here's the numbers on screen. So I've been shown this before of like, uh, if I ever need to count the puzzles, it's been done for me. There's 21 of these puzzles in the entire game, including DLC, which makes up a fairly large chunk of the 44 Nordic tombs you can potentially do during your playthrough. Eight of these puzzles are the spinning pillars. Eleven of them are the dragon claws. Two are kind of similar picture matching puzzles, but less complicated. And there's an additional spinning pillar puzzle to enter Skyhaven Temple. In similar fashion, when you've done one picture matching puzzle, you've essentially done them all. Only on an extremely rare occasion will the developers get a little bit wild, adventurous, and bold. Yeah, I'm thinking of like the poem puzzle. Uh, where you have to pick the right animals. Yeah. By making more than one up. pillar spin at a time to make it slightly more difficult than not at all. Seriously. Yeah, and with those, it's just easy to guess. Did he... Because there's a random puzzle out in the middle of, like, the, the white, white run. runs. Yeah. Did he count that one, too? Not that I can see from first glance. Yeah. I would have to know the exact name, but I don't think it even is like a marked location. I'm not even really sure how you would go about counting them. In your opinion, what would be a good dungeon puzzle that doesn't interrupt the player momentum? Well, that's the inherent thing that I pointed out in the Oblivion video <clears throat> is that by design, you have an inherent conflict between the fact that most people aren't going to want to be inconvenienced by a puzzle, and then the people who are going to want to be inconvenienced by a puzzle, you can't cater to both audiences. So there's not really a way that you would design a puzzle that wouldn't, like, either be oversimplified or filter most of the people that were going through it. So that's why my assumption of, like, there are puzzles in dungeons, but they're they're like optional areas and the player it's established with the player that like 
if you want the optional reward of doing done if of doing these like harder puzzles then you know you have to be willing to to deal with puzzles and then like they need they need a specific staff member at bethesda who that's their thing is like they had worked on puzzle games in the past and then the other thing i've talked about a lot is that skyrim needs more mechanics that you could make puzzles out of because I'm thinking, like, Skyrim can't even, like, it can, it does it once, but it can't really pull off the, like, a pressure plate puzzle. Let alone, like, laser redirection puzzles or anything like that. In most of they, these instances... They could just go the uh, Mass Effect route and just um, copy Towers of Hanoi. Yeah. <laughs> Always just copy something else. Yeah. This is the answer to the puzzle is in the same room... As the puzzle itself. For real, it's being absurdly generous to even call this rancid horseshit a puzzle because it barely. Well, yeah, it, it's insulting to the uh, the good name of our lords and saviors who actually try, like secret hunting in Doom. Kind of. I mean, secret hunting in Doom can be a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes it's just wall humping until you find like a secret door. But yeah, it's like if you have a consistent level prop that you put over a door into an optional area and then a, that like that can signal to players, oh, this is a puzzle area. I I'm not interested in I'm somebody who's not interested in doing that kind of content, so I can just skip that even though I'd get less loot out of it. Qualifies. It's a little more than a speed bump. Same goes for the Dragon Claw puzzles. The first one was nifty. But all of them after that are old hat. You get a claw, you know you have to look on it for the three symbols you've got to align to. The So the Dwemer puzzles in the DLC are kind of a mixed bag. Um, I do like the ruin that you do as part of the main quest for Dragonborn. Yeah, with the, um, the rising, Yeah, the rising water yeah. level stuff. It's not particularly complicated, but I do think it's like a really interesting conceit for that area. And it does impact gameplay as well when you have to fight and there's water everywhere or there's mm -hmm. not enough water or something. It's 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 interesting. It tried. It shows that like Bethesda is capable of doing stuff. And it's I like... found it interesting where he said um the dragon claw puzzle was interesting the first time you see it. For me, the first time I saw it was in promotional materials. Yeah, like so... the, the first time I <laughs> saw it was the QuakeCon 2011. Yeah. Where, yeah, Todd so Howard, where Todd Howard, Howard spoiled how you solve them. Yeah, so like I never actually got an opportunity to like to be surprised <laughs> by be it. A puzzle, and it's not a puzzle. The puzzle is you turn over <laughs> the item, something that the game doesn't introduce to you. Like there, oh. <laughs> there, I have been told before, there are people who are surprised that you can actually interact with the objects in the inventory. Yeah, you can interact with it and zoom in and stuff. People are mm -hmm. like, what? Open the door, and you're done. This is something they could have easily made more interesting and varied if they had mixed it up a bit, such as having them represent a riddle it needs solving, or have the three symbols instead be part of a larger picture. There are a couple of them that are like that, though. Or something. Anything else besides the same damn puzzle over and over and over again. It very much seems as though Bethesda has got a quantity over quality issue. Where they seem to think it's true you can find evidence of this when they were talking about like how many level designers they got on skyrim they, it's, we got eight level designers yeah there's so much good content coming this is definitely something that they struggle with their dungeons is like we got to have like eight thousand dungeons in our game but we don't because... have the time to make eight thousand good dungeons yeah because god forbid the people open up the map and they don't see any markers mm -hmm. yeah like god forbid there isn't something every 20 feet yeah. there's a guy on youtube who says that it's really good that there's something every 20 feet as if the world doesn't feel small enough we're also going to make it super dense mm -hmm. having more of something just means it's good Rather than f there's the occasional claw puzzle where there's a dragon or a fox. Focusing on the quality of those things. 
Dungeon 2 Boring, throw in another picture matching puzzle. This is a game about dragons? Spawn one in to annoy the player every 30 minutes. If anything, Skyrim is an exercise in repetition ad nauseum. The Dwemer runes and Imperial Forts don't fare much better either. I don't recall any of the Imperial Forts having puzzles, but they mostly come across as... Because why would they? Wouldn't gating loot to puzzle areas just spark the ire of players who feel slighted for not engaging with the content? Well, yeah, of course, you're always going to have to deal with the I have to loot every urn crown feeling obligated to do puzzles. But I still yeah. think that, like, having it be optional content but being able to go hard on it is still preferable to the to the alternative of we have to have really simple puzzles in these games. Standard dungeon affair, with the rare exception, is actually somewhat interesting. Location is po well, as they say, uh, when it comes to artistic things, when you fail, just keep fucking going. Populated by X it's the Acer Thorn grind set. X enemy type and has sick loot, maybe a couple traps, and a super convenient back exit or barred door that deposits you next to the entrance. Drummer runes tend to be more grand in scale, but they suffer similar problems, as most are infested with Falmer, so most often times you do one of these dungeons, you'll be fighting these fuckers. I get there's lore reasons- Can we see these fuckers? Are the Falmer worse than the automatons? Uh... I would say the automatons are some of the worst enemies in the game. I think it depends on the character that you're playing. Yeah, I, I guess. I think Falmer are pretty fucking terrifying for a mage because of the poison and the one-shot arrows. Mm -hmm. The automatons, like the especially the steam dude, that's pretty scary if you're a melee character. But yeah, we should probably be seeing some Falmer. For it. But the overall point... Is Especially if you're going to say these fuckers, you got to show us what these fuckers are. So sunk I mean, cost you... fallacy. I mean, would you be surprised if ML Pagliarulo was throwing in bad money or good money after bad? Bad money after good? <laughs> the distinct lack of variety, and this is something that seems fairly consistent across the board. Daedra types have been reduced to an insanely pathetic four in the base game. From all the int in fairness, we do have to clarify the Daedra are less of a focus in Skyrim than they were in Morrowind and Oblivion. So, like, yeah. Oblivion was all about Daedra invasion. Morrowind was about a region that like tolerated Daedra worship. So it made sense for there to be more types of Daedra. That said, the number of, like it is definitely ridiculous that there it, there's been that drastic a reduction in their presence. And I would say still the variety drop in them is a little strange. Like, I could see the drop in numbers, but you should still come across the occasional spider or clan mm. fear or something. I would say you definitely need scamps and clan fears. Yeah, because they were basically cannon fodder in Oblivion, so. Interesting varieties we had before. And of course, one of those four is just another fucking humanoid enemy, which is by far the most common enemy type you'll be facing throughout the game. You have a problem with uh, taking on dudes? <laughs> Meaning the already lackluster and simplistic combat system has you mostly facing off against one enemy type, dude with a melee weapon, maybe a bow, maybe a spell, and if he's a draugr, maybe a shout. This isn't even getting into the absolutely awful world building problems these locations present, or how Bethesda, once again, didn't bother to put any effort into the type of loot and items you could find in these dungeons. See, um, in the making of documentary, they showed, like, there were Tau players for Warhammer, which makes me think that, um, Beth people at Bethesda might be more into Warhammer than they are Dungeons and Dragons, and so their kind of obsession with dude fighting might come down to the fact that they aren't really into like fantasy creatures as much 
Oh, I was thinking too, it might be an animation thing. Didn't they, wasn't it just one animator who animated all the bipedal yeah. enemies? So I don't know, maybe she, maybe she just had her work cut out for her. She couldn't do any more. Yeah, there was a, there, there, well, okay. There was a chick that would do quadrupeds and there was a dude that would do the mocap for the, um, for the, uh, weapons and stuff. Yeah. He would do mocap for bipeds. Yeah. Engines, but that's a topic for another video. They were Tau players. Yeah, we we commented on that fact when it happened, because it really does explain a lot. Ah, dragons! Can't talk about Skyrim without. Yeah, this is another one of my big rants. Um. <laughs> I talk a lot about the one of the primary motivations of dragons for Skyrim, which is Reign of Fire. Because the big issue with that is that in Reign of Fire, they're fucking wild animals. Yeah. Eight level designers and only one animator for enemy types. Yeah, there's some... Because the thing is, one of the big criticisms that was leveled at... Um, at Bethesda before Skyrim but after Oblivion had to do with like how the dungeons were so they really wanted to emphasize that like oh no the dungeons are going to be better we got tons of dudes now that make dungeons and then like the guys who made dungeons would like their priorities would be like there's a tower in a cave and it kind of just tells a whole story actual quote by the way well actual paraphrase but <laughs> talking about the dragons. They were actually a selling point for this game for many people. There are no dragons in Morrowind. There are none in Oblivion. What, what about the cliff racers? <laughs> where are all the dragons? Surely with something so anticipated. I don't know. This is like saying where are all the beholders. Anticipated as dragons. They wouldn't fuck it up, right? <laughs> nope. Dragons are arguably the worst aspect of the game. Once you fought one dragon, you pretty much fought them all, including the final boss. Besides minor variations, such as what shout attacks they use, for all intents and purposes, all the dragons- You mean for all intensive purposes? Like Who said that? Oh, that's a common, um, I forget what it's called, but it's where you- you're a phrase, but you don't actually know how it's spelled. Yeah. So, like, uh, bone apple tea is one. <laughs> I've never heard that one. Yeah, that's that's a pretty that's the like the famous one. Because it's obvious. Like, what the fuck does bone apple <laughs> tea refer to? are the same. They all have the same generic- What the fuck levels? Motherfucking <laughs> one! ...bite and bash attacks in a tail slam, and that's it. And my fucking god, are they obnoxious as all hell. They're essentially no different than any other enemy. The only real difference is that they can fly. No interesting mechanics or combat abilities were introduced for fighting dragons. It's literally the I mean- Dragon shouts. I know it's it's a it's a shit point, but yeah. Yeah, it is intense and purposes. It's a it is a it is a mishearing of the phrase to say intensive purposes. That doesn't mean anything. What exactly is an intensive purpose? I don't is intensive even a word? Like intensive care? Intensive, concentrated on a single area or subject or on or into a short time, very thorough or vigorous. So for very vigorous purpose, but like in the sentence that you would say intents and purposes for, you would not say intensive purposes. Do you think it's the issue with too many cooks in the kitchen with the whole eight level designers dilemma? No, not really. Oblivion had six level designers. I mean, like, um, 
it's not like every level designer sits down in a room and says, all right, boys and girls, today we're designing Bleak Falls Bear. No, it's like each level designer is going to have a set level of dungeons and areas that they're going to be responsible for. Yeah, the only thing you have to worry about is quality of work, but if you're a large studio, I think you can do a good job hiring people that are going to manage to hit a certain quality benchmark. Yeah, and there's going to be a department head who's responsible for, like, making sure that everybody is at a fairly consistent level of quality for their level design. Yeah. Uh, oh same as any other enemy. Melee slaps them with their weapon as many times as they can. Magic is boring as fuck and either uses projectiles while praying their shots don't miss, like with bound bow, switching to lightning to get hit scan attacks, or summoning AI to fight it for them. Oh no, you got a stagger lock with impact. Stealth archers are in the same camp as mages who use projectile spells. And that's it. That's fighting dragons in Skyrim. <clears throat> it's really disappointing, too. It seems as though the developers want to make them unique, but in reality, they ended up being a little more than generic enemies. Oh great, I have to go kill Nameless Bandit number 292. Oh great, I have to kill Nameless Dragon number 487. And I mean, if you fought 486 dragons up to that point, I think you've gotten your your money's worth out of Skyrim. Is this one of those, I only got 10 playthroughs out of it kind of things? Is it is it 500 hours logged on Steam? Uh, Shit game. Not recommended. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, that's one thing. It's like, if, if it's a multiplayer game and someone has like 8,000 hours, they're actually pretty good to listen to if they st suddenly stop recommending the game. Oh, yeah. If it's a game that's currently in development... Yeah, like an early access. Or something like they release patches for and stuff and they just completely fuck the game with a patch. Yeah, like I want to estimate that I have like 13 or 1400 hours in Grand Theft Auto Online. Despite the fact that I have so many hours in the game, I can still handily say you shouldn't play it. <laughs> Was there fact, ever a point where you would have recommended it? There were ways I would have recommended it and there were time periods I would have suggested playing in. But um, as it is now, it's just a mess. I got filtered out by the launch of it where it was just crashing for two weeks straight. Yeah. The, okay, so like the first era of Grand Theft Auto Line was arguably a failure because there wasn't anything to do and the game ran like shit. And yeah. then around the... T so there was an update. I mean, there was heists and heists were cool, but they didn't really hold the game. Um, when Grand Theft Auto Line Online really started to see an uptick was when they started working on uh, finance and felonies or whatever it was, which was like the first content update, which really started adding stuff to do in the um, actual open world multiplayer. So the 30 people sessions, which was like it was VIP. So if you had like a million dollars, you could become a VIP and then hire like employees and you could do like special missions in the, in yeah. the open world. And, like, there was multiplayer components because it was, like, there was a mission where it was, like, your icon would be hidden on the mini-map and then you would have to survive for 10 minutes. And, like, players would get paid if they managed to kill you. And you would get paid if you managed to survive the whole 10 minutes. And it was shit like that. And that was where, like, Grand Theft Auto Online really started to turn around as, like, a multiplayer yeah. game. When they started embracing the open world aspect of it yeah, and the player that was, interactions. That was the most interesting phase. Now, there was still scummy shit going on with the shark cards. Um, but there was definitely an era when like it was tolerable to play um, it was really when like they started catering to like kids who just wanted to like get as many kills as possible in the in the open world sessions so like we can sell more shark cards if we sell a new toy that is more effective at killing people so it was like I mean, it started with the Hydra Jet, which came with heists, but the Hydra Jet era wasn't really that bad because you could deal with them. It was when they started adding shit like the Deluxo and and the like the hover bike that like has rockets and shit. 
there was just like crazy shit they would add that would be absurdly overpowered and it would cost like four million in-game dollars which was like yeah to, to encourage people to fucking which was like a 25 dollar shark card yeah and like that's when one the, item yeah that's when the game like really started to go downhill so i gotta ask 1300 hours played when are we getting the gta online retrospective i could absolutely do a video explaining kind of the history of gta online and like why it really went downhill that sounds like a good 30 minute video yeah like this is something that i am knowledgeable about somebody's asking me if i like the mass effect 3 multiplayer i never got to play it oh you never did you can do it by yourself no. yeah i know it's, it's still active kind of i'm just so i don't know <laughs> maybe one day i'll hop into it before they shut the servers down which could be any day now but yeah like um the appeal of grand theft auto online was that one it's a gta game where you get to make a custom character which is really cool um it was a lot of fun because like there was stuff that you could absolutely sink the money that you were making into yeah, um, th that was a game that did not suffer from money sink issues. Yeah, like, but it was also a game where, like, if you knew what you were doing, if you if you were on that grind, like, it that was an outlet for a grind set. Um, yeah. Like, legitimately, if you knew what you were doing, you could absolutely make money without ever buying shark cards. Also, there was one time where I cheated in, like, $100 million, and I got banned for a week. <laughs> or, a month, or a month or something but because i was smart about it i got to keep the money anyways <laughs> what yeah so like i had money for a long time and i was able to like so like their big thing is they'll release a new content update and you have to buy like a two million dollar building to deal with it but it's like i had so much fucking like capital that i could start every content update and then like just run it for my friends but there was a lot of cool stuff in it like um you know just running businesses there were missions you could do it was a great game to play if you were like listening to a youtube video um obviously there's a multiplayer component so you can play it with your friends um and it's like a jack it's one of those jack of all trade games so it's like if you're into flying there's a, a mediocre flying system if you're into driving there's a mediocre driving system you know there's gunplay and and melee and like and uh if you're into did you ever uh did you ever mess with like gta rp no, I never, I never got into any of those servers. Not that I tried really hard, but I don't know. There's not as much of an appeal to a GTA RP system because it's like, I don't know. If I wanted to role play, I'd play Space Station 13 because it's just a better game for it. But yeah, and it's like the last good content update by my estimation was the El Perico heist just because it was a heist where like it was actually modular like it, it it took them years but they finally managed to make a heist where like you got to control most of the elements of it which was like the main premise of GTA 5 they like really made a, a, a whole game around people liked that that bank heist mission from GTA 4. Four Leaf Clover, hell yeah. Which mm -hmm. was a... I don't... Um, I didn't they did like it. In, it. They did it in San Andreas. Oh, I love that mission. <laughs> All I remember from that mission is just like sitting in an alleyway waiting for the cops to disappear and being really annoyed. I liked... I liked um, going down into the subways and stuff. And, the, mm. and even just the drive up there was good because the dialogue between all the McCreary brothers or right? Packy McCreary. I, I don't remember what, what their name is. I like that. Mission. I think it's safe to unironically say that dragons are the cliff racers of Skyrim. <laughs> uh, that's making the assumption that cliff racers were a bad thing. I think cliff racers are just misunderstood. Because here's the thing about cliff racers. They actually drop an item that's worth money and worth stuff. Like, so cliff racer plumes are worth 20 gold apiece, and they are a levitation spell effect item. So if you want to make levitation potions, then cliff racers are extremely valuable. 
For a game that was all about heists, GTA 5 gave me the hardest time when it come to when it came to making money. Well, that's the funny thing is being an actual criminal in GTA Online means hacking. Like if you actually like, oh, I'm going to make my money by being a drug dealer. That's you being a civilian in GTA Online. And then, you know, Gay Baby Jail is uh, getting banned from the game. For anyone who doesn't know, Cliff Racers were Morrowind's only hostile flying enemy type. For those who don't, for those who aren't aware. And they're quite no You should show it. This is another one of those, you should probably show what you're talking about. But I still stand by Cliff Racers are under misunderstood. Notorious for how fucking annoying they are. They often seem to come out of nowhere, they make a horrendous noise, and they're fucking relentless in pursuing you. Yeah, it's almost like you're supposed to kill an enemy when it attacks you on the road. Dragons are much the same. After killing your first dragon, it seems as though the game feels compelled to spawn one in every hour or so for you to deal with, quite often at inconvenient I- I have heard how the system works, but I don't know- I don't remember it off the top of my head for how it decides when dragon encounters are supposed to happen. I think it has to do it, with loading screens. So the it more- It really- It the, really does feel like there is- it's not random. Yeah, I think it is on- I think it's on a timer and it has to do with loading screens. So if yeah, you fast that's... travel often, you deal with more dragons. Which is- <laughs> which is funny to say. It'd be interesting, because I would base it off of, like, cells traveled rather than loading screens. I, th I think it is loading screens. What if I just want to collect ingredients? Mud crabs are also misunderstood. Yeah, the only problem with mud crabs is that enemies that have not encountered, have not seen you can still block you from waiting in fast travel. <laughs> That's 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 the main issue with mud crabs. Ingredients for alchemy. I explored part of the map I haven't really been to before. What if I need to stop by Riverwood? Like, okay, I can fix the wait mechanics instantly. Okay, if you wait in an area around an enemy, an hour passes and then that enemy attacks you. And so it's like you solve the problem of having to track down the enemy because they just come to you. But you also preserve the element of you can't wait in an area around an enemy. so I could get materials for my shitty DLC house. What if I want to install some weird degenerate anime waifu mod and play around with it? If we're t well, okay, you just open the door on installing mods. Why don't you just install a mod that makes dragon encounters less common? Like, there's legitimate reasons to be annoyed because they, had, they added this dragon shot mechanic and then tied dragon encounters to it. Also, I think the parade of dragon encounters is influenced by the main quest stages. Yeah, I think so. Like, I think the encounter rate goes up, like, 25% or something. I, th I remember the number 25 for some reason. I think it's after um, Kynes Grove when What's-Her-Face yeah. Delphine says, I think it's going to get much worse. I think that's the trigger for it. Yeah, and then it it's, it's like, really bad until you defeat Alduin, and then it goes back to, uh, like, pre-Kynes Grove encounter rates. Does it, does it go down after you kill him, or does it go down after you defeat him on Throat of the World? Uh, let me look. Because I, I feel like I remember seeing it was Throat of the World. Because then he runs off to Sovngarde and he's not resurrecting dragons or something like that. Uh, I just want to state for the record, the um, the page on dragons on the UESP is extremely unimpressive. Oh, no. Go check the fandom page. Might be better. Uh, no, it won't be better, but... <laughs> There's been multiple times where I'm like, yeah, this page isn't very good. It's a baby's game. Why would UESP bother to right. look into it? Right. Hey.
Have you seen a dragon attack a giant? Yes. Because dragons are wild animals and will attack random creatures. One of the ways I propose fixing dragons is that there's a type of dragon that utilizes the animal allegiance shout to make animals in the area attack you. Guidance says it goes down after you kill, uh, after you kill him, because Parthenox tells you the dra tells the dragons to chill out. I mean, are they guessing or like do they actually have the numbers? I wonder if there's like a, because there's the function in, um, in Oblivion that you can call the, you can call the rate for spawning. I assume there is. Oblivion gates. I wonder if there's a function for that. I wouldn't be surprised if it's like formatted the same way too. Fuck you, the game says it's time for a dragon fight. I sure hope no NPCs you care about die in this attack. You have absolutely no control over. It would be a shame if the I mean Is this a is this a pro essential NPCs argument? I mean that I have it on good authority from Mr. Sorcerer Dave that that's what essential NPCs are for. Is them getting killed in random dragon encounters. Now obviously the direction you can take it is Hey, uh, you should probably go inside when the dragon's in the area. But, like, I don't know. I personally haven't had this issue. I haven't really heard about too many people having this issue. Well, it's Imagine fine because, just... um, they have the system, right? Where if, uh, in a, a quest giver gets killed or a shopkeeper gets killed, their brother or sister takes over the mm -hmm. duty. Mm hmm So you get to see that system work. Yeah. It's all right. As Bethesda says, sometimes you should just let a save play out just to see what happens. <laughs> Invested 500 gold in to have a large. Oh no, how horrifying. My loss in gold. Truly, <laughs> I, will, I will never be the same. After making thousands of gold from them having that money. <laughs> <laughs> the best part, too, is when you get to the point of being able to invest in shops, you already have more than enough money. Yeah, like, I don't know. This feels like a, a grasp at um, trying to make an attack at the game, but, no, like, I think it's the wrong approach. Larger gold pool for selling items to, or to suddenly decide it's a good day to punch a dragon in the face and die as a result. Yeah, dragons end up being nothing more than a fucking pest while trying to play this game. To the point I would actually fucking recommend not doing the main quest first. Do it last. Trust me, if, you, if you're intent on playing this fucking game, do the main story last. You'll, you'll thank me. Do the main story. Oh, but, yeah, but there's a lot of people who don't do it. But then you don't have access to shouts. Yeah, that's, which... that's the main issue. Um, my personal recommendation is to do Dragon Rising, but don't go up to the, to the throat of the world. Yeah. The only downside to that is you don't get a better unrelenting force, but to be honest, there are better Dragon Shouts that you would want to have well, access to. Well, if the rate doesn't increase until you hit Kind's Grove, my, I was always, I think I would you can stop. only get the second word of unrelenting force and it's not really an improvement. <clears throat> Because you can still turn, you can turn in the horn without going to Kynes Grove. Mm -hmm. And then you would get the third, the third level of the shout. You just have to ignore, you know, the obvious thing of the obvious urgency of going and stopping a right. dragon attack. Yeah, there's, there's a role play issue. It's conceivable yeah. that like you would ignore the, the Greybeard summons. Yeah. It's not as conceivable that you would answer the Greybeard summons and then say, you know what? I just <laughs> climbed this giant harrowing mountain, but I'm actually not interested in in this situation. You know what? I climbed it once. That was enough for me. I'm not going to climb it again. Yeah, I like the idea of like, I'm going to farm <laughs> words of power. And it's like, so you, basically you're saying you're Dragonborn climbed a... I, I've heard projections <laughs> that the Throat of the World's like a 19... 
thousand foot uh, mountain, which would like. By the way, I've kind of I've looked to tried to figure out multiple ways how big the throat of the world actually is, and I'm gonna say it doesn't rank in the top one hundred of real world mountains. Like it's not it's not that it's not in the even in the top three. It's not in the top one hundred. It's actually not in the top 108. Uh, for some reason, the Wikipedia article goes... To, like, it doesn't stop the chart at 100. It goes to 110. Story last. So you don't have to deal with fucking dragons for every other fucking quest you do in this game. I mean, a fun thing about dragons is that, like, they're really nice. They're, they're really nice to tell if your character's good. If you can kill a dragon in like six shots on legendary difficulty, you're doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the case for me. Like, I can destroy dragons at higher levels. And I never really got annoyed with fighting dragons during my playthrough. That might just be like experience and knowing exactly how to contend with them. Oh man, you know what's a good um, spell to use from CC? It's like the one that does all three elemental damages at once using that on dragons i found that yeah. melts them yeah the, those spells i never used them but they definitely looked like i think those these are better than the base game spells yeah for the most part i would say no i said no well yeah and there's there's always the guardians of the galaxy idea for characters where it's like just because you're playing a low responsibility character doesn't mean you can justify ignoring the end of the world. Interesting mechanics or combat abilities were introduced. Well, what about dragon shows? Yeah, okay, so he's probably going to say that, like, uh, they use, like, three different shouts, because there's some dragons that will use Drain Vitality. And I absolutely agree. Like I said earlier, they should use Animal Allegiance and... Uh, I mean, you know, shots are basically magic, so the sky is at literally the limit yeah. in terms of what dragons could do with shouts. Or how about using not, the shout that makes it rain fire? And another, makes it rain those like, fireballs yeah, and stuff. Alduin only having that is weird. Um, another idea I had was like, you could, with the systems that are in the game, give dragons personality by, like, assigning them AI packages based on, like, you could make some dragons prioritize melee combat where they immediately land and, like, engage in, like, you know, melee. And then you could have some dragons that are, like, hit and run with, with fire, with shouts and stuff. And then you could have dragons that use magic. And you could, like, really sell the idea that, like, dragons use varied tactics just like people because they are intelligent. Yeah. Like, I have a whole write-up on how, like, you can try to make dragons appear more intelligent. With the systems that are already in the game. Yeah. What about them? They're nothing more than a secondary magic system with a cool... I don't know. I will say it is... I will say that it is possible to step off of Skyrim's main quest if you're aware that that's what quest line you're doing. But it is also very easy to get... It's like a whirlpool that you can get sucked into. But it's a very visible whirlpool. Pull down. In fact, many effects they have already exist in normal magic where spells in previous games... Dude, imagine if you got to the Alduin fight and he had, like... He had uh, the skip time ability from that Diavolo has in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure where... Like, it just- the game just suddenly skips forward five seconds in time. <laughs> and it's like, oh fuck. This dude's the son of the god of time. He's a dragon, he has fucking time powers. That would- that would be very cool. So we're cut from this one, or are there other abilities that already existed? It's not a unique power system in the slightest. Like, um... The sad thing is... Part 5 of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure has a lot of opportunities to be extremely good with the stands that are available, and I think it just squanders those characters. 
Anyways, that's my quick thoughts on that. For example, there's a spell to make your enemies flee in terror. There's also a shout for this. There's a shout to disarm enemies. Uh, I'm uncertain, however, if the shout scales with, like, illusion perks. You almost win and Alduin reloads a previous save. Wouldn't that be the most wild thing? That, um... <laughs> That would be such a subversion, and people would love it if um, the first time you face Alduin, he manages to beat you because he also has access to save states. And, like, the way you end up defeating him is also using save states. Like, people would lose their shit if Bethesda did that. But this is something you could do in Oblivion if you're skilled enough with a weapon. And you could do it in Skyrim with shield bashing, as long as you're not an Argonian. Well, I mean, you know, don't play a scaly. There are some unique shouts too, but some seem to have little utility. And most of these shouts, dragons never use. It also becomes a fucking chore to collect them all. I think Bethesda realized how much bullshit it was to try and find these shouts, so they literally built into the game that you will receive a letter suggesting a dungeon you can visit that contains a shout. I mean, you can also ask the Greybeards for yeah. to be guided to dragon shouts. I mean, like, is that really, is that really something to hang the game for? Well, I mean, that's exactly my point. A lot of people really like Undertale. Um, so it's like, if Bethesda actually, like, because Bethesda is not unfamiliar with the concept. Like, one of the reasons Vivek doesn't pick a fight with you is because he's aware the player character can just keep reloading the save until they, they, until they manage to kill him. It's even fucking funnier when you read the note, and it's some random ass location. You caused quite a stir in High Hrothgar when you used your Thum. How the fuck did I cause a stir using the shout? in a place dedicated to the teachings of the dragon shouts. I like getting the note because I used a shout that's actually like supposed to be a whisper. That, <laughs> yeah, that's a fun one. <laughs> you caused quite a stir in Western Watchtower. Ah yes, the densely populated location Western Watchtower, my favorite town in the entire game. Ultimately, the system feels like it wasn't thought out well. It's just another, more annoying to use magic system, and Dragon Souls are nothing more than an extra currency to unlock shouts. Yeah, but it is more. And it's, it's, it is a stab it's at something more. It, it's an alternative to people who don't want to use magic. Which I can agree is kind of lame. Like, why are you giving non-magic people magic? Because you're flying monsters, I guess. That also land. So that's it for the mechanical side of Skyrim. At least as much as I'm willing to discuss. As well as its main feature and enemy type. And I've gotta say, this game is really lacking. It ends up feeling like much of the game was made in a sterile lab dedicated to making the most bland and accessible game ever made. The entire- I mean, you're not far off. Game realistically only has one dragon, has been reskinned a thousand times, including the final boss. Most dungeons, with rare exception, end up coming across as totally standardized and feel lazily cobbled together from a rather small pool of assets. What are your thoughts on Mike the Liar? The more I've researched Bethesda games, the more I hate Mike the Liar. Because it really does seem like almost spiteful like my is kind of a symbol of just how much bethesda really doesn't appreciate their old fans because it's basically why are you guys complaining about this stuff that we keep cutting like i i'm really interested to see what will what mike the liar will say in elder scrolls 6 in response to like all those youtubers that that said mean things about bethesda and kept insulting todd Mike can literally just come out of nowhere and one shot you now. Just teabag your corpse. Yeah, he just. Mike just shows up, punches your character in the balls, 
and there's just a five minute animation of him teabagging you. Attributes were removed and skills were butchered. Combat is overall bland and simplistic. How many times have you seen the Skyrim Tower? You know the one. This isn't even including the incident. I mean, like, I've seen it reused, but I'm not going to say that I've seen it like an excessive number of times. Probably only like about four or five times. This, this is definitely kind of a weird thing to say. How many times have you seen this tower? Uh, like five. Why are you out doing of, this? Can I call? Like my, can I call my family? Out of like two hundred locations, too. Yeah. Instances of this exact tower you find inside of dungeons, and just to make it clear, I don't even have an issue with asset reuse if there's enough variety, and it allows for more expansive worlds, and. That's kind of the issue. Like, there are Imperial Fort models that I recognize more than that tower. Yeah, that's exact. I was thinking the exact same thing. Here. The lack of variety and how small everything feels. So how small everything is. So, with the overall gameplay aspect of this RPG lacking, then surely the story and factions have to hold up really fucking well, right? Right? Yeah, they, oh, right. Because they don't. This is the next, it's the next part. It's true, they don't. Hey, Fallout music. There was Morrowind footage? He used the motor battle music from Valheim. Interesting putting this at the end of the video. What? Like all these like clips used and stuff. I would just put a title during the when the clip shows yeah. up. Yeah. There's different ways to do accreditation. I feel that uh like sourcing it as is is a much easier way to to go about it. I mean, that was pretty good. Yeah. Definitely in the upper half. It definitely well, the question, deser it deserves the, to have more than 19,000 views. The question is what is the absolute middle video? What what exemplifies the middle of the pack video? That's got to be a white light, a never knows best. Yeah. Something like that. Something with high production values, but brain dead takes. <laughs> you got your salt factories out there, which are boring. You got the salt factories book report, right? You got your Acer Thorns out there, which are crazy takes. And then you have, like, the good videos. You got Angry Joe. You got G-Man Lives. G-Man Lives says things. He, he's short and to the point, and he says things. And that's what I liked about G-Man Lives. Um, You got your Noah Caldwell Gervais. He's insightful. He's not as... He, Noah Caldwell Gervais is not as entertaining, but he's definitely insightful, and he's got a unique perspective on things. Um... You got your short and like merciful videos, like your DJ Peach Cobbler and Avardi. Um, and then you have your hours long nightmares. You got your Mr. Caption, you got your private sessions. Um, no, this is definitely like, this is definitely up there. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there was any, uh, there was nothing outlandish in this video. No claims where I'm like, this is just wrong. We already did H Bomber Guy's video. You can't, like, we knew it was a trick going in. We know full well. I think the one that tripped me up, the, the take that tripped me up the most was the, um, that they played the game on the highest difficulty setting. Yeah, and I, I didn't really buy the reasoning for that.
Yeah. But even then, it's very minor. It's sort of like, yeah, a 737 falls apart if you fly it at Mach 2. Like... <laughs> It's not like accusing a voice actor. Right. It, yeah, it's, it's definitely not saying a voice actor improv some lines because she was had been playing the game and uh, was familiar with how the dragon shot worked. I don't know. I would probably put this in, like, the top five. There's no opinion. way Joan Allen didn't say, like, what the hell is a dragon rend? <laughs> what is this word? Dargan? Where does Super Bunny Hop fall? Super Bunny Hop fa Hop fall. Super Bunny Hop uh, is in the I don't remember anything about his video camp. And I saw it very... I didn't even watch it in November. I watched it recently. Um, let's see. So yeah, like I wouldn't have an issue giving this video like a six. This is a and that's a generous score where most videos have not rated above a four. Yeah, that's the thing. So it's like, do I rate this against my own, or do I rate it against like an average? Because if it's against an average, it's like a set. It's like a seven or an eight. Skyrim videos are graded on a curve. <laughs> we'll drop the lowest. Lowest uh, grade, the lowest test grade. Right. So, for me, it would be the stealth part. I'll drop the stealth part. Is that the worst part of this? I don't know. It's hard to answer the question what the worst part of this was. There's nothing that really, like, stood out to me as, like, man, that's real bad. Yeah, exactly. It's just, if you have to drop the lowest test grade, you have to drop the lowest test grade, so. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta pick one. Even though it's, it's like, oh yeah, this one's a 60, this one's a 59, this one's a 61. Um... Yeah, probably just uh, the legendary difficulty thing. You take that out of the equation, and this is this probably goes up a point. Who is that weird dude who hunts kid dealers now? That was Mama Max. That was the guy that we cut to a fucking uh, RB and the Chief bit because his voice was ridiculous. Wait, what? Mama Max? I must, have, I must have missed this one. Yeah, it was a re-upload of a Mama Max video, because the guy wants to be taken seriously, so he deleted like all his old video game and anime reviews. Oh, okay. But like he says everything in a really deep voice, and he like was basically like a compilation of like a bunch of different YouTubers' really vague opinions on Oblivion or on Skyrim. I don't know, like, it was not a good video. We couldn't finish it because um, Mom and Max would keep coming back to the video and, like, I just would bust out laughing. Because <laughs> I shit you not, like, it was literally, like, a joke voice. Mama Max is very edgy. He's like a, uh, he's like a club where the handle is the blade. Also, him not using footage that he is discussing about. Oh, I mean, like. Ooh, wait, what are you, what are you referring to? Um, Salt Factory, we, we gave a three. Arlo got a two. Dime Tree got a two. DJ Peach Cobbler got it too. Because DJ Peach Cobbler had like cringe in his video. He's another he's another person who 
uh, denounces his old videos. Who? Uh, Pe uh, Peach Cobbler. Really? Yeah, he said it on Twitter the other day that he really doesn't like most of the stuff he's made at this point, which I found kind of surprising. Just speaking of Twitter. That, oh, that's one of those, like, stereotypical... Uh... Oh, no, I hate my old videos sentiments. <laughs> To be fair, though, every time I look at one of my old videos... I really don't start liking my videos until probably Mass Effect 2. This is why it's important for new, con new YouTubers to start with small, shorter videos, so that you can work that out. Yeah. I recommend that as well. I always get worried when, like, people tell me, like, I watched your video and I got really inspired, so now I'm, like, now, now I'm, I'm working, working on my it. own 36-hour-long project, and it's like, Jesus, don't do that. Yeah. See, I did, I did it with Oblivion for several reasons, but my main thing was, I was like, well, I should pick a game that I can talk a lot about, and I can mm -hmm. talk a lot about Oblivion, right? So, yeah. you know, it's a strategy, sure, but... You want to read Acer Thorn's comment on the last stream? Where is it? I will um, uh, send it to you. Am um, I read it out loud, or...? Yeah, go ahead. You don't have to actually change in order to undergo a character arc. Some of the best character arcs in history are from characters who refuse to change. One of my personal favorites is from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> when Charlie is deprived of his lifetime supply of chocolate. Sorry. Grandpa Joe decides <laughs> they're going to end. Fuck. It's late, bro. Got the giggles now. They're going to hand the everlasting gobstopper to Slugworth. This is got to just... performance art. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like genuinely trying. Charlie has the opportunity for change uh, to become obsessed with revenge, but he refuses to go down that path. That is his character arc. So as you can see... <laughs> Just from that one example, character arcs don't require actual change. They just require opportunity for change. Opportunity Whether the in all caps. Takes that opportunity or not, or not is what tells us the audience who that character is and what kind of stuff he's made of. Right. So, um. I guess let's uh, kind of address. Let's let's kind of broach his thesis here, um, <laughs> or like you don't have to undergo an arc. You don't have to undergo change to undergo a character arc. Let's start with the basics of what shape do you think an arc <laughs> is? That's that's my immediate question. An arc is. A curvature, a curved line between two points, a start point and an end point. That's why they call it a character arc. It starts and it ends. If a character doesn't change, it's just one point. Or a line. Yeah, and like, so a bad character is typically one that starts at one point and ends at another point and just continues down a straight line. Now, there are places for that, like minor yeah. characters, secondary characters. Not every character in a story has to undergo an arc <clears throat> or has to... Um, yeah, not every character has to undergo an arc. Some characters exist uh, for the purpose of just being static, that they represent yeah, something. Flat, flat characters and... Uh... What is the other one? Dynamic characters? Yeah, so... Like... 
round characters. That's what it is. As far as his example, like it, it's kind of hard to take seriously. Like, is that really the one that you want to pick? Like, I think he was talking about like Isron when it came to talking about character arcs. Like, don't get me wrong. I appreciate that. Like, um, of all the ways that he could have responded, that uh, he didn't like. He didn't freak out. He didn't, like, take to YouTube and, like, make a hasty response video calling me a lying sack of shit. Um, <clears throat> I'm also glad, like, YouTube cut, like, four minutes of the last stream off, but thankfully that those four minutes did not include the part where I was, like, I feel bad for him. And I think that uh, the best thing for him is to just kind of focus on improving himself as a content creator and not, like, trying to deal with uh, the baggage of all his bad takes. There's, there's always a, there's always a redemption arc for anybody. You can always but, change. But yeah, it's improve. like, okay, you can make the case that like Isran undergoes a character arc because he starts by calling East. He he starts by like dehumanizing Serana, and by the end he like does very basic things to recognize that she deserves some respect, that she is still a person even if she is an inhuman vampire, but like that's not very good like if the extent of your character arc is that you become a smidge more tolerant then like that that's very that's very basic especially compared to like what other games will do in is terms there, of character difference is there any characters that really have any serious development in skyrim well, yeah, no, that's the thing. Like, as some someone pointed out, like, Carlia's arc is that she figures, I'm just going to kill him. You know what I mean? Like, pretty yeah. much every Skyrim character is extremely <clears throat> static. Or their arc is just a right angle upwards to their end point. You know, there's no curvature. It's just... There's a change, but it's not necessarily a particularly complex one. It it changed when the quest stage progressed, is basically it. Like yeah. It's, it, it's a flag that got hit. I really am trying to think of, like, my time with Skyrim. I'm going through, like, all my memories. Like, is there an instance where a character undergoes an arc? And I think we said it yesterday, like, Vilkus from the Companions might, maybe. Be, the, might be the only instance. And like Maybe Jarl Bulgriff? I wouldn't even say that. I, I don't know, man. Like, I'm trying. I'm really trying to... It's not Delphine, not Esbern. Like I'm trying to come up with the cat, like recurring characters. That's where I'm mm -hmm. starting because that, they're gonna have, they're gonna have the, the most, most opportunity. opportunity. Yep. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe you can make the argument for Aran Gear. Not really. I mean, the only change that happens to him is like. And the thing is, we're quantifying <clears throat> character arcs as just they have, like, a shift in perspective. Yeah. When it's it's more complex than that. I'm I'm trying to be we're, as generous as possible. A character arc involves, like, a growth in character. So an example yeah. I would give would be, like, in Cyberpunk 2077, Johnny Silverhand. A lot of his, like, perspective kind of changes over the course of his interactions with V... Um, he starts very extremely hostile towards him and he almost views like he almost views V as like a, a massive pussy and like somebody that he just could not engage with. But yeah. like over time you see kind of a shift in his perspective. He still sticks to his core values, but there are definitely things about his philosophy that he doesn't really hold to anymore by the end of the game. That is a that is an inhumane comparison. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. That's like the Dark Souls comparison of <laughs> uh, of character arcs. If there would be character arcs, it would have to be in the DLCs, right? 
Serana, I guess, yeah. Because, I mean, she has to, like, overcome her apprehension of, like, she has to, like, deal with her father, basically. Yeah. And even then, that's extremely weak stuff. Like, there's a reason that fucking Acer Thorn's example came from Dawnguard. I'm trying to think of Fallout 4 examples. I mean, I think the companions can, right? It's been so long since I've played the companions, I honestly cannot confirm or deny. Well, I mean, like, um, no, like the followers in Fallout 4. Oh, yeah. That's uh, probably... Like, um, I'm thinking of, like, the, the ginger lady. Oh, uh... Yeah, yeah, she was, like, a raider or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I ever even picked her up. There's a lot of Fallout 4 I've not touched. Yeah, because she, like, dislikes basically every reasonable choice. Because she's, like, a morally bad character. Um, well, okay, let's cut this the other way. Is, are there character arcs in Fallout 3, or Oblivion, or Morrowind? Alright, so, Fallout 3. Bad? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. I can't remember characters from Fallout 3. There's not many. Your friend from the vault? Amada, yeah, you know what? Yeah, she would. She probably she has a character arc. If you go back and do the quest, um, trouble on the home front. So, like, she has a very easy, easily missable character arc. Yeah. I think the, I think there are character arcs in Far Harbor, like uh, Dima. Yeah, I only played Far Harbor once, so I can't really. I'm yeah. Well, I'm basing that off of Joseph Anderson's analysis. Yeah. Oh yeah, we mentioned Martin yesterday as having a character arc. Oh so... yeah. It, because he absolutely does. Like, yeah. That's definitely not one he wins on a technicality. And it's a pretty. It's a decent. It's a decent arc. I like it. Because it's not it's not like a flag got hit. You, you see the progression over time. Yeah, it's not one of those right angle character arcs that so many Bethesda characters have. Yeah. It's actually something that like you can t each time you talk to him, you can see the shift in his perspective. I I don't I think that. A lot of people are being extremely generous with their interpretations of what character arcs are. Character arcs are not a single moment in the story where, like, someone's motivation changes slightly. Lucy and the Chance. Hmm. There's too few scenes with Lucian. Sheogorath. Yeah, Sh yeah Sheogorath. Yeah, that one works. Let's see. Nothing from Knights of the Nine. What about... Okay, so we did Dawnguard. Dragonborn, let's see. I'm gonna say no on Dragonborn. Tribunal, I'm gonna say. Almalexia kind of has some stuff going on with Tribunal.
If we're talking about Elder Scrolls games only or any Bethesda game, well, we included the Fallout games in this, so. Doesn't Shea Gorath become a whole new character? Does that count as an arc? Um, well, I do think, no, there's like a, it's more gradual than that. It's not like, it's not really like a, a switch flips where he's suddenly like despondent and like, I think there are shades to it. The half orc vampire in in the arena. I know that's a spot. That's a binary switch. <laughs> That's definitely a right angle arc. You get to see Kellogg's character arc in his brain. Oh yeah, the the big wasted opportunity of uh -huh. Kellogg having a way more interesting story than anything else that was going on in Fallout 4. Well yeah, that's why I'm saying it really doesn't count. But also, by the way, an arc happening in a, in a flashback does not invalidate it as a character arc. Or in some kind of like past sequences. It just has to happen in a story. The Skull Chief's daughter no. from Dragonborn. That's That felt like a flag to me more than anything else. Yeah, that was definitely... Uh... And that's literally just, you betrayed my father. Yeah. player is the only one with an arc the whole game is meant to revolve around you kellogg I mean, kellogg would be an absolutely awesome companion to have like can you actually imagine that like you um, could convince him not even you could convince him but that like he could convince you to take him on because like maybe there's another step to finding the institute and he would be a big help but you would have to overcome like the fact that he murdered your spouse yeah and then like you would deal with him and so if you don't kill Kellogg, dealing with him as a companion could like also reveal a lot of the same information. That'd be pretty cool. But I'll at the same time, I had no, absolutely no attachment to my spouse, so I would probably pick him every single time. Yeah, but I mean, if I'm role playing a character and the character's established to have an attachment to their spouse, which you are in Fallout 4, then... Yeah. Um... Then does Alduin have a character arc? Does Alduin have a character? Father from Fallout 4. I thought about it, and I thought to myself, no, <laughs> not really. Because there's not really anything going on with Father. Butch from Fallout 3. Yeah, I guess he would fall into the same... If if I'm willing to say Amada has an arc, then I would have to... I'd be obliged, obliged to say Butch yeah. has one as well. Uh, it's really Fresh. sad that this is extremely, um... <laughs> this is a real brain this buster. Is, yeah, this is really a low bar. <laughs> like, Martin, I'm gonna stand by it. Martin is probably one of the best characters that Bethesda ever did. In any, At least from in the game, any of their games. In the games that I've played. I would, I would agree with that assessment. Well, I'm just gonna say, Morrowind doesn't exactly have a whole lot of character stuff going on. Yeah, but what about Daggerfall or Arena? Yeah, or those, Battles yeah those don't really have character stuff going on either. <laughs> like, it's interesting that it really isn't part of the formula and how that kind of differs from other styles of RPGs. Like, um, like, you definitely can say about, like, a Mass Effect that that character is important. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's Bioware's greatest strength, is their ability to write characters.
Yeah, that's definitely what I'm saying. Like, it's ex all of the proposals that have been, most of the proposals that have been issued in chat have been extremely generous. Regret is not a character arc. Regret is just a trait of a person. If a person comes to regret something, then that is an arc. But your Yule Septum starts with regret. So, there you go. Yeah. Character and story isn't important in Bethesda games. Yeah, that's pretty much the uh, crux of the whole thing. It's about the, the story that you, the player, write. Mm -hmm. It's your character arc. Which is Which a cop I'm, out. I don't know. Because I play Valheim, and that game has the virtually no story. Is emergent. Yeah. Oh, that. I don't like that. Don't like that term too much. But there is something to be said about just being able to run around a world, role playing, like playing in my head. I don't know if. Skyrim in particular effectively nails that, but I like that um Serana will ask you about your family and you can't tell her about your spouse. <laughs> and he's like, you can't tell her about your spouse, you can't tell her about your adopted kids, so it's like, what about you? <laughs> Do you have any family? And it's like, yeah, I'm married and I adopted two kids. And I have a pet goat that I love very dearly. Mm -hmm. And I have a bunch of factions that I'm the leader of. That I formed camaraderie with. Skyrim is my family. Yeah, um, no shit. The comparison is unfair. That's like the point. Is like that's just one more tally on why like Witcher Three comparisons are dumb, which I never understood anyways because Witcher Two is contemporary, but I guess that's not the popular one. Witcher Two is the the forgotten one. People like to talk about how dated the Witcher One is and how great Witcher Three is, but nobody ever talks about Witcher Two. Uh, people don't like transitionary periods. What Elder Scrolls game will be lost to time in like 15 years? When they release like two, two more Elder Scrolls games, which one's going to be the forgotten one? Skyrim. No. Is it really Skyrim? <laughs> um... It's not Oblivion. It's. Are you? Sh I don't know. I think that would be my choice. It would be Oblivion. There's too many people attached to it, like in terms of um, its popularity as a 360 title. What game has the most? What game has the least uh, videos on YouTube? That's gonna be the one that gets forgotten. Oblivion. I would say. And there you go. Hey, I'm seeing I'm seeing some oblivions in here. A battle spot. I mean, well, let's yeah. Well, of let's course. Put, anything that doesn't let's have filter a those out. Title. Yeah. Like, uh, let's what about Shadow out. Key? I would already say Daggerfall and Arena already forgotten. So yeah, I don't buy this. Pretty much, Serana asks you about your wife that deal she asks about your family or she asks about your parents
which is like that's why I bring it up is she'll ask about your parents um, even though the discussions about family oh somebody mentioned blades I just installed blades on my phone I'm gonna start playing that when I'm on the toilet <laughs> When I show up to Truly class, early. a fitting place for Elder Scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> when I don't feel like getting out of bed in the morning, it might it might give me some talking points for Skyrim. Who knows? I mean, I'm sure it does. I'm not. I'm still not going to play it. <laughs> um. Did you know in Blades, um, the Emperor asks the player character to take to pretend to be him during the battle at Red Ring Road? They just completely assassinated the character of Titus Mead II in Blades. So, like, it's really confusing to me because, like, one of the big reasons that it would seem like he's so stoic when you encounter him is because like yeah he's a badass he literally fought in the war but I guess Blades is like no nah, that didn't actually happen he's wait so they oh oh so they send the player character out and he basically dodges going to the battle is what you're saying yeah okay he just takes credit for the shit the player character did in Blades oh that is a interesting recharacterization. I feel like it's like okay, there's so little going on with fucking Titus Me the Second that like you can't take that away from him. You can't take the one thing he had going for him. Like, yeah, wow, I guess he really did deserve to die. Like why Maybe was they're... he why was he so brave in the face of death then? Maybe they're trying to overcompensate for Uriel Septon, where he did so much shit during his life They're like yeah we can't have another super god emperor like that again but i mean like titus me the second was approachable as like a more realistic empire emperor because he's only got one thing to his name which is the great war yeah thought it was in the card game you got swapped with the emperor i don't know i don't care oh yeah it is the card game it's not blades oh, i'm not installing that yeah, I'm sorry. So I didn't spoil Blades for you because it's in the card game. But still, <laughs> this is this is this is the lore that they're trying to to pass off. Like again, it does not make sense to me that someone who would be willing to take credit for someone else's work in a war is like stoic in the face of death. They don't need to lionize every emperor. Yeah, except you don't really get to be emperor in Elder Scrolls and not be somewhat of a badass. Or you're going to get Joffreyed, you know. I can't wait to become emperor in Elder Scrolls 6. We heard a lot of players' criticisms that, that you could not become the High King of Skyrim. <laughs> People really liked the um, Yes Man option in Fallout New Vegas, so... I wouldn't be surprised. You... <laughs> that that's the logical conclusion of becoming the leader of everything, is becoming the leader of literally everything. Yeah, now you can, now you can yeet the throne. Mm-hmm. So it's like the king effect of, um, it seems like he's a badass character, but like, it's just everybody misinterpreting his fear because it's like, makes him freeze up and it seems like he's being a badass in the face of death. <laughs> he gets the fluoride stare when something bad goes down. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> damn, this guy has to know what's going on. Like, 
<laughs> this guy could fuck me up. Look at his stance. He's completely <laughs> undefended. He's probably he's probably so fucking fast that I would be dead if I even like moved towards him. But yeah, that's like legit King's character in One Punch Man. Which I guess is technically a spoiler, but like I don't know, it's a very minor kind of deal like There's not really a big ramp up to like there's not like it's not like One Punch Man like spends a lot of time going King's going to be this badass character and then it like the twist happens. Maybe because he was a coward in the Great War and wanted to face his death with courage to gain some honor before he dies. Sounds like That's, sounds like cope to me. Sounds like a I would believe that if he was Nord. Yeah, but... I, I think that um I definitely think that like in this instance, uh this is just a retcon of them of them taking a character that was in Skyrim and like I don't know. There's not a lot of ways you could like recontextualize him where the history books would not include this fucking player character from a card game. Because, of course, the history books have to account for the players. They're just such badasses. Become emperor, get petty tasks from your advisor, and have no power. Yeah, it would be funny. It would be almost like be commentary. Niles. It would be co total commentary if, like, you became the emperor and, like, you were like, it's just, you are a puppet of like the true power of Tariel. Oh, yeah. Well, you have no formal training in the yeah. arts of statescraft. So yeah, that's, we, that's your trusted That's counsel. definitely something Emil Pagliarulo would do. <laughs> Acer Thorn has a video titled Fallout 4 is the same as the Wizard of Oz. In what regard? <laughs> like you can't just well, you can't just say shit like that. <laughs> well, there's a dog. Um. Oh yeah, there's a long pursuit to the Emerald City. That yeah. Roads aren't yellow though. If you cut anything down deep enough. <laughs> you get reductive enough. If you're disingenuous enough. Well, we can interpret the bombs falling like... Yeah, that's oh, the tornado. No. That's oh, the tornado. no. I'm, so, I'm starting to see the logic here. So, yeah, the tornado hits. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up and mm -hmm. you're in a new new world. Yes, I'm with you so far. Um, okay, what's the so, Wicked Witch? That has to be Kellogg, right? Yeah, because he's an instigator. And then, like, he gets killed by your awakening. So Kellogg is the Wicked Witch. And Who's then... the Tin Man? Oh, Dan's! Paladin Dan's is a Tin Man! Yeah, literally. <laughs> Who's the Scarecrow? Nick Valentine? Okay, wait, no, no, no. So, the Scarecrow needed a brain. Um... So, who's really dumb? Yeah, like, well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that. And then the Lion needed a heart. I can see the logic. I'm going to have to watch this video now. And then, uh, well, the big com point of comparison is, did the production of Fallout 4, like, get a bunch of people killed and hurt? And... His father, the Wizard of Oz. Was massively yeah, I unethical. Would... Hey, boys and girls. I would say that. Yeah, father's definitely the Wizard of Oz. Because he seems like a big deal, and then you get behind the curtain. And he's your son. How long did it take for you to figure out that plot twist was coming? What? That father was the... Well, okay, so I had it spoiled for me by the Joseph uh, Anderson video. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, oh, and also, um, 
I was part of the Boston Tea Party, and we were spreading spoilers for the game. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I was spoiled basically from day one that that father that that father was your son. Um, even without that, it's like I don't know. It felt obvious that, like, yeah, of course, time has passed since then. Because it, it like it just seems like time has passed in the vault. And I think like your first conversation with uh Woodsworth or whatever his name is kind of passed kind of makes it obvious that like it wasn't recent. I'm trying to think like um what what's a good Acer Thorn video? Got one person in chat who said they didn't see the twist coming. I'm sure I it's pretty possible. Much, I pretty much figured it out by the time I got to the institute. I knew something was up. I'm trying to remember I, the flow of the quest. What happens between Kellogg and you get into the institute you relive his memories yeah so you relive his memories and you realize you have to get like the courser chip and then you have to have oh, some no, gold you have the, you find the cigar and then dog meat tracks no 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 fuck yeah that's to get to Kellogg wait didn't you relive someone's memory to get to that part or did you just search his apartment no no you just search his apartment okay, and find so the cigar and they're like, well, we'll just use dog meat to... You recreate his memory, them. and then... You, oh, yeah, because you see the courser, and then you have to go after the courser chip, build the teleporter, and then you show up at the Institute. Yeah, pretty much. I don't know. I really hate the idea that, like, twists are a good thing. Yeah, I don't think all stories need a twist. You don't need to subvert my expectations. Sometimes there is value in just doing something very well. If you can make the audience feel something, you've pretty much accomplished about, I'd say, 70% of the work. Mm -hmm. If you can make them feel something and think something, congratulations. That's like 90%. Uh, we could... Uh, well, hang on. How would that work? I'd have to set up a third browser um we could like read some comments from my channel or if you've got some interesting comments too what chat comments on my channel mm -hmm. i don't know i usually don't really look at my comments all that often what no you can't say that i read every comment <laughs> So I, I put it like this. Would you rather me spend an hour every day responding to random comments? Or would you rather that hour be spent working on a new video? I feel like at some point you have to respond to comments. I respond for like a week or so on a new video. Which is kind of the default a lot of YouTubers do. Yeah. Push that, that that's probably where That's probably where, well, and that's also probably where like most of the actual discourse happens. Yeah. Well, the other problem, too, is, like, after I've worked on a video for 200-plus hours, I don't really have much desire to be talking about it. Mm-hmm. You just want to be a preacher. <laughs> yeah. Get on my soapbox so I can start talking politics. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. Hey, boys and girls. Let's talk about Ukraine. I probably shouldn't even fucking mention that. It's probably a trigger word at this point for uh I think you said YouTube. I think you said uh COVID earlier. Oh shit, did I? Mm -hmm. I, I hope like not. Like early in the stream too, so like Yeah, you you damned us. Oh wait, the videos aren't monetized though, right? Yeah, but that can still affect the rate at which they get recommended. Uh... He says like I don't give a fuck. Not my channel.
Thoughts on the worst Bethesda theory that Fallout is the past of Elder Scrolls and that magic is the radiation because magic exists in the Fallout world? Yeah, I, I hear shit like that. I, I I think I mentioned that in like the comment of my Dishonored 2 video about how there's like there's a theory that like all of the games under the Bethesda umbrella are connected, which for some reason includes our like Dishonored. Um personally I think that's an act of high cringe and you should probably like I don't know. I'm not gonna tell you to kill yourself. I'm not even gonna allude that you should kill yourself, but you should definitely pursue some kind of help. You should probably start experiencing other franchises and other forms of entertainment. Yeah, it, I think we should both. If you're start, thinking, if, yeah, we should both start seeing other men. <laughs> if you're thinking that hard about a certain franchise or a group mm. of media or a studio or something, you probably should start branching out. It stems from a Nern root in Fallout 4 and the magic from Fallout 2. There wasn't there magic in one of the Fallout 4 DLCs? There was a guy who like literally just had the ability to teleport. Which, oh. Which there yeah. are, there's some Skyrim bosses that have that ability too. The uh Periyte quest boss comes to mind. Yeah, there's like somebody in Far Harbor who uh like can tell like telepathically communicate or something like that. Yeah, that too. I always I definitely hate the radiation is magic shit that um they try to do. Like I don't know, it's like if you want to tell stories about magic, you have a fucking franchise about that. Yeah. I feel like Fallout is the opportunity to like do stuff that you can't really do with Elder Scrolls, and Elder Scrolls is an opportunity to do stuff you can't do with Fallout. Like that's the brilliance of alternating the games. And then like Starfield can enter a new dynamic because like, you know, like space is such a cool place for Bethesda to want to go. You have to at least applaud that they're doing something new. It would be very easy for them to like just go. Yep, we're just going to make Elder Scrolls 6 mm. and make a shit ton of money. It it is a risk for them to make Starfield. Yeah. Can you imagine Fresh. if Starfield fails? Yeah, that's right, not going to be good. In fairness, what is failure anymore? Like I don't believe for a second that Cyberpunk was actually a failure. I would have to look at the their PNLs. Yeah. I mean like their stock tanked, but that yes, doesn't mean that much. Snapchat's stock tanked. That shit happens all the time. Yeah, I People bought put... I bought ten dollars of Roblox at eighty dollars and now it's at like sixty five, so you know, it happens. Oh wow, did it really dip? I think I had bought a bought a peak. Yeah. That's alright, tech's going down in general right now. Oh yeah, the day of reckoning. Damn, we shouldn't have leveraged all of our money into technology companies that like don't really have reliable products. Tang tangible value fun based on fundamentals. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, I there's some really good ideas out there, but, like, investing in companies that have products is fucking stupid. Invest in promises, not products. Damn, I could sell that line. <laughs> like, I could be a, a hype man. Gotta invest in promises, not products. You sound like you're ready to start a venture capitalist mm -hmm. investment group. Time to get to Silicon Valley. Cyberpunk people said it that it already recouped the dev coughs, if I recall correctly. Um, 
if they specify development costs, that could be by implication saying that they didn't pay for marketing. And I can only imagine they spent a lot of money on marketing. Yeah, there's definitely like the issue with the merging shit is that there are, are there are uh antitrust issues with it. Yeah. That's why uh Microsoft just came out, I think yesterday, and said that they still intend on releasing a lot of Activision games on PlayStation. Because they're probably getting pushback from the FTC, so they wanna yeah, mitigate like, those concerns. It's gonna go through. The issue is um Microsoft should and shouldn't have been able to have a games division and also be uh, the develop the the creators of Xbox. Basically, there are arguments for and against that being the case. Like, obviously, you know, it's one thing if like you want to produce a couple titles that like are designed to sell your system, like a like a Mario Brothers and a Zelda and what have you, like. First-party development to sell consoles, there's nothing particularly wrong with that. But when the first-party development includes, like, in of itself, billions of dollars of, like, a multitude of different studios, and, like, you know, tens of thousands of developers, then there starts to be an issue. Especially when you're just, like, gobbling up the industry. Yeah. Well, what they're probably aiming to do is pull a, um, pull an apple where they can have a nice walled garden for themselves yeah this is why this is why i said microsoft is literally like the most bipolar publisher in the industry like it was not that long ago that microsoft was doing good things and was like we're gonna start putting our games on steam and it's like wow cool microsoft it was, being it was chill. literally like six months ago <laughs> and it's like okay they made the bethesda acquisition and it's like um Okay, well, that in of itself's not bad. You know, mergers happen. It happens. And, Activision and, and Blizzard merged, and they and they always had a good working relationship and stuff too. It yeah, seemed like a pretty. It seemed, it natural... seemed like a marriage was going to be something that was in in the cards for for them, yeah. right? And then the Activision thing went through, and it's just like, okay, hold up. Okay, a uh, yeah, hold up. Um, eighty billion dollars. There's. Sixty-eight point seven billion dollars yeah, in ins- cash. It was some insane amount of money, and um, it's like they bought a company that has like basically six franchises. Yeah, and it's like, Al- albeit they are very profitable franchises, mm-hmm. but that's an investment that's going to take at least a decade to pay off, if not longer. So when you look at it from that perspective, it's like. Oh, okay, so they're just trying to buy them out to hedge out competition. This isn't exactly a... Mm-hmm. Microsoft is not known for the long plays when it comes to uh, profit. Yeah. When it comes to, like, invest... They don't, they don't invest money into a company to, like, build it up. Let's just put it that way. That's not their M.O. Yeah, and I don't know. It's just like seventy billion dollars is definitely overvalued for Activision, in my opinion. Regardless of like how consistent their su- their successes so far has be- has been, is not yeah. indicative of future successes. And there's definitely some warning signs that like there are some fundamental management issues going on at Activision Blizzard. And it's not I think they're gonna. That, it's not something that I... an investigation is going to fix. I think they're going to purge most of the management team there. That's why it was a cash deal. Because they can just be like, all right, all right, Kodak, here's your fucking $800 million. Yeah, you, find, find, you fucking lich. Get out. <laughs> Finally, get out of our lives. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like I think the only just... that's the only benefit is like Bobby Kodak's probably gone. Yeah. He'll he'll still he'll stick around to oversee the merger, but like do you, really, is, do you really think 10 years is pessimistic for a return on investment on an 80 on a 70 billion dollar acquisition that would imply that blizzard is able to generate more than seven billion dollars a year yeah they i mean they a, have they make a lot of money but like look what do they have 
they have an MMO that is diminishing in population every year that hasn't had a yeah. major content up that hasn't had an expansion in two years, right? You have Overwatch, which has been on the downtrend. It's got more competition than ever. It's got less people playing it. Hell, there's less porn of it than than there has been like in past years, right? Um, you've got StarCraft, which has not had anything going on with it in a long time. I'm not sure if it's even has an esports scene, like a considerable esports scene. You have Call of Duty. Honestly, okay, hang on. You got Diablo 2, and there's stuff, there is stuff that's going on with Diablo, but I don't necessarily, like, I'm not I don't certain think that's a high is, prop. It's that's not, not a high a profit thing because I'm not, yeah. it's like the least monetized Blizzard product. Yeah, and the, and the main, um, audience of of that franchise isn't really going to they're not the type to be dropping shit tons of money in like microtransactions and stuff mm -hmm. I mean, i'm sure it's got its whales but it's not going to be as lucrative as call of duty yeah okay and then you have like heroes of the storm okay moving on um <laughs> then you got activision activision is bringing stuff to the table but honestly the only active thing that they have going on is literally call of duty yeah like, what else does Activision do on a semi-regular basis? Like, I've seen... Less and less I've seen their names on the bumpers of games. I think they did Sekiro. If I remember right, they did a publishing deal on that. Yeah, people are saying Candy Crush and stuff, which is... That's probably a large part of the valuation. So that's who owns Candy Crush is Activision Blizzard? Yeah. Okay, so... They own... What is that? King? I think that would be a big acquisition because I don't I don't see that market being like that market and has it, extremely low bars something serious would have to happen yeah for it to be thrown. and Microsoft Microsoft doesn't really have a major um phone market yeah or a major um mobile development market yet or anything like that um call of duty has been on the downturn like the latest release as far as i was aware was like a yeah flop. yeah that one um, just did not did not meet sales expectations it doesn't activision hold tra the transformers game rights i think that's something they have but yeah like activision used to be all over the place and they really diminished into we're going to be a one trick pony on like franchises that work. But like, I don't know, with all that, 70 billion dollars still feels like like um Activision got a lot out of it. Yeah, it's what it the power of it will be to put their catalog onto game pass which i still don't understand how microsoft makes money off of that but apparently it's big i don't know if it's big or if they're it's just popular. continuing to invest into it yeah it, it might be like we we project uh progress yeah. in the future kind of deal i don't I, I don't i've never really engaged with game pass so i'm not certain like what I'm what's just... the monetization practice of it you pay for a membership and yeah you can get all the games on game pass i feel like you would lose money on that it, it's got to be we're putting money it's, we're putting money into it's it a because good we value think it's, for the player it's games but... netflix it, that's got to be it it's the yeah. next netflix that's that's what i can imagine it being and them trying to sell it to investors that way it has to be like a it has to be something to push their stock value that's why they always bring it up during like earnings calls and stuff but netflix is barely a profitable venture the only thing that held netflix up yeah. was that they started doing their own productions yeah that's the funny thing too is a lot of companies are trying to ape like you know how they tried to co how microsoft tried to copy twitch and it's like yeah but twitch wasn't even profitable 
it's strange. The whole the whole big tech Silicon Valley, the business strategies make no sense, which is why I always make fun of it. Yeah, it's clown. No, there's absolutely clown logic that goes on with uh, like tech company investments. It's like 70 chess. Like you need to be fucking snorting Adderall and reading white papers nonstop for it to start making sense. You have to be an algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> the algorithm is just like reading news articles and it's like Microsoft, Microsoft, Microsoft. Like, like that's literally what goes on is they just, uh, they pay to have their names pumped in the news so the algorithms pick them up. Yeah. Oh shit, sounds like GM. See, this is, this is the part about the games industry that I like. I like talking about the business side. Well, okay, so it's like, Netflix still exists despite the fact that almost universally the words uh, Netflix original is a sign that the movie that, that whatever you're about to watch is going to be mediocre at best right hey D daredevil was okay so, <laughs> yeah so it's like um house I, of cards i don't remember that netflix is something that's held up almost entirely by like morons who think that like it's a good business microsoft oh. is trying to change how we consume games from buying them to a subscription service Yes, what I'm unclear on is how exactly that's a profitable venture, especially, like, they bought Call of Duty. Call of Duty's big issue in recent years is that their fucking game sizes are, like, 200 gigs. So it's like, how exactly is it a profitable venture just to um, let someone pay whatever a Game Pass subscription is and download 200 gigabytes off of your service? Well, I'm thinking of it from, like, the perspective of an end user. If I'm downloading a 200 gig game, there's no fucking way I'm downloading. Oh, huh. Hold on. Maybe that's the 4D chess here. They're switching you get to a bunch streaming? Of, get a bunch of... No, no, no. You get a bunch of games that are really big. Mm -hmm. Like, physically big. So it deters people from deleting them and downloading more games. Oh, you just so, figured that out? Because because you have to then pay less licensing fees yeah that's literally a, been a known thing on on the console market because consoles are like stuck with very like I, if you only have 500 gigs of space there's literally like i can only have four games on my console yeah so and especially since everything has to be downloaded like no that's absolutely a thing that's been going on in the last five years Game Pass subscribers spend more money on games that are more open to trying new genres. Wait, what do you mean spend money on games? I thought they got the games as that was what you paid $10 a month for. Maybe it's they're more willing to buy microtransactions in the games because they didn't have to pay for the game itself. Okay, but for that to be a profitable venture in of itself, Microsoft would just have to own everything. Yeah, they would have to be taking a cut. Yeah, it's like, man, it just seems like, it just seems wild to me. And it would be a less, it would be a less vis risky venture if Microsoft wasn't, you know, signing checks to the order of uh, two, di two digit billions. It's, that's insanity to me. I remember I got into a discussion with somebody and they were like, Sony should be buying out more more like uh, studios and stuff. I'm like, Sony doesn't have the money to do it. Yeah. Just look at, you just look at their market evaluation. Ma mm -hmm. Microsoft is, Microsoft literally has money cheats. And then they didn't even do the deal in fuck. They did it in cash. I can't believe they had that much money and just cash reserves to just be like, yeah, we're just going to drop this. No problem. Yeah. Which really shows the commitment on Microsoft's part. Like they really believe in gaming at this point. Well, and I think Microsoft is also probably terrified of, like, debt. Like, the last thing they want to do is, like, hamper their valuation by taking on a shit ton of debt just to acquire Activision. Yeah. Like, that would be a bad deal. So, it's like, it might not have been able to go through without it being a cash transaction. That is, yeah, that's that's actually a good point, because if it takes a while for them to recoup that, that investment, that would be mm -hmm. a big black mark on their books for a while and debt does that that does hurt 
companies investors don't care as much about cash especially reserves. like let's say let's say it's like a 50 billion dollar transaction if they take on debt that's still a big yeah a big like valuation issue i just i just find it interesting that microsoft just suddenly woke up like whoa hold on we can just own this entire industry now I don't think it's that they suddenly woke up. I think Microsoft was probably watching Epic Game Store and seeing like how big a splash a company like that can make. And then like like they could probably just look at the financials of Epic and then say, "All right, this is exactly the amount of money we would need to have have the same impact except proportionally a thousand times larger." Yeah. Was Epic Game Store a success? That's a good question. They have to keep giving away games in order for people to even look at their platform right now, so... Mm -hmm. I think that people were so opposed to the timed exclusivity deal that, um... That they literally do have to be baited with free shit. Yeah. I just wish I could be in those boardrooms and hearing what their comparisons are. Like, what are their benchmarks? Who are they trying to copy? Who do they want to be? It's definitely got to be, like, Netflix and Steam. Yeah. Is what they're looking at. Because, I, I mean, like, again, Netflix is, like, to a very dumb degree, an extremely influential company. Even though the fact well, is, I mean, they're just a production house. It killed Blockbuster. That doesn't matter. Retails die all the time. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta think from a boomer's perspective. Mm -hmm. And then you think of the body count Amazon stacks, and it's just like Jesus Christ. <laughs> But that's why Amazon can. That's why Amazon stock is worth two thousand something dollars a share. Yeah, the, that's a huge body count. Yeah, Amazon definitely killed a lot. I'm trying to think. Like you, the only way Amazon loses is an antitrust, which they do deserve to get hit with. I think Amazon loses just from their horrible mismanagement. That company has, I like to use the example, they have way too much money and way too leadership, way too little of leadership. Mm -hmm. Like I could see them totally just making just a long string of really bad investments that they do on debt. And then that just adversely affects their share prices and then just all goes down the hill. But if, you know, Jeff Bezos leaving didn't hurt them too badly, eh, who knows? Well, and is there a bigger joke than the Amazon Games Division? Oh, God. <laughs> but that's another company. It's like, they could just come in and just start buying shit. And that's what that's what I think Microsoft was also afraid of, was somebody like Netflix or Disney or Amazon coming in and just buying shit. Oh, yeah, that is a thing. Like, like I think those companies were looking at the industry, like, trying to figure out... I, I, I still think they... expand into it, because I... I I think games are bigger than movies. Yeah. At this well, I mean, point. we saw it. We saw it with the pandemic. People can play games from home. You know, can't really go to the movies. Yeah, like while the film industry was having difficulty transitioning to like a home streaming pla model, the gaming industry was already there. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I've heard the thing before that Amazon's going to run out of employees. I don't necessarily believe that. Nah, because Amazon is still, like, the place to go if you want. I mean, maybe, like, I could see warehouse workers kind of drying up, but then they just need them more money. Pick up, pick up like, roots and nah. plant the distribution center in a, over a, a town over. Yeah. Um, And then in terms of, like, their... Uh, corporate side amazon is still like such a great place for a resume you go there for like a couple years you're going to get hired anywhere yeah with that type of experience so yeah they can be a terrible fucking place to work for but it's still a great resume 
Yeah, I guess unions are one way that these big corporations could have issues. Oh man, I wish. That that would be good to see, and that is like one area. Uh, like, I support unions insofar as like, if the government's not gonna trust bust, then the unions have to. Yeah. Like we'll we'll do it guerrilla style then, because it's like. One thing is like, if um, everything kind of congeals into Microsoft, I feel like there's a lot of developers that, um, if if it was managed, if it continued to be managed poorly, would just leave, and just start new companies. And then it would be yep. almost it would almost like start it, it. You could actually like kickstart an era of like, oh, you were you're a corpo game developer. Yeah. Like, what do we care about Elder Scrolls 6, you know? That would be cool to see. I mean, you, you kind of have it with films already where, you know, you have a whole... the art house scene, and then you have the big budget, like, um, Hollywood stuff. Yeah, I, I think as, like... Yeah, because, I mean, like, we're probably, like, in a similar position to film in the 70s where like you know it seems really despondent but at the same time there's like a generation of people coming up that are like going to pave the way for a transformative new era of filmmaking i think at the 2019 game awards jeff said that the gaming industry does make more money than movie and tv which is surprising until you realize mobile gaming is why See, the thing is is if i'm an investor it's not just about who's making the most money, but what's the better, more consistent investments? So what I want to know is, what is a better investment? What is a more consistent investment? Putting it into the games industry, putting it into television, putting it into movies? Like, mm -hmm. there's different as like, aspects to investment. Like, like, yeah, it's not the smartest thing to just invest in the biggest company, because then you would just put yeah. all your money on Apple. Um... Yeah, it's, it is distressing, but sometimes you go look at the Amazon union busting video. Doesn't Amazon, like, spark racial tension in their workers to try and, like, break union uh, worker solidarity? Yeah, there's been, there's been a lot of crazy accusations thrown on Amazon. I have no idea. Like, how true they are they've observed the same thing that uh the ussr observed which was that unit cohesion in units that had uh east russian and west russians were really bad and that they could send east russians to afghanistan if they wanted to be like if they wanted to work with a village they could send east russians if they wanted the soldiers to fight more ferociously they would send west russians like the ussr was all about weaponizing race in their military and so it wouldn't not, it would not be a surprise if like they knew full well that like black lives matter could be like a sparking point in a union yeah. that would just break it up let's see somebody's saying i think gaming is only just got out of the ear of black and white films and has gotten to a point where the sky's the limit I need to look at the industry life cycle because I can answer that question right now. Um, I think we're in the maturity that's, phase. That's not necessarily yes. true, and I think that's crunching about like 30 or 40 years of film history Yeah, in, in, in together. So according to Investopedia, and this is, a, this is usually a pretty solid thing to apply to industries, what we're seeing right now is the maturity phase where... It's a shakeout period during which growth slows, focus shifts towards expense reduction and consolidation. Some firms achieve ec uh, economies of scale, hampering the sustainability of smaller competitors. As maturity is achieved, barriers to entry grow higher, and competitive landscapes become more clear. Market share, cash flow, and profitability become the primary goals of the remaining companies now that growth is rel relatively less important. Price competition becomes much more relevant as product differentiation declines with consolidation. So that sounds like if a we're in the maturity assessment. phase, yeah, if we're in the maturity phase, I think we're about to see a lot less creativity in the gaming industry, which is fucking horrifying. I mean, we're already there. I still think the 
the indie scene keeps a lot of arguably arguably cons the consolidation phase started with the activision blizzard merger yes yeah that's a good that's a good question when did that really begin that was to happen? that was almost over a decade ago yeah um but yeah like if people don't believe me when i say like the golden age of gaming basically ended in 2007 yeah i could see that To be fair, tech has advanced much faster than days when black and white films were a thing. Um, cycles of human culture still move at the same rate, regardless of the technology. So, like, the reason for all the big changes in the film industry are inherently cultural. The reason why the film industry got cool and was, like, started trying to be really rebellious and, like, coming up with ways to... They, they like, basically, like trying to standardize filmmaking and trying to come up with ways beyond just letting greasy producers dictate the way that things were done was because a generation uh, like George Lucas's generation came up and like really changed the way that, that business was done and by proving that like their creative model was more inherently intriguing and at the same vein um, those people getting old influenced the kind of modern era of filmmaking with like we have to make as safe of moves as possible we can't let new guys who are risky break into the big industry um and what have you even stuff like the politics of the political shifts of move of the movie industry are, are things that can be traced as just the culture of the people involved has changed because there's an ebb and flow to creativity. Indie games keeps things shaken up, but once we got the third person action adventure with stealth elements everywhere, that's when things started to stagnate. That I was mean, Sony's I'd, fault. I would say though that there's still a lot of creativity and especially the games that I play, which are a lot of like management, colony sims, mm -hmm. city builders, it depends on the it's on the genres over. that you're Stop into. Being, it's not over, guys. Stop being black pilled. Yeah. the The problem is that the indie scene is mostly propped up by Steam. Uh, so if Steam remains independent and continues to remain true to their current business practices, which I don't see them deviating from, yeah, we'll always have a safe harbor for developers to have. A good market to um, sell their games to their indie games to but once steam's gone there will not be a replacement for it and i guarantee you it will di one day disappear in one way one way or another it doesn't have to disappear but it just the gates oh, I have mean, to come up there's the also the element of people fallaciously think that um just because some, like the idea of the mainstream game industry is going to have good taste in video games is completely fallacious and was never true. Yeah. So the idea that, like, well, gamers just aren't into cool indie games. It's like, yeah, most of them are plebs. The patrician and plebs thing, that's not a meme. That's not, like, that has hundreds of years of cultural basis. <laughs> Like, like, trust me when I say Patrician and Plebs is going to get a lot more relevant in the coming years. So it's going to be one of those things where, um, damn, I said it. Uh, if, <laughs> if, if Microsoft bought Steam next year and was like, no more indie games, we only do AAA games as part of this industry, there is enough of an audience in the indie game scene to notice and say uh well we're not participating with that it is over ashes and echoes western society is over oh good hopefully so then i can stop being a uh, video game content creator damn i have to get a job <laughs> Who said anything about that? I'll just start making fucking YouTube poops or something. I'll make reaction vids. Yeah, reaction streams are the whole, all the, the big thing. 
The issue with Steam being propped up is it's literally on the shoulders of Gabe Newell. I don't necessarily agree with that. Who holds 50% of Steam's stock and refuses to sell, so when he dies, the entire scene changes. I mean, that's true, but it, like... I don't he know, could he could institute uh, contingency plans for that, but it usually is the case where just yeah, of course, losing two or three key second, managers will change a company. Yeah, of course, Gabe Newell's a founder, and second generation managers tend to be fairly consistent with the decisions that they make. Um, but all all the same, again. It's not over and you don't have to be fucking black-pilled about everything. Like, the idea of a mainstream game audience is going to be into the Shadow of Colossus. It's like, no, that's stupid. That was never true. Okay? It was never mainstream to have good taste in video games. And there's... There's more monetization models than ever before. You have crowdfunding now, which was just something that really didn't exist back yeah. in the day. You have patronage. Um, yeah. The fact that people have... are able to make porn games and profit says, in the West, says that uh, <laughs> that the, there have been changes in how uh, in how these things will go. It's, yeah, so. Like, trust me, there will be a scene where it, You just might have to do a little, do a little more legwork to find it. But yeah. if there's... If there's creative and passionate enough people in the industry, which I believe there probably always will be, we should... There should always be something Isn't out there. Isn't Humble Bundle owned by Activision? Is it? I think I think that's the case. I think they bought Humble Bundle. Aaron... Ziff Davis is an American internet and digital company. No, it looks like it's the people who own IGN. Oh, that's what it was. And speed test, really? Well, that's not surprising. Yeah. I mean, it's like how Rooster this? Teeth is owned by AT&T. Yeah. Revenue of 1.38 billion. 4,700 employees. This is This looks like a company I gotta look into. S&P 400, huh. 94 years, founded 94 years ago. It's always... That's robust right there. This, this is a company that I would do a fucking presentation on in a class. They were... My professors, my professors would always be like, okay, um, you just can't do like Apple. Here's and a, I'll just come in with some cool. really crazy ass. Here's a top tech investing company that was founded before computers existed. <laughs> I really would like to start a second channel where I cover business stuff. Oh, holy shit, they own game trailers? PC Magazine. Yeah, it's it, it always surprises me, like, what companies are invested in what YouTubers. Man, you have to feel really bad for AT&T, though, for picking up Rooster Teeth. <laughs> Talk about a shit show. I'm willing to bet AT&T has enough clout to be able to pawn that off for a profit. Okay, let's see. Who do they own right now? Hang on. Let's catch some let's catch some cringe. Mashable. There's a lot of company a lot of websites in here that I don't recognize. Hang on, what? Did Rooster Teeth steal a title from Critical Role? <laughs> I think they did. Anyways, let me, uh, I'm gonna throw something up on the watch together if you're still in there. Yeah. Oh, is this gonna make me sad? Oh, this is gonna make me sad. This is gonna make me cringe more than anything. <laughs> like, this might be my usual habit of, uh, jumping around. So, are, are you a fan of Red vs. Blue? 
Oh, we, we yeah, we've talked about it before. But uh, I mean, I used to. Well, the original obvious, five seasons. Yes, of course. That's a caveat that like <laughs> yes, everybody's a fan of the first five seasons. Yeah, Red vs. Blue is like one of those fascinating things that like if I ever decided I'm done talking about Elder Scrolls, I could also do like Red vs. Blue. I had the idea of doing one on G4 TV and then literally a week later they announced they were coming back. Mm -hmm. I was like, fuck. So, uh, yeah, this is what this is what Red vs. Blue has been reduced to. So what is this? Is this like this a is, PSA? This has got to be the intro, like the intro cut scene. Yeah, but I mean, like, is this an original new series or is it like a PSA? Like, so basically, what this has to do with Red vs. Blue is like, like the the last season of Red vs. Blue before the entire cast was fired for various reasons was like introducing these characters and like basically crossing over and then like they kind of just turned it into its own series called oh, family man. called family shatters which might be a stolen title from critical role we've called you here today to discuss something very important some might say it's the most important decision shatter squad will ever Oh man, the fact that I type in Family Shatters into Google and immediately it pops up Family Shatters Critical Role. That's a little concerning because one of the first things you do when you're coming up with names is look it up. Put it into Google. Yeah, I said, is Pat Cast taken? And uh, it was. <laughs> I have a coworker who wears red versus blue merchandise to work. Okay, how old is this merchandise? How old is his coworker? These are questions that are going to inform a lot of things about what this person, what this person's taste is. Yeah, this is this is how, what Rooster Teeth had to replace Red vs. Blue with because again, most of their cast members disappeared in the span of a month. I don't know the context of what happened, but it was Wait, a, it was a messy breakup. Well, when was that? Fairly recently. God needs a pet. Get it? It's funny because it's like, it's not actually serious. What? You know, like a firehouse dog or a cat. Absolutely not. A dog could be nice. That's two votes for a dog, guys. We're not voting. I could build a little dog house for it. Teach it to fetch? Yes, Axel, exactly. He could be a basketball star. We I love this too because it's like it's basically a tacit admission that the only reason they're using these Halo models is because they're they're they just don't have the time to make actual unique models. And they don't have to animate faces, which is great. Because there is no machin there's no machinima in this series. It's, yeah, it's pure animation. As far as, far as I'm aware, it's pure animation. So it's like... It, I mean, it, it's not even the first time Red vs. Blue has had, like, uh, you know, plagiarism issues. Because it happened with Ruby, too. We could name him Scout. He would have one brown eye and one green eye. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, we're getting a little too specific now. Okay. I vote Cat. Hi! Where'd you come from? They have knives for hands. And yeah. their purrs lower your blood pressure. That's three votes for Cat. The they animation is just so. You don't each get a vote. Why, Why not? This an this animation is so bad. The storyline is cringe. Cause you're the same person. It's just like. Excuse me. We're getting. Oh a God. Dog. We're not getting a dog. Or. Or a cat. We tried this before and it. And plus, it's like, it's the new Halo models, so they look like dog shit. <laughs> it's. Yeah, it, it's very jarring to see these super high poly, like character models, but then they're fucking rendered animations. They're animated in Blender. Yeah, their animations are using like six nodes. Yeah, it's like so they switched over like how they were doing it. So instead of using real animation software, they do everything in like Unreal Engine now. Yeah. 
because it's it's cheaper to uh, put on the render farm. End it poorly. Remember. Hey, we agree not to talk about Mr. This is like, like I feel like this is comedy that I would write, except. You know, I wouldn't be in a, working for a company that was owned by Activision. Or not. Wow, that's a big fuck up right there. <laughs> AT&T. Bubbles, you know that's a very sensitive topic for Tiny. I went on vacation for one week. One I tried my week. best. It was a very tasteful burial. Oh, no. Not a single toilet involved. The disrespect. <sighs> this is exactly what I mean. You know what this reminds me of? This and this this style of comedy reminds me a lot of Archer in the way that its scenes are kind of paced. I've never watched Archer. Responsible enough to have a pet. You can't even take care of your weapons. Excuse me? I fed and watered my weapon every day this week. Get it? Because you don't feed and water weapons? West, we can do this. We risk our lives every day. I'm sure we can handle God. I want to know who left. Those thigh gaps <laughs> I don't like I don't recognize a single voice actor so no no I think it was like comprehensive so this you want a pet this is your new pet enjoy and can you not come up with a good looking rock model you can tell which model was ripped from an actual professional video game and which one was developed, which one was actually made by. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just saying, like, it's a rock. You can't make a, you can't, like, even buy surely, a pre made good rock model. Surely Unreal Engine has, like, default rock assets right if that's what they're rendering it's like they're animating it and stuff mm -hmm. yeah like i think unreal engine has a store that you could buy rock assets from that you would be allowed to put like maybe that's that you would be maybe allowed that's to the license. joke maybe that's the joke is that it, oh it's a shitty rock model because it's it's a joke it, yeah. looks, it looks like it's made of cardboard next to that like high high uh high poly high resolution Spartan model. You know what? Like, I look need? at how much detail is packed into that hand model. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, this is definitely ripped from the games because that's the kind of detail that like three four three would put into their models. Yeah. Calling this red versus blue is charitable. It's not really about a red versus blue conflict. It doesn't involve any of the original characters. It pretty much only has the name attached to it because they need something to market this shit. Like, this has 67,000 views on YouTube. That's really bad for fucking Rooster Teeth. I have a comprehensive list of every single former Rooster Teeth employee. It's a very big list. Here's another red versus blue thing. This is actually has red versus blue in the uh, in the uh, title of it. And I had heard that it, it's even worse. Oh yeah, this is what I was definitely thinking of. What's wrong with this picture? Let's see. Well, chat, what do we think? What's wrong with this image? Okay, so it finally came up for me because of the delay. Oh, you're looking at the stream? It's not popping up on uh, Watch Together. Oh. You might need to reload then. 
Uh, let me see. Because I, I put up a new video. Oh, it started the video oh, over. Damn. Oh, okay. Yeah, it went out of sync. Okay. Don't worry. I would... Like, we can... Yeah, this. All right. All right. All right. So... You have a Halo guy on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. What the... F what game is that dude on the left from? That seems to be, like, just a generic army model. Yeah, right? Because it's just universal camouflage pattern. Like, that's just a normal-ass chest rig. Like, this is a modern-era modern era soldier. Uh, okay, so let's... let's it's cut. definitely not... That's not any sort of marine uniform from a uh, Halo from, game. Yeah, from a Halo game. This looks like a Hunt Down the Freeman model. <laughs> so that can't be good. Why? I'm just saying, anyways. It's cold out here. <laughs> really dark. Afraid of the dark? Like, what are you, a child? Shh, I'm not Look at these the animations. That's just silly. I'm afraid of what can happen. I love the, the like, camera right. effects, though. Like, everything else mind. about Is it that... looks fine. Maybe a little bit too video gamey for an animation, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be machinima, I guess. It, it's pretending but, to be machinima. Yeah, but, like, the, you got, like, a bunch of chromatic aberration going on, and, like,. Mm. Yeah, like yeah of... all those default effects in Unreal Engine. Yeah, yeah, but then you just have those terrible animations. Transport, whatever they brought here for safety, and whatever the fuck is going trouble. on in the Getting scene. Bad vibes about it. Yeah, to make things more weird. And once again, what, what are these character models? Yeah, these like, aren't. Th that's a SWAT uniform. Like this, it, these... this is literally just some shit they bought. This, but they're holding yeah, this Halo isn't guns. Easy. Like this is just generic county t counter terror response models. Surely there were like police bodies that you could find in like Halo. Uh, yeah, there ODS. were. I I think the issue is they don't want to use probably reach. that era of models with the Halo Four models or whatever, like Halo Five. Yeah, but like surely you could commission somebody to make. A couple model. I mean, it's the that, same model. Listen, they that just... would cost more money. And this, <laughs> is de this is definitely being run on the cheap. Yeah. How many views does this get? Oh, this has like six hundred thousand views. Okay. Oh well, it is. It is episode one. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. 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 We gotta the old check like the eighth episode <laughs> test. Red versus blue zero. Oh, Isn't this there's like not even eight episodes? Okay, episode three. Oh yeah, that's seventy six k. A lot of people saw this, said "What the fuck?" and left. <laughs> Alien. Alien. That sounds so dangerous. <laughs> kind of cringe. What the? Come on, on your feet. That's. How a battle rifle fires, of course. It also, what the fuck is the lighting on, like, on his chest? <laughs> like, that's not how, like, the muzzle break is exactly so that this doesn't happen. And also, this shouldn't be happening anyways. Like, until, unless you're telling me that, like, this is muzzle flash from the breach? Where, like, the bolt, like, the casing comes out? Which also <clears throat> doesn't happen? Oh, this has happened to me. What was happening was uh, each time I would fire my AR, the casing would come out and smack the uh, smack the stop, and it would create a spark. <laughs> but no, that this is definitely uh, just bad. Lens flare. We need everyone. Yeah, they definitely bought like a pack of just generic army models. Yeah. Plus, it's like 
What's the point of investing in this? The main way you kill people in this series is with a gun. So it's like, he's just immune to bullets, I guess. Oh, he's got his, uh, he's got shields. That makes, know? that makes him this effectively is, unkillable in this series. This is, this is Halo. Yeah, except, except he's they fighting never, a bunch of people that like, aren't from Halo. They, they literally never, like, used shields in Red vs. Blue. Yeah. Like, the exceptions were, like, um... Locust from the, the Chorus arc. But he had, like, very specific rules for how his shield worked. And I think, like, the meta, who also had specific rules for how his shield worked. I, I hate to be... I hate to be that guy, but I gotta point out that the increased production value is not exactly in spirit of Machinima. The whole oh, yeah. purpose yeah. of Machinima is that there was like an imaginative aspect to it. Like, what can we do within the confines of this game to produce a show? Yeah, you either become was... Rooster Teeth or you become John Graham. Which is not bad to be John Graham, but like... Yeah, this is like, they wanted to be an animation studio, but none of their original animations were actually good or like were profitable enough ventures to be ju to justify being owned by AT&T. So they had to call back to like the only thing that they actually own, which is yeah. Red vs. Blue. Well, the, the founders were on the record many times stating that they really originally just wanted to make a like a film production studio mm -hmm. but doing that's difficult you require a lot of money and stuff so they formed red versus blue instead and now when they got bought out by at&t they had the means to make their own production studio so i don't know what their live action division's doing any longer i don't know what they're doing any longer it's not looking good for their animation side though Hey, you know what would be a really good investment for this guy? A gun. <laughs> Not a grappling hook. I've seen this guy demolish people with punches, and you're telling me that yeah, she's she just took three hooks like it was nothing, and now she's like. <laughs> Oh no, please. Oh shit, it's Washington. No. Alright, so we got one voice actor back. Yeah, a character, one of the characters that I liked from the series. <laughs> I'm really confused how as to how Rooster Teeth is allowed to use Halo models for all their shit. Does Bungie even cut, keep in touch with them anymore? Well, yeah, and it's like, it's not like they're taking Bungie models, they're taking 343's models, and it's like... I think I think they have a really good working relationship with Microsoft. Is I guess we're not using them for anything, so go ahead, whatever. Yeah. Like fucking god, like this is really stretching the bounds of like reasonable etiquette. Got him. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah. Okay. How do you deal with this character? You know who would totally not be fine with uh, an IP getting just completely manhandled like this? Basically any Japanese company. Yeah. The only Japanese reason you can studios. get away with this is because Microsoft just does not give a shit. You're such an ant to them that like, yeah, no, like... Yeah. Th this is This really boggles the mind of how like this is, got made. Remember when Achievement Hunter made achievement guides and not shitty comedy videos? Yeah, but except achievement hunting like went out of fashion. So after like three years. Yeah, like extremely quickly. I honestly, I I liked original Achievement Hunter videos there, for I, a while. I don't see an issue there, with like production companies pivoting, but this is not pivoting. This is this, thrashing while dying. Yeah. <laughs> What the hell? What? I knew I should have called in. Wait, I don't follow the continuity okay. of what just happened. Did he just <laughs> thrust through the floor just, into another hallway. He just like jumped up and then. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I he love crashed. These, I love these environments. I love how sh like, look at how low poly those like 
rubble fragments are. And some of them, like... Yeah, like... It's like a default shatter effect. Also, nice CSGO oh, shit, knife. shit, nice. <laughs> I was about to say. Hey, I got that butterfly knife. <laughs> Hellcase.com, bro. It's like she's got... it. She doesn't have, like, powers that, like, are reasonable in the setting. Like, most of the powers that were, like absurd in project freelancer were like just armor abilities from halo yeah. right? yeah she has a stand from jojo's bizarre adventure it really did turn into an anime huh this is that ruby influence looking for me yeah get over here this one can teleport why where are their guns why did these guys show up to the fight without guns? I never understood this even, like, when the animation could be considered good. Why, like, so many of the soldiers that they were fighting would, like, also turn to melee. I'm waiting. Okay, let's come on! How epic. This is, like, nothing. I need plot. I want to know what's, <laughs> I want to know what's going on. Plot? Are you sure? Are you sure you want that? If I wanted to if I wanted to watch <clears throat> pointless action fights, I would probably like just watch a Marvel movie. But yeah, like, at least there would be really good production value. A big part of caring about what's going on in a fight is like context. I, I, I guess Carolina's in this fight now. Oh shit, alright, so there's another voice actor returned. So basically, like, nobody who was part of the original crew. Oh, they're long gone. Don't get distracted. Shut up. I know. We got more uh, destruction models that are like. I think there's like 10 whole polygons in that one. <laughs> Why we're here. So, this is what you're after. The MacGuffin. Why, yes. It is. Oh, God, there's another one. Commander. Commander. Then come and get it. Commander. Hey, I don't think a shotgun <laughs> has worked so far. At least she has a gun. What's going on here? Oh, yeah. Oh my oh, god. This is nuts. Are all of you this crazy? Zip it, rookie. I think I'm gonna be check it out, one. On the map, we can cut them off the Hey! That's it! Don't you dare, oh, Agent One. What? I got a plan, Axel. I yeah, I don't Don't do it. <laughs> I don't really track what's going on here. <laughs> How many Damn, gears does a Warthog have? Great. Now what? Damn, imagine if Warthogs actually went this fast in game. Hey, looks yeah, like they usually like go like 10 miles an hour. Wow. Real cringe. That's it. Take the wheel. Wait, wait, what? And these animators are being worked to death like any other studio. Do it, rookie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Yep. You're all crazy. I ain't trying to kill him. How's he working the pedal? You I pissed her off. Now oh, like, she put it in cruise control. Ah, uh, yes. Because military vehicles are known for having cruise controls. <laughs> what is this weapon? Whoa, whoa. Ooh, I almost puked on my first day. That would have been embarrassing. So it's your what first day and you get like, uh, you just get like, I don't know. How do you ask for armor <clears throat> in this universe? Like at one point it was like reasonable because it was like, oh yeah, these are minor modifications that we made over the course of a war. But it's like, this is like My Hero Academia style, like drawing a picture of what you want your uniform to be.
I gotta jump forward. Like, I gotta. <laughs> know, like, what was that? And then we're just gonna cut back to Agent Carolina and Washington getting shit faced so that we can write them out of the series. Hey, remember when we made it a plot point that we were gonna give Agent Washington brain damage? <laughs> For like no reason, just because we wanted to fake out that we were going to actually kill a main character. So they must have killed Caboose, right? Gosh. I'm falling so hard off of the. Uh... No, I literally have no idea how this attaches to Next like time. the actual answer. continuity. You have from the count of three to tell me what I want to know. Oh yeah, a torture scene. Three. Does roughing up your prisoners usually work for you? He doesn't sound like Duh. Washington. Where's the temple? Hey, that looks kind of scary. You're not gonna stick that in anything, right? Or up? Oh yeah, what? Two. He knows. He knows the alien artifacts are keys to the temples that hold the ultimate power. Shut it, you big goon. If he's not going to tell us, this will. Who what was that music even choice? Are you? Oh god. Oh, no. Well, it's time to get DMCA'd. What is this? There's seriously so much, like... What is this? To it, too, like... I mean, we're only going off of, like, what we've seen here, but... Which is, like, click, teeth, clicking through this, series. but, like... I'm not picking up on, like, what was the scene we missed. <clears throat> I'm also not recognizing a single name here, and as somebody who is more or less religiously followed Rooster Teeth for mm -hmm. the better part of a decade, that is interesting. I've I've only fallen off of them the past year. Yeah. What the fuck has happened over the past year? Yeah, it's fascinating. That's why we need like we need a video that like just gives us a brief a brief rundown on like I don't know the last three years of Rooster Teeth history. Why did she glow when she went for a kick? She wasn't using her power or anything. Uh, glowing, big deal. So yeah, if you were ever into Rooster Teeth, this is this is what they've been reduced to. No, don't worry, achievement hunters know better either. Let's, let's head over to the Rooster Teeth animation channel where... So the channel banner for the Rooster Teeth channel, a, animation channel is just Family Shatters. I guess that really is all they have going on. I mean, they've been re-uploading complete seasons of Red vs. Blue, so, and those have been getting views, so I guess... There's, there's one way to make your money. Mm-hmm. Hey, you want to guess, okay, how many views do you think the complete first season of Red vs. Blue has? And how many views do you think the most recent complete season has? Go ahead, take a stab. Wait, what was that? I was, I was death scrolling through this fucking How many views tragedy. do you think the first season, the first complete season of Red vs. Blue have? The original? Yeah, so the like they re-uploaded the, all the seasons. How many views do you think the first one got? Uh probably over a million. Yep. It was one point seven million. Alright. Now how yeah. many views do you think the most recent season, complete season, got? Talking first episode? No, it's the complete season. Oh, okay. Um Probably around like four hundred K. Ninety-four thousand. Oh, oh no. <laughs> when was that uploaded? One month ago. So, let's see. Season 15 Part 1 came out two months ago and only has 110,000 views. So, like... You can definitely tell that, like, as it got into, That's... like, the shitty parts of Red vs. Blue, like, where the view counts are dropping off. Like, literally, as soon as Chorus ends, the view counts drop off. Yeah. And let's see, what, what's Chorus's view, view counts? Like, okay, so, and then you get to Project Freelancer. So, like, Chorus, on average, gets, like, uh, 100 to 200,000 views. And then, like, Project Freelancer jumps up to, like, 500,000 views. And then, like, 
it just keeps going up from there like i mean which obviously makes sense but then like you get to the og season and you're easily above 600k to a million okay so this animation so what i'm noticing is there's a distinct lack of rooster teeth animated podcast uh i forgot what the fuck they used to call it like the clips? dude who yeah the dude um jordan swears used to make it like he was the one who made the series so mm -hmm. i want to know if he's still with the company or if he left too oh well i just want to clarify i don't think red versus blue animation has uploaded anything that wasn't actually red versus blue related yeah literally in the last six months Let's see, is he in here? Well, there's Joel Heyman, R.I.P. Yo, you'll no, be saying you'll be saying saying a lot of R.I.P.s if you go down the list of like people okay, that are so, gone. So it looks like Jordan Swears is still here. So why aren't why aren't they making any more? Because those those videos used to do really fucking well. They would just take stories from the podcast and just animate it. Oh, but the podcast is problematic. What if, like, they took a bunch of stuff down, so it's like the only stuff that's up is, like, the innocuous stuff? I'm going to check out the main Rooster Teeth channel. Yeah, okay, so jo Jordan Swears is still here. Let's see. What position does he have now? 2019, he was promoted to creative director. Man, these are... Rooster Teeth animation. The Rooster Teeth main channel does not have good views. Let me just say that. Oh, yeah. Co host a face jam. Oh, right. That's what he's doing now. I have to wonder As how much money AT&T paid. <laughs> it's sad. This this company animated adventures this this company really was in a very good position and then they sold out to the devil tuesday morning let's see uploaded all right there, april YouTube 23rd 2021 at&t incorporated is seeking buyers for rooster teeth productions that's even worse news because yeah, if their channel is only getting like that, their channel only gets like twenty to fifty k views a video, and their animation department is basically dead, then their valuation is going to be exceptionally low. And the question too is, so that was in April, right? How yeah. is their channel? How have their channels been performing? This is where we go to Social Blade. It was like it seems like it's, it's literally been a death knell. Yeah, are they still, like, trending downwards? Are they going up? Ooh, that's, always, that's always a uh, promising thing when... The, tr the charts are completely flat because, uh... It's just, like, not moving enough for Social Blades to pick up. Damn, what the fuck happened? Oh. October 2020. Yeah, I know when that happened. They lost 200... 53 million views on their video on their channel of October of last of, year yeah of Dude, uh, 2020 like, because they had all those they had all those videos that they had to take down because of Joel Heyman and Adam Kovic is there some like corporate espionage going on let's see okay so they're still losing subscribers so what happened was Rooster Teeth got picked up during the acquisition of Time Warner because they were part of Otter Media because I'm like trying to figure yeah. out like what did AT&T pay to get Rooster Teeth? And it seems like it was just a bundle deal. But it's really interesting that, like, Rooster Teeth did so poorly that, like, independently of anything else they got from that bundle deal, they're trying to sell Rooster Teeth, specifically. Yeah. Well, I know AT&T has been trying to... Deleverage de themselves from media production. Yeah. I mean, Rooster Teeth is still pulling 147,000 views on average per day, daily, so... That's not you know. very good for a channel, a, a <laughs> professional a outlet that has 10 million subscribers on YouTube and, like... And for a company that's trying to support hundreds of employees, 
Well, actually, I don't know how big they I even would, are anymore. I would, I would say maybe dozens. There was a point where they were about like, I think like 200, 300 strong. Uh, let's see, Achievement Hunter, which is the money maker. This website claims they have 250 to 500 employees. I imagine they have a lot of contract employees too, so that's kind of hard to... Damn. The gauge. Achievement Hunter is really putting, pulling 72,000 daily views. Whoa. Damn. Yeah, that's bad. That's a bad graph. Just downward. I Looks remember like when did... Rooster Teeth randomly tried to cancel Warhorse Studios and shit on Kingdom Come Deliverance because they wouldn't put African people in the game. That was really a cheap. That was really a uh, Rooster Teeth. That's funny. So like, yeah. As they, as the, uh, as the Comic Skates channel say, "Go woke, go broke." Um, that really sounds like they've had a massive downturn since then. And I guess it makes sense, like, if a bunch of people left over, like, over that kind of stuff, then... God, this is interesting. This is such an interesting thing. It's so... Damn, it's always interesting even... to watch, like, a, a company in its... Just imploding. In its death thrashes. And, like, yeah. what, it, what it decides to prioritize when it comes to content production. It's, it's fascinating looking at the Social Blade charts and seeing just that massive drop during uh, October of 2020. Oh, no. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck happened on their... What would they have to pull down on their animation side? Rooster Teeth Animation's profile picture on YouTube is just Family Shatters. Yeah. <laughs> the Matrix Resurrections in theater. Wait, what? Okay, hang on. This episode is brought to you... I gotta throw this up on the watch together. This episode is brought to you by The Matrix Resurrections in theaters and on HBO Max, December 22nd. <laughs> nice. And that is actual paid promotion. <laughs> so that's not like a bit that they're doing. <laughs> yep. I haven't heard of that before of a YouTube video being sponsored by like a movie. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that's that's got to be the AT and T connection, right? Uh, Which makes you wonder. HBO is HBO and Time Warner and all that. Uh, let's see. Who owns HBO? Yeah, Warner Media, which is owned by AT and T, right? Just gotta double check that. Yes. It is owned by at and So I wonder if Rooster Teeth even made money off of that product placement. Yeah. What if there was like a corporate edict and they were like, we have to obey this because we're in such yeah. a weak position that like, like you have to know they hated doing that. Yeah. Because they were probably just told to. Because like you said, I don't know of any content creators that get a sponsor sponsorship deal from uh well for directly like for a movie make maybe an hbo max subscription sponsorship yeah but like really you thought that fucking a shitty red versus blue knockoff on the rooster teeth main channel was going to be the 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 place that like twenty four thousand views on this video that's some real impressions numbers for a sponsorship Achievement Hunter did a sponsorship for TMNT. That is It's impossible to dodge tennis balls at this range. RT uh, has shows on HBO that. Max. Huh. I mean, Red vs. Blue was on Why? Netflix. I assume it's just like a you're in the family deal. I guess, yeah. What is this? 
We're doing a faux noir story where this gruff character remembers his noir times. God, I, I wish I had more time to go down this rabbit hole and just watch. Like, I, I want to do a book report on every season of Red vs. Blue. I think that's already been done. <laughs> I, I think what, what needs to be done is like an analysis of like, what was the point and why did it happen that like the series started to have a downturn? Oh, well, it's it's plainly obvious. It was um, shifting priorities in the company. Um, yeah, you had Bernie course. Burns, who Bernie Burns leaving Red vs. Blue because he didn't want to write it anymore was the first serious like red flag that things were starting to go. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the people were able to carry the torch a little while longer, but they started running out of steam. And then you just lost too many people. And, well, not just that you were losing people, but, like, you had no talent acquisition going on for probably years. Yeah. When you're just constantly downsizing, or your talent acquisition is almost exclusively in, like, animators to just mm -hmm. animate Ruby and so they your other shows. They weren't getting new personalities. They weren't getting new, like, actors, right? Yeah. So... Why are they all colored so atrociously? I'm not going to, to say appeal it again. to the Zoomer the crowd. And we leave you and alone. Whoever Take comes after card. Zoomers. <sighs> Literally trying to just appeal to the Fortnite crowd. Which, to be fair, Rooster Teeth has always appealed to a younger audience. Yeah, but I think that like whoever's doing this is like out of touch. It's actually yeah. it's, it's like actually sad to see like that. A company that was in touch with, like, what kids and young adults were kind of into in the 2000s, they're and old they And they managed, now. they managed for a while to remain relevant, even though... And like, even they, hold they, that old audience. They straddled, they straddled for a while. Uh, the, we're able to appeal to an older audience, but still attract a younger audience, too. They, they did it for a few years, but... That's a very difficult thing to manage to keep up. And they wound up alienating their old audience. And then, uh, yeah, they can't appeal to the new audience either, so. They can't attract a new audience. Who clicks on this video and says, this is what I want to watch? This is what I'm going to find entertaining. Are kids like, I want to know how relevant Machinima even is to younger audiences anymore. I mean, like, there's not a lot of modern games where you can do Machinima, so, like... Yeah. I mean, part of the appeal of Machinima was that Halo was new and popular. Yeah. And I, I think... would have to look into... Like, I hate to use the use the Fortnite thing, but... Fortnite, in a lot of ways, is what Halo was. Yeah. So but it's I think... like, are people making a lot of popular, successful Machinimas in Fortnite? Do you, like I doubt it as far as I was aware like uh it was basically dead as a medium yeah because it's like it a lot of people a lot of especially like younger audiences and stuff really care about that parasocial relationship like I can't form a parasocial relationship with agent Washington we have green goblins origin story open parenthetical a fortnite movie let's uh Let's put her on. What's happened? You lost Venom to Spider-Man. <laughs> there is no way this is about Ford. <laughs> that this is oh, like wait. licensed. Is this is this Rooster Teeth? No, this is uh, Newscape Pro Fortnite Shorts Films and Skits that has 2.4 million subscribers. Okay, okay. Because it's like 18 minutes long. I was like, what? This is uh, a great start. <laughs> I don't see why you're so surprised. You're weak. The symbiote's given you unlimited power, and you're comfortable using a measly 1%. Hey, devil, you are weak. Uh, 
That, so they're, they're like doing emotes. That audio effect is fucking awful. Yeah. If I was listening to this on a subwoofer, my entire room would be shaking right now. Yeah, you'd get a noise complaint. Yeah. yeah. Little nothing like you, but he was working on my opus. A miracle oh, this, like, chemical that lip syncing. If I just get the formula right, well, of course, that's going to be the main issue. I think they're going to run into is lip syncing stuff with Fortnite. Yeah, like that was one of the advantages of Halo is that there's no like just, lip m movements yeah, to just, it. Just bob the helmets. Turn anyone into a super genius. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Oh yes. <laughs> I was like, it includes paid promotion. <laughs> There's like, wow. I like the, I, I love the QR code. Mm -hmm. It's even, even better. Yeah, great touch. Uh, how often are characters going to be talking and we're going to see their faces? I feel like we're going to get a lot of like, anti shot reverse shots where yeah. the person on screen is the one that's not talking. Like a little longer to get there. How much longer? Scientific progress doesn't stop and start at your wow. whim. Patience wow. is a scientist's best friend. <laughs> well, I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? I mean, that's the that's the charm of machinima. I need a prototype in an hour. Or you're but this is like, this is like professional machinima. Like, how are they, how are they getting the camera angles and stuff? I are there tools in Fortnite? I think there is. Fired. But. I mean, because it's like Unreal Engine. Yeah. Don't argue with me. This is not a discussion. I'm giving you an order. Is that clear? If we rush this, we're all going to regret it. I don't know how much clearer I can make this for you. I just, Osborne. I love is this. Stock I love this, like, animation, right? So all they have is I'm texting somebody animation. So it's like he's having a conversation, but he keeps just tapping the fucking screen. Is this supposed to be a comedy or is this supposed to be a drama? This is Green Goblin's origin story. This is a, this is a uh, drama. Because it's okay. a tragedy. It's a tragedy. Dive. <laughs> okay, good. He put a mask on, so we yeah, they're definitely going to use a lot of that. Hey, Oscorp. You think you can remove me? This is my company. Whether you leeches Wait, say this so is the Green not, Goblin? I built it from nothing. Nothing is your Have a nice life. Enjoy it while it lasts. Walking out of that boardroom made me feel 50 feet tall. That rush of power. This, this is a character I, arc. I, lo I love these house shots because it just looks like it's something from The Sims. Yeah. Well, I mean, like this... <laughs> Like, yeah, this is an area that, like, you're meant to flash through while you're playing a battle royale game. Yeah. The thrill of the kill. But Osborne wasn't going out without a fight. What happened? I like the shaky cam. Like, <laughs> literally every shot is, like, just, yep, camera up, camera down. Camera left, camera right. There. Why did I sell that psychotic stuff? And... My poor assistant. Why did I ingest so much psychotic stuff? I, I'm not myself. I'm, I'm a billionaire, but my house is full of, like, rusted shit. <laughs> Hang on. Is he going to start hallucinating gre the Green Goblin? What? Tell me he does. Who are you? What do you mean? Think yep. about it. Washed up failure of a business. Is Spider-Man ever going to come into this picture? <clears throat> I feel like that's a long dialogue, by the way, to have with a hallucination. Totally remake the search and rescue sector. And as far as I know, we're ahead of schedule. So as long as there's no unforeseen complications, what is that? Hello! Unforeseen complication this, reporting for duty! This is a clusterfuck. <laughs> <laughs> this screen What's shake. Happening? What are you doing here? I love the, let's cut their heads off. <laughs> Tying up a few loose ends. Damn. Damn, boy. Ah! Huh? Who are you? You don't see the resemblance? Hands. 
super villain. I feel like, I like the sound. we're halfway through this video. This is like Green Goblin's here. <laughs> How much more origin is there? Is this Spider-Man? Is this is that is this who this character is supposed to be? Scream all you want, Missy. No one's coming to save you. Think again, weirdo. Oh, oh no, she's is. a generic civilian. Run somewhere safe. I'll take care of this. Oh, Spider-Man, I'm racking up quite a debt. Just stay out of trouble, okay? Oh, God. I'll try. Back away from the mic. You don't have to eat it. Listen. Sometimes you gotta go with the talent that you can find on Fiverr. <laughs> I really want to know what the licensing who, situation for this is. Who made this? Is this like supposed to be a large production, like a Rooster Teeth type deal? Yeah, this is like, this is not a person. Or is, or, right. Yeah, or is this like a couple of, this is definitely not like a couple of kids in their basement or something like this. This, this feels like it has money behind it. Well, I mean, it's a two million plus sub channel like there's definitely an element of god they do shit like this constantly so like this has to be like a at least 10 person operation whoa you whoa for stealing my prey whoever you are i'm spider-man <laughs> i love the turning around <laughs> animations because it's so stilted like turning around in Halo looks smooth, right? If you maybe they're doing it with a mouse, but like with Halo, all the old machinima was done with a controller. So like yeah. this the turning animations would be really smooth. There's like a lot of John Graham stuff like emoting that he figured out how to do just with ca like moving the controller camera. And you are? Mm, that's a good question. I'm green and a goblin. You put it together. I don't remember how Sam Raimi got Green Goblin got his name, but I feel like it wasn't that. This feels like this feels like one of those weird asset flip mobile games, mm -hmm. but the YouTube equivalents. Yeah, yeah, I could take that action. <laughs> Well, and it's like, again, I'm just wondering about the licensing. <laughs> there is no licensing. There's no way. Like, is is there a deal if you make a Fortnite machinima that, like, you're protected if you use copyrighted characters? Yeah, maybe. Because, like, it's since it's, like, these are characters in the game. In the game. Yeah, exactly. But I just feel like there's some, like, Disney lawyer who's like who watches our streams that is like wait a second what is this what's the name of this channel <laughs> look just calm down okay before your rap sheet gets any longer the justice system isn't kind of floating psychos i appreciate the sympathy spider-man but i've got scores to settle a lot of people are on my bad side I suggest you buzz off unless you want to join them. Not yes, gonna it's also happen. too loud. Oh my god, what? <laughs> <laughs> you want some more? I'm loving the emotes. <laughs> yeah. Like we're emoting to uh, communicate the ideas. The most the most amount of money that went into this production was buying all the emotes. <laughs> well, of course, it's an investment to buy all those skins. <laughs> question your father no i Harry. oh god it's worse when the characters like okay the last character talking was awkward because but he had a beard right yeah. <laughs> this is a smooth-faced child talking and there is no lip movements that's that's not what i meant i i didn't mean to yell i didn't that wasn't me i gotta go I need some time to figure all this out. Is this supposed Harry, to be funny? I might be gone for a while. Wait, you can't go. I'm, I'm ruined. That's the thing. I don't know what the goal of this is. Well, what am I supposed I, to be feeling? Do you right think now? I was joking when I said that this is a, a drama <laughs> and a tragedy? <laughs> this is not a comedy. This is not haha laugh at the at the jokes and the japes. 
This is uh This is a serious telling of the Green Goblin story. You're the last hope for the Osborne name. I need you by my side. What Osborne name? I'm waiting for the sex scene, personally. Dad, you're a murderous criminal, and your company's in sh this, this is, okay. Knowing what you look, what the Green Goblin looked like outside of the suit, this is definitely not his son. This is, de this is definitely his son had a different father. Then I'll have my revenge. Help! Please, somebody help! Is that guy holding a pizza? Ah, an yeah. Civilian. Perfect. Spider-Man won't be able to resist. God, the fucking you camera is literally help. making me dizzy. Well, and I love that, like, their rendition of New York, they can't actually do a city. Although <sighs> they did have a city earlier. So we're just in the countryside, and there's a pizza guy kneeling down on the side of the road. The Green That's Goblin is about to harass. Does Spider-Man go out that way? I, I think it would be difficult for Spider-Man to get around an area that doesn't have giant buildings. Actually, this probably would be more like upstate. This is like White Plains. Spider-Man yeah. definitely would not be going up to White Plains. Oh, what happened to you? This samurai guy came and I already <laughs> don't care. Can you help me dress this wound? I love the audio effects. Oh, you've got dress it. this wound? Dude, you're holding a pizza. <laughs> Backwards. If you want to live, I need a favor. What? Did I stutter? I could crush you without breaking a sweat. Okay, okay, what do you want? If I know Spider Man, he'll come over to check on you soon. When he gets here, tell him to. The Spider Man's known to just cruise around areas that would be extremely difficult for somebody who swings on a web to navigate. <laughs> Deliver that pizza to the next town over. Racy Grove? That's it. But this pizza's for tilt. Oh, see, what part of uh, New York is Greasy Grove in? Um, it's probably like Albany. The towers. Well, now it's for Greasy Grove. Assuming you want to keep that leg. Okay, okay, jeez. Perfect. I'm so glad we understand. This, I, like... I'm not going to lie, Domino's manages to pull off some extreme service if this guy got wounded on a delivery and, is, like, earn... and is still worried about like managing to pull off the delivery. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're living off tips. <laughs> Stat each other. <laughs> and that brings us to the present. Wait, hold on. Oh. <laughs> this was flashbacks the entire Oh, this is time. entirely by flashbacks. <laughs> As if this wasn't confusing enough. That makes it even better because it means that there's like literally no stakes. We know that nobody can die and Green Goblin can't get captured because obviously he's not in prison. My plan would have worked. But I also like that like Green Goblin's really open uh, opening up on his history with uh with Venom, like Venom's kind of confused. It's like, okay, but why did I need to hear the part about your like emotional coming out story with your son? <laughs> if it weren't for that ninja, once you and I track Spider-Man down and get him on his own, we can put him in the ground for good. It'll be easier than that. Oh, do elaborate. He's friends with my teammate, Tim Pensky. I what? The two of them are on their way right here, right now, to tell me. And this chimpanzee, is he a threat? Only if you let him talk. What the fuck is a chimpanzee? I, I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. What? You don't? You're not up on your Spider-Man lore? <laughs> you to death. I, I mean, this is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? <clears throat> I, I thought this they was. Licensed, uh, what, did they it, license the whole universe, or is it just specific characters? How do you even broach a licensing deal like that? Um, be Epic Games and own an IP that is okay. Like, that makes sense if you're Epic Games. You're a YouTube channel who like makes machinima. This, this is definitely they have to have some sort of like protection clause or something like that from Epic. 
Yeah, like Epic must have negotiated something where it's I like... I can only imagine the Disney lawyer just like staring at the screen like, wait a second, our agreement <laughs> lets them do this? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there should be caveats. Or we need to be getting a cut. Yeah, like... How delightful! Give us some of that Rage Shadow Legends money. We, we know you got money, you got a sponsorship. All we have to do is wait. Venom, open up. Yes, like labs to the That's slaughter. Shimpansky? I'll have some explosives. What should we do in the meantime? Okay, that didn't return Stall results. Stall for time. Keep them on the doorstep. I don't care how. What do you want, Shimpansky? Spider-Man told me what you... <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my God. Aren't there, like hundreds of character models in Fortnite. Yeah. So I'm looking into this group right now. Um they have a Minecraft segment. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's a whole like 999,000 subscribers. I'm just trying to get this channel to pop up. They're called Hang on, I can give you a name. Uh Newscape Pro, that's one word. Dash yeah. Fortnite Shorts Films and Skits. Like I put that into into Social Blade and it just didn't return any results. Let's see if I just do Newscape Fortnite. Okay. Newscape Pro 3. Whoa. Whoa, this is a whole hustle here. Yeah, this is the kind of shit you really want to invest into. Yeah. Spider-Man the early years of Fortnite movie. It's 90 minutes long. Holy shit. The chat was not kidding. <laughs> it's a 94 minute. There is a 90 minute Spider-Man movie, Fortnite movie, and it has the same shit. It's, I'm like the preview video is just shaky cam of, of Deadpool talking. Well, these people are not pulling as many views as Rooster Teeth. So, there is still hope for Rooster Teeth, I guess. Okay, I'm seeing like Rick and Morty episodes. Not like not like episodes of the show, but like they've made short films that are just Rick and Morty. <laughs> How are they getting away with this? This is like. <laughs> this they've is some wild the, ass shit. They've got the Mandalorian. There's the Predator. It's just like if you've ever if you've ever accepted having your shit put in Fortnite, these people have used it to uh get themselves views. Now, now I'm I'm really curious what the licensing agreements for uh Epic manages mm -hmm. to uh negotiate include. Uh, let's see, Fortnite Machinima licensing. See, this is what this is why about sections were exist. Okay, so these people are in the United States, apparently. I find I find that hard to believe. This really this has a eastern european vibe to me like the the legally gray sort of skirting the bounds here this feels like a like a romanian operation fan content must have no commercial objective as an exception to this individual fans are permitted to monetize web videos with advertisements so long as those videos otherwise meet the requirements of this part wait you can't have commercial objective, but you can monetize videos. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So I guess these people are protected. Well, so far, I'm going down the list. Join our hero. Oh, hold on a sec. <laughs> 
Fortnite Shorts, Films, and Skits by Newscape Pro is a Fortnite machinima short channel where we create videos from your favorite characters, including the Ice King, the Prisoner, Lynx, Drift, Hybrids, and many more. All Join our heroes as they explore. So, okay, now they own. Oh, they yeah, own... okay, so they own these. <laughs> Subscribe for more crazy Fortnite movies, backstory, love stories, and origin stories, and daily content across all our channels. This is... Oh, they I'm have not... a TikTok as well. See, I'm not seeing any, like, protections in the fan content policy about using... Like, there's stuff about the epic intellectual properties, but there's not stuff about intellectual properties that, like, are... That epic themselves are licensing. Okay, so they have a store. Let's see if they have any licensed crap in here. Wow, they got a lot. They got a lot of stuff in here. Who are they? What is their? I want to know what their um, audience analytics looks like. Okay, so I'm not seeing any light. This looks like channel, uh, like channel original art. So they're not going so far as to put Spider Man on like coffee mugs and shit. Got a bunch of SCP stuff, but that's not copywritten as far as I'm concerned. As far as I'm aware. I wonder if Pat will be able to find something cringier than this. Um, that's not the kind of thing you want to challenge me to. But we are <laughs> we're already in the rabbit hole. <laughs> All right, Fortnite machinima licensing. Like, what else <laughs> can, can you look up? How do you research this stuff? Report copyright and trademark infringement. If they have a form for that that might be inf that might be uh informative how would you even find this i looked up fortnite machinima and this was the first hit <laughs> <laughs> let's see how much of a stranglehold these dudes have on there's stuff like um filing dm so this is like filing dmcas if you're material is being used in epic game stuff so this is not like a content policy this is about i think The Halo TV show looks not good. Yeah, that's one way of putting that. This is the copyright case that had to do with those Fortnite dances. Five YouTubers I got mad at viewers. Sunday, Mr. Beast, Preston, Jelly. What the fuck are you talking about? I, I'm just death scrolling now. I'm trying to read this intellectual property rights thing. You're permitted to use the services for your personal non-commercial use only or legitimate business purposes related to your role as a current or prospective customer of Epic. Except as provided below, you must not copy, modify, create derivative works of, publicly display, publicly perform, republish, or transmit any of the material obtained through the services, or delete or alter any copyright, trademark, or other proprietary rights notices from copies of materials from the server. Okay, so don't remove terms of service or anything like that. Maybe this mission, my group. I'm, now I'm just going to read chat and see. 
It was Mission to Group has a deal with Epic. Yeah, but Epic doesn't have. They only have like. They license have, agreements. Okay, so they, like they can't. I assume the case is that yeah, like when Thanos shows up in Fortnite, that's because they license the rights to have that character. That license does not then extend to like Epic can't then replicate that license. Like that's why we're curious. Like okay, if this machinery group is licensing these characters from Epic, then the original like Disney would also have to be involved in that licensing agreement. Yeah, I just, I have a real hard time if, like, if, what's, like, Rooster Teeth had to facilitate, like, create a working relationship with Microsoft and 343 3 and Bungie in order to do their stuff. Yeah, and um, Microsoft, Those are... Microsoft had a reuse policy that they created yeah. specifically because of Machinima that was, like, you can use Halo music, um... If you're making Halo Machinima, for instance, I, I just have a real hard time believing that like Disney would be so cutting edge that they know how to that they would be OK with licensing this to like content creators. I don't even know what that sort of licensing agreement would what that term would even be. I bet Epic is turning a blind eye, but yeah, so Epic can turn a blind eye, but YouTube can't. Well, that's kind of a complicated, a complicated thing. Like, how does the rules enforcement work then? Yeah. And I mean, these people have like a huge channel network and stuff, so surely by now yeah, like, so, some lawyer would have gotten wind of this. Yeah, these these hour and a half long spider-man movies have like millions of views yeah across right. their whole network they have over a billion views just on their two main channels they have over a billion views they've got multiple channels yeah like they've got no i mean like they've got five fortnite channels yeah we are This is, uh, how far back do they go? Are these like dudes relatively new? Have they been doing this for a few years? Wait, which one was the original one that does machinima? You skate pro Fortnite's shorts. Okay. It's the original one. So we look at Purple. the oldest videos on this channel. It's from three years ago and it's a video titled Never shoot John Wick, period, ever, period, all caps, by the way, open parenthetical, a Fortnite short film. So it's like, from the outset, they were basing their entire content model on... On the licensed IPs in Fortnite. Yeah, like using licensed characters. This is boring to me. I don't care about Fortnite. You will consume the Fortnite to. content. It's time to come home. <laughs> and why should we do that? You know why? Villainous scheming is beneath your talents. We need you at Sanctuary. I always planning something big. One of these characters is not quite like the other. <laughs> There's nothing for us there. But, but like unless unless there's some comic book character that I didn't know about. Stuis. What? Yeah, maybe doesn't Disney doesn't give a shit. Yeah, Disney has been very known for just letting people violate their copyright, just take fat shits all over their copyright. This is this is something that is in character with Disney's general practices. Do you mean without Dawn, there's no reason for us to continue working together? Don't say that. I know losing her was hard. What, what was the with the crowd sound? Word apes. 
Earth, but she wasn't your whole life. Charlotte and I miss you. That's your mistake. Well, I'm out of patience. Spider-Man! Come on, Venom. I know I'm not your favorite person in the world, but... Yes, we were right. Spider-Man is here too. Just keep him talking while I rig these landmines. We need you to come home. He's like we were one so tense. If you want us to follow you to our mysterious secondary location, you'll have to come in here and show your faces. That's risky. Who knows what Venom's got with- I, th I think we know which one is the actual owner of this channel. Because, uh... Think for us in there. He needs to know we're not a threat. And which, which ones are paid by Fiverr? <laughs> what do you mean? Venom may be plotting with someone. No, we're so close. No one's here but me. I promise. I just... Uh, have a podcast on. Yeah, see, Chimpansky? Venom's probably stressed out of his mind. He's just trying to calm down. Mm. Whatever you say, but Venom, when we come in there, no funny business. You hear me? Of course. Well, come on. It's an easy setup. Like, that's how you tell, like, it's so low effort that fucking, like, they just didn't say, all right, Venom, no monkey business. <laughs> we swear. Weren't we doing rooster we doing, teeth? This is this more interesting is, to me. This is it. <laughs> this is the future. This is rooster teeth too. <laughs> ready? Goblin? Ready? <laughs> oh, I can hardly contain my excitement. Okay, Venom. See? No threat. We don't mean you any harm. Duh. We're just here to help. Now, Goblin. You're really oh, nice. stuck in <laughs> Spider-Man. What? Green Goblin? There's got to be some effort in, like, doing the shaking cam, right? Wait, that's, that's it? it? That's it. That's the that's origin the grand... story over. Yeah. <laughs> that's Green Goblin's origin story. It ends with him fucking killing Spider-Man. <laughs> he won. Not only is Green Goblin's origin story over, that's just Green Goblin's story. Okay, everyone, what's worse, this or RVB? I would say RVB because at least this is machinima. Yeah, at least Red vs. Blue was good at some point. <laughs> There's a kind of divine comedy aspect to it. That abrupt end, uh, well, I mean, like, you know, it was 15 minutes before they had got to go home, so <laughs> <laughs> there just wasn't any more time. Uh, they, they know most of their audience tuned out by then. They watched for the first five minutes and then stopped. Well, that's the thing is, like, I don't know. I just feel like when I was a kid, this is not content I would have tolerated. I don't know. I had some pretty fucking shit taste as a kid, so. As a kid, kid, maybe? Like, I mean, that's, I can see. That, that's why I want to. That's why I'm wondering what their, like, demographic. Well, I feel like there's not even, like, a kid's appeal because, like, nothing is happening. It's literally just dialogue <clears throat> scene after dialogue scene of I mean, boring shit that only appeals to adult of... comics bo comic books fans. I could see I could see 10-year-olds digging this. I mean, evidently somebody's digging it. They get shit tons of views. Okay, so the kid that's riding in, in the cart at Walmart that's watching a video on his iPad, this is what's playing? I could believe that. No, there's not enough going on. If we're talking like an eight-year-old, an eight-year-old needs shit to happen. That's part of what was like appealing about Machinima was like shit was happening. There would be like fight scenes and shit. I think it's more for babies, like really young kids. Even f like, okay, four-year-olds aren't going to understand what's going on. 
Poisoned as corp. Hang on, where's where's the part where he has like an existential conflict with himself? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure kids. I'm sure this is really appealing to children. You like you got to look past. This is Fortnite. This is stuff that kids recognize and say. What is it exactly that's holding kids like interest here? What do the comments look like? That's true. Destroy the house. Oh, what's the other interesting part that like uh kids would really be into? Oh yeah, the part where like uh he's Green Goblin's having a breakdown with his son. Yeah, this seems like really this is just I don't... this is the kind of drama that holds children. Alright, so Red versus Blue is mostly standing around and talking. Um Red versus Blue was not the machinima that kids were watching. I'm thinking, like, kids were watching, like, fucking, uh, at the adventures of Master Chief, where, like, uh, he would say a bunch of expletives and fucking, uh, like, kill hookers. Because there was, like, constant, like, shit just going on. What are you talking about? There's another me. He's angry and psychotic. I don't know where he came from, but if he comes out again, you just need to trust that I'm still in here somewhere, okay? That doesn't make any sense. How can you say you're my dad when you're dressing up like a goblin and bombing people? You insolent, ungrateful brat. Don't you dare question your father. No, I... I... Harry, that's, that's not what I meant. I, I didn't mean to yell. I'm sorry, son. It wasn't me. I, I, I Listen, I'm under a lot of stress. Ever since me and your mom split up, I know that it's been hard on you. It's been hard on me, too. I hope that we can really reconcile our... Like, come on. This is not shit that, like, kids are going to be into. That's why it's okay. such a confusing zenith. So, the Green Goblin is voiced by a regular. So, it's not a Pfeiffer actor. So like they have a they have a cast of like recurring characters, okay. yeah, or recur recurring uh, voice actors, I should say. Yeah, I'm just scrolling through the comments. I'm not really. It's just a lot of people who are just like, I love it. Although the top comments are kind of interesting because the the channel like this top comment is help me reach 1k subs with two videos how the fuck does that hit top comments with only seven upvotes uh there's a top comment grind set yeah that's what i have set and then the one below it is 54 upvotes the fuck youtube I think it's time for genocide. I think we've hit the uh the bottom of the barrel here. Yeah, the uh you guys challenged me to go lower and uh I like to think that I delivered <laughs> on this stream. I was I'm glad to have been a part of it. There's, there's always, the yeah, here. there's always rock bottom. <laughs> there is always a point in your life where you can realize that, um, uh, you could be like reacting to Fortnite videos <laughs> <laughs> at three thirty in the morning. Mm hmm. So yeah, I think we're gonna cut it off here. Yeah. What a what a wild twist of events. I had fun. Yeah, it was a it was a good stream. It was nice having the well, some of the Kretosis guys over at least. It was nice that that video was actually uh pretty good. Yeah, I know. Like thank god. It only took 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> 